Chapter 29 Savongla was not a rare sight in the Sunalak's Hai Chu, as the ship's officers affectionately called their mess. So he knew the ripple of stunned silence sweeping across the tables behind him had less to do with his presence than that of the person approaching. He did not turn to see who it was. That would have implied curiosity, and he was not curious. The war master continued to study the basin of Yanskaks before him, his eye fixed on a juicy fellow with an eight-centimeter fence of dorsal spines. The thing seemed to realize it was being watched, and kept its tail poised, but it made no move to bury itself beneath the others, as wise old Yanskaks often did. This one seemed worthy, a true creature of Yunyamka. The voices close behind Savangla murmured into quiet, and a pair of feet scuffed the floor. He raised an arm, signaling whoever it was to wait, then darted a hand into the basin and grabbed the yanskak beneath its tail barb. Instead of struggling to escape, the creature reared back, driving its dorsal fence into the warmaster's fingers. Two spines struck bone, and another lodged in a knuckle, pumping poison directly into the joint. A cord of white heat shot up Savong La's arm into his shoulder. The pain was exquisite. With the spine still embedded in his fingers, the war master stepped to the dressing table and braved the Yanskak's clacking kilopeds to eviscerate it alive, then tossed it onto the brazier, still thrashing, to cook in its scales. The entrails he flung to the floor for the Kostog cleaning scavengers, who began to fight over them stinger and tentacle. Such were the gifts the gods gave to their strong. Battle, pain, life, death. Savong La cleaned his kufi in a vat of venagel and drew the edge across his own palm to sanctify the blade, then turned to see who had come. Yes. To his surprise, he found himself facing not a messenger, but a striking young communications attendant with black honor bars burned across her cheeks. You may speak, Seif. Seif raised a fist to the opposite shoulder in salute. News from Talfalia, War Master. Instead of continuing, she cast a nervous glance around at the other officers in the high chu. I take it the Jedi have shown themselves. The crack of rupturing keeloped told Savong La that his yanskak had finished cooking. He snatched his meal out of the flames with his bare hands. No officer in the Hai Chu would dream of using the bone tongs provided for that purpose. Then peeled the tail down, pulling the scaly skin off with it. How many refugees did they save? All of them, my leader, or nearly so. Seif's gaze dropped. The blockade was defeated, as was our fleet. Defeated? Savong Law grasped the yanskak by its dorsal spines and took a bite. The flesh was firm and tangy, designed by the shapers to be savory as well as nutritious. You're certain? Seif drew her kufi and offered the hilt. It shames me to bear this news. But the sentinel's view was clear. They attacked with a fleet many times larger than our spies claim they have, and they employed weapons our shapers are still struggling to analyze. She lowered her gaze, not wishing to offend the great war master, by looking upon him as she delivered the last line of particularly disgracing news. Their star destroyers were even able to capture one of our capital vessels, the Loka. Intact. More than not, I fear, Seif answered. Interesting. I want to go see this for myself. Memory Chi Labs are on their way from the Sentinels now, war master. And that won't be necessary. Savong La pushed the kufi aside. We have been awaiting this. We have? Seif looked more puzzled than relieved. The Jedi have finally let their emotions lead them astray. Though he had been working toward this moment since the fall of Duro, he felt strangely disappointed in his enemies. He had thought them better foes than this not so easily manipulated. 
See if you will ask the readers to discover if the gods favor two bold attacks, one to take Borlios, the other to take Risi. Risi? This from a master tactician standing in line behind him. Will you bypass the Bilbringi shipyards? For now. Savang La placed a hand on Seif's back and pushed her gently toward the exit, then tore the kilopads off his yanskak. Splaying them open, he raised his arm high enough for everyone in the high chu to see. The time has come to prepare our pincers, my warriors. He brought the claws together. We are ready for battle plan Coruscant. Chapter 30 Gaunt and thin-lipped, with a much-broken nose and a black-pithed Playerian bowl glaring out of a restructured ocular orbit, Nomanor was the most recognizable Yuzhan Vong in the galaxy, at least to a Jedi Knight. The feathery creature hopping along beside him was another matter. Standing a little over waist-high on reverse-jointed knees, it had willowy ears, corkscrew antennae, and delicate whiskers fringing a broad, simian mouth. Jason had never seen a creature quite like this one, and yet he had the uncanny feeling he should know it. Halfway to its destination, the ramp where Ganner had inadvertently insulted the Yuzhan Vong at the rescue ship, the thing stopped and turned its head in his direction. Though it was gazing through two layers of window membrane and across a hundred meters of landing pit, it looked straight at him. It let its gaze linger long enough to send a cold shiver down his spine, then smiled slyly and fluttered forward to rejoin Nomanor. Beside Jason, Ganna whispered, It couldn't have seen us. Despite his assertion, he retreated deeper into the shadows. It glanced over by chance. It felt us, Jason said, lowering the electro-binoculars. More than that, it felt our apprehension. He did not add that the creature had done so through the Force. The shock radiating from Ganner suggested he had already reached the same conclusion. "'What's wrong with you two? Jaina asked, joining them in the archway. "'You feel like you've been hearing the Emperor's voice. Don't tell me you're afraid of a few Yuzhan Vong. There are more than a few.' Jason passed the electro-binoculars to his sister. Her emotions felt oddly disconnected, as they often did when combat was imminent. But he could not criticize her performance. When the thudbugs started flying, she was always the steadiest, most level-headed Jedi on the strike team. Ignoring the company of Yuzhan Vong warriors forming up outside Numanor's shuttle, he pointed at the bird thing. But it's Numanor's pet that bothers me. I think it touched me with the Force. Gina studied the little creature. You're sure? Not sure, Jason clarified, but convinced. Me too, Ganner agreed. That smile. Hmm. Gina frowned in thought. Does feathers there remind you of anybody? I keep thinking it should, Jason said, but I've never seen anything like it. Sorry. I forget that New Republic intelligence isn't sharing with Uncle Luke these days, Gina said. We've seen some interesting holograms in Rogue Squadron. That's Vergeer. Vergeer? Jason gasped. Vergeer had been involved in one of the Yuzhan Vong's first efforts to assassinate the Jedi. But she had also been the one who had given their father the healing tears that had first put Mara's illness into remission. To this day, there remained disagreement over whether Vergeer was a friend or foe of the Jedi, a mere pet of the assassin or an agent in her own right. It's either Vergeer or another creature like her, Jaina said, and if she touched you through the Force, we can assume she was more than the assassin's pet familiar. Ganner nodded. She was there to point us out to the killer. I'm not so sure, Jason said. If she was part of the plot, why did she save Mara's life? Why hasn't she sounded the alarm about us yet? Maybe we were wrong, Ganner suggested. Maybe she didn't feel us. I felt her. 
Jason insisted. Their discussion was interrupted by the arrival of Anakin and the rest of the strike team. The two dark Jedi, Lomi and Welk, were with them, now clothed in their own dark armor and swaddled in Techley's back to bandages. Jason was ashamed to find himself wishing the group had known the pair's identity before his brother decided to rescue them. He felt certain they would still have made the attempt, but after killing the Voxen Queen. Ganner passed the electro-binoculars to Anakin at about the same time that Nome Anor and Vergeer reached their destination. The unarmored Yuzhan Vong, who had challenged the strike team earlier, appeared on the ramp and began to speak with Nome Anor. When Vergeer intruded with a harsh comment, he stiffened and brought his fist to his shoulder in salute, then began to include her in the conversation. Anakin turned the electro-binoculars toward the troops in front of Nomanor's shuttle. How many? Too many to fight, Jason answered. Anakin ignored him and looked to Ganner. More disappointed by the slight than irritated by it, Jason swallowed his pride and remained silent. After all, his brother had asked for information, not recommendations. Ganner said, I counted a hundred and four warriors, probably three platoons and an overseeing officer. Anakin's expression did not change, but Jason felt a rare surge of anxiety in his brother. Their first plan had already failed, and now their second was coming apart. He did his best to mute Anakin's apprehension and prevent it from affecting the others through the battle meld. Lomi stepped to Anakin's side. We can escape into the training course. There's an exit into the laboratory complex. Jason saw Welk's face pale and felt his terror through the force. What's the training course? Jason asked. It's where the Yuzhan Vong teach Voxen to hunt us, Lomi explained. She narrowed her eyes, clearly resentful at being questioned. It will be dangerous, but less so than the spaceport. And we know the terrain better than the trainers do, Welk said. Despite his fear, he was eager to support his master, perhaps because she frightened him more than the Voxen did. The Voxen won't be a problem, not for so many of us. Unless Skywalker's students do not live up to their reputations? Lomi taunted Anakin with a sneer. The choice is yours, young Solo. We deserve our reputations, Anakin said. The unarmored Yuzhan Vong with no Manor pointed down the colonnade toward the detention warren, where the group was hiding. I don't think he's telling them how to find the refresher, Ganner said. Things are getting dangerous. Not dangerous, just interesting, Anakin replied. He backed out of the archway, then waved Lomi deeper into the detention warren. Lead on. Zek started after him. Anakin, what are you doing? Jason did his best to dampen the alarm and indignation pouring into the battle meld, but Zek's feelings were too powerful. They cascaded through the group, evoking enmity and resentment from Raynar and Errol, and something more deadly from the Barabels. Anakin glanced back at the landing pit, where Nome Anor and Vergeer were waving to their troops. We'll never make it around the spaceport. We need to follow Lomi through the training area. She's a night sister, Zek continued. You can't trust her. You can't even bring her. Zek, we don't have any choice, Jason said. He was glad to have an opportunity to support his brother. Maybe that would convince Anakin to forgive him for his mistake aboard the exquisite death. Abandoning them would be the same as killing them. Worse, Lomi said, leading the way past the detention cells. I doubt you have any spare lightsabers, but perhaps a blaster? I said we need you, not trust you, Anakin said. Lomi smiled guilefully. As you wish. She turned down a corridor lined so thickly with Isolamiri trees that Jason felt as though he were traveling through the jungle floor back on Yavin 4. The battle mill broke briefly as they entered a deep region where the Isolamiri had not smelled the pheromone capsule. Then the corridor entered a throat of Yorick coral so narrow 
that even Techley had to turn sideways. Had the walls not been covered with the slippery blanket of mildew, Lobaka would not have been able to squeeze through at all. On the other side, the passage opened into a sparse forest of bitter-smelling trees with drooping crowns and knife-shaped leaves. Through the spindly foliage, Jason saw that they had entered a canyon-like passage, perhaps a hundred meters wide and half that in depth, with a sky of brightly glowing lichen clinging to the ceiling above the treetops. Lomi paused there. Keep your weapons at hand. The trainers were working a pack when you arrived, and they pulled us out in a hurry. The Voxen could be anywhere by now. Jason looked back through the narrow throat of Yorick Coral. Why not the detention warren? The fungus, Lumi explained. It prevents them from clinging to the walls, and the passage is too narrow for them to pass through otherwise. They paused long enough for Lobaka and Ganner to plant a pair of detonite trip mines in the corridor, then continued down the trail. Jason re-established the battle melt and was struck by the discord in the group. With events turning against them and everyone nervous about a vox in ambush, emotions were running raw. Lomi guided the strike team down the trail, then turned down an intersecting passage at a convergence Jason had not even seen. The trees grew instantly darker and denser, their branches draped with long beards of quivering moss. They had traveled no more than fifty paces through this area when a muted crack sounded behind them, followed by the muffled roar of falling stone. Mine detonation confirmed, 2-4-S reported. Casualty count unavailable. Tell us something we don't know, Tahiri said. Lomi led the way around several more corners. Tahiri's comments growing more frequent as the forest grew steadily thicker and darker. A pair of coral skippers flew over, then wheeled around just beneath the ceiling and dived toward the treetops. Presence detected, 2 us warned. Lomi rushed the team down a swampy side rift with scaly trunked trees rising out of green water. 2 us secure the intersection, Anakin ordered. Affirmative. The droid responded. They were barely a hundred splashes into the swamp when the wump wump of the droid's blaster cannon reverberated down the canyon. Lead ship destroyed, 2-4-S reported over their comm links. The fire continued another second before it was joined by the roaring sizzle of a plasma volcano. Through the treetops, Jason glimpsed the dark disk of a coral skipper swinging toward the canyon mouth, a fan of dark mist pouring from its belly. Breath masks, he shouted. Most members of the strike team were already pulling the masks over their faces, but the two dark Jedi could only glance helplessly at the others. Lomi turned to Anakin with an outstretched hand. I need a mask. Hold your breath, Zek said nastily. And who will guide us if she falls? Alima demanded. The Twi'lek tossed her breath mask across the swamp, using the force to propel it into Lomi's hands. Then the roar of the two forces's propulsion rockets sounded from the intersection. Jason glanced back to see the droid rising out of the swamp on a column of yellow flame, all weapon systems pouring fire into the nose of the coral skipper. The enemy pilot countered with a pair of plasma balls to the chest. YVH 24S vanished inside a ball of white flame, but still managed to steer himself into the oncoming coral skipper and trigger his self destruct charges. Coral Skipper and Droid vanished together in a brilliant flash. Jason's vision spotted, then the shockwave sent him stumbling backward through the water. He was caught by Tenel Ka's strong hand. After steadying him, she said something he could not hear over the ringing in his ears, but the sentiment of which he recognized through the battle melt. His breath mask would do him no good dangling from his hand. Jason pulled the straps over his head, more than a little distressed by 2-4-S's annihilation. Not only had the droid been a valuable and respected comrade, but with both him and 2-1-S destroyed, the entire strike team felt far more exposed, as though their protector had vanished and left them to fend for themselves. When the spots cleared from his eyes, Jason saw a cloud of oily smoke drifting down the canyon toward them. Beneath it hung the same dark mist that the coral skipper had been releasing when 2-4-S destroyed it. 
He turned to warn the others and found Anakin already motioning the team forward. Then he felt the familiar agitation of a voxen somewhere ahead. Sith blood! Tahiri put her lightsaber in one hand and her blaster in the other. When does something go right? A forest of lightsabers snapped to life and Anakin ordered, Keep going. Let's stay ahead of that mist until it disperses. The Barabels inserted their earplugs, then dropped to their bellies and glided out across the water, their thick tails propelling them quietly forward. The rest of the strike team put in their own earplugs and waited after the hatchmates, some with blaster weapons in hand, others with lightsabers, some with both. They advanced no more than twenty meters before a loud purling rippled through the trees ahead, and Jason felt an outpouring of surprise from Bella. He pointed toward her side of the gorge and started to shout the alarm, but the rest of the team was already splashing in her direction. The Barabelle shot from the water like a rocket, plastering her body against a nearby tree trunk and scrambling for the top. Behind her came a voxen's flattish snout, its beady lips drawing open to spray acid. A flurry of blaster bolts converged on the creature's head. Many hit scales and bounced harmlessly away, but several more burned through or buried themselves into the soft tissue around its eyes and ear slits. Ganner and Alima leapt forward and hacked off the smoking head with their lightsabers, leaving the next stump to slide back beneath the surface. Found it, Bella called, dropping back into the swamp. The three barabels broke into a fit of sissing inside their breath masks. Then the mist curtain caught up to them, and tiny droplets of black vapor began to melt into the water. Alima! Welk! Into the water! Jason yelled. Alima was already underwater by the time he finished, but, not being part of the battle meld, Welk was slower. He looked around in confusion for a moment, then finally grasped what was happening and threw himself beneath the surface, only to bob to the surface a few seconds later, limp and floating face down. Lomi used the force to summon him to her, then held him above the water while Tekli examined him. His breathing is fine, the Chadrafan said. I think it's only— She let the sentence trail off as she, and everyone else in the battle meld, experienced a sudden surge of panic from Alima. You think what? Lomi asked, unaware of what the others were feeling. Will he recover, or am I— she was interrupted by the crackle of liquid turning instantly to vapor as Alima's lightsaber ignited underwater. The Twi'lek shot out of the swamp in a cloud of steam, using the force to somersault backward over Ganner. Another voxen, Alima yelled, pointing. It caught me by the... Her eyes closed before she finished, and she splashed into the water on her back. Ganner and Bella ignited their own lightsabers and began to back away stabbing at the water as they moved. Jason concentrated on muting the team's negative feelings and keeping the battle meld efficient, and Anakin used the Force to lift Alima out of harm's way and float her over to Tahiri. Take her. Anakin pointed back toward the murky forest where the coral skippers had found them. Take Lomi and Tekli. Wait for us on dry land. Me? Tahiri let the Twi'lek sink half into the water before reaching out with the force to keep her afloat. Why do I have— Because Anakin asked you to, Jason said. He stretched a hand toward where Alima had fallen and summoned the Twi'lek's lightsaber from beneath the water, then slapped it into the girl's hand. Now is no time for jealousy, Tahiri. I'm not jealous, Tahiri snapped. I just don't like being sent off like some child. With that— she motioned to Lomi and Tekli, then took Alima and retreated up the canyon. Jason activated his own lightsaber and started forward to join the others searching for the Voxen, but saw the Barabels spreading across the channel with a handful of concussion grenades and realized they had a better idea. Everybody back, Anakin ordered, approving the plan even before the Barabels suggested it. Watch those trees. We don't want them falling on someone. The Barabels began to throw their grenades in simultaneous trios, working inward from the farthest distance they guessed the Voxen could have traveled. With each column of water, the explosions 
sent shooting into the air, Jason felt a sharp concussion against his legs. On the second throw, three voxen floated to the surface with glazed eyes and bleeding ears. Ganner and Lobaka used their lightsabers to finish the stunned creatures. That's four. Anakin deactivated his lightsaber. The whole pack. Perhaps, but it would be wise to be sure, Tenelka said, glancing in Jason's direction. Do you feel any more? Jason reached out to see if he could locate any other creatures. It took a moment, but he finally located a large group of presences several hundred meters up the canyon. There are more, he reported. A half a dozen at least. They seem kind of stunned and wary. Good, Tenelka said. Then that will give us plenty of time to go the other way. Anakin nodded, and the strike team turned to go. Twenty meters from the intersection, they found Tahiri and the others rushing back toward them. No, go that way. Tahiri pointed up the canyon toward the Voxen. Nomanor and his bird are coming this way, with about a hundred Yuzhan Vong. What next? Raynar complained. He slapped a hand to his forehead and ran it over his blonde hair. Can anything else go wrong? Zek glanced at Lomi, then turned away, shaking his head, as if to say this was what came of consorting with Dark Jedi. Jason realized that he needed to speak with Zek at the first opportunity about his impact on the battle meld. But Anakin seemed oblivious to the strike team's growing sense of fatalism. Not seeming to hear Raynar, Anakin clapped a hand on Tahiri's shoulder and flashed a brash, solo smile. This is no problem, he said. Lobaka growled a question, which MTD translated almost accurately as, Master Lobaka wishes to inquire if you have lost your mind. That was a long time ago, Jaina answered, not quite laughing. And if he's thinking what I'm thinking, it's just crazy enough to work. Hoping to share with the others the positive emotional spark from which Jaina's words sprang, Jason reached out to his sister, and found only the same battle numbness as before. Trying not to let his concern show, he asked, What are you thinking? Ambush, Jaina said. Anakin nodded and pointed to four trees. That will be our killing zone. We'll close the Yuzhan Vong off from behind, and fire from adjacent sides with high in the back covering low on the side. The battle meld remained tight enough, so that was all he needed to say. The firing teams rushed to their assigned places, the humans spreading out in the water along the canyon wall, while Lobaka took Joven Drark and the Barabels high into the trees and spread out across the channel. Tekli used the force to lift Alima and Welk into the trees well outside the ambush area. Jason placed himself at the corner of the angle, where he would be as close as possible to everyone in the battle meld. Lomi waded up to Anakin, who was standing in the water just five meters from Jason. Very impressive, young Solo, she said. Where would you like me? Out of the way. You have no weapon. Lomi gave him a sarcastic smile. A Jedi is never without a weapon, Anakin. Would you rather I use a blaster or the dark side? Anakin sighed, then used his comlink to have Lobaka pass down Alima's G9 power blaster and grenade belt. Anakin, you can't, Zek protested. He was so loud that Anakin could hear him even without using the comlink. Not your choice, bounty hunter, Anakin said. This might get ugly, and she has a right to defend herself. Tell him that Welk and I promise not to use the dark side. As long as we remain armed, Lomi said, sneering. That should calm him. Anakin relayed the message. I suppose you'll be bringing them into the battle melt next, Zek said sarcastically. A warning click came over the comm channel, and the human Jedi lay down beneath the surface of the swamp, relying on their breath masks' backup oxygen canister for air. It was not long before they began to feel the tension of those watching the enemy's approach from the trees, though this sensation was all but overwhelmed by the qualms Zek and several others felt at seeing an armed, dark Jedi in their midst, though Jason was not entirely happy about matter himself. 
it seemed a better alternative than having her call on the dark side. He did his best to subordinate Zek's resentment and keep everyone's emotions focused on the task at hand. But the Discord was hurting their combat effectiveness. He could feel it. Finally, the faint sloshing of waiting Yuzhan Vong came to his ears underwater, and an eruption of glee from the Barabels let everyone know it was time to attack. Jason rose quietly out of the swamp and saw a mass of enemy warriors moving through the trees with far too much confidence, convinced, apparently, that even Jedi would not attack at an odds disadvantage in excess of five to one. Obviously, they had not done their research on the Soto family. Jason armed the fragmentation grenade in his hand and threw it into the midst of the still oblivious Yuzhan Vong, then raised his T-21 repeating blaster and opened fire. The Yuzhan Vong reacted like the well-trained warriors they were. Even with the swamp exploding into shrapnel and blaster bolts all around them, they did not panic or fall into helpless confusion. Their officers immediately began to shout orders and were promptly picked off by Joven Drark's deadly sharpshooter blaster rifle, the Long Blaster. Jason caught a glimpse of Nomanor yelling into a shoulder villip near the back of the company and swung his G-9 power blaster in the executor's direction, but could not bring himself to fire, at least not instantly. It was one thing to attack an impersonal foe in the necessity of battle, quite another to murder a much-despised enemy. Jason had learned on Duro, when he had been forced to act to prevent Savong La from killing his mother, that a Jedi was free. No, obligated, to protect others from evil. But targeting a specific person out of anger still felt like murder, and using a battle as an excuse to commit such a sinister act still seemed like the way to the dark side. Before he could work the matter out, Vergeer stepped out from behind a tree, inadvertently placing herself between Jason and his target. Jason raised his weapon, training his aim on Nomanor's head. Virgir glanced at him with her slanted eyes and briefly locked gazes, then grabbed the executor and pulled him to safety behind a tree. Jason squeezed his trigger and watched the bolt flash harmlessly across the swamp, then swung his weapon back toward the battle. With their officers dead and Von Dune crab armor shattering all around them, the Yuzhan Vong warriors were seeking cover underwater. Someone called Concussion over the comlink, and Jason stopped firing to pull a grenade from his equipment belt, then realized that he had no idea who had spoken. Clearly, the battle meld was suffering. Two-second delay, Anakin calmed. Arm! In the time it took Jason to thumb the arming switch, the Yuzhan Vong began to regroup, at least two dozen rising out of the water behind the cover of tree trunks or fallen logs. Throw! Jason tossed his grenade into the center of the killing zone with everyone else's, then raised his rapid blaster and began firing again. The swamp's surface bucked upward, and several Yuzhan Vong floated up bleeding from eyes and ears, staring vacantly at the sky. Steady streams of thud and razor bugs began to drone out from behind the trees where the survivors were hiding, and Jason heard several Jedi groan as they took hits in their armor-lined jumpsuits. Somewhere down the line, a lightsaber snapped to life, and Ganner waded forward, slapping bugs from the sky. Ganner, Anakin calmed. What are you doing? Can't let them pin us down, Ganner replied. Lomi started forward as well, her body weaving and pivoting as she dodged thud bugs, her power blaster filling the air with brilliant flashes as she shot incoming razor bugs out of the sky. If nothing else, her advance impressed the Yuzhan Vong who began to concentrate their fire on her. Wait! Jason calmed. He had no doubt that they could advance en masse and wipe out the patrol, but he did not think they could do it without taking losses. I can flush them. He sensed a query forming in Anakin's mind, then explained, The Voxen, I think I can use them. Think? Anakin asked. Can? Jason assured him. Anakin hesitated a moment, then said, Let's try it. Ganner and Lomi retreated to cover. And Jason reached out to the Voxen he had sensed earlier, 
calling on the force to soothe them out of their shock, to lull them into thinking there was nothing to fear ahead. The Voxen responded almost too well. The entire strike team experienced a hungry stirring in the force as the beasts reached out to locate them. Then Jason felt the creatures start down the canyon toward the ambush. The two sides began to trade fire more sporadically. The Yuzhan Vong content to sit in cover in the mistaken belief that help would arrive soon. The Jedi content to let them. Jason thought about calming Joven to tell him to keep an eye out for Nomanor and Vergeer, then decided against it. He was treading as close as he cared to the dark side. Less than a minute later, a Yuzhan Vong snarled in surprise, then gurgled horribly as a voxen dragged him underwater. Several other Yuzhan Vong cried out as the creatures brushed past, but only two let out screams, suggesting they had been attacked. The voxen, Jason realized, were more interested in the force-wielders down the way. Out of the water now, he calmed. As his fellow Jedi used the Force to boost themselves into the trees, Jason thumbed a fragmentation grenade active and tossed it into the swamp. While not as powerful as concussion grenade, it would generate enough of a shock wave to serve his purpose. He waited until the grenade exploded, then reached out to the Voxen, encouraging them to blame anything in the water for the attack. Several more Yuzhan Vong cried out. A few even stumbled from cover to be picked off by Joven and the Barabels, but more than a dozen remained in hiding and continued to fling thud bugs into the trees. Climbing into a tree himself, Jason dropped the battle meld it was not working that well anyway, and focused only on the Voxen. He threw another fragmentation grenade and urged the creatures to attack anything in the water. The Yuzhan Vong attacks dwindled as they turned to battle the attacking Voxen. A handful tried to scramble into the trees, as the Jedi had done, but without the force to boost them, they could not climb fast enough to escape their pursuers. Lobaka and the Barabels took advantage of the distraction to leap through the treetops and attack from above. Soon they were shooting at nothing but Voxen, and a few concussion grenades brought the last of the creatures to the surface. Jason dropped back into the swamp, feeling not exactly guilty about luring the creatures to their doom, but hardly noble either. Maybe Zek was right. Maybe Lomi's mere presence was enough to taint the entire strike team. Jason was still trying to work this out when Anakin waited over with Tahiri, both of them grinning ear to ear. Tahiri clasped Jason's arm and pulled herself up to kiss his cheek. That was astral. Well done. Anakin slapped Jason on the back, and there was more warmth in the gesture than had passed between the two brothers since Centerpoint Station. You saved a lot of Jedi today. Jason would have felt good about that, had the day been over. Chapter 31 Even with Han sprawled on the couch next to Leia, Ben gurgling in Mara's lap and the Wild Knights comparing notes with Rogue Squadron in the back of the room, the informal sitting chamber of the Solos Coruscant residence seemed all too empty. The five Solos had not been in this room together for more than a year, and Leia could not recall ever gathering here without the shadow of some faraway crisis hanging over someone's head. Most of the responsibility rested squarely on Leia's own shoulders. She had devoted her life to the New Republic, and, on its behalf, she had involved Han and Chewbacca and Lando, and everyone else she knew in one dangerous mission after another. Even her children had spent most of their lives dwelling apart, first because they needed protection from the Empire's kidnappers, and later because the New Republic needed them to become Jedi Knights. Now they were hundreds of light years behind enemy lines, fighting a foe as ruthless and cruel as Palpatine himself, facing dangers she could not even guess at, but that she felt constantly through the Force. After fighting a lifetime to make the galaxy a safer place, she wondered if anyone would blame her for questioning her choices. Given the danger her children were facing on the galaxy's behalf now, she wondered if anyone would dare. Leia felt Han reaching out to her even before he touched her shoulder. You're sure you don't want to be there with Luke? Han glanced around the packed room conspiratorially. 
There's a hover car hanging around the back platform, and I know your brother isn't all that comfortable, addressing the Senate himself. Send the hover car away, Han. Leia put just enough sharpness in her voice to let him know she was serious. I'm through with the Senate. Han rolled his eyes. Where have I heard that before? It's true, Han. Leia allowed her apprehension for their children to show. I'm thinking of other things now. Han studied her for a moment, then nodded. Okay. He glanced across the room to Lando and Wedge and gave a slight shake of his head, then pulled Leia tight to his side. All this waiting. It's bad enough without feeling everything through the Force. Leia squeezed his leg. We're not accustomed to being the ones left behind. Izal Waz wandered into the room and stopped behind the couches. Hey, look at this! He used a voice command to change the holovid from the Senate feed to a news channel. In the foreground, he was shown debarking the Wild Knight's blast boat, while a breathless Arcona newswoman explained that a member of their own species had participated in the daring Jedi rescue of the Talfalian hostages. I'm a hero! Almost since their departure from the system, the hollow net had been filled with news of the Yuzhan Vong's total defeat at Talfalio. A Kuwati network had even managed to obtain a hologram from a Star Destroyer holocam, showing an enemy corvette exploding for no visible reason in front of a Jedi X-Wing. The newscaster had identified the wing markings incorrectly as those of Kip's dozen. Fortunately, the shadow bomb responsible could not be detected even with enhancement, but Luke had prevailed on the New Republic High Command to censor all images of Jedi combat techniques, lest another, better recording, betray the secret. Saba grabbed Ezol by the arm and pulled him away, saying, Yes, we are all famous now, so don't embarrass us. Mara stood her son up on her knees and cooed in a high, chirrupy and very unmara like voice. Someone found the salt, didn't he? Then chortled in response, his delight rippling through the force just the way Anakin's used to when Leia visited him in hiding on Anoth, and so powerfully it moved her to tears. She turned away and tried to hide her face by leaning against Han's shoulder, but Mara was not one to miss such an obvious sign. She reached over and placed a hand on Leia's forearm. Leia, it's because of you we're here at all, she said. Remember that. I know Anakin and the twins will. Thank you. Leia wiped her eyes and smiled, taking strength from her sister-in-law's plain words. That helps. A lot. Yeah, me too. Han studied Mara, his expression somewhere between gratitude and envy. Thanks. Lando called out that the session was starting. Someone switched the holovid back to the Senate feed, where Luke, dressed simply in a plain Jedi robe, was riding an escalator to the speaking rostrum on the chamber floor. Luke stepped off the escalator beside the speaker's rostrum, wishing he felt more certain that today he would heal the rift between the Jedi and the New Republic. The Senate chamber was awash in good feelings toward him and the Jedi, but there was also anger for taking matters into their own hands apprehension about Yuzhan Vong retaliation, and something more sinister, something dark and dangerous that he sensed would soon reveal itself to him. He lowered the cowl of his robe and, facing the long consul on the high councillor's dais, bowed to the advisory council. Chief Thalia, councillors, you asked to speak with me? Somewhere high in the galleries, a Wookiee roared in ovation, and the chamber erupted in cheers and applause. Luke stood calmly, neither acknowledging the outpouring nor discouraging it, as he studied the members of the advisory council. Most kept their faces carefully neutral, though Fior Rodan of Kaminor sneered in disapproval, no doubt blaming the Jedi for not saving his own planet, and Borsk Felia bared his fangs in a smile that felt surprisingly sincere. Allowing the applause to continue, the chief of state left his console and descended to stand before Luke. 
He raised a furry palm and brought the chamber to order with impressive speed, then surprised Luke by clasping his hand warmly. Princess Leia was unable to attend? Felia asked. The invitation was to you both. Leia is occupied elsewhere, Luke said. Felia nodded sagely. Anakin and the twins, of course. He lowered his brow in a well-rehearsed expression of concern, then turned slightly toward the hovering sound droid. Let me assure you, the New Republic is doing everything possible to determine what has become of them, and to find the person responsible. That much was certainly true. The Wraiths had been snooping along the war zone for several days now, coming so close to identifying the true delivery ship that Luke had been forced to ask Wedge to rein them in. Reportedly, Garrick Face Loren was furious. I'm sure the families of all the missing Jedi appreciate your desire to help, Luke said. But we must not forget that the Yuzhan Vong threaten more than Jedi. The Jedi certainly have not forgotten. Felia pumped Luke's hand enthusiastically. On behalf of the New Republic, let me congratulate you on the Jedi victory at Talfalio, and thank you for the lives of our citizens. We were glad to be of service, Luke said. The Jedi have consolidated their forces and hope to be of more service to the New Republic in the future. But it is important to note we did not do this alone. We are aware of the support provided to you by the Moon Mothma and Elegos Akla, Vicky Shesh said, speaking from her seat on the dais. Though it was hardly necessary, she leaned closer to the sound pickup in her console and looked down at Luke. Thanks to the Holonet coverage, so is the whole galaxy, including no doubt the Yuzhan Vong. Luke went cold between the shoulders and he knew he had found the dangerous presence he had been sensing. Or rather, it had found him. A New Republic task force happened to be in the area, yes, he answered. It's my understanding they suffered no casualties. The galaxy is a vast place, Master Skywalker, Shesh said coolly. Perhaps you can explain how they happened to be in the area. Felia raised a hand to stop Luke from answering, then whirled on Shesh, his lips drawn up to show the tips of his fangs. We have all read the reports, Counselor. The vessels were on a shakedown cruise. I failed to see the point of your request. Shesh continued to glare at Luke. That is precisely the point of my request, Chief Felia. Wedge Antilles and Garmbel Iblis are two of our best generals. Too experienced to take a shakedown cruise into Yuzhan Vong territory. The last I checked, Senator, the Corellian sector was still in the New Republic, Felia said, drawing a chorus of pointed laughter. As for the General's experience, I am sure we both agree that they know better than you or I how to shake down a Star Destroyer. Undoubtedly, when they are in possession of their wits, Shesh retorted. The chamber filled with murmurs of outrage and speculation, and Luke saw where Shesh was taking her line of questioning. If you are suggesting that the generals were in any way influenced, that is exactly what I am suggesting, Master Skywalker. Leaving her own seat, Shesh stepped over to Felia's console, using his master controls to override the rostrum's microphone with her own. The Jedi are famous throughout the galaxy for their mind tricks but you have gone too far when you subvert the legitimate orders of a New Republic task force. Hear, hear, Fior Rodan said, rising. The New Republic cannot tolerate this Jedi abuse. A surprising number of senators, most from inner rim worlds, that still hoped to placate the Yuzhan Vong, rose on cue. The Wookiees and Bothans roared in opposition, and Luke turned slowly calling upon his Jedi control to keep a calm face. Leia had warned him to be surprised by nothing that happened in the New Republic Senate. Still, he failed to see how intelligent beings could be persuaded that the utter destruction of an enemy fleet and the rescue of a planet full of hostages was a bad thing. But it was not about the fleet, 
or the hostages, of course. It was about alliances and power, about who had it and who was losing it, who might have it tomorrow and who would share it. No wonder Leia had refused to step foot in the chamber again. No wonder the New Republic was losing the war. Thalia left to reclaim control of his console and found himself delayed when Fior Rodan blocked his way on the flimsy pretext of discussing some important rule of procedure, and Shesh continued to control the public address system. Master Skywalker, perhaps you fail to realize the damage your selfish antics have caused the New Republic, she said, in using new weapons aboard the Mon Mothma and Alagos Akla, prematurely. You have alerted the Yuzhan Vong to the existence of two very powerful technologies we are in the process of deploying, two technologies that we had hoped might turn the tide of the war. This drew a fresh outburst from Shesha's supporters, and the counter-protest began to sound half-hearted. Still finding his way blocked by Fior Rodan, Thalia raised a hand to summon a security droid. Shesh rushed to Presser Point home. Master Skywalker, I am afraid this council must demand that the Jedi disarm and cease their irresponsible activities. No. Luke spoke softly but firmly, using the Force to project the word into every niche in the vast chamber. The Jedi will not disarm. As he had hoped, the shock of hearing his calm voice quieted the chamber, and he continued... We have in no way influenced any New Republic officer to disobey orders. You expect us to believe you. Shesh cast a meaningful eye over the suddenly tranquil gallery. When you are so obviously using your mind tricks on us now? Luke allowed himself a wry smile. No trick, he said. Only one calm voice. This drew a chuckle from many in the gallery, and, with the arrival of the security droid, Fior Rodan feigned surprise and stepped aside. All the same, I insist, Shesh said quickly, if the Jedi will not disarm, the Senate must prohibit the New Republic military from having any contact with them whatsoever. The chamber broke into an uproar, but Shesh elevated the speaker volume and spoke over the tumult. There will be no more spare X-wings rotated into your hangars, Master Skywalker, nor will there be any more intelligence-sharing sessions. If you continue to abuse us— You are exceeding your authority, Senator Shash, Thalia interrupted. The Bothan shouldered her aside and reclaimed control of his consul. Return to your seat, or I will have you removed from the chamber. Shesh gave him an acid smile and obeyed but the damage had already been done. She had turned the Jedi's moment of triumph into yet another Senate-dividing issue, and Luke had to wonder why. As the supervising senator of Selkor, the Kuwati had certainly proven herself corrupt, and Leia's accusations of misconduct had done nothing to endear the Jedi to her, but this seemed to go beyond even that level of depravity. This was more than opportunistic vengeance. This was treachery with a plan. Had Luke not been able to feel the woman's darkness through the Force, he would have stepped onto the dais and started trying to remove an Uglith masker. As it was, he vowed to watch this woman until he knew the source of the darkness and danger in her. Thalia repeatedly called for order, then finally gave up, and sank into his chair to wait for the tumult to yell itself out. Luke merely crossed his wrists and did likewise, knowing— he would only play into Shesh's hands by using another Jedi technique to calm the gathering. He saw no real hope of accomplishing what he had come to do, but he could not leave without appearing arrogant, and arrogance would only be another weapon for Vicky Shesh to use against the Jedi. The tumult finally began to subside, but failure was staring so raptly at his vid console that he failed to notice. Fearing the Yuzhan Vong were hurling some new disaster at the New Republic, and knowing them well enough to realize they would pick just such a moment. Luke reached out to get some sense of what was consuming the Bothan's attention. Like any seasoned politician, Thalia held his emotions tightly, but what Luke sensed there seemed more surprise than dismay or panic. 
Always quick to seize the initiative, Vicky Shesh rose. I am very concerned about the Jedi problem. So concerned, in fact, that I propose a resolution. When failure remained transfixed by his vidconsole, Luke sent out a gentle force nudge. The Bothan jerked and turned toward Shesh, but did not interrupt. She continued, May it be resolved that the Jedi are henceforth named dangerous persons to the war effort. That was as far as she made it before the chamber erupted again. She tried to continue over the din, then turned to failure, eyes flashing as though he had killed her sound feed. Chief Failure, I have every right to make my motion. Failure smiled. By all means, but perhaps you would allow me to make a statement first. He flipped something on his console, and a row of holograms appeared on the chamber floor near the speaker's rostrum. Luke had to step away before he could identify the figures as General Wedge Antilles, General Garm Beliblis, Admiral Triast Crefe, General Carlos Dryekin, and several other senior commanders. The chamber gradually quieted. A surprising number of high officers have contacted me in the past few minutes, Failure said. After hearing what they have to say, I am directing, not authorizing, but directing, the New Republic military to cooperate and coordinate with the Jedi. The chamber grew even quieter, save for Shesh, who began to stammer, You can't do that. I can, and I have. Thelia locked his console out, then stepped down to Shesh's. If you feel I am exceeding my authority, you may, of course, call for a vote of no confidence at any time. Do you wish to do so now, Senator Shesh? Shesh looked into the stunned gallery, trying to gauge whether the Bothan's autocratic mandate might have cost him enough support to lose such a vote. When even her own supporters could not tear their eyes from the holograms of the angry-looking commanders, she saw that she was the one who had overplayed her hand. She lowered her gaze and shook her head. No, and I withdraw my resolution. Good. We'll talk about your new committee assignments after we finish here. Thalia left the High Counselor's dais and returned to Luke. Now, where were we? First, I'd like to ask something. Luke put his hand over the rostrum's microphone, then used the force to send the sound droid whisking high into the galleries. What did the general say to you? Nothing, actually. The communication was from Nurmok. The Yuzhan Vong are moving on Borlias. Failure turned toward the commanders, his fangs bared in what Luke felt certain the Bothan intended to resemble a smile. These are file hollows. In the solo apartment, the cheers were still ringing off the sitting room walls and Gavin Darklighter was already planning joint missions with Saba Sebatine and Kip Duran. New Republic pilots were pouring bubble zap all around, and putting C-3PO into a dither by spilling far too much on the Santa buffed floor. Lando and Tendra were on their comlinks lauding the virtues of YVH war droids to suddenly receptive New Republic procurement officers. If anyone noticed that Wedge Antilles, one of the senior command officers supposedly in contact with Borsk Felia, was actually sitting on the couch with Han and Leia, they did not think the matter worth mentioning. Feeling far less gleeful than her guests, Leia turned to Han. Am I the only one who noticed? Han gave her a crooked smile. I noticed. He glanced past her to Wedge who was continuing to stare at his image on the holovid, his expression somewhere between anger and approval. Borsk bluffed. In politics, it's called misconduct, Leia said. He had no authority to issue that directive alone. Maybe not, but he did the right thing. I seem to recall your telling him to do that. He didn't do it because he likes Jedi, Leia retorted. Borsk wouldn't take the risk. He could have lost his post. He still can, if Vicky finds out what he did and stirs up enough outrage. It isn't going to happen, Wedge said, finally stirring himself out of his shock. Borsk is the one who sent us to help you at Talfalio. 
None of the commanders you saw on the chamber floor is going to contradict him, at least not to Vicky Shash. A half-dozen comlinks chimed simultaneously, among them wedges. He shut off the audible alarm, then he and several other New Republic officers stood and started for a quiet room. "'You'll have to excuse us,' he said. "'It sounds like General Bedemir has lost his pet Minox again.' Ananleia laughed dutifully. When he was gone, they looked at each other and shrugged. "'I guess we'll find out soon enough,' Han said. Leia's thoughts had already returned to failure. First, he wins the commanders over by sending a task force to Tafalio. Then he gives the credit to us. She looked back to the holovid where Ophelia was making a great show of presenting Luke with an encryption card that would allow him to navigate the planetary mine shell. He's solidifying his power base, Han. He needs the Jedi supporters on his side. And the Jedi need him, Han said. We're in this together. I know. Leia was mortified to find her own purposes aligned with those of Borsk Felia. That may frighten me more than the Yuzhan Vong. Chapter 32 Fixing his mind on the driving rhythm of Vekta's chanting voice, Savong La thought of Yun Yuzhan's sacrifices, of the eyes he had surrendered to light the stars and the tentacles he had given to make the galaxies. As the gods had done in their time, now the Yuzhan Vong must do in theirs. Today's victory would establish the left pincer of his final attack, so it was his left hand that he laid on the cutting block. He understood the place of faith as his predecessors had not. That was why he would succeed where they had died or floundered. That was why Sadong La had requested the return of the priest Harar, his own spiritual guide and the only person he would trust to advise him on the offerings necessary to ensure victory to the Yuzhan Vong. He would have liked to have Harar lead the ritual himself, but it would not do to insult Vekta. Today, Harar would stand at his side as a witness and a friend, not a priest. As Vekta blessed the rodank claw the shapers would attach in place of his sacrificed hand, Sabong La gazed out at the steamy blue-green disk of Borlias, now swaddled in a flashing meshwork of energy bolts and plasma streaks. By all accounts, a world completely lacking in resources useful to the enemy, it was nevertheless an ideal staging area for a strike against Coruscant itself, and therefore fortified both heavily and cleverly. The infidels had arranged their orbital defenses in three layers, with the heavy platforms on the exterior, the smaller fast targeting platforms on the interior, and a dense shell of space mines between. A plasma ball the size of a small moon finally overloaded the shields of a heavy platform and reduced the unliving abomination to a melting mass of metal. But the island ship that had made the attack paid dearly for success. A cone of meters thick turbo laser bolts converged on the vessel, overwhelming its singularity projectors and blasting four huge breaches into the hull. The ship began to bear away, the life inside gushing into open space. A swarm of infidel missiles streaking out from the heavy platforms to complete the kill. Seif, his communications attendant, stepped into his view bearing the already averted villip of Mal La, a shrewd officer from the Warmaster's own domain, and the supreme commander charged with securing today's victory. The Savang La could see the alarm in his subordinate's face. He waited in humbleness until Vekta finished her blessing, then gestured at the villip. Is it permitted? Vekta nodded. The gods are never offended by one who answers to his duty. The priestess immediately began to make the obeisances that would be required to Yun Yu Zhang and the other gods before dedicating the War Master's sacrifice to the slayer, and Savong La turned to the villip. Your commanders grow too bold, he said. They are eager to win your praise, the villip replied. The image was that of a square-jawed warrior with so many battle swirls that he had been forced to start laying red tattoos over blue. 
I have warned them that they will not do so by risking their vessels here. But you favor bolder tactics yourself, Savong surmised. I understand the need to conserve ships, War Master. Coruscant is well defended. Savong Ma was surprised. After the loss of the great ship, he had expected the Supreme Commander to argue for an insertion assault to lay down Dovan Basil gravity traps in the inner ring of defense platforms. Costly as the tactic was, it would quickly clear their way to the planet by pulling the minefield down onto the inner ring of orbital platforms. Provided enough of the assault force survived to actually execute the plan, it would also telegraph the tactic he intended to use to clear the far more formidable defenses around Coruscant. You are to be commended on your patience, Mala. The Warmaster looked out at the battle, where Borlias's dark moon was just swinging around the horizon, tiny flecks of crimson fire erupting in a jagged line down its murky face. How are matters on the moon? The infidels are putting up a stiff resistance, but they cannot hold much longer, Mola assured him. The Dovan Basil will be on the surface within the hour. They had sent three assault divisions to install a giant Dovan Basil on Borlias's dark moon. Instead of crashing the satellite into its planet as the Praetorite Vong had done on Cernpedal, however, the Dovan Basil would be used to sweep the planetary defenses out of position. Given the moon's thirty-two-hour orbit, the stratagem would take more than a day to execute fully, but it would also conserve ships and avoid alerting the infidels to his plan for Coruscant. Lekta took Savong La's kufi from its sheath and began to cut a ritual offering from the thigh of the shaper who would attach the rodank claw to his wrist. Realizing he had only a few moments before he would be fully consumed by the ceremony, the war master returned his attention to Mal La's villip. You have matters well in hand, my servant. Savong La could not help being secretly disappointed. As the war master, it was his privilege to decide what was to be done and how, but once the battle started, the actual doing fell to his subordinates. But I doubt that is what you wished to report. I would never disturb you only to report that I am performing as you expect, great war master, Mala said. The Yamask informs me that her little ones are feeling gravity pulses from the out-system side of the planet. In his astonishment, Savong La forgot himself and nearly removed his hand from the cutting block. The Yamask was Mal La's war coordinator, with whom the Supreme Commander shared thoughts, and her little ones were the Dovan Basils linked to the sensor systems of each vessel. Gravity pulses my servant. The modulation is clumsy and erratic, War Master, but it is definitely a code of some sort. Certain elements even bear a resemblance to our own. Mass mapping identifies the source as an armored space yacht, similar to the Jade Shadow, a vessel present at the Battle of Duro and later confirmed to be Jedi property. Jedi. According to Savong La's spy, the Jedi were still on Coruscant, refueling and rearming their fleet. His readers had assured him they would not reach Borlias until nearly a day after the projected end of the battle. When did it enter the system? That is unknown, Mala said, but it is unlikely the vessel was here when we arrived, based on what knowledge. Had the Jedi been here when we arrived, they would already have been in contact with Borlias and established a more secure mode of communication. They have several methods we cannot yet detect, so it would hardly be necessary to draw attention to their presence now by hailing the planet so openly. And you have surmised their purpose in taking such a risk? Savong La asked. The villip looked uncomfortable. Great War Master, my judgment in these matters is a blaze bug before the nova of your wisdom. But what if your spy on Coruscant is riding both ends of the Rajat? Savong La fell quiet, considering the likelihood of this. It was possible that he had underestimated this Vicky Shesh, that she was playing him for the fool or even that the New Republic deception sect knew of her contact with him and was feeding her false information as a means of passing it along. Nor could he place any faith in the holonet vidcasts the readers had used to confirm her story. The enemy deception sect 
could have planted those as easily as his own agents could infiltrate a planetary shielding crew. As Sabong La puzzled his way through the significance of the Supreme Commander's report, Vekta cut a strip of flesh from her own thigh, and letting her black blood run free, twined it with the one she had taken from the Shaper. She laid the result on a ceremonial Gatog shall platter, and blessed it in the name of Yun Yamka, then held it out to the Warmaster. One moment. Sabong La lifted his hand from the cutting block. Hara's eyes bulged in disbelief. You ask the gods to wait? They will understand. Sabong La turned back to Mala and asked, This is the first pulse message we have intercepted from the enemy, is it not? Mala nodded. To my knowledge, yes. Then why should we believe it is Borlias they are trying to contact? He switched his gaze to Seif, find out what happened to the Yamask at Talfalio, and issue orders to all Supreme Commanders that their war coordinators must be destroyed if threatened with capture. Seif nodded, her eyes now bulging as far as Harar's. It will be done. Mala said, I will assign a task group to capture the Jedi vessel. It would be better to ignore the vessel than to inform the Jedi of our success, Harar suggested. He motioned to the cutting block. If you please, War Master, the gods are waiting. Only a moment longer. Savang La relayed Harar's suggestion to the Supreme Commander in the form of an order, then added, And I no longer wish to let the moon do our work for us. Order an insertion assault to lay the gravity traps. But what of course, Aunt? Mala's expression grew as surprised as Harar's and Seif's. If you are right about the Yamisks, there is no need to betray ourselves now. Perhaps not. But sometimes the blaze bug is right, and the Nova is wrong. Savong returned his hand to the cutting block, then glanced out at the defensive shell protecting Borlias, and slid forward until his elbow lay beneath the Shaper's saw. Our need will be great today. Give him the arm. Chapter 33 Jaina crested the latest in a long series of chalk dunes, and found an imperial walker looming over the next one, its white cockpit and armored passenger hump silhouetted against the darkness deeper in the passage. She hissed a warning to those behind her, then dropped into a defensive crouch and snapped her lightsaber from her harness. An obsolete all-terrain armored transport— was the last thing she expected to see inside a Yuzhan Vong world ship, but a hundred rogue squadron actions had taught her never to be surprised by anything. When a glow stick came to life in the Atat's cockpit viewport, she yielded to her battle-honed instincts and hurled herself down the slope in a series of evasive zigzag somersaults. As Jaina rolled, she felt herself sinking into that odd state of emotional numbness that seemed to accompany any fight these days. Other pilots sometimes spoke of feeling detached or outside themselves in combat, usually about two missions before they made some stupid mistake and let a scarhead send them Nova. But this was closer to resignation, to a weary acceptance of the horror and heartache that was battle. She would have liked to attribute such feelings to her trust in the Force, but she knew better. Her reaction was emotional armor, a way to avoid the anguish that came with watching a friend or wingmate die horribly, and to deny the fear that her turn was coming. Jaina reached the bottom in a billowing cloud of chalk dust and rolled to a stop. She sprang into a low battle crouch and brought her lightsaber around in a middle guard, then heard a familiar hissing sound. Sticks, you should grow a tail, Tsar Sabatine said. Maybe you would not be so clumsy. This drew a series of chortles from Krasov and Bella. Very funny, Gina retorted. Even without the battle meld, which Jason was leaving down in an attempt to dampen the growing discord in the group, she was cognizant of the rest of the strike team's silent amusement. You could have said something. 
and I could pluck the scales from over my heart, Bella rasped, but I do not. There was more sissing. Jaina stepped out of the chalk cloud to find the bear bells waiting with Anakin and the other team members. Their vac suits, now folded into their self-storing protection packs, and clipped to the back of their equipment harnesses. Caked hood to heels in dust and looking more like Jedi ghosts than Jedi knights. They were sitting against the passage wall, keeping a sharp watch for the coral skippers that always seemed to come around, spraying some enervating breath agent whenever they stopped. Two pairs of footprints, one set huge and obviously Wookiee, led over the next dune toward the Atat. Jaina stretched out through force and felt Lobaka inside the walker with Joven Drark. Where did that thing come from? The trainers are very thorough, Lomi explained. They keep an entire city of slaves to operate captured equipment so they can habituate their voxen to lifeless abhorrences. There is nothing they will not do to rid the galaxy of Jedi. There is even a starliner berthed in a grotto hangar, Welk offered. Notions of crashing a million-ton spacecraft into the cloning facility began to fill Jaina's mind. Is it? The energy converters have been removed, Lumi said. Even the walkers and land speeders run on low-capacity battery banks instead of fuel slugs. They cannot range much farther from the slave city than this. Of course, Jaina sighed. Given a few resources and a little time, she and Lobaka might well have found a way to restore the machinery. But with the infiltration already thirty hours old, the last thing the strike team could do was give the Yuzhan Vong more time to react. A pale green tint began to come over the chalky passage, and Jaina looked up to see Mirker, pushing its emerald disk across a jagged patch of window membrane that had been used to mend a twenty-meter breach in the outer shell of the world ship. She suddenly felt rejuvenated, a little less jittery and worried. There was something about the arrival of a bright body in the sky that always made her feel as though she had just risen from a long night in a warm bunk. Joven Drak's Rodian voice buzzed over the comlink. The force has favored us today. The batteries still have a charge, but the power feeds have been isolated by mineral secretions. A shiver of danger sense raced down Jaina's spine. Secretions? she calmed. It appears to be an insect nest, Joven reported. Lobaka is cleaning it off now. Jason's voice came over the comm channel. What kind of insects? Though her twin brother was always interested in new creatures, Jaina sensed through their bond that he was asking out of more than curiosity. If they look like worms with legs... It's no shockapede hive, Joven calmed. These are little flit gnats, completely harmless. Nothing the Yuzhan Vong create is harmless, Alima Rar said to Anakin. This is a trap. Everything's a trap with you, Tahiri objected. As she spoke, the walker's cockpit illumination activated, creating a band of pale light above the next dune. Why can't the Force just be with us for once? We could all use the ride. Anakin wisely looked to Lomi. What do you know about those things? That they are an unnecessary risk. She pointed down the way to where the passage ended in the sheer face of Yorick Coral. We have almost reached our destination. The main cloning lab is only a kilometer beyond that wall. About time, Zek said, joining the rest of the group. I was beginning to think you were stalling. Lomi smiled sourly. You will understand if I prefer alive over fast, Zack. Our fates will be the same in this. She's kept us out of trouble so far, Anakin added, scowling at Zack's provocative tone. In contrast to nearly everyone else on the strike team, Anakin seemed completely untroubled by the time it had taken to negotiate the training course. Let's make the safe play and avoid the walker. We'll be done and on our way home in two hours anyway. Four at the most. Careful, Anakin, Jaina said. You're beginning to sound like Dad. Despite the jovial smile she flashed, Jaina was distressed by her younger brother's overconfidence. Having lost only Yulaha 
and the two droids, despite all their setbacks, Anakin seemed to think that the strike team was untouchable, that even an entire world ship full of Yuzhan Vong could not stop a single platoon of well-trained Jedi. That might even be true, but Jaina had learned in Rogue Squadron that being best guaranteed nothing, that plans went awry for everyone, and always at the worst possible moment. Anakin nodded to the Barabels, who never seemed to tire of walking point, and the strike team started up the dune in a billowing dust cloud. Jaina stayed at her brother's side, debating the wisdom of pointing out how much trouble they were in. Before leaving Eclipse, Yulaha and the tacticians had estimated that the mission's likelihood of success would drop two percent with every hour of duration, which meant that the strike team's chances had to be approaching zero by now. And to that the fact that the Yuzhan Vong had anticipated their assault far enough in advance to send an ambush and sent Numanor to recapture them, and the odds had clearly fallen to minuscule. Even the wraiths would have given up at this point and called for extraction, but that was not an option for the strike team. They had known from the outset that any flotilla sent to support the operation would be destroyed either crossing the war zone or once it was detected near Mirker. Seeing this as his chance to save the galaxy, Anakin had insisted on coming anyway, arguing that if the group needed to be rescued, the Jedi were already doomed, and with them, the New Republic itself. As much as it frightened her, Jaina thought he was probably right. As they neared the top of the dune, Anakin asked, Jaina? She looked over and was struck by how tall her brother had grown by how handsome he had become, even with several days of beard growing through the chalk on his face. Yeah? What are you doing out of line? He glanced over his shoulder and then spoke so quietly he had to use the force to carry his words to her ears. Is there something you want to say? Jaina smiled. There is. She reached over and squeezed his forearm. You're doing a good job, Anakin. If we're going to get this done, it's because of your confidence and determination. Thanks, Jaina. Anakin probably meant his lopsided grin to be cocky, but to his sister it seemed more surprised, perhaps even relieved. I know. Sure you do. Jaina laughed. She punched him in the shoulder hard enough to make him stumble, then added, Just remember to keep your guard up. They crested the dune and found themselves looking into the Atat's transperisteel viewport. Jaina thought at first that the interior lighting had been dimmed, but then she noticed Lobaka's jumpsuit-covered rump protruding up behind the instrument console and realized the Merc had less to do with illumination than swarming flit gnats. So thick were the insects that the main access tunnel was not even visible, only a slight darkening where it led out of the cockpit back into the passenger compartment. Anakin was instantly on his comlink. Streak, what are you doing in there? I said... Bobaka growled a terse reply, his shaggy hand reaching up to slap a filter housing on the console. Master Lobaka reports that he is simply trying to retrieve some needed equipment. MTD translated, for those who did not understand, Shri Wook. And please forgive his brusqueness. The fit nets are starting to bite. Bite? Jaina echoed. She eyed the distance up to the cockpit and began to gather the force in preparation for a long jump. What about you, Joven? When no answer came, Anakin calmed. Joven? Lobaka's furry head appeared from behind the instrument console and turned toward the rear of the cockpit. He barked a query through the access tunnel, then rose to his feet, a second filter housing dangling from his hand. Jedi Drak fails to answer, MTD reported. Master Lobaka can see him. Dangling from a belly hatch, Tisar interrupted. Kossoff will bring him down. Lobaka grunted an acknowledgment and, scratching furiously beneath the collar of his jumpsuit, turned back to the instrument console. Lobaka? Jaina called. What are you doing? Get out of there. The Wookiee growled a garbled explanation about needing face masks, then dropped heavily to his knees and returned to his work. 
A long arm rose into view and clumsily piled a handful of hoses with the filter housings, then slipped down behind the console and did not reappear. Oh, my, MTD reported. Master Labaka seems to be suffering a processor crash. Using the force to lift her the extra five meters in height, Jaina somersaulted off the chalk dune and landed lightly atop the cockpit roof, then nearly plummeted backward when Anakin and Zek landed beside her. Anakin thumbed his lightsaber active and plunged it into the seam of the cockpit escape hatch. Jaina ignited her own blade and began to work in the opposite direction, while Zek dropped to his belly and dangled over the front to peer in through the viewport. "'I can't believe it,' he said. "'He's still trying to get the face masks.' "'Perhaps he is getting tired of carrying unconscious Jedi,' Lomi said, alighting next to the others. She pointed to two places on opposite sides of the hatch. "'Cut there and there.' Jaina and Anakin did as he instructed, their lightsabers whining sharply as they burned through the hatch's locking bolt and reinforced hinges. As they continued to work, Ganner's voice came over the comlink. Joven's alive, but dizzy and sick. Techly thinks she can save him. Save him? Anakin gasped. You should see, Anakin, Tahiri calmed. I didn't know Rodian swelled up like that. Anakin paled and said nothing, focusing all his effort on getting to Lobaka. Orders, Ganna requested. We must retreat and try another way, Lomi suggested. Anakin shook his head firmly. Never. A muffled thud sounded from inside the cockpit. Then Zek said, Hut slime, he's out. Jaina's lightsaber burned through the hatch bolt with a final acrid sizzle. She snapped the blade off and hung the handle on her equipment harness. Anakin, maybe you should listen to her, she said nervously. If this is a trap, they'll be coming for us. So what if they are? Anakin's knuckles whitened as he continued to cut. We're Jedi, aren't we? The value of sacrifices has a limit even to Yuzhan Vong, Lomi warned. They will kill us before allowing us to reach the cloning lab. We must go around. I thought that was why we came this way, Zek said over his shoulder. They anticipated us, Lomi said simply. But there are other ways. And when they anticipate those, Anakin demanded, cutting through the last centimeter of reinforced hinge. Then we try another way, and another, Jaina said. She knew their situation would only grow worse as time passed, but she also knew it would be fatal to let the odds pressure Anakin into a rash act. Sooner or later we may have to fight, but on our terms, not theirs. The soft hiss of a breaking seal sounded from the hatch, as it finally came free and settled deeper into its seating ring. Anakin deactivated his lightsaber and, still not responding to Jaina or Lomi, stepped away. Anakin, there's a dust cloud coming up the canyon toward us, and I don't think it's a New Republic land speeder, Ganner said. How about those orders? In a second, Anakin snapped. He let out a calming breath, then knelt beside the hatch and looked to Jaina. Ready? Ready. Even without the battle meld, perhaps even without the force, she was close enough to her younger brother to sense what he wanted from her. Watch yourselves. Jaina levitated the heavy escape hatch out of its seat and moved it aside. A few flitnats drifted out of the opening, their wings emitting a barely audible buzz as they circled Anakin and began to land on his face. Paying no attention, he peered into the cockpit and used the force to pull Lobaka up into the hatchway. Even beneath his thick fur, the flitnats were visible on his face, teeming over his eyelids and swarming inside his black nostrils. His cheeks and lips were swollen to twice their normal size and his breath came in strangled coughs. The Wookiee's huge shoulders proved too broad to fit through the hatchway, and Anakin had to lower him back into the cockpit. The instant the opening was clear, clouds of flitnats began to pour out, lighting on Anakin's face and drawing a hissed curse as they started to bite. He leaned into the at, -at and grabbed Lobaka's arms, then pulled them through the hatchway first. 
Along with Zack, Gina dropped to her brother's side and grabbed an arm so Anakin could concentrate on squeezing the unconscious Wookiee through the narrow space. Her hands and face exploded in stinging pain as the flit gnats swarmed. Lomi stepped behind the others and made a feeble attempt to call up a force wind, which failed to blow the insects away. As Labaka's torso came through the hatchway, masses of blood-bloated flit gnats began to drop from his sleeves. The skin on his hands had been chewed bald, and it was already erupting into purple lumps the size of Jaina's fingertips. Anakin's only reply was to pull Labaka the rest of the way through. A billowing cloud of flit gnats poured out behind the Wookiee, prompting Jaina to turn for the hatch. The flit gnat bites were already making her sick and itching so madly she had to take a second to concentrate before she could levitate the heavy piece of steel. When she turned back around, it was to find Lomi summoning an armful of filter housings and breath masks through the hatchway. Mustn't forget these. Lomi gathered the equipment into her arms and started toward the front of the cockpit where Anakin was already lowering Lobaka to the doom below. The Wookiee did risk his life for them. Jaina slipped the hatch into place, then felt Zek's hand on her arm. She was surprised to find herself stumbling as he pulled her off the front of the cockpit after the others. Though the drop was brief, it was long enough to draw a distracting rise from her queasy stomach. They landed hard between Anakin and Lomi where Jaina fell to her knees and remained, at once choking on chalk dust, itching madly, and trying to keep her gorge down. Across her back, Lomi asked, What do you think now, young Solo, still determined to fight? Anakin thought for a moment, then said, Blaster bolts. He pulled Jaina to her feet and sent her stumbling down the back side of the dune, then activated his comlink. Gana, let's go. Retreat. Chapter 34 Then cradled in one arm, Mara circled the shadow's hull, looking not for signs of abuse or carelessness, though she knew that was what Danny and Silgal believed, but for signs of micro-pits and gas-scouring. Such wear was an inevitable result of any journey through the mass-rich space— around Eclipse, and she took as much pride in her vessel's sleek appearance as Han did in the Falcon's character. She found only a handful of items that needed attention, a sign of what must have been an oppressively slow final approach. Mara stopped at the rear cargo lift, where Danny and Silgal were unloading the equipment they had taken to Borleos. You took good care of her. Thanks. Thank you for trusting us with her. Danny put something that looked like a giant teething ring with a black eyeball in the center onto the repulsor pallet. We tried to fit everything in a blast boat, but... It's fine, Danny, Mara said. She and everyone else had still been awaiting Luke's return from the Senate when Danny and Silgal contacted her to ask if they could take the Shadow to Borlias. I'm sure I cringed when I realized you were already underway, but it was in a good cause. I only wish we had been more successful, Silgal said. She placed a blast boat gravity generator on the pallet next to the teething ring thing. I was sure I understood the structure of the Amisk's gravitational resonator. Perhaps the freezing altered something. Mara felt a rush of joy from Ben, and did not need to turn to know that Luke was leading Corin, Leia, and most of Eclipse's leaders across the hangar toward them. Get ready, ladies, she warned quietly. They spent the whole trip from Coruscant arguing about how Borlias's defenses could be defeated so quickly. That is an easy question to answer, Silgal said. The Yuzhan Vaughn care less for their own lives than ours. They throw away ships. The blaring roar of an assault alarm drowned out the Moon Calamari's final words. Radiating fear and discomfort into the force, Ben added his own voice to the din, and the hangar erupted into action as ship crews rushed to prepare ships for launch. The alarm fell silent and was replaced by the watch officer's voice. Attention all crews, this is no drill. We have incoming Yorick coral vessels. Danny and Silgal looked at each other guiltily. Mara experienced a flash of anger at them for leading the Yuzhan Vong here and endangering her child, 
then realized that was not possible. She had inspected the shadow carefully enough to know there were no tracking barnacles attached to the hull, and it would have been impossible for even the Yuzhan Vong to track a ship through so many hyperspace jumps without a homing device of some sort. No way they followed you here, but that won't make any difference when the bolts start flashing. We'd better take our combat posts. Mara pushed her son into Silgal's arms. Then, as Danny ran off toward the Wild Knight's blast boat, kissed him on the head. Go to the emergency shelter with Silgal, Ben. Ben gurgled uncertainly, then fluttered his arms and legs as Mara rushed off toward her X-wing. Though hardly one to panic in a crisis, she deliberately kept her thoughts focused on the task at hand, and felt Luke doing the same. Uncertainty bred fear, and as strong as Ben was in the Force, she did not want him to sense any dark side emotions in his parents. By the time she reached her starfighter, the mechs were already lowering her astromech droid. She called him Dancer, for no particular reason, into his socket. She grabbed her flight suit off the side of the cockpit and pulled it on, listening intently as the watch officer updated the alarm over her comlink. Sentry stations report a light cruiser analog task force inbound, in pursuit of a Mark II class Imperial Star destroyer, possibly the errant venture. Corin Horn was instantly on the channel, demanding answers the watch officer could not provide. The destroyer was not transmitting a transponder signal, not at all unusual for Booster Tarek, nor had it hailed the base. Mara's bewilderment mirrored what she sensed in Luke. The errant venture was supposed to be hiding the Jedi Academy students in the New Republic rear base at Risi, not hazarding trips to Eclipse, and a light cruiser task force was hardly the type of fleet the Yuzhan Vong would send to assault the base of the hated Jedi. Something odd was happening here, something that felt faintly connected to the Shadow's presence at Borlias, and yet something that did not really follow from it. Mara stopped at the top of her cockpit ladder and glanced over at Luke, whom she sensed looking in her direction. She knew instantly what was troubling him. Corn Horn was still on the comlink, yelling at the duty officer to break base protocol and hail the destroyer. Mara nodded, and Luke activated his own comlink. Negative on hailing the destroyer watch. Negative? Corin's voice was close to a shriek. My kids are on that destroyer. I feel them. Then we can assume it is the venture, Mara said. She empathized with his feelings. Were Ben being chased by a Yuzhan Vong flotilla, she did not doubt that she would be just as concerned and a whole lot more dangerous. We can also assume Booster has a good reason for staying quiet. The Star Destroyer is taking heavy fire, Watch reported. It's possible that all sensor dishes have been destroyed. Stang, Mara thought. Very helpful watch. Corrin's X-Wing fired its repulsors and lifted off the hangar floor. Commander Horn, Luke barked. Where do you think you're going? Where do you think? This from Mirax. The steady click of heels striking Duracrete suggested she was in a corridor somewhere, walking fast. To chase those rocks off the venture's tail. Corrin's X-Wing started toward the containment field at the mouth of the hangar. A handful of starfighters followed him. Watch, request shield deactivation for combat departure. Too early, Mara calmed. She powered up her systems and had Dancer start running diagnostics to warm the circuits. We're not ready to form up, and we can take them by surprise if we wait. Easy to say when Ben is safe inside, and you're still worried about hiding Eclipse's location, Mirax countered. Not so easy when the venture might go up any minute, taking Valen and Gisela with it. Watch, acknowledge departure. Corin's voice had an alarming edge to it. Deactivate this shield. Corin, Mirax, you're not the only ones with children at risk, Han said. Given the risk that his children were facing at the moment, his words made even Mara feel a little guilty for thinking only of Ben's safety. Corin, they shamed into silence. And neither of you is thinking very clearly right now. If Booster was in trouble, you can bet he'd be rattling this rock with concussion missiles. Contacts have entered visual range. 
Watch reported. Identity confirmed as errant venture. They were coming fast. Mara activated her tactical display and saw the Star Destroyer streaking toward Eclipse's star, its forward turbolaser batteries blasting a clear path through the enormous asteroid disk that passed for a planetary system even at the edge of the deep core. There were eight light cruisers and twice that number of frigate and corvette analogs on his tail, and they were all traveling far too fast to intend decelerating anywhere near Eclipse. Corin, what's happening? Mirax calmed. Why aren't you launching? Han's right, Mirax. Booster has something up his sleeve. There was a moment's pause, then Corrin added, I apologize, Master Skywalker. Mara was not sure whether the relief she felt was her own or Luke's, or both. I'm sure you'd do the same for me, Corrin, Luke said. There was no hint of irritation in either his voice or his emotions. We'll launch after they pass. Can I count on you to keep a clear head? It might be better if Han took battle control, Corrin admitted. I seem to have, uh, seated myself in the wrong vessel. Han did not argue. Like Mara and Luke and most others old enough to have fought in the rebellion, he had engaged in enough heroics to last five lifetimes. Now he was content to go where he was needed and let the combat come to him. The venture has been hulled, Watch reported. Somehow Mirax managed to limit her outcry to a strangled gasp. Mara would have filled the channel with curses that would have made even rigored metal blush. Venting debris now. Mara looked to her tactical display and saw a cloud of flotsam drifting in Eclipse's general direction as the venture flashed past. The Star Destroyer swayed wildly from side to side, as though struggling to retain control after the hit, then suddenly cleared a new path with a volley from its port turbolasers. Turning as sharply as a Star Destroyer could, it angled for a dense mass of asteroids just in sun from Eclipse. He's setting us up. Han said, launch by... Wait, Mara said, still watching the debris cloud descend toward Eclipse. Watch. Scan that flotsam for life forms. Booster wasn't hit. He threw that stuff at us. Before Watch could comply, Corrin said, Mara, thank you. I can feel Drysella and Valen reaching out to me. Affirmative, Watch said. Those are escape pods. Leia, can you send Han up to control and oversee the pod recovery in the Falcon? Luke asked. And you and Mirax can help her, Corrin. Corrin was already setting his X-Wing down next to the Falcon. I'd like nothing better. Thank you. Everyone else launch, carefully, by squadrons, Luke ordered. Watch, lower the shields. Sabres. Three, two, mark. Mara activated her repulsor lift and followed Luke's X-Wing out of the hangar, sweeping around an escape pod and waving at a pair of wide-eyed young Jedi students watching her through their viewport. By the time the other three squadrons had formed up behind them, the Star Destroyer and its pursuers were already out of visual range, and as they eased into the asteroid cluster, growing difficult to find even on the tactical display. Mara thought their approach might remain undetected, until a handful of frigates poked their noses out of the asteroid cluster and began to drop their skips. They must want Booster pretty desperately, Mara observed. Or they don't know who we are, Luke asked. The asteroid cluster came into visual range now, the flash of the Star Destroyer's sixty turbolaser batteries lighting up the interior like a tiny red dwarf star. All X-wings, lock S-foils into firing position. Don't be stingy with those shadow bombs. Farm boy, you'd better hold back a minute, Han calmed. Hold back? Affirmative, hold. Han's voice dissolved into static as the asteroid cluster began to explode, mountainous rock by mountainous rock, sixty of them in staccato succession, each one spraying millions of tons of superheated stone in every direction at several thousand meters a second. On her tactical display... Mara saw a boulder split one of the frigates down the spine, 
and glimpsed a cruiser analog tumbling out of the cluster in three separate sections. Then Luke was yelling, Break! Break! and ducking them behind the shelter of a city-sized asteroid. When Han's voice returned, he was explaining, Old smuggler's trick. Shunt all engine power to the particle shields, then heat an asteroid behind them and wait for it to explode. He paused a moment, then added, Works really well with a Star Destroyer. You could have warned us earlier, Control, Mara observed. Hey, do I look like a Jedi mind reader? The rubble wave reached them then, tumbling past in lightning-like streaks of gray, occasionally shattering a nearby asteroid with the flash of a detonating proton torpedo. Their own mountainous shield took several hits that jolted the whole rock noticeably and pelted their particle shields with sprays of loosened pebbles. And finally the storm was passed, slowly dissipating as the debris spray dispersed and gave up so much momentum to collisions that the individual shards no longer had the energy to explode on impact. When they poked their noses out from behind their shield, Mara was astonished to find the venture on her tactical display, where there had been only the asteroid cluster before. There were a few blank spots on the array where clouds of dust or frozen vapor confused the sensors, but most alarming were the squadrons of A-wing and Y-wing starfighters spilling from the Star Destroyer's launching bays. The tactical display marked them all as New Republic craft, but the Star Destroyer reduced the number of cruiser analogs to five with a devastating turbolaser volley, and the A-wings reduced it to four with a high-speed concussion missile-proton-torpedo combination pass. Farm boy, the errant venture doesn't have a fighter squadron, Mara calmed, let alone six. Try ten, Jedi, an unfamiliar voice said over the tactical net. And we're just hitching a ride on the venture. We're a Reese fleet, all that remains of it. A piece fell into place in Mara's mind, and she saw the tenuous connection she had sensed earlier between the Shadow's presence at Borlias and the venture's unexpected arrival at Eclipse. A surprise attack? she asked. At the same time as Borlias? On its heels, the voice corrected. And they meant to keep it that way. The first thing they did was, well, jam our communications. All we've got are our fighter comms, and only when we're outside the Star Destroyer. Jam? How? Some sort of Dovin basil, we think, the pilot answered. The first Reese knew of the attack was when they swarmed the base shields. We thought they were some sort of Minoc at first, but when we tried to transmit, they pulled the signal in like a black hole. No one was able to send a message? Mara asked. No one. The venture caught a dose when she came to get us, he said. We were trying to clean them off when this task force jumped us at the edge of the deep core. So the New Republic doesn't know that Risi has fallen, Luke said. Or that the Bilbringi shipyards have been cut off, Han added. But they will soon. I'll have a message sent now. The Star Destroyer's form grew visible ahead, its nose coming up before the sabers as it wheeled around to bring its turbolasers to bear on a cruiser trying to attack from above. Mara could just see something that looked like tiny, heart-shaped freckles dotting the white hull, no doubt the signal-devouring Dovin basils that the pilot had described. Another cruiser analog was following behind the venture, pouring plasma balls and magma missiles into its vulnerable exhaust ports. Sabres and shockers, take that cruiser on the tail, Han ordered. Knights and dozen, remove the one trying to cut him off. You hear that, Reese? Luke asked. A flurry of comm clicks acknowledged. Good. See if you can clear us a path. We're coming in hard. The Reese squadrons first engaged the coral skippers in the Jedi's way, then tried to draw them off by turning to flee. The skips started to fall for the ploy, then abruptly reversed course, and began to gather in front of the intended targets. They have a Yamask! Danny actually sounded happy about it. In that port cruiser, if we can... Check, a Reese voice replied. Thanks for the tip, Jedi. Two squadrons of A-wings wheeled on the cruiser instantly, 
discharging concussion missiles as they dropped. Taking a cue from the fighters, the errant venture concentrated a whole bank of turbo lasers on the vessel, and the hull began to vomit York coral immediately. Wait, Danny calmed. I meant capture it. We need it alive. The vessel went dead in space and began to drift, bodies and atmosphere streaming from its hull breaches. The coral skippers continued to cluster in the Jedi's path, their volcano cannons now belching plasma. Master Skywalker, it's still communicating with the skip, Danny calmed. If we can board it quick enough... Let's finish this run first, Danny, Luke replied. Sabres and knights ease off. Shockers and dozen, you'll have to clear the way. Rigard simply took his squadron and shot ahead toward their target. Kip, however, did not seem to have fully grasped his assignment. Let's go, dozen. He calmed, peeling off. We have first shot. The shockers rocketed into the enemy coral skippers, a kilometer ahead of the sabers, and commenced fire, clearing a path to the cruiser as much by forcing the skips to dodge as by blasting them out of the way. Mara saw one shocker go EV and slam into a chunk of asteroid when a volcano cannon sheared his S-foils, then watched another vanish in a ball of flame as his starfighter smashed headlong into a magma missile. She and Tam began to weave shields with Luke, each sensing the other's intentions through the Force, juking and jinking in perfect unison. Mara kept up a constant barrage of laser fire, using the Force more to avoid hitting her own ships than to target the enemies. Two skips deteriorated into rubble as she rocketed past behind Luke. The darkness ahead suddenly grew bright as the shockers launched their proton torpedoes. Then it grew brighter still as the decoy flares deployed. The cruiser retaliated with a barrage of Gretchen's and magma missiles. Rigard's squadron was already diving down and away, leaving the weapons to come streaking toward the sabers. Launch, Luke ordered. Mara's shadow bombs were already gone following Luke's toward the cruiser. Without really thinking about it, she nosed her X-wing over behind his, one eye on her target as she used the force to guide the weapon home. Tam's laser cannon flashed, blasting a gretchen away from her cockpit before it could attach, and then the brilliant flash of the first proton detonation caused her canopy's blast tinting to darken. More explosions followed in quick succession, and by the time Luke swung the sabers around, the ship was coming apart. The inert cruiser lay ahead, surrounded by a cloud of floating bodies and equipment. The rifts in its hull hung dark and ominous, some large enough for an X-wing to enter. Mara checked her tactical display and saw that Luke could be thinking what she feared. The venture, now turned on its side next to the sabers, was already hammering the last cruiser, and the Reese squadrons were herding the surviving skips into an ever-tightening sphere, picking them off now by the twos and threes. Skywalker, Mara calmed. A dead Yamask is one thing. They need a live one. And when is it going to be easier? Luke eased his X-wing toward the largest breach. Danny's already shown how valuable it is just to know when there's a Yamask present. Imagine what we'll be able to do when we can intercept its messages. How are you going to carry it back? Mara asked. Under your seat? Han, send us the Jolly Man. Wait a minute, Danny said. Something's wrong. The Yamask has gone completely silent, and now the skips look confused. That's enough, Luke, Mara said. Close to home or not, this felt too easy to be safe. The Force was with us at Talfalio. Today, it's not. Luke was already swinging his X-wing around as the flash of an exploding magma magazine tore the vessel apart. Bouncing your coral off his particle shields and licking his exhaust ports with hundred meter flames. Chapter 35 Though the Skyway balcony was always the grandest entrance to any society apartment, Vicky Shash had long believed that the interior approach revealed more than the occupant's station in life. The solo apartment sat in a sanibuffed cul-de-sac as wide as a speeder avenue, with a floor of milky larmel stone. 
a costly non-fabricant available only from the Roche asteroid field, and rare red ladellums blooming in rounded wall niches between pillars of white mard. A barrel-vaulted ceiling of custom-made glow panels infused the area with cloudy light, and a smiling servodroid greeter no doubt with the full tattletale security package, stood patiently outside the Chris de Steel door. The Solos had certainly come down in the world since Leia's days as Chief of State. Upon learning that they had quietly traded their prestigious Orowood hideaway for something in the more affordable Eastport Administrative District, Vicky had at first been inclined to doubt her informer. One did not expect to find two of the Rebellion's most acclaimed heroes and power brokers living among the bureaucrats, much less at an address nearly three hundred meters down from the top of a not-very-tall tower. But the Ladalums convinced her. Unique to Alderaan, the shrubs yielded red blossoms only if their line remained pure to their planet of origin. Given the vicissitudes of disease and cross-pollination, they were, like so many things Alderanian, these days, gradually dying out. That was what happened to those who lost power, Vicky supposed. They withered slowly away, until one day they were just gone. Like Moon Mothma, like Admiral Akbar, like Leia Organa Solo, like Vicky herself, after being undone in the Senate by Luke Skywalker and his Jedi tricks. Not wishing to draw attention to herself by staring too long at the Solo's apartment, Vicky looked casually away and continued past. Just another Eastport bureaucrat heading home on personal business in the middle of the day. Dressed in a fashionable high-collared overcloak and swank slouch hat, she certainly looked the part, well enough to have fooled the young Jedi trailing her when she and an assistant exchanged clothes in the refresher station of a crowded transit hub. She followed the corridor around the corner to a lift bank and stepped into a tube, removing her hat and overcloak as she rose to the rooftop. Now, garbed in the conservative business tabard of a money watcher, she stepped out onto the sky shuttle landing pad, deposited the clothing in a disintegrator chute, and crossed to another lift bank. After giving the proper visitor authorization for an apartment on the same level, she descended to the Solo's floor and started back toward the apartment, trying to think of how she could insert the census slug without being observed. Entering the cul-de-sac, even on the pretext of examining the beautiful ladlums, was out of the question. The greeter droid would be very polite and solicitous, but it would also be scanning her image and voice print for a data match. Vicky approached the entry head-on this time, strolling along and peering over the top of a sheaf of flimsy plast documents she had brought as a prop. There was simply no way to enter the cul-de-sac without being seen by the greeter droid, which meant she would have to find some other way to insert the census slug. Her contact had assured her that the creatures were capable of finding their own way inside once they had been targeted. But the Yuzhan Vong understood even less about cleaning droids than she did about census slugs. Having already lost half a dozen of the insects trying to slip just one into the Nurmok committee room, she felt reasonably certain that the instant the census slug came within twenty meters of a ladlum, some little pest hunter would zip out to destroy it. Vicky was starting to consider other options, food deliveries or using a third party, when she heard the solution marching up the corridor behind her. It's hardly the time to go sightseeing, dear, Han Solo was saying. It's exactly the time, Leia countered. They had a reason for trying to keep the capture of Risi quiet, and that reason will be all the more pressing now that we know about it. Still pretending to be absorbed in her documents, Vicky quietly slipped one hand into her pocket and palmed what felt like a thumb-sized leech in her fingers. In place of a head, it had a huge compound eye. She turned the eye toward the Soto's crystal steel door, and squeezed the creature until she felt its body grow warm with understanding. Han and Leia veered toward the center of the corridor as they came up behind her. Some creature in their party gurgled softly as they passed, and two pairs of metallic feet clanked on the floor behind them. Besides, we know the reason, Han argued. Bill Bringy. That's the obvious reason, Leia countered. When have you ever known the Yuzhan Vong to be obvious? 
The solos swept past Vicky without a second glance, both dressed in rumpled flight suits. Han cradled an infant in one arm. Vicky was hardly an authority on babies. When the time came to bear one, she intended to have a staff and a tulban to care for the thing. But she did know the solo's offspring to be adults now, or nearly so. This had to be the Skywalker heir. The couple's famous golden droid came clumping after them, a four-armed TDL nanny droid traveling smoothly at its side. Vicky turned a little more toward the wall. The two humans would not see through her disguise, she knew, because this was the last place they expected to find her. The droids were a different matter. Droids scanned and analyzed and did not let their expectations lead them astray, and she felt fairly certain that the protocol droid, at least, would have her face committed to its memory banks. The droid seemed more concerned with the discussion between its owners than who she might be. When Han did not answer his wife's objection, it said, Forgive me for intruding, but I'm quite certain that when Master Luke and Mistress Mara said Ben would be safer on Coruscant, they anticipated that we would be staying longer than fifty-seven minutes. Leia shot a look over her shoulder that would have melted lesser droids. You let me worry about that, 3PO. Yes, Princess. Vicky guessed from the presence of the Skywalker baby that they had to be coming from the secret Jedi base. Savong La was still trying to discover its location. That was one of the reasons he had assigned her this task. And given what Skywalker had done to her in the Senate, she was eager to see the War Master pleased. She waited a moment longer to make certain there was no one else in the Solo's party. Then, as they approached the intersection in front of the apartment, she flicked the census slug at the protocol droid's back. The worm hit in absolute silence and slithered down toward the waist coupling, but the droid suddenly paused at the corner and swiveled its head around to look behind it. Vicky hid her face behind her documents and turned to the corner, then ran into something barely as high as her chest and cried out in surprise, flinging her flimsy plast props in all directions. A wispy voice below her rasped, I beg your forgiveness. She looked around to see a little bug-eyed alien with gray skin and a mouthful of sharp teeth, gathering her documents in his long-taloned fingers. The Nogri passed the documents back to her. I apologize. Vicky allowed the alien to place the props in her hand, then sensed the solos watching her. She had taken care to disguise her appearance by coloring her hair drab ash and making liberal use of an NRI disguise kit. But at that moment, she could not help wishing that she had accepted her contact's offer to give her an Ooglith masker. Unable to resist looking, she glanced over at the solos and found them both staring. Han's expression grew concerned. You okay? Would you like to come inside for a minute? Vicky's heart jumped into her throat. She mumbled something indecipherable, then scurried off, shaking her head. Chapter 36 Anakin could feel nothing through the battle meld except doubt and resentment. So he was as surprised as anyone when the crack-crackle of a thermal detonator reverberated through the street behind him. Raising his lightsaber to high guard and thumbing the activation switch, he pivoted around to discover a ball of blue-white light contracting between Raynar and Errol, obliterating everything in a five-meter radius and opening a deep crater in the street. Subsurface service ducts began to spew water and sewer gas, filling the hole with steam and flame. Over the course of several dozen attempts to reach the cloning facility, the Jedi had crossed replications of nearly every environment where Voxen might be sent to hunt them. Replications of agri-tracts, robo-factories, swamp farms, even an automated cloud mine. Now they were pushing through the slave city itself. With tiers of windows and balconies built directly into the walls, the metropolis reminded Anakin of the pictures his mother had shown him of Crevasse City, on lost Alderaan. In addition to a dozen different species of slave residents, the artificial city contained turbo lifts, slide walks, even droid operated hover cars. Anakin stepped past Tahiri and Tekli, 
and peered over Raynar's shoulder into the flaming crater. Nothing remained of whatever had prompted the attack. Voxen? he asked. Since their retreat from the walker, the Voxen attacks had been coming with increasing frequency. Raynar shrugged. I didn't see. It came out of the street hatch, Errol explained from the other side. Her green eyes flickered briefly in Raynar's direction. Then she added, There was no time to do anything but toss a detonator down its throat. Sorry for the waste. Anakin thumbed his lightsaber off. I don't know that I'd call it a waste. The team was down to a dozen thermal detonators. Now eleven, and perhaps twice that many grenades. But at least they had not lost anyone since Yulaha. Raynar is probably worth the price of a detonator. Probably, Raynar objected. If there's any question, the House of Thule will gladly reimburse the Jedi for all detonators used on my behalf. You're sure? Errol asked doubtfully. She circled around the burning crater, then pinched Raynar on the cheek and laughed. Behind her came Zek and Jaina, like Anakin and Lomi, now completely recovered from their encounter with the Flitnats. Even Lobaka and Joven had nothing worse to show than a bad rash, thanks to Tekli's quick realization, that the insects had been engineered to promote a debilitating allergic reaction. Anakin's earplugs sealed themselves against the disorienting blast of a Voxen screech attack. Such attacks came so regularly now that they were no longer startling. Anakin simply pushed his breath mask into place and started forward to where a mob of slaves was staggering away from a convergence of blaster fire. A lightsaber flashed, sending the tip of a severed voxen tail tumbling over the crowd. Then the creature itself rose into view as Tenel Ka used the force to lift it out of a street hatch. Ganner and the Barabels set on it instantly, hacking it apart with their molten blades before Anakin could reach them. Killing Voxen was becoming almost routine. The strike team rarely traveled more than a few kilometers without being attacked by at least one of the things. Anakin reached out with the Force to search for more. There seemed to be no others lurking beneath the street, but he did perceive someone in anguish lying inside the growing cloud of toxins released by the creature's noxious blood. Slipping past the fighting, he found a mucus-coated slave curled into a fetal ball. So badly acid-burned that only his raw nerve cones identified him as a Gotal. Anakin called Tekli forward. She should have felt the need on her own, but the battle meld was so full of discord that it served as little more than confirmation that everyone was still alive and conscious. As the Chadrafan knelt beside the dying Gotal, Lumi and Welk came up, now wearing the breath masks Lobaka had risked so much to retrieve. They watched Tekli's ministrations, not with the disdain or detachment Anakin had expected, but with visible outrage. He knew better than to think they were empathizing with the slaves' suffering. They were simply using the anger it engendered to feed their dark side power. I don't like coming through here. Anakin eyed the growing number of slave residents, stumbling away from the toxic fumes. We're endangering them with our presence. They are already in danger, Lomi said, and you are the one who wishes to try the Voxen Warren. This is the only way to reach it. You know you're going to get us killed? Welk asked. Even you, Jean Vong, don't go down there. Which is why we must, Anakin said. Whether Numanor intended to or not, he was wearing the strike team down, steadily depleting its munitions and draining its vigor. We need to break through soon, or we never will. If this doesn't work, we may have to accept never, Lumi said. There comes a time when we must think of our own lives. Yeah, like after we've vaped the queen. Tahiri stepped to Anakin's side. There is no try, only do. Lumi flashed Tahiri a condescending smirk. Very impressive, child. You have memorized Skywalker's maxims. She looked back to Anakin. Seriously, if this does not work, you must signal your extraction team. I won't throw away my life. 
There's more at risk here than your life. Or ours, Anakin said. Lumi rolled her eyes. I know. The Jedi themselves. The Jedi are the galaxy's best hope of survival, Anakin replied. Otherwise the Yuzhan Vong wouldn't be working so hard to destroy us. Lumi ran her eyes down Anakin's figure, her expression almost seductive. You are so very earnest, Anakin. It is really quite adorable. Her smile turned icy. But I did not see Skywalker sending his Jedi Knights to save the Night Sisters when the Yuzhan Vong captured Dathomir. I will show you to the Voxen Cave. But if we cannot fight through, you must call your extraction team. Anakin hesitated a moment, wondering how earnest she would think him after he lied to her. And then he realized there was no need. He returned her smile with one just as icy. Extraction team, he asked. What extraction team would that be? Lumi's eyes narrowed, and she reached out to test Anakin with the Force. Do you think you can... When she encountered no resistance, her jaw fell and she let the probe drop. You are on a suicide mission? It's no suicide mission, Tahiri said. We've walked rockier trails than this lots of times. Lumi ignored her and continued to stare at Anakin. The War Master anticipated our plans, he explained. We lost our ship coming in. And your backup plan? Lumi asked. Surely you have a backup plan? Anakin nodded. Kill the queen and destroy the lab, then hope we can steal a ship in the confusion. I see. The anger in Lumi's eyes grew more intent. There is no try. Only do, Welk finished his voice mocking. If that doesn't blast my bones. The acid-burned Gotal finally died, and the strike team started up the street again. As soon as they left the Toxin Cloud, the mob closed in, begging the Jedi to free them, thrusting children out for rescue, volunteering to fight. There were thousands of slaves, Ranats, Osan, Tagorians, even some species Anakin could not name, all cognizant of their fate, all desperate to escape their coming doom, the very people who needed the Jedi, the weak, the downtrodden, the defenseless. Anakin's heart grew heavier each time he was forced to say he could not help, that his mission here was too vital, that he had no way to get them off the world ship. Soon it grew too painful to explain that much. He simply apologized in a quiet and calm voice, using Jedi persuasion techniques to comfort those in despair and to redirect the wrath of those who were angry. Lumi started down a cramped alley canyon that would not have felt out of place in Coruscant's underlevels. Barely three meters wide, the lane descended at a steep angle beneath a network of balconies and catwalks, then vanished into the dank-smelling murk ahead. The windows and doors that pocked the walls to both sides were sealed behind curtains of living membrane. An odd double pathway worn into the dusty ground was spaced about right for the wide-set legs of a voxen. Noting that the slave residents showed no desire to follow them into the alley, Anakin stopped three steps in. Stay sharp, everyone. We need to make this work. He turned to his brother. If you can do something to keep the Voxen quiet, now is the time. Jason paled. I'll do my best, Anakin. He started forward. But these aren't normal animals. I can't just reach... Anakin did not hear the rest, for the general haze of Yuzhan Vong present suddenly grew strong and almost distinct. He turned to scan the crowd and found a group of humans shoving toward Jason. All five were large men with swarthy faces and blank expressions, men so similar they could have been clones. Four reached for their belts. The fifth tossed a thumb-sized capsule at Jason's feet, and a thin coat of greenish gel spread across the street. Lorast jelly. Anakin burned a blaster hole through the jelly thrower's throat, then used the force to pluck his brother off the ground. Watch the crowd. 
A dozen lightsabers came to life and formed a dancing cage of light around the rear half of the strike team. Anakin put Jason down in the alley mouth. Someone took a heavy blow, and a tide of darkness swirled through the battle meld as they struggled to stay conscious. Jaina! Jason yelled. The mob roared and scattered, trampling each other in their panic. The imposters flung more blorash jelly, capturing slaves and Jedi alike, turning the street into a tangle of confusion. Lubaka roared, his bronze lightsaber flashing down, cleaving something Anakin could not see. Tenel Ka yelled for support. Alima cursed in Rill, her silver blade burning through a soft body. Errol cried out as green gel spread over her foot. She hacked the stuff apart, and the second piece bound her other foot to the ground. She reached into her equipment pouch for a more potent defense. A razor bug flew out of the crowd, caught her below the nose, and slashed her face in two. Her eyes rolled back, and the lightsaber slipped from her hand, and she fell and began to convulse. Shock burned through the battle meld like an ion blast. Doubt and resentment gave way to anger, blame, guilt. None of it helpful. The emotions only added to the chaos, blurring Anakin's awareness. He felt just one thing clearly. The black gauze threatening to engulf his sister. Anakin stepped out of the alley and heard an amphistaff hiss. He caught the snakish head on his lightsaber, then spun around, driving a back kick into his attacker's midsection, and bringing his molten blade around in a neck-high sweep. The imposter collapsed, head tumbling from his shoulders. Tahiri somersaulted under Anakin's lightsaber and sprang to her feet behind her blade, driving the tip up through the torso of a Duros male. Seeing no amphistaff, Anakin thought she had made a terrible mistake, then sensed Yuzhan Vong pain and saw a gableth masker peeling off the Duros face. Anakin jerked her behind him. Careful. You're one to talk, she snapped. Tahiri pulled a handful of arson salts from her equipment pouch and sprinkled them on a blorash jelly sliding toward their feet. The stuff drew back, then began to divide itself into oblivion. Anakin circled past and first sensed, then saw more impostors, three human and two duros, shouldering their way out of the crowd. He pushed Tahiri at Ganner and the Barabels and ordered them to secure the alley entrance, then sprang into the air and called on the force to carry himself over the charging Yuzhan Vong. As he somersaulted past their heads, he dragged his lightsaber across one impostor's skull and split it down the center. He landed behind the group and thrust-kicked another onto Tisar's waiting blade. The barebell ducked a whistling amphistaff, then trapped the arm that had swung it and pulled the elbow into his sharp-toothed mouth. With the odds in the alley now firmly in the strike team's favor, Anakin turned to find Raynar pulling Errol's limp body into his arms, his face streaked with tears and seemingly unaware of the blorash jelly binding his knee to the ground. Anakin sprinkled some salts on the blob. Raynar looked up, eyes wide. I can't feel her, Anakin. She's not in the Force. Anakin shared his shock. Before, Nomanor had seemed intent on recapturing the strike team alive. So why were Yuzhan Vong hurling razor bugs now? Because suddenly the strike team had a good chance of reaching the cloning labs. That was why. He pulled Errol into Raynar's arms, then pushed them both toward the alley. I'll send Tekli. Anakin rushed forward into a mad riot of shrieking slaves. Some lay dead, and many were bleeding but the battle had already drifted out into the street, and most were screaming only because they were trapped. He hurled a few sprinkles of arson salts as he passed, then met Tenel Ka coming in the opposite direction, levitating Joven Drark. Tekli was kneeling astride the Rodian, her hands buried to the wrists inside his open chest. Anakin touched him through the force and immediately felt sick and hollow inside. Joven had only the faintest glimmer of life and even that was fading. Jaina's in trouble, Tenelka said. They're trying to— Anakin was already racing forward, leaping the bodies of groaning slaves and fallen Yuzhan Vong, flinging arson salts at the few remaining patches of blorash jelly. 
He should have anticipated this. Should have realized Nilmanor would use the slave city to ambush them. Now Errol was dead, Jovan dying, Jaina about to be taken, and the strike team had yet to reach the cloning labs. He found Jaina pinned against a building, a blob of blorash jelly binding her along one side, blood pouring from a head wound. Despite it all, she was holding two Yuzhan Vong imposters at bay with a one-handed lightsaber defense. Lubaka and Zek were fighting toward her through a half-dozen still-masked warriors. Alima Rar crouched behind a crashed hovercar, using Joven Drark's long blaster to delay a company of reinforcements. Anakin gathered the force to him and charged, somersaulting into the air, as he had a few moments before. Zek's opponents broke off, stepping back to hurl their amphistaffs like spears. Anakin batted one aside, then felt a hot pain in his abdomen when the second pierced his jumpsuit's armored lining. As he finished his tumble, the shaft swung away, the head pivoting inside his abdomen. He heard himself scream. Then he was coming down, landing on his feet and hammering the butt into the ground. Cold anguish filled his belly. His knees tried to buckle, but he would not let them. Could not let them. Anakin! Guided by her screaming voice, Anakin flung a handful of arson salts in Jaina's direction, used the force to carry them to the jelly. Then he grabbed the amphistaff and jerked it from his body. The agony was crushing. Anakin shunted it aside, used his Jedi training to prevent his suffering from crippling him. He was injured, but not mortally so. One of Jaina's attackers spun to attack, changing his amphistaff to whip form in mid-swing. Anakin batted the fanged head aside, leapt forward, feigned a slash. The imposter tried to step inside, had to try. Anakin slipped a foot behind his foe's heel and swept the leg. The Yuzhan Vong went down, rolled, then opened his own throat on Anakin's downturned lightsaber. Now free of her blorash jelly, Jaina was driving her foe back with a wild web of lightsaber slashes. Calling on the force for strength, Anakin stepped over and slashed his blade across the Yuzhan Vong's knees. Jaina opened the warrior's chest plate before he hit the ground, then turned and grabbed Anakin by the elbow. By the Sith, Anakin. Why'd you do something like that? Like what? he asked. Jaina glared. They both knew his rescue had been rash. We lost two, and I wasn't going to— The words caught in Anakin's throat, and he had to try again. You were in trouble, and now you are. Jaina tried to wipe the blood from her eyes and failed, then started toward the alley. Anakin, this was really— Are you ever going to learn? As they turned, Anakin found himself looking at a wall of Jedi with Lobaka and Zek flanked by Jason, Ganner, and everyone else he had ordered to stay in the alley. The last of the Yuzhan Vong imposters lay on the ground behind them, their maskers and Vondun crab armor hacked into smoking pieces. Zek went instantly to Jaina's side. Tahiri beat Lobaka and Jason to Anakin's. She tried to pull his hand away from the wound, but he wouldn't allow it. He lifted his chin toward Alima who was still crouched behind the hovercar burning holes in Yuzhan Vong chests. Call her off, he said. Let's go before someone else gets killed. Paying no attention, Tahiri continued to tug at his arm. Anakin, how bad is it? Let me— Tahiri, stop. Anakin pushed her arm down. It's just a little cut. Chapter 37 You call this a shortcut? Trust me. Han looked away from the starless swirl of black nebula gas outside and smiled at his wife. If the Vong who jumped Booster were protecting something, we'll find it at the end of this run. This is the only way they could have reached the core region without tripping a picket mine. And we aren't going to trip a picket mine. Why? Leia asked. Because there aren't any. Han said. The New Republic doesn't know about this lane. Nobody does. Nobody? Well, Lando knows. Han returned his gaze to the long-range sensors. 
and began to scan for dangerous mass centers. And Chewbacca, he knew. So did Roa. And, of course, Talon Card always knows. So basically, you're saying that every smuggler or gambler who ever had a reason to slip into Risi, undetected, knows this shortcut? Yeah, Han said. Like I said, nobody. They had already made five jumps in as many hours, and now they were flying the Falcon into the inky heart of the Black Bantha. Listed erroneously on most charts as a Gamma-class navigation hazard, which usually meant an unlocated black hole, the Bantha was actually a protostar, a small cloud of relatively cool gas slowly contracting to become a star. In a few million years or so, it would contract enough to start fusing hydrogen, but for now its core emitted nothing more dangerous than a vague aura of infrared heat. A good pilot could fly straight through it at near light speed, so long as he stayed clear of its dust ring and avoided the uncharted gamma-ray pulsar on the other side. An alert chimed once, twice, a half-dozen times, then became a steady bell. A field of dark shapes appeared on the display, ahead of the falcon and a little below, each with a set of numerical readouts below it. Han? Leia asked. What are those? Asteroid cluster, Han said. It's supposed to be farther out, but it must be drifting toward center. Really? Leia sounded doubtful. Standard rock iron asteroids? That's right. Han glanced at the readouts and immediately saw her point. The contacts were too uniform to be asteroids, and not nearly dense enough. He put the Falcon into a hard turn, then shut down the ion drives to avoid illuminating their position. I said we'd find them here. At the end of the run. It looks like this is the end of the run. Dark shapes continued to appear on the display as they drifted across the protostar. Leia activated a data record and began to run an analysis. Han activated the rest of the passive sensors and kept a wary eye on the dark shapes as they slowed and began to deploy pickets. So far, they did not seem to realize they were being watched, which did not really surprise him. The Falcon's sensors were the equal of any reconnaissance ship, and the New Republic's one small advantage in this war seemed to lie in surveillance. Still, it would not be long before the picket ships drew near enough to sense their presence. Okay, Leia. I think we'd better go. Not yet. This is too big, Leia said. That's kind of the point. No, Han. I mean really big. Isn't the New Republic getting ready to jump to Risi? In about... Han glanced at the instrument panel chronometer. Three hours. Unofficially, of course. I don't think they're going to find anything. There must be a thousand vessels already. Han started to ask Leia what she wanted him to do about it, but realized he already knew. The crooked hyperspace lane behind them zigzagged all the way through the colonies to the edge of the core region. From there, the Yuzhan Vong would have a clear path to both Eclipse and Coruscant and Han did not think even Savong La was sending a thousand vessels to attack the Jedi base. I don't want to do this. They had been in the right place at the right time too often in their lives already. It wasn't fun anymore. I really don't want to do this. I'll ready a message, Leia said. Send it to Adarak and Miwal, Han said. We may get only one try and they're in a better position to make sure the news reaches Wedge and Garm. Already thought of that. And tell them to find Lando, Han added. The fleet's going to need a guide. Thought of that, too, Leia said. And tell Luke, Han. Hey, coming out here wasn't my idea, Han said. I'm just trying to help. Leia gave him a glare that suggested he get on with it. Han risked a subspace imaging scan and located the real field of asteroids where he had expected, just inside the dust ring down on the protostar's plane of spin. He plotted a short burn course that would carry them away from the Yuzhan Vong at an oblique angle and bring them in behind the asteroid cluster. Once they were safely established there, they would be able to monitor the entire gas cloud with long-range sensors and feed the data to the New Republic fleet as it arrived. Providing, of course, it did arrive. There was always a chance that Felia or some other bureaucrat would panic and decide to keep the fleet at home. 
We'll have to risk an ion glow, Han said. I don't think anyone will see it in this cloud, but if they do... I've already plotted an emergency hop, Leia said. It won't be long, but it should buy us some time to come up with something better. The data dump is ready to go. Hold on tight, Han said. We'll be slam-pivoting straight to Vector. Wonderful. Something to look forward to. Leia grabbed the arms of the big co-pilot's chair and nodded grimly. Han clenched his jaw, then activated the ion drive and hit the attitude thrusters. Though the acceleration compensator was dialed to maximum, the Falcon slewed around so sharply that the crash webbing crackled from the strain. His hands nearly came off the yoke, and he had the sensation of tumbling sideways. Then his stomach rebelled, and he had to clench his jaw to keep from embarrassing himself. The acceleration compensator caught up as they began to travel in a straight line again, and Leia opened a subspace channel to Coruscant. It took only a few seconds for the signal to find a route through the relay maze to their east port apartment, but Han used the time to check the sensor displays and spied a pair of skips peeling off to investigate. The Yuzhan Vong would have dispatched an entire flotilla if they had seen an ion glow, so it seemed likely the pair were only chasing the wake the Falcon was punching through the nebula. Hoping to muddle enemy readings and give his ship the tumbling signature of a rogue asteroid, Han began to cycle power to the particle shields in a top-bottom pattern and deployed the emergency gas scoop. The ship's reactor could fuse raw hydrogen if necessary. Miwal's voice finally came over the subspace, a little scratchy due to signal loss inside the absorption nebula. Lady Vader, we were not expecting to hear from you. All is well. For now... Leia began the data dump. See that this information reaches... Leia gasped and let the sentence break off, one hand rising to her chest, her expression growing pained and distant. Lady Vader? Leia? Han reached over to touch her arm, but she signaled him to wait. Hear me, Wall. She closed her eyes and seemed to collect herself, then continued. I need you to see that the data package I sent reaches Wedge Antilles and Garmbel Iblis in fleet command. At once. Do what you must to succeed. Send copies to Luke and to Lando Calrissian, along with my suggestion that they offer their services to Admiral Sav. This could mean the war for us. Lady Vader, it will be done. Miwal's tone was so flat, she might as well have been promising to tell a neighbor the Solos would not make it home for drinks after all. But if she had to fight her way into fleet command, Han pitied the poor sentry or bureaucrat, foolish enough to deny her access. Fortunately, the Nogri were as creative as they were stealthy, so she would probably just surprise the generals in the refresher or something and avoid unnecessary bloodshed. Minuscule as friction was even inside a gas nebula, the drag created by the hydrogen scoop was enough to require an extra two seconds of ion glow. Han watched nervously as the Falcon's vector converged with that of the investigating skips, trying to guess when the light of his ion drives would give them away. But the coral skippers continued as before until the burn finally came to an end. When he saw that they were slowing to swing in behind him, a standard safe approach for any unknown contact, and that their vector would not cross the Falcons until after it reached the asteroid cluster, he exhaled in relief. They still did not know what they were looking at. Han found Leia staring out the viewport, her face the color of pearls, her expression distant and guarded. Recalling her unexplained gasp earlier, and her diplomat's habit of not showing her emotions until she had won control of them, he started to ask what was troubling her. She cut him off before he spoke. Later, Han. There was an alarming catch in her throat, but also that unyielding edge that he had learned was about as flexible as durasteel. Pay attention to your flying. A variation alarm sounded as they passed a straggler from the asteroid cluster large enough to exert its own gravitational pull. Han touched the alarm silent and plotted their new trajectory without making a suggested correction. Any such change would instantly alert the approaching skips of the Falcon's true nature and ruin all hope of the New Republic catching the fleet unprepared. 
The new trajectory pointed the falcon out toward the dust ring, where Han would be forced to retract the gas scoop to avoid clogging the intake filters. He was still struggling with how to accomplish that without altering their flight signature when the variation alarm sounded again, and another asteroid pulled them back toward the cluster. Han plotted the new trajectory and saw they would hit, and soon. This was a big one, large enough so that its own gravity would shape it into a rough sphere, and it was bending their vector ever more sharply. Han saw only inky swirls of nebula gas beyond the transparasteel. But the asteroid was out there, off to their left, yet drifting toward the center of the viewport and looming larger every moment. And it was just what they needed. Han turned to the navigation computer and began to input blast radii and acceleration rates. The answer came back higher than he liked, and he had to concentrate to keep from cursing aloud. Leia, you know that trick Kip is always doing with Jedi shadow bombs? Define no she said. About a kilometer a second, Han said. I can get some initial acceleration by pressurizing the missile tube. The missile tube, Han? Then blowing the hatch, he finished. But we'll be right behind it when the warhead detonates, and even Han Solo isn't that fast. Leia's face paled. You're not going to— We don't have much time here, Han said, arming the missile. Can you do it? Leia closed her eyes. Which one? Port tube. Han instructed the computer to open the rear of the tube, then deactivated the missile's ion engine and overrode the launch safeties. By the time he had completed all this, a deeper darkness had begun to emerge from the swirling nebula fog, a certain stillness that left no doubt about its solid nature. Han depressed the launch trigger and heard a soft pop as the hatch cover swung open. Sucked from its tube by the sudden decompression, the missile drifted out from between the Falcon's cargo mandibles and seemed to hang there. Now would be a good time, Han urged. I'm trying. The missile moved forward, picking up speed, but gradually. Well, it was a good idea, Han said, prepping the ion drives for a blast start. Leia was no Jedi. She had never had time for the rigorous training. But she could control the force, and he had seen her move things heavier than the missile. Maybe the nebula interfered with the force or something. Nice try, but... The missile shot away, then vanished into the darkness. That'll work, Han finished. He moved his hand to the repulsor lift drives and waited. In the sensor display, the coral skippers omitted the detour caused by the first asteroid and cut straight for the one ahead. They would have a clear view of the impact, though hopefully not so clear they would see the matte black falcon silhouetted against the flash. As soon as the first pinpoint of light caused the cockpit blast tinting to darken, Han activated the repulsor lift drives and swung away, decelerating and turning almost as sharply as his earlier slam pivot. The coral skippers would be in scanning range by now, but repulsor lifts were not nearly as conspicuous as ion drives and he was betting the energy burst from the concussion missile would wash out whatever the skips were using for sensors. They were around the horizon before the impact flash had begun to fade. Flying in the total darkness by sensors and instruments alone, Han slipped the Falcon into a deep stress rift, orienting it nose up and using the landing gear to wedge it against the walls so the efflux nacelles would not be damaged. Now what? Leia asked. We wait until they're done searching. You think they'll search? Leia asked. That concussion missile had to leave a pretty convincing crater. Yeah, but that's a big fleet, Han said. They'll search. Then they'll search some more. Han shut down any of the Falcon systems that might leak so much as a photon of energy. Then he and Leia lay back and stared into the darkness. He had purposely selected a rift facing the interior of the Bantha so even the stars were too shrouded in nebula gas to count. It reminded Han of being frozen in carbonite, except that he had not been conscious of time in carbonite. How long do you think we'll have to wait? Leia asked. Longer than we like. Han had a bad feeling about her gasp earlier, and wanted to ask about it, but knew better than to press. 
We'll know. How? We'll get tired of waiting. They were silent some more, then Leia just said it. Anakin's been hurt. Han's heart collapsed like a black hole. Hurt? He began to depress actuator buttons and toggle circuit switches. Even with so many systems shut down and cool, the Falcon's startup sequence was remarkably short. They would be launched and on their way in less than three minutes. Hum. There was frailty in Leia's voice. Where are we going? Huh? Han primed the ion drives and began a twenty-second countdown. Where do you think we're going? I have no idea, Leia said. Because I know you'd never have let Anakin go through with that hyper-crazed surrender plan if there was some other way to reach Mirker. The count reached fifteen, and Han's finger automatically swung over to the actuator and hovered there, waiting for twenty. Then he finally grasped why Leia had waited for the Falcon to cool down before telling him, and stopped counting. There's not another way. He deactivated the primers and began to shut down the rest of the systems, then found the strength to ask, Is it bad? Leia's only response was a nod. Han wanted to do something, protect Anakin or help Leia with what she must be feeling through the Force, but how could he defend a son from a thousand light years away, or assume Leia's burden when he could not even sense the Force, much less feel Anakin's wound through it? At least he's not alone. Han reached over to her and noticed that his hand was trembling. He laid it on her arm anyway. Jane is there, and Jason. Yeah, and Jason. Given Jason's recent moral dilemma over using the Force, Han was not accustomed to thinking of his oldest son in the role of a Jedi warrior. But on Duro, it had been Jason who faced Sabong La and saved Leia's life. The twins will look after him. That's right. Leia nodded absently, her thoughts already back on Mirker, a thousand light years away. He has the twins. The last glow faded from the cockpit displays, and they sat in the dark, alone with their thoughts and still close enough to hear each other breathe. After a time, Han could stand it no longer. I wish I hadn't said those things when Chewbacca died, he said. I really wish I hadn't blamed Anakin. A warm hand found his. That's over, Han. Really. They waited in silence, pondering the same unanswerable questions. How serious? How did it happen? Was he safe now? For what seemed an eternity. Once, Han saw a glimmer of purple cross over the rift but it was so faint and fleeting that he thought it more likely to be a trick of his light-starved eyes than the glow of a Yuzhan Vong cockpit. For the most part, they just sat and waited, not even able to confirm that the New Republic would be sending an attack fleet, since the Falcon's subspace transceiver antenna was shielded by several kilometers of iron asteroid. With the sensor dish pointed into the heart of the Bantha, the one thing they could do to occupy themselves was periodically risk a passive scan to update their data. Eventually, it grew obvious that the Yuzhan Vong were drawing vessels not just from the flotilla that had grabbed Risi, but from active duty stations all over the galaxy. Most of the arriving vessels went straight to the heart of the fleet and lined up to nurse food and munitions at the big ship tenders. Han was relieved to see that the Yuzhan Vong were only marginally faster at the process than his own fleet had been when he was a general. At the rate the enemy was reprovisioning, even the cumbersome New Republic Fleet Command would have time to make a decision. He only hoped they would bring enough ships. The first hint of action came when a sensor sweep showed two skips, almost certainly the pair that had followed them to the asteroid, streaking toward the heart of the Bantha. Shuddering at how many times they had discussed leaving their hiding place, Han activated all passive scanning systems and plotted the results on the main data display. The screen looked as though someone had blasted a nest of killer sting gnats, with frigate and corvette analog Yorick coral vessels boiling out toward the protostar's opposite rim, and more than a hundred cruiser and destroyer analogs moving to the heart of the formation, 
forming a sphere of protection around the enormous ship tenders. It certainly doesn't look like a jump configuration, Leia commented. No, that's their taken-by-surprise configuration, Han said. Store this for analysis. It's not a formation the New Republic has seen before. Han Cold started the repulsor lift drives and lifted the Falcon out of the rift. They had barely cleared the rim before the voice of a communications officer came over the tactical comm unit. Hailing the Millennium Falcon. The energy-absorbing effects of the nebula gas rendered the young woman's voice thready and full of static. Repeat, this is the New Republic scout vessel Gabrielle. Hailing the Millennium Falcon. Please respond on S-Thread 609er. The coordinates don't match the bearing to the battle, Leia said. She tapped the data display, indicating a position a quarter of the way around the circle from where the corvettes and frigates were headed, and on the Risi side of the Bantha. Could the Yuzhan Vong be pulling a friendly hut? If some traitor told them we were out here, why not? A friendly hut was an old imperial tactic, in which they tried to trick their quarry into giving away its position. But we have to take the chance. This is no time to be a coward, not with the war hanging in the balance. Han did not add, and not when our children are risking their own lives. But Leia heard him just the same. As he started to bring the rest of the Falcon's systems online, she activated the subspace transceiver, and entered the coordinates provided. This is the Millennium Falcon. Thank the Force! Wigentilis exclaimed. We've been trying to raise you for an hour. I thought something unfortunate had happened. Han and Leia glanced at each other, but said nothing about Anakin. We had a couple of skips sitting on us. Leia's fingers flew across the computer input. Here's the data we promised. As she spoke, the first bursts of battle static appeared on the sensor display. The assault fleet itself was too distant to be detected through the nebula gas, even with active sensors, but Han could tell by the fire that there were only a few hundred vessels attacking. Still, scores of Yuzhan Vong frigates and corvettes vanished into stars of dispersing energy before they could organize themselves into a picket wall. The Falcon was too distant from the battle to detect anything as small as a starfighter, but Han knew they were present by the sparks of explosion static that appeared all too frequently between the Yuzhan Vong vessels. By now the New Republic fleet had its own surveillance craft watching the battle, but Han and Leia held their position and continued to relay data to the oddly placed command post. In a conflict this size, information was more valuable than ships, and both combatants placed a premium on destroying, blinding, or misleading enemy reconnaissance vessels. That made the Falcon, as an undetected observation asset, more important to the attack than any three Star Destroyers. Slowly, painfully, the Yuzhan Vong frigates and corvettes overcame their initial disorganization and started to hold the starfighters at bay. With this threat brought under control, the big capital ships left their places in the heart of the formation and went forward to support their smaller companions. As they drew into range of the New Republic's own capital ships, bright bars of energy began to flash back and forth across the data display, at times lighting it up so brightly Han could not see anything else. Eventually the battle began to drift in the wrong direction, and Han knew their long wait had been for nothing. He activated the subspace microphone. Wedge, are you getting this? We are, Han, but you're the only asset still showing the situation in the heart of the protostar. Please, stay on station. What for? Han grumbled. Saab didn't bring enough ships. Tell him to break off and save what he can. Negative, Han. Wedge did not sound nearly upset enough. We can't do that. A Yuzhan Vong destroyer analog pressed the attack too hard and erupted into a two-second flare of light and frigates and corvettes continued to vanish at a steady rate. But the battle continued to drift in toward New Republic lines. Soon a discernible gap appeared between the capital ships participating in the attack and those that had remained behind to protect the huge ship tenders, 
In a gesture of what had to be the ultimate disdain for the New Republic commanders, a quarter of the big ships redocked with the supply vessels and continued to reprovision. Now that is just too arrogant, Wedge commented. Admiral Sov needs to teach them a lesson. I hope he scolds better than he counts, Han muttered. Han, Leia cautioned. Han ignored her and continued bitterly. Our message said there were a thousand ships, and more arriving every minute. But I had only nine hundred ready for action, a pinched Sulliston voice said. And your message also said to hurry. Leia closed her eyes and let her chin fall. Admiral Sav, please excuse my husband's impatience. No apology is necessary, Admiral Sav said. We'll be out of contact for eight minutes, but I'm sending you our order of battle. Can you have a tactical update ready when we make contact again? Instead of answering, Leia turned to Han with an expectant expression. Uh, sure thing, Han said. When Leia scowled, he added, Admiral. Good. This from Wedge. And we have a request from Eclipse. They'll be looking for the Yamask and would appreciate any guidance you can give them. Tell them we'll try to narrow the possibilities down to no more than a hundred ships. Han rolled his eyes as Wedge and the Admiral signed off, then turned to Leia. I guess Luke must have found his boarding harpoons. Or had someone make them, Leia said. I only hope they work on your coral. Used legally and illegally across the galaxy by security forces, pirates, and anyone else who wanted to storm a ship, boarding harpoons were a recent development. Basically giant hypodermics filled with coma gas. They melted through a target's hull with a mega-heated tip, then lodged themselves in the hole, extended a flexiglass membrane to seal the vacuum breach, and injected the gas. Depending on a ship's size and recirculation system, everyone aboard could be rendered unconscious in anywhere from a minute to a quarter hour. For the sake of the Jedi who would be using them, Han hoped it would be closer to a minute. They spent the next few minutes scanning the heart of the protostar, identifying high-priority targets, calculating ranges and hit probabilities, estimating how quickly the capital ships on the front line would be able to disengage and return to the heart of the protostar. In less than five minutes, they had a situation report that clearly suggested it would be wise to attack cautiously and conservatively, despite the advantage of surprise. It was not exactly the decisive blow Han had hoped for, but there was no arguing with facts. Then Leia frowned, said something didn't feel right and began to work the computer again. Han scanned and rescanned the entire Bantha, and stared at the data display without blinking. Everything felt right to him. He even managed to narrow the likely Yamask ships down to three destroyer analogs and half a dozen big cruisers. Leia was still working the computer, muttering softly to herself and taking notes in a data pad, when New Republic contacts began to blizzard onto the sensor display jumping almost directly into battle because of the protostar's dispersed mass shadow. By the time Admiral Sov's flagship emerged from hyperspace, the lead vessels were already bleeding starfighters and pouring turbolaser fire into the Yuzhan Vong capital ships. The communications officer quickly established a comlink, and Leia sent the tactical update on an encrypted data channel. While they waited for Wedge and Admiral Sov to digest the new information, Han was surprised to see the Yuzhan Vong capital ships remaining close to the ship tenders instead of rushing out to engage the incoming fleet, and by time for their comrades to return from the forward battle. He opened a voice channel. Wedge, maybe you should have your forward elements hang back. Those rocks are hiding something. Yes, they are, Leia said, finally looking up from her data pad. But don't hang back. Those ships haven't provisioned yet. That's what they're hiding. Admiral Saab was on the channel at once. Are you sure? I am, Admiral. Our computer issued an identifier to each contact, and I just ran a full history of each one. None of them has docked with the tenders. I see, Saab said. Your recommendation would be? Before answering, Leia looked to Han. 
If her analysis was right, the tactics that followed from their report would be too conservative, perhaps even give the enemy a chance to disengage and escape. But if she was wrong, she was not. Han could feel it. He nodded. Leia smiled at him. Then she said, Go for Sabak, Admiral. Our recommendation is bet the fleet. I see. Saab was barely able to choke out that much. Sullistons were seldom happy gamblers. An unusual way to put it, but thank you for your suggestion. Han winced, then checked to make sure they weren't transmitting. That's what's wrong with putting Sullistons in command. They're more interested in building careers than winning battles. Not this one, I think. Leia pointed at the display, where the largest part of the New Republic fleet, including all of the Star Destroyers and most of the cruisers, were peeling away from the ship tenders and fanning out toward the far edge of the Bantha. Their turbo lasers were already flashing, pouring bolts into the rear of the Yuzhan Vong battle line. Several cruiser analogs and two destroyer-sized vessels began to break up instantly. Others quickly followed when they turned to meet this new threat and were assaulted from behind by a now lethal decoy force. The two walls of New Republic ships began to come together, smashing the disorganized Yuzhan Vong between them. In the core of the protostar, a swirling cloud of smaller vessels swarmed the tenders and their escorts. The Yuzhan Vong held their attack until the enemy was almost upon them, then loosed a wave of fire so intense that Han and Leia could actually see the glow, lighting the heart of the Bantha like the star it would one day be. The sensor display required nearly a minute to clear, and when it did, a full quarter of the New Republic contacts had simply vanished. Leia closed her eyes. Han, did I? They're Yuzhan Vong, Leia, he said. You know they're going to fight back. With rocks, if need be. They watched in apprehension as the tender escorts continued to lace the heart of the Bantha with plasma balls and magma missiles sometimes taking whole frigates out in single volleys. Finally, though, the fire began to dwindle, and the destroyer analogs started to take hits. Whole squadrons of New Republic starfighters darted past the lumbering vessels to pelt the defenseless ship tenders with proton torpedoes and concussion missiles. It took only a few minutes of this bombardment before the core of the protostar lit up again, even more brightly, as one supply vessel after another disintegrated in the heat of its own detonating cargo. A few minutes later, Luke's voice came over the comm unit. On, can you come down here? We've got some cargo we need you to drop off at Eclipse. Live cargo? Leia asked. Danny Quee had been trying to capture a live Yamisk since before Booster had told them about the fall of Risi. That's affirmative, Luke reported. Sub back, Han said. Pure sub back. Chapter 38 Anakin's anguished body was screaming for a stop, a trance, any kind of escape. But that was not possible, not with Nomanor and his company coming up the passage. The Yuzhan Vong were hanging behind now, just far enough so even the Barabels had lost their sound. But Anakin could still feel the enemy through the lambent, a cold aura of anger and malice pressing the strike team onward, always pushing, always threatening. The Yuzhan Vong had been back there since the slave city, harrying the Jedi whenever their pace lagged, assailing them with bug attacks and provoking them into firing their weapons. Though the assaults had escalated, Nomanor had not changed tactics. He was still beleaguering the strike team, still wearing it down still trying to take a few prizes alive. And Anakin had given the one-eyed spy no reason to try anything else. He had avoided the trap at the at, at only to wander into the ambush in the slave city like some dust-kicker straight off a moisture farm. Distressed by the plight of the inhabitants, he had allowed Nomanor's impostors to sneak up on the strike team. Now Errol and Joven were dead. Anakin should have remembered Nomanor's predilection for subterfuge and foreseen the attack. Should have at least kept the crowd away from his Jedi. He should have been more careful. He... Jaina thumped him behind the ear. Stop that. 
What? Anakin rubbed his ear, then his concentration slipped, and pain roared through him in waves of fire. And thanks for caring. You can feel sorry for yourself, Jaina said. A thin line stretched diagonally across her forehead, where Tekle had sealed the gash over her eye with synth flesh. You were reckless, Anakin, and you paid the price. And that's not the point. You need to stop blaming yourself. The distant rustle of Yuzhan Vong feet came up the passage. Anakin tried not to let it weaken his concentration and asked, Who should I blame? The war, Jaina said. Do you think Uncle Luke sent us here to train? This is important. If people die, people die. That's a little cold. I'll cry at home. Jaina hazarded a glance over her shoulder, then said, Maybe you made a mistake. Maybe you didn't. But start focusing on the mission, or more people will die. Jaina held his eye for a moment, then the distant rustle of feet grew louder, and they concentrated on running. The strike team passed one of the waist-high tunnels that descended into the warrens of the feral Voxen. According to Lomi and Welk, the ferals were creatures the trainers simply lost. Eventually the beasts found their way to the slave city, the only consistent source of prey in the training maze, and laired in these caves with an irregular shape, acid-pocked walls, and an overpowering stench of decay. The tunnel certainly seemed like something the creatures might have excavated. Everyone except the Barabels donned their breath masks. Anakin wore his for perhaps a thousand steps before he pulled it off and discovered that, while the air was fresher, his breath came no easier. He began to feel feverish and realized that his pain was creeping up on him, eating through his forced defenses. Something serious was wrong. Clearing his mind as he ran, Anakin opened himself completely to the Force. Though hardly a talented healer, he knew his own body well enough to follow the ripples of disturbance down into his wound, to feel that something had come loose inside. He reached under his equipment harness and touched a wet bandage. When he withdrew his hand, his palm was crimson. Anakin! This came from Tahiri, who was, as always, running alongside him. What's that? Nothing. Anakin concentrated on the tear inside, tried to use the force to draw the edges together, and was too weak to concentrate. He stumbled and would have fallen had not Tahiri reached out with the force and levitated him. Need help, she cried. The strike team slowed. Jaina and several others crowding around even as Anakin protested he was all right. Neg that, Tahiri ordered. You're not all right. Not even close. The sound of the Yuzhan Vong feet swelled to tramping. Tekli emerged from somewhere under and between Ganner and Raynar, who were sharing the burden of carrying Errol's body. Keep him levitated, Jaina ordered. She plucked Tekli off the ground and set the Chadrafan astride Anakin's legs, then grabbed his wrist and started up the passage. Everyone, move! Anakin tried to insist that he needed no help, but managed only a gurgle. One of the Barabels dropped a flechette mine to delay the Yuzhan Vong, and the strike team broke into a hard run. Tekle began to undo bandages, her weight barely noticeable on his force-supported legs. The Chadrafan tossed the blood-soaked back to gauze aside, and placed her hand over the wound. The force flowed into Anakin, yet his strength continued to fade. We must stop, Tekli said. No. Anakin's voice was barely a whisper. Can't let. Tekli ignored him. He has internal bleeding. I need to see what's happening. How much time? Jaina asked. That depends on what I find, Tekli said. Fifteen minutes, maybe twice that. The tramping of Yuzhan Vong feet grew steadier, and the force stirred with the familiar hunger of Voxen on the hunt. These were not the free-roaming beasts that had been harassing the Jedi so far, but well-trained creatures kept on leashes by experienced handlers. The strike team had killed three already. If the pack was typical, there would be only one more. Everyone hoped it was a typical pack. 
Alima stared back down the passage toward the approaching threat, then turned to Jaina. I can buy us fifteen minutes. Her voice sounded strangely distant. I need half a dozen concussion grenades. Dimly, Anakin heard Ganner say, Do it, and saw him flip something to the Twi'lek. She danced over to the Barabels, then all four sprinted up the passage ahead of the strike team. Anakin slipped closer to delirium and began to lose his sense of the others in the Force. He could always feel Tahiri at his side, telling him he was going to be fine. He believed her, but could not muster the strength to say so and squeezed her hand instead. Time passed. It couldn't have been much, and the hum of a lightsaber filled the passage. They passed close to Tisar, and Anakin glimpsed Alima, sitting on his shoulders, pushing her silver blade into the ceiling. Behind her, Bella was on her sister's shoulders, using Joven Drark's long blaster to tamp a wad of cloth into a similar hole. Alima took a grenade from Tisar and reached up to push it into the hole she had made. Then Tahiri pulled Anakin around a corner, and he lost sight of what was happening. He heard, clearly, one of the Barabels rasp, six seconds, and knew Tekli was stabilizing him, perhaps even bringing him back. Anakin lifted his head and saw Alima and the Barabels come racing around the corner behind the rest of the team, then heard an all-too-familiar drone coming up the passage. A pair of thud bugs splatted into Alima's back. They failed to penetrate her jumpsuit, but sent her sprawling. Tisar caught her on the run, pulling her into his grasp and continuing up the passage without breaking stride. An instant later a shock wave jolted Anakin, and his earplugs sealed themselves against the roar of falling Yorick coral. Dust billowed off the passage walls, and as the cloud overtook the team, Techley pushed Anakin's breath mask over his face. The Jedi continued another thirty paces and stopped. Tekli had Anakin lowered to the floor and gave Jaina a tube of stink salts to rouse Alima, then pushed her small hands into Anakin's wound and up under his rib cage. He tried not to scream and failed. She continued to work, issuing half-whispered instructions to Tahiri. Anakin looked down once and found Tekli's small arms immersed to the elbow. Darkness closed around the edges of his vision, and he did not look again. The sound of blaster fire began to drift up the passage from the cave-in. Anakin tried to raise his head, only to have his brother push it back down. Don't worry, Jason said. Everyone's well covered. Malima. Hurt? Anakin gasped. Angry. Jason waved in the direction of the battle line, already blasting Yuzhan Vong. And enjoying it. Good reason, Anakin retorted, after easy. Jason raised his hands in surrender. I'm not being judgmental. Anakin winced as a sharp needle pierced something inside. Then he forced up a doubtful brow. Really, I'm not, Jason said. The intensity of the blaster fire at the cave in increased. Then Lobaka roared the announcement of a Voxen kill. Jason glanced toward the joyful sound uneasily, then said, Am I worried about what's happening to us? Sure. This war is bringing out all that's selfish and wicked in the New Republic, corrupting the galaxy star by star. I see it pulling one Jedi after another to the dark side, making us fight to win instead of protect. But I can't push others down my path. Everyone needs to choose for themselves. Center point taught me that much. Fooled me. Fooled myself, Jason said. I thought I was the only one who knows the difference between right and wrong. I realized that wasn't true. Actually, Tenel Ka pointed it out, after what I said on the exquisite death. I've been trying to apologize to you since. Really? Anakin grimaced, as one of Tekli's tiny hands brushed an organ that did not like being brushed. Didn't know. Jason flashed a lopsided solo grin. I figured. The zipping sound of blasters gave way to the snap hiss of lightsabers, and Anakin raised his head. Atop the rubble pile, a solid line of colored blades was dancing against the darkness beyond. Got to go. 
He pushed himself to his elbows. Not getting anyone else killed. Except yourself if you don't let me finish. Tekli snapped. She nodded to Tahiri, who promptly pushed Anakin back down. We can leave in a few seconds. Anakin dared to look and found the Chadrafan coating the interior of his wound with salve. He was alarmed to discover he no longer felt her working. You numbed me, he asked. To help with the pain. Tekli took a pad of Bactagauze from Tahiri and packed it into the wound. But I can only do so much. You need a healing trance. Anakin nodded. When we're done. Tekle looked up, her flattish nose twitching. Sooner. Much sooner. Sooner? Tahiri echoed. She glanced back toward the fight on the rubble pile. But healing trances take hours, even days. Tekle ignored her and continued to speak to Anakin. Your spleen was punctured. She looked back to her work, joining the edges of the wound with thread instead of synth flesh, in case she needed to reopen it. I closed the hole, but it will continue to seep until you enter a trance and heal it yourself. How's he going to do that? Tahiri demanded. We can't stop, not with the Yuzhan Vong so close. There was an uneasy silence as the situation grew clear. Jason tightened his lips to keep them from trembling, and reached out to Anakin through the force, trying to reassure him. Tahiri grabbed Tekli by the arm and pulled her to her feet. Do something. Use the force. The Chadrafan laid a comforting hand over the one holding her arm. I have. We must start with what's possible, Jason said, pulling Tahiri away. Maybe we'll find a way to buy enough time. Not by staying here, Anakin said. He felt more guilty than frightened. It was his wound placing the mission, and his companions' lives, at risk. He rolled to his elbows and sat upright, grimacing when Tekli's back to numb proved weaker than he had expected. He activated his comlink, then said, Prepare to break off. Buy some space. Carrying with her one arm, Tenel Ka used the force to pluck a fragmentation grenade from her harness and activate the thumb switch, then sent it hurling past her opponent. Two seconds later, it exploded with a brilliant flash, and the battle din quieted to a rumble. Labaka, Alima, Ganner, Lomi, Raynar, you first, Anakin commanded. The five Jedi leapt backward off the rubble pile, flipping through the air and landing safely out of the reach of their foes. Anakin assigned Alima, Lomi, and Ganner to cover the others, then motioned Lobaka and Raynar up the passage to gather their dead, Errol and Joven. Where? Raynar demanded. Errol's body isn't here. Neither is Joven's. What? Anakin glanced back to find Raynar and Lobaka standing over a pair of bloodstains. They're gone? Lobaka rumbled indeed they were, then squatted to inspect some marks on the floor. He rumbled something more. Master Labaka wishes to inquire whether the feral Voxen might have taken them. To this fairly accurate translation, MTD added his own opinion. I must say it hardly seems possible. Not from beneath our very noses. Anakin turned to Jason, who had already closed his eyes and reached out to the ferals through the Force. There are four, no, five, moving up the passage ahead of us. They seem, uh, excited. Excited? Alima asked, turning her attention forward. How? The cacophony atop the rubble pile grew suddenly louder, and Anakin looked up to see Yuzhan Vong's silhouettes clambering into the gaps between his friends. Later, Alima, Anakin said, keep covering. He activated his comlink. Break off, everyone. As the rest of the Jedi battle line stepped off the rubble pile, Anakin grabbed his brother's arm and pulled himself to his feet, and instantly collapsed. It was as if a lance had pierced his heart, and he screamed so loud, his voice echoed back to him a dozenfold. Then Jason and Tahiri had him under the arms, dragging him half a dozen steps down the passage before they levitated him into the air. 
Bugs swarmed down from the top of the rubble pile, drawing angry curses as they splattered against the strike team's armored jumpsuits. Someone thumbed a remote, triggering the mines planted on opposite sides atop the rubble pile, and the bug storm fell silent. Anakin glanced back to see the area clouded in blast shrapnel, the fragments burying themselves two millimeters deep in bare flesh, Bundoon crab armor, or even your coral before detonating again. The Yuzhan Vong literally vanished in a fog of detonite fume and blood spray. The anguish in Anakin's chest subsided and was quickly replaced by a different kind, coming to him through the battle meld, a heavier, sadder pain that could be described only as sorrow. He swung his feet around, breaking Tahiri's force grip, and began to run alongside the others. A large barabelle body was floating between her hatchmates, being pulled along by her arms. The amphistaff that had felled her still wagged between her shoulder blades. Bella. Anakin half turned toward Jason. Is she... There was no need to finish the question. He could feel that she was dead, knew that the amphistaff buried in her back was the source of the pain that had driven him down earlier. He had let another Jedi die. Worse, had not even noticed until she was gone. Yet again, he had failed his strike team. Nomanor's muted voice shouted an order somewhere on the other side of the rubble heap, and a muffled clatter rolled up the passage as warriors began to clamber over the bodies of their fallen comrades. Jason took Anakin's arm. Let Tahiri lift. No. Anakin jerked free. Not again. It was my wound. I forced us to stop. Lobaka triggered a second set of mines, and again the rubble pile quieted. By now the strike team was around the corner, out of sight of their pursuers and opening a substantial lead. Anakin drew heavily on the force and made himself keep pace. He was weakening, and he knew by his friend's anxious glances how obvious it was. But he would not let Tahiri tire herself for him. Not anyone. No more Jedi were going to die because of him. Not even Dark Jedi. It was not even a minute before Anakin felt the Yuzhan Vong gaining ground again. There was no ambush, no trap that would delay them. No Manor just kept coming, forcing the Jedi onward, soaking up munitions with his warriors' bodies and drawing down power packs with their lives. And the Jedi could do nothing to slow him, could only keep running. A sour stench began to fill the passage. Everyone but Tisar and Krosov donned their breath masks. They rounded the corner and saw Errol's red hair disappearing into a low, jagged tunnel on the right. Raynar raced forward and dropped to his knees, screaming for the Voxen to release her, reaching inside its acid-melted lair. Anakin stretched out with the Force and plucked him back into the main passage. Hey! Raynar yelled, flailing. A low burping sound erupted from the lair, and a spray of sticky acid shot out into the passage. Raynar stopped struggling. Uh, thanks. He glanced over. Anakin, you can put me down. I'm not going in there. Are you certain? Alima went over to the tunnel and, cautiously, stooped in front of it, peering inside. This is exactly where we need to go. You've gone space-happy, Welk said. Twi'leks, do not go space-happy, Alima replied mildly. The distant sound of Yuzhan Vong feet began to rustle up the passage. Alima held her palm over the tunnel entrance, then pulled it away, and looked up the main passage. Has anyone else noticed that we have been circling around something? Anakin shook his head with the others. We'll have to trust your instincts on that, he said. As a Twi'lek, Alima's sense of direction was undoubtedly more accurate than that of anyone else. Her species inhabited a vast warren of underground cities on the inhospitable planet Ryloth. What are you thinking? This hole is breathing. Eyes twinkling, she took Anakin's hand and held it in the steady breeze that carried the foul stench from the Voxen tunnel. It goes somewhere big and it bisects whatever we're circling around. It could be a shortcut. Not one we can use, Jason said, 
The Voxen are protecting something down there. I'm trying to make them think they need to stay with it. The sound of tramping began to roll up the passage. They all glanced back toward their unseen pursuers. Ganner said, Then you make the Voxen leave instead. He turned to Anakin. We've got to do something. Even before Anakin turned to ask if what Ganner suggested was possible, Jason gave an almost imperceptible shake of his head. Anakin looked to Lomi. What's down there? The Dark Jedi shrugged. Voxen, I'm sure. But the snakehead may be right. It could be a shortcut. There are more tunnels like this one near the gate. Gate? Anakin was already imagining the difficulty of fighting through a company of gate guards with no Manor rushing them from behind. A guarded gate? Lomi nodded. You can be certain. Anakin began to feel sick. There was no way. No escape. The tramping grew louder. Anakin? Ganner asked. There's no choice, Jaina said, inserting herself between the two. We need time for your healing trance. We are unlikely to buy much time in a cavern full of Voxen, Tenelka observed. Quite the opposite, I am sure. Anakin glanced guiltily in Bella's direction. He knew what he wanted to do, but he had been wrong so many times on this mission, and every time someone fell. Now he had to choose again. No matter what he decided, more Jedi would die. Maybe they all would. Young Solo? Lomi inquired. We are waiting. Anakin turned to Jason. What do? Thanks for asking, Jason interrupted, not quite hiding his surprise. He took a thermal detonator from his equipment harness and dropped to his hands and knees in front of the foul-smelling tunnel. But you know what we need to do. I think we all do. Chapter 39 The smell was more sweet than rank, at least to Savang La, whose limb was the one rotting. The raw dank leg with which the shapers had replaced his arm was overbonding to his elbow. The aggressive linking cells attacking and killing his own tissue well above the amputation point. Scales and spines were already emerging as high up as his swollen biceps, and above that his arms swarmed with the diptera maggots, seeded by the shapers to eat away his dying flesh. If the alteration stopped at his shoulder, he would be accorded the respect of one who had sacrificed much and risked more in his devotion to the gods. If it continued onto his torso proper, or he lost the arm itself, he would be excused from his duties and shunned by his caste as a shamed one, disfigured by the gods as a sign of their displeasure. Savong La suspected that where the alteration stopped would depend on how long he allowed the loss of his Risi fleet to delay the capture of Coruscant, and that, in turn, depended on how long it required Nomanor and Vergir to capture the Solo twins. With half his assault force now gone, and the possibility—no, likelihood—that the Jedi had captured a live Yamask, he did not dare attack until he had secured the blessing of the gods. His mind made up, the war master grasped a villip resting beside him and began to tickle it awake. Though he was sitting naked in the purifying steams of his private cleansing well, Savang La did not bother to cover himself. The villip in his servant's possession would show only a head. After an irritating wait of nearly a minute, the villip reverted into the likeness of a huffing gnome Anor. Giving the executor no opportunity to apologize for making him wait, Savang La scowled. I trust you are chasing the Jedi, Nomanor, and not fleeing them. Never, the executor assured him. Even as we speak, I am leading the Kastar's two scourge in pursuit. Will you catch them? Yes, Nomanor said. We are taking casualties, but... Three scourges waiting in ambush at the end of this transit. There is no escape this time. The casualties did not interest Savang La. He had already heard how many vessels the Jedi had destroyed above Mirker, and how they had slain the Kastar's first company, one scourge, to a warrior, and he would have considered twice the losses insignificant. 
You will not harm the twin solos. It had to be the fourth or fifth time Sabong La had given the order. But now more than ever, he wanted no Manor to understand. Your warriors understand the fate awaiting the one who kills either of them? As I do, War Master, no Manor said. The twins are forbidden targets. I have also commanded Yalfath to have his own troops stand off, though he bristles at my authority. It would be wise of you to underscore the order. As you suggest, Sovong La agreed, ignoring for the moment his servant's audacity in telling him what to do. I need those sacrifices, Numanor. Our situation is deteriorating while I wait for you. You will not need to wait much longer, War Master, Numanor promised. My plan is an excellent one. That would be healthy for you, Savong La warned. I expect to hear from you soon. He pressed his thumb into the billop's cheek, causing it to break contact and invert. The War Master set this one aside and picked up Vicky Shesh's, considering whether the time had come to expend this particular asset. Since her removal from the New Republic's Military Oversight Committee, she had been working doubly hard to prove her usefulness to the Yuzhan Vong. Less out of greed or power lust, Savong La thought, than a simple thirst for vengeance. Such weapons tended to be very explosive, which could be good or bad, depending on when they were detonated. The steam cell door spiraled open behind him. Admitting a cool draft that wafted pleasantly across his naked back. Without turning around, he snapped. Did I not say I was cleansing? How dare you disturb me? My life in payment, War Master. The voice belonged to Seif, his female communications assistant. But the choice was not mine. Lord Shimmer's villa has averted. Not bothering to cover himself, Sabong La stood and turned, already reaching for the kufi Seif held ready for him. Except in circumstances involving breeding, it was forbidden for a subordinate to look upon his naked body and live. But when he saw her eyes flickering away from the suppurating flesh above his graft, he left the weapon in her hand. If he killed her now, the gods might well believe that he was simply trying to keep the condition of his arm a secret. Savang La studied the communications officer a moment, pushed the kufi away and narrowed his eyes in a way that left no doubt about his intentions. You will prepare yourself. Yes, War Master. Her face betraying no hint of whether she considered this a better fate than death, Seif returned the kufi to its sheath and inclined her head. I will await you in your chamber. After she stepped aside, Savong La left his steam cell and draped a cloak over his shoulder hooks, taking care to keep the sleeve well above his elbow, so that the condition of his graft would be visible to all. He found Lord Shimra's villa set out on the table, its features cloaked in obscurity beneath the cow-like protrusion of an epidermal mane. The warmaster touched his breast in salute, and placed his palm and new talon on the table in front of the villa, then pressed his forehead to the back of his hands. Supreme One, he said, forgive the delay. I was cleansing. The gods value the pure. Shimra's voice was a wispy rumble, but also the triumphant. What of this fleet you lost? The gods have reason to be displeased. The loss was total. Six clusters. An expensive feint, my servant. Samung La's throat went dry. Supreme One, it was no, I am sure your plan warrants the sacrifice. Shimra said, cutting him off, that is not why we are speaking. Indeed. Savong did not try to correct Shimra. If the Supreme Overlord declared the fleet's loss a feint, then it was so. 
The War Master's mind leapt immediately to the problem of shattering Coruscant's formidable defenses with only a single-pronged attack. Perhaps a variation of the mind-sweeping moon he had intended to use at Borlias, or something involving refugee ships. Refugee ships would be good. The Fuhrer over the hostages at Talfalio had proven how vulnerable to such techniques the New Republic really was. As the rough outline of an idea began to take shape in the War Master's mind, he said, I assure you my plan is an excellent one, Supreme One, but I am honored to speak with you regarding any matter. Before continuing, Shimmer hesitated just long enough to express his displeasure without speaking it, then said, The success of your new grafting is in doubt. It is so. Savongla answered. He did not ask, even of himself, how Lord Shimra knew of his troubles with the Rodank leg. I fear my arm may have offended the gods. It is not your arm, my servant. I saw nothing of that. Savongla remained quiet, desperately trying to work out in his own mind whether Shimra's vision was the reason they were speaking, or merely the excuse. It is the twins, my servant, Shimmer said. The gods will give us Coruscant, and you will give them these twins. It will be so, Supreme One, Savongla said. Even now, my servants are running them to ground. You are certain? Shimmer asked. The gods will not be disappointed again. My servants assure me their plan is an excellent one. It did not escape Savongla's notice that Nomanor's words had been much the same as his own to Lord Shimra. There is no escape. Let it be so. Shimra was silent for a moment, then said, See and be seen, my servant. Savong raised his head, but said nothing. He had been invited to look, not speak. Know this, Savongla, Shimra said, in allowing your villa tender to live, you have kept for yourself one who should belong to the gods. Savongla went cold inside. Supreme One, this is so. But it was not my intention. It pleases the gods to let you keep her. Do not insult them by explaining what they know. Shimra's villip began to invert. Use her well, my servant. All things are forgiven in victory. Chapter 40 Tattooed sparsely beneath his sagging eyes and bearing no mutilations except a hole beneath his lip that looked like a second mouth, the Yuzhan Vong was clearly a raw recruit, probably assigned to point duty for the sole purpose of drawing fire. Praying that the shadows in the tunnel were deep enough to hide her, Jaina used the force to press her back more tightly to the ceiling. She held her breath as the warrior crawled another meter into the cave. Holding an activated lambent at arm's length, he used his amphistaff to prod the floor beneath Jaina. She could see the weapon's snakish shape, and knew her own silhouette had to be just as visible, but the Yushan Vong did not look up. He merely gagged on the stench of the place and retreated. When he reached the entrance, he rose and yelled, Foss, and continued up the main passage. Jaina remained where she was, watching Von Doon crab-armored legs march past, desperately hoping the next thing to peer inside would not be a voxen. Though they had already killed four of the beasts, Labaka had blasted the last one at the cave -in. The possibility that Nomanor had brought more than the standard number was the one weak point in the strike team's plan. The Yuzhan Vong could be expected to miss the Jedi's detour, but a Voxen could not. A Voxen could feel the change of direction. A second Yuzhan Vong, this time with the fringed earlobes and heavily branded face of a veteran, thrust his lambent crystal into the jagged tunnel. Like most of the Jedi on the strike team, Jaina had toyed with the idea of capturing one of the crystals, but it was certainly not worth the risk. Anakin's bond to his was unique, 
no doubt because of his role in growing it, and even he doubted that he could recreate the feat. Certainly, no one in the Eclipse program had even been able to figure how the things reproduced. This time, the warrior searched the ceiling as well as the floor, but he rose and continued up the main passage without crawling inside. Finally allowing herself a full breath, Gina removed the flechette mine from her equipment harness. She set the signal feature to their comlink frequency and attached it to the ceiling in front of her. She did not activate it. Once she set the detonation selector to motion, she would have only three seconds to leave sensor range, and she could not risk moving until all the Yuzhan Vong had gone by. The company seemed to take forever to pass. Without their pet Voxen to warn when Jedi were near, they moved warily, keeping a five-meter interval and looking for booby traps. Despite everything, the strike team remained alive, mobile, and, with a little help from the Force, capable of destroying the Queen. Were Anakin in one piece, Jaina would have considered that a victory in itself. She alternated between being scared for her brother and furious with him. She could not really blame Anakin for coming to her rescue. She would have done the same for him or Jason. But she did. It had been a reckless and typically Anakin thing to do. Spectacular. Rash. Effective. Foolish. Techley had made clear what would happen if they didn't find time to let him heal, and Anakin had made it just as clear that they were to place the mission above his life. Gina was determined to do both. But if she had to make a choice, well, she had only two brothers, and she did not intend to leave either one behind. Jaina felt Jason reaching out to her through their twin bond, and knew that, somewhere deeper in the tunnel, the others had encountered the first of the feral Voxen. She opened herself to the battle meld, and was relieved to discover that Anakin's wound had drawn the group back together, though Zek remained resentful about the Dark Jedi. And the others were distracted by concern for Anakin. Worried that any battle sounds from behind her would reverberate into the main passage, she summoned to mind the stillness of a Masasi temple, and used the Force to expand this silence outside herself, creating, she hoped, a sphere of quiet between her companions and the Yuzhan Vong. Another set of Vondun crab-armored legs passed the mouth of the tunnel. A pair of thin, reverse-articulated legs arrived next. They paused, pulled it down on themselves, and lowered a feathered torso into view. Jaina had to calm herself for fear that her pounding heartbeats would break the sphere of silence. A simian face with slanted eyes and delicate whiskers appeared atop the feather ball and peered into the tunnel. Vergier, or some being like her. An alien presence touched Jaina's mind, startling her so badly she lost her concentration and dropped a hand's breadth before she regained composure and lifted herself back to the ceiling. She leveled her blaster pistol at Vergier's face. A wry smile crossed the odd being's lips, and Jaina knew Vergier had touched her on purpose. But how? Through the Force? It didn't seem possible. If Vergier was a Force-wielder, then the Voxen would hunt her as well. Wouldn't they? A thicket of Vondun crab-armored legs gathered outside the tunnel. The silence barrier prevented Jaina from hearing whether the Yuzhan Vong were speaking, but she did not doubt that Vergier knew of her proximity, even if she had not actually seen her. The alien presence was still touching her, taunting her, almost daring her to attack. Jaina activated the flechette mine, then pushed herself back out of sensor range. Vergier's smile changed to a smirk, and the alien touch faded from Jaina's mind so quickly she began to wonder if she had felt it at all. Vergier spoke to someone behind her. Jaina thumbed off her blaster safety lock, but her target turned and hopped up the passage before she could fire. The Yuzhan Vong followed, and then even the memory of the alien touch dwindled away. Jaina lowered her blaster and, shaking so hard she had to use both hands, re-engaged the weapon's safety lock. She did not understand why she was so frightened. The creature had not even known she was there.
The other end of the Voxen Tunnel opened into a grand corridor, six or seven meters high, and wide enough to be a hover car lane, but still dank and foul-smelling. Even in the small area lit by Jason's glow stick, it curved away noticeably but gently, vanishing into darkness at both ends. The wall opposite the strike team's hiding place was breached by a pair of archways, set about twenty meters apart, and each large enough for a ranker. Between these arches stood wookie-sized alcoves containing sculptures of the Yuzhan Vong's bulbous-headed, many-tentacled god of war, Yun Yamka. Above every alcove hung another alcove, empty and upside down, with the top pointing at the floor. Once, Lomi had explained, the giant world ship had spun on an axis, generating artificial gravity through centrifugal force, just as smaller versions did. Sometime during the journey between galaxies, the central brain had lost its ability to control the spin, breaking off the vessel's spiral arms and destabilizing the whole system. The shapers had switched to Dovin basal induced gravity, forcing the entire world ship to reorient its concept of up and down. There were a few places, such as this, where signs of the transition remained. Through the archways whispered the ceaseless rustling of scales and, occasionally, the belch of an angry voxen. Jason could feel more than a dozen of the creatures lurking in the darkness just beyond the light of his glow stick, as patient as spice, spiders, and far more deadly. Looks like the outside of an arena, Anakin whispered. He was lying on the tunnel floor next to Jason. A really big one. Or a temple, Lomi said. She and Ganner were squatting on their haunches above the brothers' feet, with Tisar and Kossov stooped behind them, and everyone else waiting deeper in the cramped tunnel. If Jason can use his power to keep the Grand Corridor clear, perhaps we can sneak. We can't, Anakin interrupted. One way or another, we have to fight. How many, Jason? Too many. Jason could not perceive individual creatures well enough to make an accurate count, but he could sense them hiding in the cavity of darkness beyond the archways, scattered along the slopes of a bowl-shaped depression that felt easily a kilometer across. He recognized in most of the creatures the same determination to defend their territory that he had sensed in many species but there was something fanatic about it, the suggestion of a familiar kind of selfless devotion. Nests. The outline of a plan began to form in Jason's mind. They're defending their nests. Nests? Lomi demanded. What do clones need with— Anakin silenced her with a raised hand. Let him concentrate. Not too long, Ganner said from somewhere in back. Sooner or later, even no Manor will notice we've slipped away. Jason focused on the Voxen across the way and sensed not protectiveness, nor even hunger, but something closer to longing. One by one, he reached out to the other creatures beneath the arches and, perceiving a similar craving, knew he had guessed right. He backed deeper into the tunnel and faced Tisar and Kossov. I have an idea. Do it. Tisar rasped. Bella will be honored. Do what? Welk demanded, looking from one Jedi to another. How come nobody around here ever finishes a sentence? No time, Ganner said. Let's go. The Yuzhan Vong have got to have noticed we're gone. Jason ignored him and asked Krossov. You understand? She gave her life to the Jedi, Krossov said. She and Tisar squeezed aside, then levitated their hatchmate forward in between them. Her body is nothing. They rubbed their muzzles briefly against hers, then removed Bella's equipment harness and vac suit pack. Tisar set the timer of a Class A thermal detonator to four minutes, then secured it deep within her reptilian throat. Kossoff affixed her sister's lightsaber in hand with synth flesh, and they exchanged places with Lomi and Ganner and floated Bella's body into the Grand Corridor. Choking back tears, and wondering if he could have done the same thing had it been Anakin's body, Jason watched in horror 
as more than a dozen feral voxen rushed into the light of his glow stick. The creatures filled the corridor with sonic screeches, and his earplugs activated. Tisar used the force to ignite Bella's lightsaber and slice the muzzle off the first voxen to reach her body. The second bit the arm off at the shoulder. The third bowled the corpse over and straddled it. The other voxen hurled themselves into this one, snarling and snapping at its legs. Several together caught hold and dragged the beast down the corridor where the battle erupted into a vicious acid-belching melee that reduced the combatants to smoking heaps of scales. The rest continued in a more restrained manner, each trying to straddle Bella's body, the others fighting to unseat the current possessor, slowly dragging her down the corridor toward one of the archways. The battle moved into the darkness, and the strike team was left to listen as the snarling and hissing grew more distant and muffled. Finally, the crackle of a thermal detonator shattered the quiet, and a brilliant glare flashed through an archway far down the corridor. Jason reached out to the Voxen with soothing thoughts, trying to reassure them the light would not come again. The surviving creatures, and it felt like there were plenty, greeted his efforts with sonic squeals and clattering claws, but gradually settled down and returned to their nests. Jason checked to make sure no Voxen lurked in ambush, then led the way out into the grand corridor. The stench was so bad that even his breath mask could not filter it out. He reached out to summon Jaina and felt her already approaching, apprehensive and baffled, but not panicked. Anakin joined the Barabels and began to speak with them quietly, though Jason knew Tisar and Kossoff would be more unsettled by an apology than gratified by it. He kept his distance. Anakin needed his talk with the Barabels. Maybe they would do for him what Jason could not. Jane arrived, and, at Ganner's insistence, the team set off up the corridor. Anakin reluctantly allowed Tisar and Kossoff to assume their usual position in front, though only because they appeared insulted by the suggestion that it was someone else's turn at point. Every thirty meters, another archway led into the rustling darkness. Though Jason never perceived more voxen lurking in these openings, the Barabels took no chances. They always leapt onto the wall and, extending their claws to hold themselves in place, peered through the opening to be certain. Jason stepped to his sister's side. Everything okay back there? You seem uneasy. Fact, Tenelka said, joining them. You have more furrows between your eyebrows than a hut's purser. Thanks, Jaina said. I saw Vergeer. Jason waited, then finally asked, And? Jaina's eyes went vacant. And nothing. She left. She pointed her chin ahead. How's little brother doing? Jason looked forward to where Anakin was keeping pace with Lobaka's long stride. Their brother was so powerful in the Force that it was difficult to tell how much pain he was burying, or how much strength he was burning. But Jason could feel the fatigue nipping at the edges of Anakin's carefully maintained facade of vigor. Hard to know, he said. I'm scared. Jaina fell quiet, then surprised Jason by grasping his arm. Don't be. We're not going to let anything happen to him. Tenel Ka took Jason's other arm. Fact. Anakin followed Tisar and Kossoff up the Grand Corridor. Every time they leapt onto a wall to peer around the haunch of an archway, he cringed. His efforts to explain how sorry he was about Bella's death had only bewildered them, prompting the pair to apologize to him for the strike team's other casualties. He had ended up feeling more guilty than before and the Barabels had seemed vaguely affronted by the idea they might need comforting. Reminding the hatchmates to be careful was out of the question, but the force in the immense chamber beyond the arches was full of brutish agitation, and he kept expecting a mass of brown bile to blast one or both of them. Instead, he felt a sudden surge of primal longing. Anakin ignited his lightsaber and, along with everyone else, shouted, a pair of open jaws darted into view. Kossoff hissed and pulled back, 
not quickly enough. A tooth snagged her breath mask and tore it free. Anakin jumped forward, slashed the voxen under the jaw, reversed strokes and cut off the muzzle. The creature reared, then Tisar and Krasov swung down in front of him and severed its swiping claws. What remained of the voxen's jaws began to open. Krasov dragged her white blade across its throat, then staggered back, her face covered with gummy acid. Tisar used the force to hold the reeling voxen upright as Anakin drove his lightsaber into its chest and spun away, pulling his purple blade through its body. The voxen went limp and hung suspended in the air. Kossoff's face was masked by rising fumes, but the sizzle of melting carrot and left no doubt about what was happening to her. Tisar, she gasped. My eyes. Here, Kossoff. Leaving the voxen to fall, Tisar pulled her out of the archway. A loud clatter sounded from the darkness beyond. Anakin pulled a thermal detonator off his harness and threw it well down into the room. There was a familiar sizzle and a bright flash, but no shockwave or heat blast. Precision was what made thermal detonators so useful. Everything within the blast radius was utterly disintegrated. Everything beyond remained completely untouched. When Anakin sensed no more Voxen charging the door, he turned to call Tekli and found her already guiding Kossoff to a seat against the wall. The Chadrafan began to scrape off the sticky bile with the blade of a multi-tool. Too many scales came with it. Anakin looked away, said nothing. Every decision cost someone something. Their mission began to seem distant and impossible. Trouble coming! Anakin barely heard Jason's words. He did not want to make any more decisions, cause any more casualties. Anakin? He felt Jason probing, checking to see if the battle had caused his wound to open. It had not. The pain remained bearable, and the force gave Anakin strength. A muffled rustling came down the corridor from both directions. Sith blood, Jaina cursed. He's cracking. Someone fired a blaster. Someone else fired in the other direction. The force became permeated with primal longing, and Voxen poured into the Grand Corridor to both sides of the strike team. The blaster fire grew deafening. Anakin drew his own weapon. It would be easier this way. No decisions to make. All he had to do was aim and fire. Anakin started forward, and Lobaka clamped hold of his shoulder and pointed toward the arch at their backs and groaned a question. Anakin shook his head. Tahiri can keep watch. I'm fighting with everyone else. Better if you watch, Tisar rasped. He pushed Anakin toward the arch. For Krasov. I'm not hurt. Anakin followed the barabel toward the battle line. I can still fight. Anakin, will you stay? Jaina pointed her blaster into the arch. Get yourself together. Though spoken softly, the words struck Anakin like a fist. His own sister did not want him fighting at her side. Had he bungled things that badly? Jaina joined the others on the firing lines. Anakin squatted behind the dead Voxen and stared into the rustling darkness, alert to any change in sound or in the force that meant more creatures coming. Though hardly as sensitive to the beasts as Jason— he could tell that most of the creatures on the other side of the archway were bloodthirsty but defensive, and almost stationary. "'You don't have to let them push you around,' Tahiri said, dropping to her knees and almost yelling to make herself heard above the battle roar. "'You're still team leader.' "'Some leader,' Anakin said. Tahiri waited almost a full second before demanding, "'What's that mean?' I keep getting people killed. People are getting killed. Who says it's your fault? I do. Anakin glanced toward the battle. They do. Neg that. They just want you to get us out of here. A concussion grenade shook the corridor and was answered by a dozen sonic screeches. So do I. Think of something. Fast. Tahiri kissed him and turned toward the battle her blaster drawn. So far, the bolt storm was holding the Voxen at bay, but that would change. It would change soon. 
Several Jedi were already drawing down their last power packs, and eventually the Voxen would mount an attack through Anakin's archway, unless the strike team left first. Tisar rasped a curse, hurled his mini-cannon at a Voxen, and summoned Krosov's weapon to hand. His target sprang at his head, claws lashing. Raynar Thule caught the creature on a hissing lightsaber, opened a three-meter slash down its belly, then leapt away, into the path of its lashing tail. The barb penetrated. Raynar winced and retreated into the Jedi ranks, severing the tail a meter from his jumpsuit and leaving the stump to hang. Anakin spun to call Tekli and found her scurrying forward, antidote in hand. They had to move. They had to move soon. Anakin turned his glow stick to maximum and tossed it through the archway, catching it with the force and holding it high in the air. The Voxen belched acid at it, but settled down as they grew accustomed to the radiance. Anakin glimpsed many dozen creatures, probably not a hundred, spread over the tiers of a vast stadium. Most were squatting over the corpses of slaves they had dragged in from the city, glaring and ruffling their neck scales at each other. No way to levitate across that. Jedi could not fly, after all, and the distance had to be more than a kilometer. Maybe if they used their force acrobatics... Jason came to Anakin's side, and, sensing the drift of his thoughts through the battle meld, peered into the arena. We don't want to startle them. They won't leave their, uh, nests unless they feel threatened. I might be able to keep them from attacking at all. Good, Anakin said. It'd be nice if something went right. He turned to find Ganner pointing toward an acid-melted Voxen tunnel just up the corridor and yelling that they had to make a run for it. Afraid he wouldn't be heard over the battle roar, Anakin activated his comlink. Right idea, Ganner. Wrong direction. He pointed through the archway. This way. The arena? This from Jaina. You can't heal... I'll heal when this is done, Anakin interrupted. What he wouldn't do was hole up in some Voxen tunnel and get everyone trapped. This way. Tsar Sabatine was the first to nod. As you order. He laid a barrage of covering fire. Fall back. Bobaka did the same for those facing the opposite direction, and Jason led the way into the arena, dropping the battle meld so he could concentrate on soothing Voxen. The closest creatures ruffled their scales and scratched furrows into their tears. They also remained in their nests and did not attack. Anakin let out a breath and turned to Krosov. Though her face was covered by Bella's breath mask, plenty of bones and teeth showed around the rim. Anakin caught Tekli's eye and raised his brow. Not this time, little brother. Krosov's voice was barely a croak. Allow this one to cover your... Departure. No, Anakin said. We'll toss a detonator back. Too late. Kossoff opened her hand to reveal a thermal detonator, few set to ignite three seconds after her thumb left the trigger. This is better. Alimarar slipped past, pulling a stuporous Raynar Thul along. His condition was due to the antidote, not the poison. Anakin sent Tekli after the pair and laid covering fire for Lubaka. Krosov, secure that trigger, Anakin ordered. Half a dozen Voxen came boiling down the corridor. He dropped the leader with a bolt to the eye. Krosov? Krosov is gone. Tisar tossed a concussion grenade into the rest of the pack, and as the blast rocked the corridor, kneeled to press his cheek to Krosov's. He held it there until the residual acid began to make his own scales smoke then rose and pointed to her thumb, now barely holding the trigger. This one thinks we should hurry. Chapter 41 Anakin ducked through the arch into the arena, Tisar close on his heels. The rest of the strike team was already three tiers below, lighting their way with glow sticks and nervously snaking past a nesting voxen. The two Jedi started after them, circling around a forty-meter crater that Anakin had made moments earlier with a thermal detonator. 
A tumult of snarling and bellowing rumbled through the arch behind them, prompting Anakin and Tisar to launch themselves headlong down the tiers. The thermal detonator Kossuth had been clutching when she died would go off three seconds after the ravaging Voxen knocked it from her lifeless hand. Something tore inside Anakin's wound and sent a half-numbed pain shooting up through his belly. He ignored it and completed his somersault, then landed, dead-legged, two tears below, and tumbled over the edge. Two things happened next. First, the Voxen that he had disturbed took offense and opened its mouth to spew acid. Second, the thermal detonator went off above him, flashing a fan of white brilliance across the arena and disintegrating a forty-meter length of wall and bringing untold tons of Yorick coral crashing down into the arena. Anakin was a lot more worried about the angry Voxen. Fumbling for his lightsaber, he rolled away and leapt to his feet, only to find the beast scratching at its own throat, mysteriously choking on its tongue and dribbling brown acid out the side of its mouth. A dark shiver raced down his spine, and he turned to find Welk standing behind him, one hand curled into a strangling claw, his face contorted into an angry mask of concentration. Jason needs everybody down. Tenelka's hushed voice came over the comlink. Stay low and silent. Anakin obeyed quickly. Welk less so, and Anakin watched in silence as the dark Jedi used the Force to strangle the life out of the creature. Certainly, neither Anakin nor anyone else on the strike team would have used the Force to kill directly. Calling upon its power to extinguish the very life that sustained it was a certain path to the dark side. But Anakin would have been hard-pressed to call it immoral. Had the situation been reversed, he would not have hesitated to use a blaster or lightsaber to save Welk. As the rumble of falling Yorick Coral faded away, the Voxen continued to snarl and scratch at the Yorick Coral beneath their feet. Anakin felt Jason reaching out with the Force, soothing the beasts with reassuring thoughts, working to persuade them that this was the last of the disturbances. Given the commotion of the last hour, the task was difficult, but the Voxen were so eager to remain on their nests that they calmed. "'It is okay to move slowly,' Kennel Ka advised. "'But do nothing threatening. Under no circumstances must anyone attack.' As Anakin rose... A wave of dizziness made him brace himself against the wall, but no one noticed. All eyes were focused on Zek, who was marching over to Welk with fury in his eyes. You used the dark side, he hissed. Better to let the beast kill young Solo? Lomi asked, placing herself between the two. You broke your promise, Zek said. He saved my life. Anakin stepped to Zek's side, then glanced pointedly around. There were no live voxen closer than twenty meters, but all of the beasts within the range of their glow sticks were ruffling their neck scales and staring at the strike team. And if we can feel your outrage, so can the voxen. The heat went out of Zek's expression. Sorry, Anakin. He glared at Welkin Lomi, then said, don't use the Force again. Not around me. With that, he spun on his heel and started down the tier after Jason and Jaina. Anakin watched him go, suddenly too weary to concern himself over Zek's rigid view of the dark side. His legs shook from the mere effort of standing. He took a moment to concentrate, using the Force to muster his strength, then waved Welk and Lomi forward and fell in behind. By the way, thanks for saving my life, he said to Welk. Then you do not feel tainted by the dark side? Lomi asked. I'm not afraid of it, if that's what you mean, Anakin replied. But Zek's right. You did break your promise. Don't worry, Welk said, not looking back. I won't do it again. They descended the tears in a zigzagging course as Jason gave the widest possible berth to the nesting voxen. Even through the breath masks, the stench grew ever more unbearable, and they saw bodies in all states of decomposition, the hopeful mothers still standing guard over the food they expected to nourish their sterile eggs. In a few cases, the voxen herself had starved to death and collapsed on top of her nest's bare bones. The sight struck Anakin as morbidly sad, though it did not really surprise him. 
He knew from his studies, and from Jason's endless discourses during long space voyages, that many creatures faced death to bring forth the next generation. This willingness, and the fact that in some species it was even necessary, was tangible evidence of the eternal nature of the Force, Jason said. About halfway down they came to a ten-meter drop, which proved to be another tier of archers, similar to the ones out of which they had come. Rather than risk drawing any more nestless voxen through these portals, they began to circle the arena, or whatever it was, clambering up and down tiers in order to avoid voxen nests. The effort quickly began to tell on Anakin, even when he used the Force to assist himself. It was not long before his knees were trembling and his belly burning. Tahiri, of course, noticed right away. Anakin, you're shaking. Anakin nodded. The smell is getting to me. The smell makes no one else shake, Tisar noted, coming up behind Anakin. This one will carry you. Before Anakin could object, the Barabel scooped him up in his arms. Tahiri insisted on reporting Anakin's condition to Tekli, whose examination came to an abrupt end when an angry voxen stuck its head over the tier above and belched acid in their direction. Fearful of agitating the rest of the beasts, the strike team resumed its march, with Anakin cradled in Tisar's scaly arms. As they continued around the arena, Anakin saw that the tiers below were better appointed than those through which he and his companions were traveling. The walls were decorated with statues of Yunyamka, many showing the god tearing off his own limbs or draining his blood. A few showed Yuzhan Vong warriors being devoured by the god or emerging whole again from among its tentacles. When he began to glimpse long spikes and sharp hooks protruding from the walls surrounding the arena floor, Anakin thought this was probably a stadium where the Yuzhan Vong had once entertained themselves by pitting slave gladiators against each other. Then Anakin noticed the series of ramps extending from the lower tier onto the arena floor and realized he had it wrong. The Yuzhan Vong had been the ones who fought here, or at least those lucky enough to sit in the privileged lower tier. Viewed in that light, the statues of Yun Yamka took on a religious tone, and he began to imagine the arena as an enormous church. He could almost see the place filled with Yuzhan Vong faithful as the world ship hurtled through the darkness between galaxies, the most prominent citizens and celebrated leaders down on the arena floor, honoring their gods with their blood, by their deaths assuring the Yuzhan Vong of a new home in the distant galaxy of the New Republic. Put me down, Anakin said. Warriors like those would not be defeated by someone who had to be born into battle in another's arms. I won't be carried, not in here, not until this is done. Tisai returned Anakin to his unsteady feet. Babaka groaned, then moaned a question. Then how do you expect Tisar can help me, Anakin said, interrupting MTD's translation. He turned to the Barabel. When Yulaha was being tortured, you gave her strength. It will not be as much, Tisar warned. There were three then. I'll take what I can, Anakin said. I just want to finish this on my feet. The Barabel showed his needle-like teeth. And this one would be honored. Anakin felt Tisar make contact through the Force, and then experienced a peculiar reptilian chill as the Barabel brought them together emotionally. The world turned strangely crimson, and Anakin felt his weakness pouring into Tisar, and Tisar's strength flowing into him. With it came a strange sense of loneliness, not quite sorrow as humans knew it but two aching absences that would never be filled. Without realizing that he had closed them, Anakin opened his eyes. I... It isn't quite what I expected. No, Tisar rasped. You wanted scales. Astonished to discover he actually understood the joke, Anakin chuckled and started after the others. His connection to Tisar felt similar to the battle meld save that now it was the Barabel's strength that was being shared. 
A few minutes later, Alima announced that they had circled around the arena to a point opposite their entry arch, and the team began to ascend the stairs. Anakin was able to climb under his own power, but Raynar was still suffering from the effects of the poison antidote, and had to be lifted from one tier to the next with the Force. They were only one tier from the exit when Raynar, waiting for Alima to climb up after him, pointed ten meters down the tier. Look. His tongue was so thick that Anakin did not understand him at first. Errol. Raynar turned and started to stagger in the direction he was pointing, drawing a warning neck rustle from a nearby voxen. Alima pulled herself up in one swift motion and rushed after the disoriented Jedi, while Anakin and several others reached out with the Force and jerked him back. The voxen belched acid and missed, then lunged forward and slashed Raynar twice. The first attack tore through his armored jumpsuit. The second opened four deep gashes. Leaving the wounded Jedi to his companions, Anakin jerked his lightsaber off his harness and activated the blade. Anakin, no, Jason warned. Let it go back to its nest. Anakin deactivated the blade, but kept the weapon at high guard. Tisar floated Raynar's babbling figure over to Ganner and Alima, who quickly disappeared behind the edge with him. The Voxen continued to glare down, its beady eyes fixed on the lightsaber in Anakin's hands. Need help, young Solo? Momi asked. I can kill it. But there is that promise. Keep your promise, Anakin said. He slowly lowered his lightsaber and backed away. You really don't want to see Zek angry. Do not be so sure, Lomi said. I hear he is very powerful when he is angry. The Voxen retreated to its nest. Anakin dared to breathe again. Then he and the others scrambled up the last tier to the exit. Alima and Zek were already on the other side with Tekli and Raynar, but Jason and the rest were waiting just inside the arch. Anakin stepped through and peered at Raynar over the Chadrafan's small shoulder. Four deep gashes ran diagonally across his chest, but the bleeding was not severe and no bone was showing. How is he? Well enough for now, Tekli said, filling the wounds with cleansing foam. But much will depend on how Silgal's anti-disease agents work. Anakin continued to stare at Raynar. Another casualty. This one a close friend of Jason and Jaina. But they had made it across the Voxen Warrens. He felt both sorrowful and relieved, but not guilty. He had chosen as well as he could. Though Raynar was probably too incoherent to notice, Anakin kneeled down and patted his shoulder. Can he be moved? Have someone levitate him, Tekli said. I'll ride. Zek had the patient in the air before Anakin could give the order. Alima was beside him, holding Tekli's medpack her face distressed. Anakin gave her arm a reassuring squeeze, then gently took the med pack from her and passed it to Tahiri. We need you to navigate, he said to Alima. Lomi's never been outside the training course, and everyone else is lost down here. Alima thought for a moment, then guided them down the passage in what seemed the opposite direction they had been traveling. This corridor resembled the one they had followed into the arena save that it lacked acid-scarred caves connected to a parallel tunnel. Eventually, the team passed an intersection that had been blocked with a Yorick coral plug, presumably to discourage Voxen from escaping onto the rest of the world ship. Olima passed by the first, then the next, and finally stopped at a third. It feels like we're very near the surface here. A shudder ran down her leku as she spoke. I'm guessing we are far from the gate they were hurting us toward. Maybe we can finally take them by surprise. Jaina checked her comlink. Maybe we can. They still haven't tripped the Flechette mine. Anakin gestured at the barricade. Who wants the honors? Lobaka and Tisar ignited their lightsabers simultaneously and set to work. The Yorick Coral was much harder than that aboard the Exquisite Death, and it required nearly twenty minutes to cut through the meter-deep plug. Anakin spent much of the time in meditation, doing what he could for his injury, but Tekli did not want to open it again. 
even if a stitch had popped, there would be nothing solid to reattach it to. Finally, Ganner levitated the last block out of the intersection. Ahead of them, a large access tunnel ascended toward the surface at a shallow angle. About fifty meters distant, it ended in a transparent wall of membrane and an air-locked valveway that opened into one of the deep-walled service routes they had seen from space. This travelway, however, was obviously no longer in use. It was crammed with captured equipment. Land speeders, utility lifts, hover taxis, even a Sorosub cloud car. All of it no doubt being stored out of sight until it was needed in the training course. And there, sitting cockeyed in the middle of the tangle with hatches sealed tight and one landing gear only half extended, was a battered light freighter. Well, Anakin said, it looks like the Force is finally with us. Chapter 42 It was a forty-second turbolift drop to the Soto's floor in their Eastport residential tower, and forty seconds had never seemed so long. Leia pulled her lightsaber from the thigh pocket of her grease-stained flight suit, and Han checked the power level of his famous blast tech DL-44. Given the tower's unobtrusive but watchful security department, Leia felt certain there would be a pair of guard droids and a sentient supervisor waiting with a retina scanner when they stepped out of the lift. As long as Han didn't start a firefight, that would probably even be a good thing. It was always smart to have a little support in situations like these. Can't this thing drop any faster? Han grumbled. They don't put acceleration compensators in turbo lifts, Leia reminded. Be patient, Han. We'll be more useful without our knees in our chests. Han was silent for a moment, then asked, Did Adarak... Say they were on the way, or already in the building. On our floor, Leia said. He said they were already on our floor. With its rare red lad limbs and milky larmel stone floor, the Solo Atrium appeared as deserted and placid as the first time Vicky Shesh had visited it. Instead of ambling casually by as she had before, she walked straight toward the cul-de-sac the looming figures of an entire Yuzhan Vong infiltration cell following close on her heels. Dressed in the blue jumpsuits of the Municipal Health Bureau and wearing conspicuously similar Uglith maskers, Vicky's companions looked more like a squad of sextuplet assassins than a vermin control team, though it hardly mattered. Droids were not capable of making the leap of thought necessary to interpret the odd similarity as a threat, and there would be no sentience awake inside to notice. Ten minutes ago, she had walked past and innocuously blown an ultrasonic whistle, causing her census lug surveillance bug to self-destruct and release an invisible cloud of sleep-inducing spores. By now, everyone in the Soto apartment, including Ben Skywalker, would be slumbering peacefully. Vicky had almost entered the atrium when a sudden rustle broke out behind her, and she turned to find the infiltrators opening their collars to reach for the Nuliths concealed beneath their jumpsuits. Not yet, gentlemen. In an attempt to keep the security system from identifying the stress pattern in her voice, Vicky spoke in a bare whisper. We don't want to alarm anyone. But the spores grow ineffective after five minutes, or so I was given to believe. Vicky was not at all happy about having her judgment questioned by a male inferior. It has been... Ten minutes. They settled to the ground after five minutes, the leader corrected. His name was Inko or Igko or something similarly odd. If they are stirred into the air again, we'll mask when we are inside, Inkle. Vicky pushed the leader's hand back beneath his jumpsuit, then tipped her chin toward the servo droid GL-7, standing patiently outside the crystal steel door. If the greeter droid sees a vermin control team approaching in Nuliths, he'll have tower security down here before we cross the atrium. We must disable him before revealing ourselves. The leader considered this for a moment, then nodded to his warriors and removed his hand without the Nulith. Ingodar, he said. I am called Ingodar. Of course you are. Vicky rolled her eyes and turned back to the atrium. Follow me, Ingo. 
and do only what I command. Though Vicky was about to expose herself as one of the most notorious traitors in the short history of the New Republic, she had not bothered to mask either her appearance or her voice. A thorough analysis of the security data would penetrate such a disguise anyway, and she knew from her spy in the security department that any attempt to avoid all the tower's hidden holocams and microphones would be hopeless. Besides, there was a part of her, a big part of her, that wanted Luke Skywalker to know who had taken his son. No one could cross Vicky Shesh and hope to escape the consequences, not even the Master of the Jedi. There would also be consequences for Vicky, of course. She would become a hunted woman and a reviled traitor, and her whole planet would be stigmatized by her betrayal. But not for long, she was certain. Since losing her seat on Nirmok, she had actually expanded her value to the War Master, recruiting a network of spies who believed she was merely working to regain her lost prestige. She had provided him with not only the secret of the Jedi shadow bombs, but also the technical readouts of the gravity projectors aboard the Moon Mothma and the Alagos Akla, and the disposition of the New Republic hyperspace mines now being laid between Borlias and Coruscant. Savong La knew that in commanding her to distract the Jedi in this manner, he was forfeiting his most valuable intelligence asset, and Vicky could think of only one reason for him to do that. Savong La was coming to Coruscant, and soon. As Vicky approached the door, the GL-7 swiveled its smiling face in her direction and made a show of scanning her features, though she knew that it had already done that from twenty meters away when she stepped onto the hidden pressure pad at the entrance to the atrium. She smiled warmly and slipped a hand into her stylish hip pouch, reaching for the powerful two-shot hold-out blaster she had hidden inside a scan-proof cosmetics case. Senator Shesh, how kind of you to call. The GL-7 radiated electronic enthusiasm. C-3PO informs me that the household is napping at the moment, but he expects them to awaken shortly. If you and your friends care to wait, he is prepared to offer refreshments. Refreshments? It was hardly the type of greeting Vicky expected, but perhaps the droid's programming had not been updated since her retirement as the chair of Cellcorp. Certainly, Leia Solo would have been eager to offer a warm reception to the senator in control of the refugee effort's purse strings. Leaving the holdout blaster in her hip pouch, Vicky said, Yes, refreshments would be nice. C-3PO is waiting for you inside. The crystal steel door slid open. Please enjoy your visit. Only her experience as a politician kept Vicky's jaw from dropping. Thank you. I am sure we will. Hoping that the infiltrators behind her were not doing something foolish like reaching under their jumpsuits for the amphistaffs twined around their waists, Vicky crossed the threshold and stepped into the foyer, a domed atrium similar to the one from which they had just come, though much smaller and even less grandiose. To the left, a large double door opened onto the apartment's skyway balcony, where, two meters below, a hover sled from a popular airbed vendor was waiting to provide a fast escape. The Solo's golden protocol droid appeared from deeper inside the apartment. I am C-3PO, Human-Cyborg Relations. The whole galaxy knows who you are, C-3PO, Vicky remarked dryly. How kind of you to say so, Senator Shesh. C-3PO gestured at a set of poof couches arrayed around a potted ladalum, then said, We have been expecting you. Please be seated and I will take drink orders for you and your friends shortly. The droid's tone was so pleasantly matter-of-fact that the significance of what he had said did not strike Vicky until he had turned away and vanished around the corner. The infiltrators instantly began to rustle beneath their jumpsuits for their newlets, but Vicky pulled her holdout blaster from its hiding place and started after the droid. C-3PO you were expecting us. Why, yes, Senator Shesh. The droid reappeared instantly, 
his metallic hands grasping a delicate, Vors glass orb, spattered on the inside with some sort of organic material. I was given to understand that this belongs to you. Still struggling to make sense of the situation, Vicky leveled her holdout blaster at the droid's head. Stay there. C-3PO stopped. Oh, my. The glass sphere slipped from between his hands. Is that really necessary? Vicky had time enough to draw one breath before the orb shattered on the tile floor. Then a small, gray-skinned alien slipped past the droid with a T-21 repeating blaster in his hands. He was, she saw, wearing a breath mask. Vicky fired once in his direction and heard the first infiltrator thump to the floor. The alien fired past her twice, and two more warriors crashed down. When a fourth fell, Vicky realized the situation was hopeless and turned to flee. Even if any of the Yuzhan Vong remained conscious long enough to don their nuliths, they would never fight past the Nogri. As she approached the Skyway balcony, the double doors slid open automatically, and a second Nogri dropped onto the floor. Vicky took two more steps and loosed the holdout blaster's last bolt. The shot missed, of course, but it did force the alien to waste an instant pivoting away. That instant was all Vicky needed. She raced across the balcony and hurdled the safety rail blind. With any luck at all, the hover sled would still be there, two meters down. The crook of Luke's arm felt strangely empty without Ben there to keep it occupied. At the oddest times, he found himself holding his hand in front of his belly, and his elbow slightly out from his body, rocking from one foot to another and humming softly to himself. Sometimes, such as now, it even seemed to him that his ribs were warm where his son would be pressed against him, or that the air was sweet with the smell of the milk on Ben's breath. Sensing a sudden silence in the air, Luke looked up to find the three women in the room, Mara, Danny, Silgal, studying him with knowing smirks. He felt himself blush, and knew there was no use denying that his thoughts had been elsewhere. Well, nothing else seems to work. He shrugged and smiled sheepishly, then looked through the transparasteel viewport at the writhing mass of tentacles in the nutrient tank. I thought we might as well try music. Sure you did, Luke, Mara said. I'm sure that every Yamask war coordinator will be mesmerized by Dance, Dance, Little Ewok. Why not? Silgal asked. It works as well as anything we have tried. We know they communicate through gravitic modulation, but there must be something in the wave pattern we are missing. Whatever we try, it fails to answer. Fails or refuses? Luke asked, studying the creature more closely. We keep talking about Yamisks like they're animals, but I'm not sure. What if it doesn't want to answer? If they're smart enough to run a battle, then they're smart enough to avoid helping us, Danny said. She shook her head wearily. For every step forward, Luke's comlink buzzed, then Mara's. Mara got to hers first. Mara here. Everything's fine, but Leia thinks you should know we just had a little excitement here. Han's voice was tinny and scratchy, a result of the relay from Eclipse's comm center being split between two comm links. Luke turned his off, and the voice sounded more like Han. There's nothing to worry about. Luke and Mara looked at each other. Then Mara demanded, What do you mean there's nothing to worry about? If there was nothing to worry about, would you be calming us? to say there was nothing to worry about. Vicky Shesh paid us a visit, Leia said. She had a squad of infiltrators with her. They were after Ben? Luke asked. That's how it looks, Han said. Adarak and Miwal took them in the foyer. The Yuzhan Vong are either dead or on their way to an NRI interrogation facility. And Vicky? Mara asked. She jumped off the balcony, Leia said. She didn't fall far, Han added. She had a delivery sled one floor below. NRI is tracing it now. But it won't take long to find her, Leia hastened to add. Within the hour, every voice scanner on Coruscant will be trying to match her print. Luke and Mara looked at each other again, 
Then Mara shrugged. So who said I was worried? Mara asked. If anyone in the galaxy knows how to deal with kidnappers, it has to be Han and Leia Solo. This drew a laugh from both Han and Leia, who had almost lost count of the number of times their children had been abducted. But you two stay put, Mara ordered. No more sneaking off on secret reconnaissance missions when you're supposed to be watching my son. Firm that, Han said. I could use some time on the couch. After they clicked off, Luke could still sense a lingering uneasiness in Mara. He waited until they had stepped into the frigid corridor. Eclipse's heating system was again performing below specifications, then spun Mara around and zipped her thermosuit to her throat. It isn't easy being here, he said, not with the Yuzhan Vong after Ben on Coruscant. Mara managed to smile. And with everything so quiet right now? You could probably take a few days. Ben might like to see his mother, too. And his mother would like to see him, Mara said. She fell silent, considering, then shook her head. But she also wants to protect him, and the only way to do that is to keep the Yuzhan Vong away from Coruscant. With all those refugee convoys disappearing from Raltir and Rinnell, this is more than just quiet. Luke nodded. I feel it, too. He took her hand and started toward the hangar caves, where Corrin Horn wanted to show him a supplemental targeting system being installed on the XJ-3s. This is the dark before the Nova. Chapter 43 Good news. Master Lobaka wishes to report that the Tachyon Flyer will be ready for launch before you attack the Queen. Horrified that MTD's sharp voice would carry down the dusty slopes to the Grashel's protective thorn hedge, Anakin and several others fumbled for their hanging earpieces. They were studying the cloning lab from more than a hundred meters distant, but the air in this part of the world ship was so still that even soft sounds carried. He's reinserting the reactor cores now, MTD said. We're going home, Master Anakin. We're going to survive after all. Affirmative. Anakin's voice was barely a whisper. Earlier, Jason had felt a single Voxen presence inside the huge Grashel, so it seemed likely they had at last reached the Queen. Now all they had to do was kill her before the Yuzhan Vong realized they were here. Maintain calm silence. Calm silence? MTD's voice was quieter now. Does that mean you're in... The question came to an abrupt end, as the droid was switched off. Then Lobaka acknowledged with a calm click. Anakin responded with a double click and continued his reconnaissance. The cone-shaped Grashel stood in the heart of what had once been a vaulted dome, but which had become an immense basin when the Shapers reoriented the world ship's gravity. As the strike team had seen from the other side of the spaceport, the peak of the huge structure protruded through the outer shell of the world ship and, judging by the number of patching membranes, provided some much-needed support for the makeshift ceiling. Whether Nomanor understood that this was where his prey had gone was impossible to say, but Anakin felt an urgency in the Force. The strike team had escaped through the Voxen lair over an hour ago, so the executor certainly realized by now that his quarry had disappeared. Provided he knew a shorter route, he might even be waiting inside. Someone should have been able to help with this question, but Anakin could not think who. Alima? Tahiri? Both had experience with Yuzhan Vong bases, but their knowledge of this complex was no more specific than anyone else's. He shook his head. There was someone else, but for the life of him, he could not remember who. Inside the Tachyon Flyer, a battered but serviceable Corellian Engineering Corporation YV-888 light freighter, Lobaka tightened the last shielding bolt to its proper torque, then initiated a self-test. The instrument panel broke into a flurry of dancing lights as the reactor brain checked its circuits. Finally, bright green steam began to rise behind the shielding door's observation panel. When none of it appeared to be seeping through the seal, he authorized a pressure check, slipped the hydro spanner into his equipment belt, and started forward to check on his patient. Techley had assured him, 
that the dose of Trankarest would keep even a Jedi quiet until long after the others returned. But Lobaka wanted to be sure. He had already been forced to secure Raynar in crash webbing after the feverish Jedi Knight thrashed his wrist against the bunk's safety rail. As Lobaka passed the airlock, he heard someone banging on the outer hatch. He went to the security panel and activated the external monitor. The vidcam was so dust-caked, he could see only the vague shape of a small vac-suited human, hammering at the Durasteel with the butt of a mini-cannon. He activated his comm link and started to ask what was wrong, then recalled Anakin's request for calm silence and stepped into the equalization chamber. He sealed his vac suit, then shorted two wires dangling from the control box. As the outer seal broke, he experienced a sudden ripple of danger sense and snapped his lightsaber off his belt. The hatch opened, and Lomi Plo's voice came over his personal channel. There's no need for that. She tossed the mini-cannon at his waist, forcing him to lower his arms to catch it. Come along. The Scarheads have your friends cornered. She turned and started down the boarding ramp, unslinging her own T-21 repeating blaster as she ran. Pausing only to clip his lightsaber on his harness, Lobaka rushed after her. The Wookiee was already at the bottom of the ramp when he sensed another human behind him, lurking somewhere beneath the tachyon flyer. Instinctively bringing the mini-cannon up, Lobaka spun around to find Welk stepping out from behind a landing strut, a blaster pistol aimed at his chest. Needing no further evidence of the pair's treachery, Lobaka squeezed the mini-cannon's trigger. The power pack did not even contain enough energy to activate the depletion alarm. Struck by the depth of the betrayal, Lobaka lowered the mini-cannon and switched to Welk's personal channel, then growled a one-word question. Because your friends are going to get themselves and everyone with them killed, that's why, Welk answered. He fired, catching Lobaka full in the chest with a blue stun bolt. The Wookiee choked out a pained growl and dropped to a knee, drawing on the force to keep himself conscious. He hurled the mini cannon at Welk and reached for his lightsaber, then rolled over his shoulder and came up on a knee, molten bronze blade slashing toward the Dark Jedi's waist. Stun bolts began to pour in from behind. Play nice, Wookie, Lomi said. We could have set our weapons to kill. Anakin had almost finished explaining his plan when a blue glow shone down through the transparent ceiling patches. He lifted his gaze and saw the tachyon flyer shooting into the green sky, its efflux nacelles glowing brilliantly as the ion drives flared to life. Loey? He gasped. Jaina and the others were instantly on their comm links, trying to raise Lobaka and find out why he was leaving. They received only static in return. Strange, Tsar Sabatine rasped. This one has always heard that nothing is more loyal than a Wookiee. That's right, Jason said, and Lobaka is more loyal than most. Something's wrong. Fact, Tenelka said. The strike team stared at each other blankly while Anakin tried to raise Lobaka again. When that did not work, Jaina switched channels and sent an activation signal to MTD. Danger? the droid asked, finishing the question that had been in his circuits when Lobaka shut him down. Oh dear, when did we launch? MTD, what's Loe doing? Jason asked. Why is he leaving? Leaving? Why, Master Lobaka is doing nothing of the sort. He's right here with— The droid let the sentence drift off, then screeched, Help! They're stealing me! Who? Anakin asked. Who? MTD echoed. Lomi and— The explanation ended in a crackle of static. Welk, Zek finished, his voice hard and angry. Lomi and Welk. As soon as he heard the names, Anakin recalled the Dark Master— who had guided them through the training course, and whose last sentence to him had been something along the lines of, We were never here. He had seen her hand rise and felt the force behind her words. But Lomi was as subtle as she was powerful. He could not even remember if there had been time to resist. Ganner might not have been the first to realize what the ship's theft meant for Anakin, but as usual, he was the only one bold enough to say it. Anakin, I'm sorry. 
Once we found out they were Dark Jedi, we should never have... Yes, we should have, Anakin said. He was surprised to discover how calm he felt, how focused he was on the duty at hand. Without them, we wouldn't have made it this far. And I would have died in the arena anyway. Not anyway, Tahiri insisted. We'll find another way off this rock. First things first, Anakin said softly. Though Tekle was still working on him, reaching into his wound with the force to repair his torn organs, he could feel his strength fading and his pain rising. Let's concentrate on the mission. The blue dot of the tachyon flyer's ion drives blinked completely out of sight. Then a flight of coral skippers streaked across a patching membrane and shot into space. A moment after that, the dark shape of Nomanor's frigate floated over the horizon, also pursuing the YV-888. I hope the Scarheads catch them, Ali Marar said, her voice full of bitterness. I hope they dump them in a voxen pen. I do not. Tenelka displayed her comlink, which was already pulsing static as the first plasma balls battered the flyer's shields. Our friend Raynar is still aboard. The sinking feeling in Anakin's chest was all too familiar. He activated Lobaka's comlink remotely and found it completely silent. But not Loey, he said. And if he had been killed, I'm pretty sure we would have felt him die. When no one said anything, he looked up from his comm link and found everyone else studying him. There were tears welling in Jason's and Jaina's eyes, and Tahiri was wiping her cheeks with the cuff of her sleeve. We'd better do this now, Anakin said, not wanting to lose focus. He disengaged from Tekli, then took Raynar's G9 power blaster off his shoulder and raised the long-range sight. Jaina, keep a channel open to Raynar. Maybe we'll hear what becomes of him. And maybe they wouldn't, Anakin knew. In war, people sometimes just disappeared. No one ever found out what had happened to them, leaving friends and family with lifetimes of longing and uncertainty. When no one moved to ready themselves, Anakin said, Now might be nice. Spurred into action, the strike team readied their weapons and opened their emotions. Despite the lingering outrage and some feelings of blame over the Dark Jedi's betrayal, the battle meld felt the tightest it had been since the detention warrens. Anakin knelt a few meters from the passage mouth and took aim at one of the dark shapes visible through the thorn hedge. When he felt the others also find their targets, two to each guard, he fired. Eight streaks of color fanned down the dusty slope and tore through the hedge into the four dark shapes beyond. None of the bolts missed. No Jedi would bungle such an important attack, not with the Force to guide his aim. But only two shots burned through. Six ricocheted off the guard's Vondun crab armor, blasting dust columns into the air or burning pits into the grassal wall. The surviving guards dropped and crawled for cover. Half the strike team was already rushing down the slope, firing as they ran, their T-21 repeating blasters keeping the Yuzhan Vong pinned and clearing the hedge for the more powerful weapons behind. Anakin and Jaina fired again. Prone to deflection and straying at that distance, their power blasters could only flush the guards. One warrior fell to Alima's long blaster. The other was staggered by T-Sar's mini-cannon, then finished by the T-21s as they reached effective range. Now the second wave was up and running. Despite the strength Tisar was sharing, Anakin could not keep pace. Tahiri, Jaina, and Tisar dropped back to stay with him. Go. I'll catch up. When Jawas swim... Tahiri shot back. Anakin, you're in no condition, Jaina said. Go back to the equipment pit and locate Loey. Maybe if you find a safe place to hole up and go into a healing trance... Too late for that, Anakin said. I'm seeing this through. Even if it means putting others at risk, Jaina demanded. If you're slow, you're a danger to us all. At least try a trance. Things had gone too far for a trance, Anakin knew. He was thirsty enough to drink sweat, and his abdomen was hard with trapped blood, 
and the effort of finding a place safe enough to enter a trance would probably kill him anyway. But the thought that he might be endangering others did give him pause. It was one thing to face the inevitable, quite another to take others along. He sought guidance from the Force, opening himself to its tide, trying to sense where it was carrying him. The sound of the ruffling Voxen scales rose to mind. He felt again the awe he had experienced in the arena when he realized it had been Yuzhan Vong patricians who fought there. The Force had spoken to him then. I'm going, he said. Gina clenched her jaw, then looked away. I thought so. The first wave reached the hedge and ducked through the burn holes. Stalks began to strike like snakes. Half a dozen lightsabers snapped to life and hacked the brambles away. Then the Jedi stumbled out the other side, ripping thorn tangles from around their throats and legs. The hedge struck again as the second wave crossed. The first wave left them to their own devices and continued on toward the Grashel. Speed was crucial. During their reconnaissance, Anakin had sensed a company of Yuzhan Vong lurking a few hundred meters beyond the cloning lab, presumably where the strike team had been expected to leave the Voxen Warrens. By the time Anakin and his three companions penetrated the hedge, the first wave had already cut through the Grashel Wall. Tenelka, Zek, and Alima pressed themselves against the block and rode along as Ganner used the force to shove the monolith inside. A burning cloud of bugs came boiling out. The Jedi huddled down in their armored jumpsuits, their blades tracing crackling color fans as they batted insects from the air. A grenade explosion rocked the Grashel, then another and another, and the bug storm withered to a trickle. Clear, Zek yelled. Ganner and Jason ducked inside. Jaina hefted her power blaster to follow, but then everyone's comlinks popped and hissed static. There came a ripple in the force, maybe strong enough to be Raynar's death. Anakin looked to the ceiling, saw nothing through the patching membranes but Mirker's green glow. He would never know. They'll pay. Jaina tore her eyes from the ceiling. They will pay. Then so will we, Anakin said. Jaina's eyes were sunken with fatigue, and her mouth was drooping with sorrow, and she looked more frail and troubled than Anakin had ever seen her. We're here to destroy the Queen, not take revenge. Right. Jaina stepped through the opening. Revenge comes later. Anakin left Tahiri and Tekli at the breach with Alima's long blaster and followed his sister into the Grashel. It was like stepping into a Yavin 4 night storm, a dark fog hanging overhead, glow lichen up there somewhere casting sallow halos, blaster bolts and lightsabers flashing like colored lightning, and the humid air muffling the scream and roar of combat, making all that death seem more distant than it was. Anakin spun out from behind the door block and battered a razor bug from the air, found himself staring through a jungle of pulsing white vines their corkscrew stalks rising out of planting bins filled with briny-smelling mud. The Yuzhan Vong were ahead everywhere, their presence too dispersed and indistinct to tell him much. A pair of thud bugs sent him diving for cover. He exchanged his lightsaber for the power blaster and came up firing. The first shots left him so light-dazzled, he glimpsed only a dark shape on the opposite side of the bin, diving for cover. He spun around the end of the box, heard the snap hiss of an igniting lightsaber, then Tisar Sabatine's familiar hissing. The Yuzhan Vong had thrown his last bug. Anakin reached out with the Force and found the rest of the strike team taking heavy swarm, pinned down in the darkness, easy enough to fix. He reached for his incendiary grenades, but felt Tisar already lifting three objects into the dark fog overhead. A smug Yuzhan Vong presence drew Anakin's attention to the next planting bin. Rolling from his hiding place, he saw a dark figure leaping across the aisle ahead, Amphistaff poised to strike. He lifted his power blaster and pitched forward as a razor bug sliced across his neck from behind, vibro-sharp mandibles gliding off his jumpsuit's armored lining. The insect banked and came back, pincers stretching for his face. 
Anakin pivoted and took a cheek slash, fired at his original target. The bolt cut the Yuzhan Vong in a shoulder seam and spun him around. An arm flew off, trailing the smell of scorched flesh, but the warrior did not even scream. He just pirouetted and, now swinging one-armed, brought his amphistaff down. Anakin's razor bug came around again, this time slashing for the throat, and he had to turn away. Behind him, T-Sai's lightsaber snapped to life and sputtered harshly. Anakin blocked with the body of the power blaster, then took a pair of thud bugs in the flank and slammed to the floor. He heard the dull thump of an amphistaff hitting a thick reptilian skull, and the flow of strength trailed off as the bear bell plummeted into insensibility. Anakin did not consciously fire his power blaster. He was too busy reaching up into the darkness, searching for falling grenades. How many seconds left? The power blaster just flashed, and Tisar's attacker crashed to the floor. Anakin found what he was looking for and pushed. A ripple of danger sense made him roll away as the razor bug crashed to the floor where his head had been. He hammered the thing dead, then heard the telltale crackle of the grenade detonations. Hoping he would still be there when the sound fell silent, he closed his eyes and reached out to find his attacker through the Lambent crystal. Not easy. Too many Yuzhan Vong in too many places. But he felt something off to his left. He spun and fired. The depletion alarm sounded, just loud enough to be heard over the crackling flames above. The Yuzhan Vong presence was closer now, eager. Flinging the useless blaster aside, he plucked his lightsaber from his belt and thumbed it to life, brought it into a cross-body guard, caught an amphistaff descending toward his head. Eyes still squeezed shut against the brilliant glare above, he swung his legs around and scissored his attacker's knees. The contest ended in a quick lightsaber thrust. The flames crackled out. Anakin opened his eyes and saw yellow glow lichen shining bright the last wisps of vapor cloud evaporating into the hot air. He lay there for a long time, taking stock of his condition, trying to fight off his anguish. It took five full breaths to establish that the pain was caused only by his old wound, ten heartbeats more to bring it under control. Gradually, Anakin grew aware of the battle meld again, of the strike team's mounting elation. Pushing his agony aside, calling on the Force, he lifted himself to his feet. The Jedi were advancing on the left side of the Grashel, driving back the last handful of shapers and guards, slashing nutrient vines and cloning pods as they went. Through the pulsing tangle of stalks, he could not see what they were hunting, but he could feel it, over by the Grashel wall, trapped a little below floor level, unsettled, wild, ferocious, afraid. Behind Anakin, the long blaster boomed. He felt panic from Tahiri and turned to find her rushing into the Grashel. A ball of fire followed her through the breach and exploded into the monolith standing there, and Tahiri went flying. Anakin rushed to help, but she was up before he took two steps. Magma spitters were cut off. Anakin did not bother to look. Techly, Tahiri pointed behind him where the Chadrafan was sprinkling stink salts on Tisar's forked tongue. The bear bell was smiling, but not waking. Take him, and go. Every word filled Anakin's belly with fire. He pointed toward the others. You may need to cut a way out. You? Tahiri said. I'm not going. Do it, Anakin snapped. When Tahiri's face fell, he spoke more gently. You need to help Tekli. I'll be along. Yes, Tahiri, Tekli said. She cast a knowing glance at Anakin, then kneeled astride the bear bell and began to slap him. Tisar is not responding. I cannot move him and work on him both. Tahiri looked doubtful, but could hardly refuse to help. Blinking back a tear, she stretched up to kiss Anakin on the lips, then caught herself and shook her head. No. For that you have to come back. Anakin gave her his best lopsided smile. Soon, then. Soon, Tahiri repeated. May the Force be with you. 
this second part, she added so quietly that Anakin did not think she meant him to hear it. All too aware of the growing weakness in his legs, he went to the makeshift doorway and peered around the edge. An artillery squad had set up beyond the thorn hedge, their four magma spitters trained on the opening. No one was attempting to move closer, which meant the main force would be attacking from the other side. Anakin turned toward the primary entrance and focused on what he felt through the lambent crystal. It did not surprise him at all to sense a heavy Yuzhan Vong presence streaming in from the ambush site. He set off at a painfully slow run. Twice, he dropped to a knee when his legs buckled, once while trading blows with a glassy-eyed Yuzhan Vong, who had no more business in hand-to-hand -hand combat than he did. He won that fight by slashing open a planting bin, then levitating himself while the nutrient mud spilled out and swept his foe off balance. The next combat he nearly did not survive at all, catching an amphistaph bud in his wound and popping the external stitches. His life was saved only when he used the force to bounce his blaster off the warrior's tattooed brow. As he retrieved his weapon and rose, Anakin vomited blood. Even before he was finished, he was using the force to lift himself to his feet, willing himself to run. He had to beat the enemy assault force to the door. At last he cleared the planting bins and spied the door membrane twenty meters to his left, as wide as an X-wing was long and twice as high. The far corner of the membrane rose slightly. Anakin ducked back into the planting beds, freehand already pulling a thermal detonator from his harness. When Anakin saw the figure who stepped through, he nearly dropped the detonator. The newcomer's back was turned, but he wore a tattered jumpsuit and stood a head taller than most humans. He set off for the Voxen pen at a sprint. Loey, Anakin called, using the force to make his weak voice carry. He reached out, but felt only the same hazy Yuzhan Vong presence as before. The newcomer turned, revealing the profile of a sandy-haired human, and raised an old E-11 blaster rifle. Anakin was already behind a planting bin, activating his comlink. Imposter, he warned, trying for pens. The blaster fire crescendoed to a deafening roar, as did the Jedi frustration. The firing angles were impossible. A grenade detonated somewhere, and Jaina yelled for a charge. The door membrane began to roll upward, revealing forty pairs of Yuzhan Vong feet, waiting to rush inside. Anakin opened himself to the Force completely, drawing it into himself through the power of his emotions, not through his anger or fear like a dark Jedi, but through his love for his family and his fellow Jedi Knights, through his faith in the Jedi purpose and the promise of the future. The Force poured in from all sides, filling him with a swirling maelstrom of power and purpose, saturating him and devouring him. There was nothing to be frightened of, no reason to grieve. He could feel it flowing into him, and himself flowing into it. Anakin was the Force, and the Force was Anakin. Anakin rose. His body emitted a faint aura of light the glow of his cells burning out, and the air crackled around him. His injuries no longer pained him. He was acutely aware of everything in the grashel, the musty smell of the droning thudbugs, the sultry heat rising from the planting bins, the huffing breath of his fellow Jedi, even the Yuzhan Vong. Their presence was as distinct to him as that of his own companions, almost as though the Force had somehow expanded to include them. Firing as he ran, Anakin raced along the rising door. Every bolt blasted a Yuzhan Vong foot. Muffled roars reverberated through the membrane. Ahead of him, half a dozen warriors dropped and rolled into the grashel. He blasted these before they could rise, then reached the other end and stroked the tickle pad. The door lowered again. Hot breath. Jaina cursed over the comlink. She's escaping. Anakin could feel it, too. The Voxen was moving down and away. He activated his own comlink. The imposter must have opened an escape tunnel. It no longer hurt to speak, but his aura had gone from faint to bright. His cells were burning like fire. Jason, you're in charge. Take everyone and go after her. Jaina's surprise at not having her own name called carried through the force like a shout across water. But she stifled any resentment she felt and said, 
Can't get there, little brother. The path will clear. Anakin slashed the membrane tickle pad and circled toward the empty Voxen pen. He could feel Yuzhan Vong ahead, crouching behind the last row of planting bins, secure in the knowledge that help was coming. That changed a moment later, when Anakin began to pour blaster fire into their flank. His angle was poor for headshots and his bolts too weak to penetrate Von Doon crab armor, but by the time the Yuzhan Vong realized that, they were being overrun by Jedi. A plasma ball roared through the Grashel door and set fire to a twenty-meter swath of cloning vines. Anakin charged back toward the melted membrane, miniature forks of lightning dancing off his arms and legs, the force swirling through him like fire, burning more ferociously every moment. He was completely filled with the strength of the light side now. His injured body could hold no more. The energy was burning its way out of him, consuming a vessel too weakened to contain it. Yuzhan Vong, their feet fully intact, poured in five abreast. He dropped the first rank from fifteen meters out, his blaster pistol singing out twice between each step, every bolt burning through a face or a throat. The volcano cannon roared again, and a sphere of white fire blossomed in front of him, seemingly from nowhere. Anakin dived and rolled into the wall, hit boots first, sprang into a backflip, returned to his feet ten meters from the explosion. Anakin! Janus' cry resembled a scream. Go, he commanded her through the Force. She's getting away. The blaster sang out in Anakin's hand, dropping Yuzhan Vong as fast as it could fire. More warriors poured in. A razor bug buried itself in his shoulder, his jumpsuit half disintegrated by the Force energy escaping his body and no longer much protection. He allowed the impact to spin him around, fired again, and once more heard the depletion alarm. The Yuzhan Vong hurled handfuls of thud bugs and rushed, already pulling amphistaffs off their waists. Anakin threw the blaster pistol at the first and dropped him and leapt the second, thumbing his lightsaber to life in the air. He landed in front of the entrance and began a whirling dance of slash and parry, blocking once and striking twice, every attack a killing blow. His aura was burning so brightly that he cast shadows behind his foes. He batted the blade, left to right, overpowering two blocks to open two throats, then sent another warrior tumbling with a hook kick to the head. And still they came, piercing Anakin in three places, one amphistaff sinking its fangs into his flesh. The force scalded the poison from his system before he felt it, and the new wounds troubled him less than the old one. But there were a dozen more warriors behind them, and he could not hold forever. He killed another, then another, took a crippling slash to his thigh, and gave ground. The Yuzhan Vong rushed, trying to slip past to the right. The long blaster roared from the pen area, blowing a head sized hole through one Yuzhan Vong and a fist sized hole through the one behind him. Anakin launched himself into a backflip and landed five meters away. His aura flickered wildly as his cells began to burn and burst. He hazarded a glance over his shoulder and saw Jaina peering over the pit wall, tears streaming down her cheeks, the long blaster propped against her shoulder. Jason was beside her, likewise weeping, trying to pull her away. Go, Anakin said through the force. I can't hold. The Yuzhan Vong charged again and Jaina fired. Another warrior fell, and the rest came. Anakin flipped another five meters back, then felt someone, a Yuzhan Vong, creeping along the far wall of the Grashel. He retreated until he could see the figure, the Jedi imposter, perhaps thirty meters distant, dragging a heavy cargo pod toward the strike team's makeshift opening. The warriors arrived again, and Anakin had to defend himself. Purple blade ticking back and forth, blocking and parrying and slipping strike after strike. He faded two steps and saw an opening. He brought his feet up and planted his heels in the center Yuzhan Vong's chest. His lightsaber flashed twice, cleaving the skulls of the adjacent warriors. Then he kicked off, launching himself into a series of force-assisted cartwheels. Anakin continued far enough to see where the imposter had come from, a work area near the Queen's pen. 
Dozens of tendrils lay stretched along a workbench, each ending in a small cloning pod, some open, some closed. It looked like a tissue transfer station. That was what the imposter had. A cargo pod full of voxen tissue, enough to clone a million. Anakin's aura flashed and dimmed, flashed again and dimmed more. His cells rupturing in chain reactions, the cycles coming faster and faster as less of him remained to contain the energy. He felt himself not exactly departing, but melting back into the Force. He pulled his last thermal detonator off his harness and thumbed the timer three clicks. Go now. Anakin, I can't, Gina calmed. Anakin raised the detonator so his brother and sister could see. Thirty seconds. He released the trigger. Take her, Jason. Kiss Tahiri for me. With the charging warriors almost on him again, Anakin threw the detonator across the grashel. He wasn't conscious of using the Force to guide it, but he must have because it hit the imposter in the head. Anakin was too busy parrying to see what happened for the next few seconds, but when he finally managed to spring away from his attackers, he was no longer strong enough to flip or cartwheel. The imposter was gathering himself up, rubbing his head and searching for what had struck him. Even from thirty meters, his broken nose and misshapen eye orbit identified him clearly as no monor. When the executor's gaze fell on the silver sphere, his real eye grew as large as his Pleiarian bowl. He reached down. Anakin used the force to nudge the sphere away, then caught an amphistaff in the ribs and went down hard, letting his lightsaber fall from his hand. His aura was only a faint glow, flickering between dim and non-existent. The maelstrom inside was dying away now, flowing back into the Force. Omanor rushed for the detonator again. Anakin waited, waited until the executor was almost on it, then reached out with the Force one last time, rolling the sphere toward the cargo pod. He did not hear the angry curse that followed, nor did he see Nomanor fleeing at a dead run. By then, Anakin was gone. Chapter 44 No way they're coming for Eclipse. Not with the armada that left Borlias. Kent Hamner was saying. Now serving as the official liaison between the Jedi and the New Republic, he had arrived an hour before to report some alarming Yuzhan Vong fleet movements. Even if they could bring that many ships in here, it would take a standard year to stage through the hyperspace gauntlet. The Jedi's best tacticians were gathered in the Eclipse War Room, studying the three displays Luke had put up. One hologram showed the array of hyperspace routes spraying outward from the planet Borlios. Another showed the tortuous route into Eclipse, along with the planet itself hidden behind its screen of asteroid belts and gas giant neighbors. The third hologram showed the entire Coruscant system, and it was to this map that everyone's eye kept drifting, specifically to an obscure cluster of comets on the capital planet's side of the system. Mara pointed into the swirling mass of comet tails. And there are uncharted asteroids, orbiting with the Oborins? We're keeping an eye on them, Kenth said. We can take them out any time. No one suggested that the asteroids might be anything but reconnaissance vessels. Corrin Horn, who was one of the Jedi studying the display, had confirmed not long before that Space Rock was a favorite camouflage for Yuzhan Vong scout ships. This is it, then, Luke said. He adjusted the hollow projector, annulling the displays of the Borlias hyperspace routes and the Eclipse system. Then, when his connection to Anakin suddenly began to strengthen, failed to enlarge the Coruscant map. He flashed on an image of Yuzhan Vong charging past a tangle of burning vines, of a purple blade ticking back and forth, of a golden light burning in a dark place. Luke could feel that his nephew was calm and focused, in harmony with the Force and himself, but weak and growing weaker. Master Skywalker? Corrin asked. What is it? Luke turned away and did not answer. He knew that Saba Sebatine had felt the Hara sisters die, and others were gone, too. He could not feel who, only that there was a growing Jedi absence in the Force. 
Now the strike team was losing Anakin as well, and Luke had sent him, had sent them all. Luke? Mara was standing behind him, taking his hand. Luke let her, but reached out for Jason and Jaina, found them filled with sorrow and horror, fear and rage, but alive at least, and strong. Then Anakin was gone. Luke felt like the Yuzhan Vong had reached inside and torn his nephew out of his own body. There was a black void in his heart, a tempest so fierce and cold he began to shake uncontrollably. Luke, stop. Mara's fingers dug into his arm and jerked him around to face her. You've got to shut it down. Then we'll feel you. Think of what this will do to him. Then... Luke covered Mara's hand with his and drew in on himself, dampening his presence in the Force, and losing his connection to the twins. Unable to contain the anger rising up inside him and unwilling to inflict it on his son, he turned and brought his hand down on the hollow projector. Master Skywalker, Kent gasped. It's Anakin, Mara said. Anakin? Oh... The room broke into groans and startled outcries. Then Corin managed to ask, Master Skywalker, what can we do? What indeed, Luke wondered. He looked to Mara, struggling to regain his composure and focus his thoughts. The question was not what they could do, but what they had to do. Anakin, Luke choked on the words. Tried again. Anakin died for a reason. Corrin and the others waited in silence and looked to him expectantly. What we need to do is prep our battle wings, Mara said, taking charge. She turned to Kent and get in touch with Admiral Sav. We're going to need a place to berth when we get to Coruscant. With circles under his eyes almost as dark as his glassy black Sullustan pupils themselves, General Yeel's vid image suggested that of a chubby cheeked Yuzhan Vong child, a spoiled chubby cheeked Yuzhan Vong child. Han banged the heel of his palm on the comm desk out of vidcam pickup and pasted a forbearing smile on his face. I'm not saying installation security is lax, General Yeel, Han said. He was with Lando in the study of his East Port apartment, trying to do the New Republic a favor and finding it impossible as usual. But Vicky Shesh was on Nermak. She could have slipped an infiltrator onto a shielding crew any time in the last two years. Why take a chance? Do you have evidence of that Solo? Not General Solo or Retired General or even Han, but just Solo. If you have evidence, I will institute a review at once. I don't have evidence. That's the point. Han ran a hand over his brow. Look, what could it hurt to assign a couple of YVHs to every generator station? This is a great deal. Yes, free is a great deal, Yil replied. What's wrong with them? Lando slipped into the vidcam's view. Nothing is wrong with them, General, I assure you. I'm a loyal citizen of the New Republic, doing everything he can to help. Yeel looked doubtful. Wasn't it a YVH droid that failed to protect Chief of State Failure when infiltrators attacked him? That was a glitch in the demonstration program, Lando said patiently. The droids I'm donating to the New Republic will be combat-ready. Fully combat-ready. That is what frightens me, Calrissian. Yeel blinked twice, then placed his arms on his table and leaned toward his vidcam. Chief of State Failure asked me to take your call, and I have. But I am not going to put new technology into my generating stations without a full compatibility evaluation. And Planetary Shielding will not be conducting any evaluations until we know where the fleet at Borlias has gone. I'm sorry, Calrissian. An anguished wail echoed down the corridor, so shrill and frenzied that Han did not recognize the voice as human, much less Leia's, until he was already out of his chair and snatching his blaster holster off the table. Leia! 
If anything, the wailing grew louder and less human. Han raced down the corridor to Leia's private study, where he found Adarak and Miwal, flanking the desk and looking uncharacteristically confused and helpless. The furred image of the Boffin General of the Orbital Defense Command was staring out of the vid screen, looking confused and inanely repeating, Princess Leia? Princess Leia! Leia herself was lying on the floor, curled into a fetal ball and screaming something incomprehensible. When Han saw no obvious threat in the room, he knelt at Leia's side and grabbed her arm. Leia? She did not seem to realize he was there. Her eyes were rimmed in red, and her tears were pooling on the floor. And the only thing Han could get out of her was a long, Ah! Uh... The Boffin General continued to repeat, Princess Leia? Princess Leia! Lando came into the room, and, ignoring the comm unit, put a hand on Han's shoulder. What is it? Han shook his head and looked to the Nogri. Lady Vader was speaking with General Batra, Miwal explained. She was explaining how Lady Rysant Calrissian is already on her way with a thousand hunter ones. Then she suddenly stopped speaking. Leia grasped Han's arm and began to sputter. Ah, ah. And Han knew. Anakin was gone. And Leia had felt him die. Princess Leia, Batra droned. Princess, are you... Finding the DL-44 still in his hand, Han used it to blast the comm unit silent. It felt so good that he turned the weapon on the holopad and blasted that, too. And then the security system vid bank and anything else that crackled and made sparks when a supercharged particle beam burned a hole through it. Han! Lando cried. Han, what are you doing? He's dead. Han shot a data pad off Leia's desk then sent Lando diving by swinging the blaster around to target a holographic wall panel. They killed our boy. Han pulled the trigger and watched the pinnacles of Terrarium City erupt into a spark storm. Then Adarak was on him, trapping his blaster arm in a control lock and wrenching the weapon away. Han collapsed to his haunches and began to sob. Now too weary to be angry too certain of the look in Leia's eyes to doubt the truth. Leia did not seem to notice any of this. Still wailing in anguish, she gathered herself up and ran from the room. Han watched her go, realized somewhere in the back of his mind that Ben was crying. Lando squatted at his side. Blaster arm still locked in Adarak's grasp. Han looked over at his old friend. Anakin is gone. Han, I'm sorry. Lando squatted at Han's side, then caught Adarak's eye and nodded toward the door. First Chewie, and now this. I can't imagine. I can't either. Those terrible things I said to him. Han said. In the back of the apartment, Ben was crying more ferociously than ever, and Leia was sobbing even more loudly. I drove him to it. He had to prove no. Lando leaned in close and locked gazes. Listen to me, old buddy. Anakin died because he was a Jedi Knight, doing what Jedi Knights do. Not because of what happened to Chewbacca. Not because he was trying to prove anything to you. How would you know? Han snapped. He was lashing out, not because Lando had said anything wrong, but because the anger was returning, and... He needed to be angry with someone. He wasn't your son. No, he wasn't. A pained, perhaps even guilty look came to Lando's eyes. But I was the one who turned him over to the Yuzhan Vong. He didn't blame himself for what happened to Chewbacca, and he knew how much you loved him. Everyone could see that. The gentleness in Lando's voice robbed Han of his anger, and substituted despair instead. He knew that his friend was only trying to comfort him, to keep him from falling apart like he had after Chewbacca's death. But the words rang hollow. Han knew how he had behaved after Chewie died, how he had taken out his anger on Anakin and let the rest of his family drift apart while he wallowed in his grief. 
He had nearly lost them, and now it was happening again. And this time Leia was not going to be there to pull them all together again. This time Leia would need someone else to be strong. C-3PO clunked into the room, his electronic voice shrill with alarm. Someone, please help. Mistress Leia has switched Nana off, and now she's going to crush him. Keeping one hand on Han's shoulder, Lando rose. Crush who, C-3PO? C-3PO threw his golden arms into the air. Ben, she won't let him go. I'll see what I can do. Lando pushed C-3PO at Han and started for the door. Watch him. No, Lando. I'll go. Han grabbed C-3PO's arm and pulled himself to his feet. It'll need to be me. Lando lifted his brow. Are you up to this? Han nodded. I'll have to be. He led the way to the nursery in the back of the apartment. Leia was standing in front of a transparisteel viewing pane, clutching Ben to her shoulder and staring out at the passing hover traffic, patting him on the back and swaying gently from foot to foot. If she realized that he was crying at all, she did not seem to recognize that it was because of her own keening. Han went to her side and shooed the Nogri away, then slipped a hand between Leia and the baby. Let go, Leia. He gently began to pry Ben free. You need to let me take him. Her gaze drifted toward his face, but her eyes seemed to look through him without seeing anything. Han? That's right. Han caught Lando's eye and passed him Ben, then wrapped Leia in his arms and held her. Just held her. I'm here, princess. I'll always be here. Chapter 45 They came like snow, at first a few contacts dropping out of hyperspace, then a steady shower cascading down toward the Oberyn comet cluster, then finally a data blizzard that swept Luke's tactical display white with vector lines and bogey symbols. Outlying sensors confirm hostile contacts. Even over the battle net, the signals coordinator, SIGCOR, sounded jittery. Stand by for a message from Admiral Sav. The Admiral's nasal voice came over the battle net, addressing what amounted to half of the New Republic Space Navy in a less than inspiring Sulliston monotone. Luke's attention began to wander almost immediately. Still reeling from Anakin's death, he could not help second guessing himself, re examining his decision to let his nephew embark on such a dangerous mission. Had he overestimated the strike team's abilities? or underestimated those of the Yuzhan Vong? Mara's voice came over a private channel. Luke, stop beating yourself up. You can't carry a load like that into battle. I know, Mara. There were times when Luke truly wished his emotions were not an open book to his wife. This was one of them. But it's not so easy. I keep thinking I let them go on a suicide mission. You didn't, Mara said. Does Leia blame you? Leia is in no condition to blame anyone, Luke said. He could feel his sister's anguish beneath his own, a numb, almost physical pain not so different from what he had experienced when he lost his hand to Darth Vader. She was in shock, struggling to accept that a part of herself was gone forever. But... You heard how Han was. He was worried about Leia. That's what he said, Luke replied. This time Mara did not argue. Luke could sense how frightened she was about leaving Ben with Han and Leia, while they were both so grief-stricken. But he knew better than to suggest again that she go to Coruscant. She had already told him she would go after the battle, and even Luke Skywalker— especially Luke Skywalker, knew better than to press Mara once she had made up her mind. A moment later, Mara said, Luke, it would have been wrong to deny your nephew his chance to save the Jedi, and Han and Leia know it too. Think back to that meeting in the crater room. They're the ones who told you to let him go. 
knowing Mara would sense his nod even if she could not see it, Luke remained quiet and began to concentrate on his breathing, employing a Jedi relaxation technique to focus his thoughts. The truth was, he had a bad feeling about the coming battle that had nothing to do with Anakin. With what they had planned, Eclipse was going to lose pilots. Maybe a lot of them. Admiral Sov captured Luke's attention again by thanking him and the Jedi intelligence apparatus for alerting the defense force to the time and place of the enemy's arrival. This drew a chuckle from Mara and the rest of the Jedi Knights. The apparatus had been a growing sense among the more powerful masters that there was trouble coming from the Oborin Comet Cluster. Given that the Force was blind to the Yuzhan Vong, the Jedi had been mystified by the feelings and reluctant to act on them, until they learned from Talon Card that a huge Yuzhan Vong assault fleet had departed Borlias about the same time the sensations began. Admiral Sav who had been looking for political cover to concentrate his defenses around Coruscant, had seized on the feelings as a reliable report from Jedi intelligence, and used them as an excuse to recall several outlying fleets. Wedge had told Luke privately that the Admiral did not really expect the Yuzhan Vong to show, but had set up today's ambush for the sake of maintaining appearances. When contacts finally stopped dropping out of hyperspace on the tactical display, Sov said, the moment is upon us, my friends. Please switch to your assigned battle channel now, and may the Force be with you. Luke opened the channel assigned to Eclipse. You all know what we're attempting, and why. Stay in formation, and follow your squadron leader's orders. The battle will turn on us. And the war on the battle. Several voices replied. We know, Master Skywalker. Saba Sebatine said. You have said this seven times already. This drew a nervous laugh from both Eclipse wings. Luke would have liked to do his part to ease the tension with a witty comeback, but found that part of his mind still too fogged by grief. Sorry. Just wanted to be sure. Control. Stand by for target identification, Corrin said. Hisser. Go ahead and stick your nose out. Everyone else, hold positions. Saba's blast boat slipped out of formation and eased alongside the comet, a wide-swinging stray, behind which the Eclipse squadrons were hiding. Luke switched his tactical feed from fleet to Jedi. The display image rotated ninety degrees, so that the main body of the comet cluster now hung along one side, and the contacts were streaking horizontally across the screen. The counter at the bottom of the display read in the tens of thousands, and still rising. A small square appeared in the center of Luke's tactical display, outlining a set of five blips near the heart of the invading fleet. Danny Kui's voice came over the comm channel. Yamisk located. We'll pinpoint which vessel when the fighting heats up. Everyone fast and furious? Corrin asked. Luke checked his command display to confirm that the status readout for each craft in his squadron read full DSW, drives, shields, and weapons. When he found everything at full capability, he opened his emotions to Tam, the third member of his and Mara's shielding trio, and chinned his microphone. Sabres are good. When the other three squadrons also verified, Corrin cleared them for launch. Both wings, seventy-two X-wings and eight supercharged blast boats, dropped out from behind their comet and accelerated to near light, closing so rapidly that they were past the perimeter pickets before the Yuzhan Vong could loose a magma missile. Luke took the lead, plotting an interception vector that would carry them into the heart of the main fleet without making their target obvious. Well done, Corrin calmed. The tactical display shifted scales, now showing Luke's two wings of blue symbols surrounded by a sea of yellow Yuzhan Vong symbols, each displaying the ship's mass, analog class, and, when the jolly man's computers could match the attributes to a profile in the databank, occasionally even a name. Intent on pushing through the comet cluster and carrying through on its surprise attack, the enemy fleet maintained its loose formation so that each vessel would have maneuvering room. 
When Luke looked outside the cockpit, he could see the ships only as black areas, blotting out the distant starlight. This far from Coruscant's sun, there was little light to illuminate their dark hulls. A frigate identified as the Reaver loosed the first Yuzhan Vong salvo, but only one plasma ball was leading the fast-moving attack wings far enough to strike home. It hit one of the shocker's X-wings and, overwhelming the shields, reduced the starfighter to a flash of photons and atoms. "'Hold your fire,' Luke ordered. He began to jink and swerve, deliberately keeping both combat wings between two vessels at all times, so enemy gunners would risk hitting their own ships if they fired and missed. "'If we stop to fight, we're lost.' As they streaked deeper into the fleet, the Yuzhan Vong kept up a steady but ineffectual dribble of fire, all the while maneuvering to clear a firing lane. It was a futile exercise against the nimble X-Wings and their blast boat escorts. With the surveillance crews on the Jolly Man watching their backs, Luke always knew when a lane was opening and slid into a new attack vector. The Shockers lost one of their blast boats to a magma missile but the crew retaliated by mass-firing their torpedoes and bombs before going EV. Almost half the volley penetrated the cruiser's shielding singularities, and a long line of breaches began to vent bodies and atmosphere from the port side. A skip carrier decelerated and turned to cut them off. As soon as coral skippers began to drop off the vessel and form up, Danny's targeting square shrank and isolated an unnamed heavy cruiser in the heart of the five-ship group she had designated earlier. Yamas confirmed. Luke studied the tactical display, then touched a finger to a destroyer analog well off their current vector. The name beneath the destroyer was Sunalok. Designate secondary, R2. A circle appeared around the vessel and Luke opened a comm channel to Corrin. Control, are we clear for a diversionary launch on that one? We'll bump over and slide away on the other side. You're good to go, farm boy. Corrin divided the target into attack sectors by squadron, then calmed Luke. By the way, Sigcor says they're reading Ion Tails at the front of the fleet. Ion Tails? Yuzhan Vong did not use Ion Drives. Maybe they're bringing the Peace Brigade along, Mara said. That would explain how we felt them coming. Luke stretched his awareness of the Force forward. He found nothing for a moment, then felt a whole wall of life at the forward edge of the fleet. Too many for a crime cartel. I feel two or three million beings there. Must be one of their slave armies, Tam said. Luke was not so sure. The presence lacked the muted, static-like sense caused by the head growths the Yuzhan Vong used to control their slaves, but he had no time to contemplate what else he might be feeling. The skip carrier was dropping the last of its coral skippers, and the first squadrons were already coming out to meet them. X-wings slow. Blast boats break, Luke ordered. The seven surviving blast boats turned hard, swinging in behind the destroyer analog's rearmost escort frigates. Luke waited until their vector had straightened, then gave the command for the X-wings to follow. All four squadrons pivoted on their bellies, reverse-firing two engines and overthrusting the opposite pair, and were instantly flashing past the blast boats toward the two escorts. Flashes of ruby fire blossomed from the frigates' rocky sterns as they belched magma missiles at their attackers. Luke dropped his nose and dived for two seconds to force the Yuzhan Vong gunners to fully depress their launchers, then snapped into a climb and accelerated past their sterns while they tried to readjust. He checked his tactical display and saw a dozen squadrons of coral skippers swinging after them from the skip carrier. But their pursuit angle was so poor, they would never reach the killing zone behind the X-wings. When Luke raised his eyes again, it was to find space burning around him. He thought for an instant he had been hit, but felt no surge of concern for Mara or Tam. He gave his hand over to the Force, and continued to jink and juke in tandem with his shielding companions, and the firestorm quickly resolved itself into exploding plasma balls and streaking magma missiles. A crackle of static announced the destruction of someone in his squadron, and R2-D2 scolded him with a long series of whistles. 
I don't like it either, R2, Luke said. But Admiral Sov is depending on us. The maelstrom faded as quickly as it had erupted, and Luke checked his tactical display. He had taken his squadrons exactly where he intended, midway between the two escorts. But this pair had shown no fear of firing in each other's direction. He had lost one of the Sabre's blast boats, while the Dozen and the Shockers had both lost an X-Wing. The frigates had paid a deep price for Mr. Tax, however. Both symbols were blinking steadily to show that they were moderately damaged. We must be doing something right, Kip calmed. They really don't want us near that big rock. Another pair of escorts came into view, their sterns sparkling with missile launches. The Sunalok's tail was now visible between them, a dark disk the size of a thumb tip. Luke went into an evasive dive and rise, and missile trails began to streak past above and below. He checked the tactical display and found the dozen squadrons from the skip carrier still on their tail. It looks like we'll have to take this ruse all the way, he calmed. We'll separate by squadrons and run hulls past the escorts. Shockers and dozen left. Sabres and knights right. The order was acknowledged by a flurry of comm clicks. Then the four squadrons separated into pairs. Luke led the sabres and knights on an undulating course toward the escort on the right. Narrowly escaping a trio of plasma balls launched in a desperation spread, he brought his X-Wing in above the frigate's weapon banks and skimmed its flank barely two meters off the hull. To his surprise, both escorts continued to attack the squadrons opposite, pouring so much fire into each other that R2-D2 had to reinforce the particle shields because of all the Yorick coral geysering up in their path. Danny, you're sure the Yamask is on the cruiser? Kip calmed. Because the way there... I'm sure. The Yamask is going crazy. Danny's transmission ended in a crackle of static. Then she came back yelling, Drift! Luke did not need to check his command display to know that Saba had lost one of her Jedi pilots. He felt the Barabel die. The sabers reached the bow of the frigate, and he immediately angled across the nose, both to confuse the enemy weapon crews and to set the squadron up for their diversionary attack run. Then the comm speaker crackled with a huge pulse of static, and a nova bright flash illuminated space behind Luke. He checked his tactical display and saw the adjacent escort coming apart just behind the shockers, engulfing Kip's dozen in flame and debris and hurling X-wings in every direction. Three, four, and finally five symbols winked out as starfighters exploded. Then the blast boats went, and two more pilots went EV. Headhunter. Corin calmed. Headhunter, are you there? No answer. Any dozener? Again, no answer. Just fried circuits, Rigard said optimistically. We had a good spike ourselves. Let's hope so, Luke said. He checked his display and saw that six of the skip squadrons pursuing them were peeling off to go after what remained of the dozen. Dozeners, if you can hear this, you're out of action. Run if you can, or shut down and try to hide. The order was answered by a single, scratchy comm click. Luke felt Mara reach out to him, silently urging him to forget the sinking feeling in his stomach and concentrate on the task at hand. Luke turned back to the Sunalok and found the destroyer analog's stern swelling up before him. As big as a sand crawler and growing fast, a half dozen weapon stations spitting plasma balls the size of banthas. Arm one proton torpedo, Luke ordered. Fire on my mark, then go over the top and be ready to break. By the time the last comm click had acknowledged his order, Luke had lost his second blast boat to one of the big plasma balls and the Sunalok's wing of coral skippers was streaming back beneath the destroyer's belly to engage the X-Wings. Ready? Mark, Luke ordered. The blue glow of fifty ion drives filled the darkness and resolved itself into a dazzling wall of receding circles. The shielding crews began to work their Dovin basils, capturing perhaps a third of the proton torpedoes and forcing the proximity fuses to detonate a safe distance from the Sunalok. Luke pulled up, angling for the top of the destroyer analog, 
and watched with satisfaction as the rest of the torpedoes struck home. The entire stern came apart, hurling a wall of flame and Yorick coral pebbles in front of the approaching X-wings. Relying on their shields for protection, they shot through the rubble and streaked along the spine of the wounded ship. Luke continued for perhaps a half kilometer, then broke off sharply and dived toward the heavy cruiser. R2-D2 tweedled helpfully and displayed a message for Luke. Thanks, R2. Luke armed the rest of his torpedoes and shadow bombs. Twenty seconds to target. Preparing for the main attack run. Copy. Corrin was quiet for an instant, then said, Message relayed. Good hunting. They were halfway to their target when a wall of New Republic turbolaser fire erupted from the main body of the comet cluster and briefly silhouetted the entire Yuzhan Vong fleet. It looked like nothing more menacing than a vast field of black lozenge-shaped asteroids, but Luke experienced a terrible disturbance in the force as several thousand beings from their own galaxy were blasted back to their elemental atoms. Everything went dark again, and an uneasy silence settled over the Eclipse comm channels. Though only half of the pilots and crew in the combat wings were force-sensitive, the rest had been around Jedi long enough to have some idea of what their battlemates were experiencing. An instant later, the vanguard of the Yuzhan Vong fleet responded to the ambush with a lightning storm of crimson flashes and streaking fireballs. The New Republic turbolasers flashed to life again, the force quavering with another thousand deaths, and the battle exploded into its full horror. Luke saw a pair of frigates accelerating to cut them off from the cruiser. He touched his tactical display, designating the rearmost one as a secondary target. We'll go through this one, he said. Hisser, will you take the lead? My honor, the bearer bell replied. The wild knights drew a tight formation and moved forward, a golden aura slowly expanding around Saba's blast boat. The frigates dropped their skips and began to pour more fire into the glowing ball of radiance, which only made it grow faster, as Ezal Waz used the force to trap the light. Once the sphere was large enough, Luke lined the other two squadrons up behind it, picking off skips as they tried desperately to fight their way into the golden orb and stop the wild knights. As Danny had described happening at Arcania, the frigate eventually grew so nervous about the approaching sphere that it turned a shielding singularity on it, the glow ball abruptly lengthened as it was caught and accelerated by the gravity of the tiny black hole. Drop the block, Saba ordered. By the time she finished giving the command, the glow ball had stretched into an ovoid twice as long as it was thick. Ezal Waz let the golden sphere fade away, and the Wild Knight's X-wings fanned out, already firing proton torpedoes. The shielding crews scrambled to redirect their singularities, and never saw the two-ton block of black durasteel that it had just accelerated to several hundred thousand kilometers an hour. The frigate did not explode so much as flash out of existence, and the wings from Eclipse suddenly found themselves diving on their target through a cloud of superheated dust. A full wing of skips came boiling out of the cruiser to intercept them. The ship itself opened up with all batteries, pouring constant streams of fire from its bow and stern in an attempt to force the attacking X-wings to come at it amidships and meet its coral skippers. Time to try out Control's new targeting system, Luke said. Break into your shielding trios and go down the center. And don't stop to dogfight. Those skips from the carrier are still on your tail, Corrin said. He switched to a private channel, then added, And, farm boy, you need to get this right the first time. Listen. There was a scratchy pause as Corrin patched in the civilian emergency channel, then a confused babble filled Luke's cockpit. A moment later, he began to recognize individual voices, and wished he hadn't. On us, please. We're civilians from... Is the happy hut with five thousand refugees... Meteor Racer out. Six hundred transponders just came on, Luke, Corrin said. They confirm what you're hearing. Of course they do. Luke needed no further explanation to know what was happening. 
He recognized the Happy Hut as one of the refugee ships missing from the evacuation of Raltier, and he felt certain that a records search would turn up the meteor racer's name as well. The Yamask cruiser's wing of skips began to fire at maximum range, no doubt trying to force their attackers to decelerate and be caught from behind. Instead, the X-wings and blast boats continued forward at maximum firing velocity. Luke clicked off with Korn and had R2-D2 activate his supplementary targeting system. The reticle quickly locked onto the gravitational pulses coming from the Dovin basal in his target's nose. With lasers quadded on full power, he squeezed the trigger. One bolt streaked out a millisecond ahead of the others, following the targeting lock straight toward the skip's nose. The rest diverged according to a carefully calculated ratio of distance and velocity until they were caught by the gravity of the skip's shielding system and bent back inward. The first bolt vanished into the singularity. The other three converged three meters behind it, taking the coral skipper directly in the pilot's compartment. Almost as good as the force, Luke said. He found a pair of skips coming out of the field of detonations that had been the cruiser wing a moment before, and set his targeting reticle on the one on the left. Already spoken for, Mara said. She and Tam fired simultaneously. A moment later, both skips vanished. Sorry, farm boy. You're forgiven, Luke said. With its entire detachment of skips eliminated in the flash of an eye, the cruiser began to concentrate its fire in the approach lane. Knowing that even one of its big plasma balls would take out an entire shielding trio, Luke ordered his wings to fan out. As quick as the pilots were to obey, one trio of sabers evaporated into the flame, and the shockers lost their last blast boat. But now the cruiser was laid out before them. A kilometer-long lozenge of dark Yorick coral, striped with bands of knobby weapons banks. With Mara to one side and Tam to the other, Luke juked and jinked for a three-count, firing his quadded lasers into roiling clouds of flame while he gave the rest of his pilots time to reach firing position. Finally, they were ready. Fire everything you have. We won't be coming back. Luke fired the two proton torpedoes from his open bank, fired three more from the other bank, then dropped the shadow bombs stored in the XJ-3's third set of launchers and used the force to send them on their way. He saw the first two torpedoes vanish into a shielding singularity, then a plasma ball erupted from a weapon nodule ahead, coming so quickly at this distance that he barely had time to slide out of the way and kiss wings with Mara. Close, farm boy. Luke eased away, then winced inwardly, as she dipped her own X-wing and sent a magma missile ricocheting off her shields. You're one to talk, Luke calmed. Then the attacks dwindled away, and finally they could see the flames and debris erupting from the breaches their shadow bombs and torpedoes had torn into the hull. In some places, secondary explosions could be seen rolling down sections of exposed deck, and there were clouds of bodies and material billowing out into the vacuum. Luke decelerated as much as he dared with the skips coming behind them and locked down the trigger of his laser cannon, burning round after round into the interior of the cruiser. Danny, what's the Yamask status? Quieting, but still alive. Luke checked the tactical display and found the skips from the carrier still thirty seconds behind them. What part of the vessel? Luke asked. Negative, farm boy, Corrin said. We talked about this. You had your shot. Now get out of there. Danny, what part? Luke demanded. Mara's apprehension level spiked. Farm boy, one dead hero. There are a lot of dead heroes out there today. Too many to leave this undone. Luke checked his tactical display. Twenty seconds. Where? Now. Try lower deck midships, Danny said. I can't be sure. Now take one more shot. Luke angled toward the middle of the ship and continued to decelerate. Everyone else, go. Not on your life, Mara said. She and Tam decelerated along with him. With the rest of the wing flying cover, they began to work their way along the cruiser's hull, pushing through the body clouds 
and sticking their noses into likely-looking holes. Farmboy, you have fifteen seconds before those skips are all over you, Corin said. And there's something else. He patched the fleet command channel through. You to cease fire, Sov's nasal voice was shouting. The New Republic Navy does not butcher its own people. We are not butchering them, Garm Beliblis countered. The Yuzhan Vong are. We are trying to fire around them. And, failing miserably, General, Triest Crefe countered. What about Coruscant? Garm argued. What about the Jedi? Do you know how many pilots they lost to give us this chance? Corrin deactivated the channel. Luke, the Yuzhan Vong are already pushing through the comet cluster. Rather than fire through the refugee screen, Trieste is falling back and trying to maneuver. Garm will have to join him soon or be cut off, and Wedge is two minutes behind schedule because the battle is moving toward Coruscant. According to Sov's original plan, Wedge would be the hammer falling on Garm and Trieste's anvil, sweeping in from behind the Yuzhan Vong to drive them into the ambush. Wedge can still surprise them if the Yamask is dead, Luke said. He could sense that Mara felt betrayed by Sov's decision not to fire on the refugees, but Luke was not so sure. Would a New Republic willing to attack through a fleet of its own people be worth saving? This isn't over yet. Five seconds, farm boy. Luke stuck his X-Wing's nose into a breach just below the dormant weapons bank and burned through two more decks, puncturing a sealed bulkhead and sucking a long stream of startled Yuzhan Vong out into the vacuum. You found it, Danny exclaimed. He was joined by Mara and Tam. Combined, their fire was enough to blast through the other side of the vessel, and Luke glimpsed a many-tentacled creature flying out the breach amid a cloud of frozen vapor. That's— Danny's confirmation dissolved into static as the skip's plasma ball dissipated against the blast boat's shields. The attack was answered instantly by a storm of laser cannon fire— but staying to fight was the last thing on Luke's mind. He pulled his X-wing out of the breach and dropped the nose. Break off. Luke led the way under the cruiser and up on the other side, forcing the oncoming skips to decelerate or risk having the X-wings pop up on their tails. Without the Yamask to coordinate them, the coral skippers reacted in disarray. Some streaked over the cruiser at full speed and some under while others stopped cautiously on the other side. Luke sighed in silent relief, then calmed. Let's go find Wedge. We've got to refuel, rearm, and return, Saba said. She sounded more eager than determined. There are still plenty of Yuzhan Vong for everyone. Chapter 46 They had eaten worse things, the sour fungus growing on the walls of Nola Tarcona's real mines came to mind. So Jason knew it was not his sister's delicate sensibilities that kept her from choking down the tasteless pulp Alima had commandeered from their terrified Yuzhan Vong host. Nor was it the urgency of their situation. The strike team was hiding in a one-room lodging cell on the outskirts of a domicile warren deep inside the world ship trying to stay out of sight until Tisa reported back with news of the Queen's location. They had seen no sign of Nomanor or his troops since the battle in the Grashel, when they had escaped by bringing the passage ceiling down behind them and fleeing into the heart of the world ship. Jason scooped a bowl full of pulp from a shell-like serving basin and pressed it into Jaina's hands. I don't feel like eating either, but you need to keep up your strength— Jaina hurled the gruel against the bioluminescent wall. Their Yuzhan Vong captive, a lowly worker who was almost attractive in her utter lack of mutilations or tattoos, cringed in the corner as though the bowl had been thrown at her. The lichen began to glow more brightly as it absorbed nutrients, and no one spoke. Jason could feel the guilt and anger tearing his sister apart, though her emotions were so intermingled with his own that he could barely distinguish them. They shared a void that would never again be whole, an emptiness that he sensed pulling at Jaina like a vacuum breach. He laid a hand on her knee, hoping his touch might serve as her anchor. 
We can't give up. We still need to destroy the Queen. Jaina looked up, a faint spark of presence finally showing in her vacant eyes. You left him to the Yuzhan Vong. We had to, Jason said, accepting the rebuke. As much as he himself was hurting, he would rather Jaina lay the blame boiling up inside her on his shoulders than her own. They were all over him. You saw that? Jaina pushed his hand from her leg. He put you in charge, and you left him behind. Jason said nothing. Though he knew his sister's own feelings of guilt were driving her to accuse him, he did not trust himself to keep an even voice. Jason does not deserve your blame. Tenel Ka was sitting on the other side of the small room, her legs crossed beneath her and her posture as erect as ever. Everyone heard the command, and we all know why he gave it. To disregard such an order would have been to dishonor Anakin's memory and dismiss his sacrifice. Stay out of this, Tenel Ka, Jaina said. You can't possibly know anything about it. You have the emotional depth of a Ronto. The speed with which Tenel Khan folded her legs and stepped around the low table proved how mistaken Jaina was. Jason thought for a moment the Dathomiri would slap his sister. But Tenel Khan only continued to glare, until Jaina finally grew uncomfortable and looked away. When she did, Tenel Khan said, We are all hurting, Jaina. Your brother, too. It was difficult to tell from Tenelka's tone whether she meant the words to be conciliatory or cutting, but they caused Jaina to stand. Jason reached for Jaina's hand, but he needn't have worried. Zek was already stepping between the pair, positioning himself to intercept any blow that might be thrown. What's this going to help? Zek addressed himself more to Tenelka than to Jaina. Calm down. Both women opened their hands, but continued to stand and stare, each waiting for the other to apologize. The room remained uncomfortable and silent. The other Jedi stared into their gruel. They were spared the necessity of a long wait by a low growl over their comlinks. Jason snatched up his own comlink. Tisar? he asked. As the strike team's stealthiest member and only natural night hunter, the Barabell had been the obvious choice to send slinking through the murky lanes of the domicile warren. Did you find her? He was answered not by the Barabell's voice, but by another low growl. It took him a moment to recognize the sound as a Shrywook word, as Wookie voices did not carry well over comlinks. Louis? Jaina gasped, grabbing her own comlink. Is that you? Lubaka confirmed his identity with a groan then began a long apology for allowing the Tachyon Flyer to be stolen. Loe, forget it. They fooled us, too, Jason said. Where are you now? The answer Lobaka rumbled was considerably more than a location. Why would they do that? Jason asked. Lobaka grunted a guess. Keep watching, Jana said, and whatever you do, stay with him. I'll be there as soon as I can. She snapped her comlink off, and Jason barely caught her arm before she reached the door. What are you doing? Going after Anakin's body. What do you think? It was Tahiri who said this, speaking for the first time since they had fled the Grashel. They're not taking him anywhere. She rose and went to Jaina's side, as did Alima, and, a moment later, Zack. Jason ignored them all and continued to hold his sister's arm. What about Anakin's last words, he asked. He told us to destroy the queen. Then destroy her. Jaina tore her arm free of his hand and slapped the tickle pad. But I'm going back. Not even checking to see if she would be seen, Jaina jerked her lightsaber off her belt and led the others out into the dark. Chapter 47 Save that Leia was smelling Ben's sweet breath instead of her own nervous sweat, and the couch was not slewing around beneath her. War looked much the same on a wall-sized holovid as it did from the cockpit of the Millennium Falcon. 
Plasma balls still rolled over their targets in blossoms of white fire. Turbo lasers still laced the air with dazzling lances of color. Wounded vessels still bled dark clouds of flash-frozen crew. The inset image of a grim-voiced Duros war correspondent described how the massive Yuzhan Vong fleet was steadily pressing forward behind the screen of refugee ships, despite a fierce running assault on its rear by Wedge Antilles' Fleet Group 3. The invaders had already crossed the orbit of Nabatu, the tenth planet of the Coruscant system, and were expected to reach the Ulabos ice bands by the end of the standard day. The news vid changed scenes, now showing the Starliner swift dreams as it strayed into a barrage of turbolaser fire. Leia knew she should have felt something, should have been angered or frightened or something by the huge Yuzhan Vong fleet sweeping down on Coruscant, but she was not. All she cared about was holding Ben in her arms, keeping his warmth pressed to her body. As the swift dreams began to vent a cloud of tumbling refugees, a Bith correspondent appeared in the inset and reported that Garmbel Iblis's fleet group two continued to attack through the refugee screen, ignoring friendly fire accidents such as the one shown and repeated orders from Admiral Sav to stop. Several reliable sources claimed that Sav had actually relieved Bell Iblis of command, an order that the general and his entire force also ignored. There were unsubstantiated reports of whole attack groups, leaving Triest Kreefe's Fleet Group 1 to join Bel Iblis in his effort to stop the Yuzhan Vong at any price. A pair of military analysts came on the news vid and began to argue about whether Garm Bel Iblis's actions were the only way to delay the enemy until reinforcements arrived, or the first sign of the disintegration of the New Republic military. What a mess, Han said. Leia did not reply. It was the first either of them had spoken since turning on the vid screen, and she had actually forgotten he was sitting beside her. He had been following her around since it happened, as though he were afraid it might be necessary to snatch Ben out of her arms again. His constant presence was starting to annoy her, though she could not bear even the small emotional turmoil that she would cause by telling him so. The analysts were replaced by an image of Luke and Mara climbing out of their starfighters. As they joined a long line of exhausted Jedi stumbling across a Star Destroyer's docking bay, a behorned Deverunian reporter appeared in the foreground and described how the Jedi-led attack wing continued their daring penetration missions, destroying more than fifteen capital ships in the heart of the Yuzhan Vong fleet. While Eclipse's losses were classified for intelligence reasons, Casualties in both personnel and equipment were rumored to be high. No one had seen the famous Kip Duron or any of his dozen since the battle began. Han used a voice command to change to the Senate feed. Good old Han, worried about Leia being upset by news of the danger her brother was facing. She would have liked to be upset. She would have liked to feel something, anything, other than the hollow ache that consumed her now. Why had Han needed to change the feed? She just wanted him to go away and leave her alone. The holovid split into two images, one showing the packed chamber, the other a hologram of Admiral Sov standing before the High Counselor's Consul. The Solistan was demanding that Nurmok confirm his dismissal of General Bel Iblis and a long list of officers who had deserted to serve under his command. Boris Kfelia appeared in an inset, his fur tangled and his eyes sunken with stress. "'You have another way to hold the enemy at bay, Admiral Sav?' Felia asked. The Sullistan's hologram continued to stare directly ahead. "'Beliblis's mutiny is undermining the command integrity of the whole military.' "'So the answer would be no,' Felia said. "'In that case, I suggest that instead of interfering with General Beliblis's efforts, you follow his lead.' You will not stop the Yuzhan Vong by nipping at their heels. This caused enough of a tumult in the Senate chamber that Ben opened his eyes and began to cry. The TDL nanny droid was instantly at Leia's side, reaching for the infant with her four synth-skin arms. Leia shielded Ben with her body and chewed the droid away. Nobody was taking this child from her. Apparently speaking to Thalia via direct feed and unaware of the uproar in the chamber, Admiral Saab did not wait for the audio to equalize. 
and his response was lost in the general tumult. I am also aware of how many lives we stand to lose here, if you let the enemy drive that refugee fleet into our planetary shields, Felia said. Admiral Sov, as the chairman of Nurmak, I am not only instructing you to fire through the hostage screen, I am ordering you to. If necessary, you are to fire on those ships directly. Again, Admiral Sov did not wait for the audio to equalize, and his reply was lost to the general uproar. Thalia's response was not. Then you are relieved of command, Admiral Sov. I am sure General Bel Iblis understands the necessity of my order. This time the audio could not be adjusted to filter out the din in the chamber. Hundreds of senators stood and began to shout their disdain of the Bothan. A smaller number rose to applaud his courage and decisiveness. Then, one by one, holograms of Sov's Soliston protégés began to appear on the speaking floor beside the Admiral. There were the generals Moon and Yeel, Admiral Rab, Commander Gott, and a dozen others, all powerful figures in the New Republic military, who owed their rise to Admiral Sov. Thalia did not seem all that surprised to see them appearing before him, but his beard fur bristled when General Raikin, Commodore Brand, and even his fellow Bothan, Trieste Crefe, added their holograms to those standing with Admiral Sov. We don't need to watch this, Han declared, still trying to shield her from anything upsetting. How about one of Garrick Loren's old holodramas? Those always used to make you laugh. Leia shook her head. This is fine. The disintegration of the New Republic military ought to keep her mind off the empty hurt inside. She signaled the droid for a collapse of pack of formula and settled back to feed Ben. Now, if she could get Han to go away and leave her alone, she just might make it through the day. Thalia rose and tried for a while to quiet the chamber. When this resulted only in a louder outburst of shouts, he gave up and returned to his seat, then disappeared behind his instrument console and began to work the controls. Apparently, he noticed that his face was still on the vid feed, because he scowled and flipped something and the inset disappeared. The Solo's comm unit began to beep for attention. Han frowned and started to rise. Han! Surprised by the alarm in her own voice, Leia caught him by the arm. Where are you going? Han gestured vaguely in the direction of the study. To answer the comm. Leia shook her head and pulled Han back to the couch. Don't leave me. Han's face melted. Never. I'm not going anywhere. The comm unit continued to beep. The vid screen split into three images, one showing the uproar in the Senate galleries, another the holograms of Sov and his supporters, and the third the top of Borsk Felia's head as he stared at his instrument console. C-3PO stepped into the door. Excuse me, Master Han, but the comm unit is requesting attention. We know, Goldenrod, Han said. We lost a son, not our hearing. C-3PO's photoreceptors dimmed noticeably. Oh, of course. He clumped out of the room. The turmoil in the Senate chamber finally began to fade, though there was still too much noise for the sound droid to pick up Admiral Sov's voice when his hologram spoke to Felia again. The Chief of State looked up long enough to signal the commanders to wait, then returned his attention to his instruments and spoke briefly. A moment later, C-3PO walked into the room with a portable comm screen. He glanced at the vid screen and tipped his head in robotic bewilderment, then turned to the couch. I'm sorry to interrupt, but Chief of State Failure is asking to speak with Mistress Leia. Me? Leia's mind would normally have leapt immediately to speculations as to why Failure would be calling her at such a time. But all she could think of now was that she hadn't slept or bathed or even brushed her hair since it happened. No, absolutely not. C-3PO glanced at the vid screen again, then said, He said to tell you it was a matter of galactic security. Leia looked to Han, and she did not even need to say anything. He simply took the comm screen from C-3PO and put it on the couch between them, with the built-in holocam facing him. 
This is Han Chief Failure. Leia can't talk right now. On the wall screen, Leia watched Failure's hand run through his head fur. Yes, I have heard that something might have happened to Anakin. If that's so, I'd like to express not only my own sympathy, but that of the entire New Republic. We appreciate that. Han glanced at the wall screen and rolled his eyes, then looked back into the comm unit's holocamp. Now I'm sure you'll understand if I sign off. Phidia's hand darted out toward his instrument panel. Wait. There was one other thing, General Solo. General? Han looked over the comm screen at Leia and cocked an eyebrow. Don't tell me you're reactivating my commission. You can't be that desperate for line officers. It finally occurred to Leia that her husband was playing with the New Republic's chief of state, not for his own amusement, but in an attempt to cheer her up. The effort touched her, even if it failed to come close to drawing a smile. Not yet, General Solo. Philia's ears twitched, a rare sign of being flustered. Actually, I was hoping to prevail on Leia to say a few words of support for my government to some of her old friends in the military. Han glanced over the comm screen. Thelia seemed to realize Leia was listening in because he quickly added, I'm sure Leia realizes how supportive I have been of the Jedi recently, and the military has several sizable droid orders pending approval with Tendrondo arms. Leia sighed and stared at the floor. Was this what Anakin had given his life for? The thought was so depressing that she started to sob again. Sorry, Chief Failure, Han said, reaching for the comm screen power switch. This time, you're on your own. To Silgal's sensitive nostrils, the foamy fungus eating away the scorched metal of the surviving X-Wings smelled almost as foul as the soiled flight suits of the eight exhausted pilots themselves. There was an acidic edge to it, and the metallic mustiness of corrosion a common enough smell on oceanic worlds like her own moon calamari, but certainly a rarity coming from the rust-proof alloys used in starfighters. Silgal used a plastified agitator to scrape some of the yellow growth into a sample bag, and the musty smell grew stronger. Though she had already scanned for the typical Yuzhan Vong attack toxins, she found herself wondering if she should have taken the time to return to her laboratory for her breath mask. Behind her, Kip Duran sneezed, then asked, What do you think? After several dozen terrifying hours, zipped tight in his EV suit because of a vacuum leak in his cracked canopy, he was by far the worst smelling of the survivors. A new kind of weapon? Not a very effective one, if it is, Silgal said. If this is all it grew in the time you needed to limp back to Eclipse, it will not destroy many fighters before the tech crews steam it off. She continued to scrape and finally reached bare hull. As her nose had led her to suspect, the metal was pitted with corrosion. The fungus was metabolizing the X-Wing itself. But why? The Yuzhan Vong would not have gone to the trouble of creating a self-heating, vacuum-hardened fungus unless there was a purpose to it. Kip sneezed, and Silgal turned to face him. How long have you been doing that? she asked. Were you sneezing in your EV suit? Kip shook his head and wiped his nose on the cuff of his flight suit. It started when I unzipped. Spores. Motioning Kip to follow along, Silgal took her sample bag and started toward the hangar hatch. They wanted it to produce spores. Silgal was just about to palm the control pad when the blaring roar of an assault alarm reverberated through the cavern. It continued for fifteen ear-piercing seconds, then was replaced by the watch officer's voice. Attention all crews. This is no drill. We have an incoming York coral vessel. Sith blood. It has to be that frigate again. Kip had already explained to the watch officer that the return had taken so long because of a frigate that kept turning up behind them. I could have sworn we had lost him. Before Silgal could stop him, 
Kip turned and ran off to join the bustle, as the ship crews prepared Eclipse's motley assortment of backup starfighters for launch. With the errant venture in a protective orbit around the base, and well crewed by refugees from Risi, there was no question of a single frigate destroying the Jedi stronghold. Unfortunately, Silgal knew, there was no longer any chance of keeping the secret of its location. As the vessel traveled through hyperspace, its hull built up a tachyon charge that was not released until it entered real space again. If she was right about the fungus growing on the eight X-wings, and apparently she was, given the approaching Yuzhan Vong frigate, the spores were freeing the tachyons in hyperspace, creating a long thread of faster-than-light particles leading straight to Eclipse. So absorbed in this theory was Silgal that, when she returned to her laboratory, she immediately set to work stripping a tachyon gun from a spare S-thread spinner. The Moon Calamari was not very good with human mechanical equipment. She preferred to rely on Jaina or Danny for such jobs. So the task absorbed all of her concentration for the next quarter hour, until the base alarm blared again, and the dismayed watch officer announced that the frigate had sacrificed itself to slip three skips past Eclipse's outer defenses. The whole base shook as the two big turbolasers opened up on the small vessels. At first, Silgal took the erratic ticking she heard to be a subsurface vibration from the weapons. But then she noticed a complicated repeating pattern, and it was coming from the gravitic pulse coder standing in front of the captured Yamisk's cell. Silgal rushed over to the observation window and found the creature's tentacles splayed straight out in the pool, its body membranes pulsing in consonance with the ticking of the pulse coder. So you do talk. Silgal turned to the pulse coder and found it scratching a complicated series of peak and trough readings onto a flimsiplast drum. They did not yet have enough data to convert the marks into a meaningful message, but it seemed likely that the scratches would translate into identity codes, vectoring instructions, and target priorities. Silgal activated their own makeshift gravitic wave modulator, adjusted the amplitude to match that being recorded, and began to generate the gravitic equivalent of white noise. The Amisk stopped pulsing for an instant, then whirled around in its tank and launched itself into the viewport with a resonant thud. Silgal stumbled back, and the creature held itself against the transperisteel, its tentacles lashing along the edges in search of a seam. Silgal turned off her modulator. When the Yamisk dropped back into the water and began to pulse again, she knew they had succeeded. The watch officer's voice came over the internal comm system again. Suicide run. Close all airtight hatches. Secure environment suits and prepare for impact in ten. Nine. Silgal glanced at the pulse coder's flimsiplast drum and suddenly knew what was recorded there. Though she could not have translated the message directly, she felt certain it said something like, here I am. Destroy me. Destroy me at any cost. There was no time to disconnect all the power and data feeds and save the pulse coder. Silgal ripped the flimsy plast off the scratch drum and flew out of the doomed laboratory, almost forgetting to slap the emergency hatch seal as she left. Chapter 48 The Sabres dropped out of the Moon Mothma's forward fighter bay and saw Coruscant's thumb-sized disk twinkling at them through a gap in the Yuzhan Vong fleet, the planet's trillion-light aura, a genial reminder of what they were fighting to protect. Ben was down there beneath one of those lights, sleeping soundly in his aunt's apartment and dreaming of his mother's return. That much Mara could feel through the Force. What she could not feel was when his dream would be answered. Despite the steady flow of New Republic reinforcements, even Admiral Akbar was rumored to be on his way with a Moon Calamari fleet, the Yuzhan Vong continued to press their advance. Their route in system could be traced by the swath of derelict vessels littering space. But they still had half their fleet, and now they were within sight of Coruscant. It was as close to her child as Mar intended to let them come. A sheet of blue energy lit space overhead as the Moon Mothma's turbolaser banks opened fire again. A moment later, a Yuzhan Vong frigate vanished from the tactical display, 
and the cockpit sensor alarms started to scream as a flight of skips headed their way. Wedge Antilles's voice came over the comm. All squadrons, stand by for close defense. This time we're going to make them stop and pay attention. Mara was engulfed by the reassuring warmth of her husband's forced touch. He's going to be all right, Luke said. We're not going to let anything happen to him. Blue eyes widening as the safe band narrowed, the Bail Organa's young comm officer asked, Shall I ask Planetary Defense to deactivate a mine sector for us, General? Garmbel Iblis twirled his mustache and, ignoring the tactical display on the bridge's wall screen, stared out the viewport at the plasma storm blossoming against the Star Destroyer's forward shields. Between flashes, it was just possible to see a swarm of blocky silhouettes moving forward behind the assault rapidly swelling into the shapes of New Republic starliners and mass transports. Never one to substitute technology for his own judgment. He knew instinctively that the refugee screen would be on him in less than a minute, just as he knew that planetary defense would need to deactivate two sectors of mines, not one, if Fleet Group 2 was going to withdraw an order. General? the young woman asked. I have an open channel to planetary defense. Very good, Anger. Garm's eyes shot briefly to the tactical display, where he saw that with all the defections from Fleet Group 1, his force was actually larger than at the beginning of the battle. You may tell Planetary Defense to keep all sectors of the mine shell active. We won't be retreating. Anger's face went as pale as her hair. Excuse me, General? Give me an open channel to all fleet groups, Garm ordered. I'll need to say a few words. Located in a repulsor-equipped satellite hovering on a station in front of the Yuzhan Vong invasion route, Orbital Defense Headquarters was as large as a Moon Calamari floating city, and the control hub at its heart was the size of a full shockball court. Despite being packed to overflowing with weapons directors and traffic coordinators, the nerf center was also, at the moment Lando followed his escort through the hatch, as still as space. Noting that every pair of eyes in the place was fixed on the ceiling, Lando lifted his chin and found himself staring through a large transparasteel dome at a vast abyss of spiraling magma trails and blossoming fireballs. Some of the explosions appeared close enough to lick the shields. Lando's instinct was to drop for cover and crawl back to the Lady Luck as quickly as his hands and knees would carry him but it was a matter of pride with him never to be the first to panic. Despite what his eyes were telling him, the station remained stable, and, in a room packed with electronics, there was not a single crackle of pulse static. In a deliberately calm voice, he asked, Optical ceiling? That's right. His escort, a winsome petty officer who would have made even Tendra frown with jealousy, said, Sometimes it helps to point the station and see what's going on. Uh-huh, Lando said. Now that he was sorting out the scene, he could see the blue circles of several thousand ion drives receding into the firestorm. Garmbel Iblis had turned on the invaders like a cornered wampa, and Fleet Group 2 was accelerating through the refugee screen to meet the enemy head-on. New Republic corvettes and frigates were vanishing by the dozens, Cruisers and Star Destroyers were belching fire and falling away, one after another. Lando took his comm link off his belt and opened a channel to Tendra. Have you finished with the weapons platforms yet? I'm making the last delivery now, she answered. There's still an open shield section on the far side of the planet, so I thought I'd drop the extras at the Imperial Palace. You'd better hold off on that, Lando said. I think they'll be closing that hole shortly. I'll meet you at our rendezvous. When? Tendra sounded worried. Soon, Lando replied. Very soon. The petty officer leaned through the hatch and summoned the two YVH war droids Lando was delivering, then led the way across the control hub. By the time they had twined their way through the maze of aisles and checkpoints to the lift tube on the other side, Fleet Group 2 had penetrated the refugee screen and was webbing the darkness beyond with turbolaser fire. The hostage ships themselves were accelerating forward, their dark shapes backlit by blue halos of ion glow. 
The petty officer pressed her palm to a security pad to authorize access, then led Lando and his droids onto the command deck. Though General Batra was already surrounded by aides and junior command officers, all speaking to him at once, the Bothan motioned the newcomers over immediately. Muzzle curled into a faint snarl. He looked the wardroids over and grunted approval. Gratified to finally find someone who appreciated the craftsmanship of the droids, Lando smiled warmly and extended his hand. General Batra, how nice to meet. Cash it, Calrissian, Batra snarled. We're in the middle of a battle. Lando let his hand drop with his spirits, but kept the smile. Yes, sir, that's why I'm donating these wardroids to your security detail. Donating? Free of charge, Lando confirmed. Batra looked doubtful. And what do you get in return? Nothing yet, Lando said. These are good droids, and I'm just trying to preserve the market long enough for people to realize that. Preserve the market? The Bothan smiled wryly, then plinked a claw off YVH-1302A's armor. Quantum? Better, Lando said, deliberately duplicating the general's brusque manner. Echoing the customer's tone was one of his most effective sales techniques. Laminanium. Developed it ourselves. Ah. Sensing the Bothan's approval, Lando said, I have twenty more aboard the Lady Luck, if you have a use for them. They're not spoken for? Lando shook his head. This is my last stop. A flare of orange light strobed through the control hub's observation dome as a pair of space mines fired their rockets and accelerated toward a Raltiri refugee vessel. The converted freighter's shields absorbed the detonation of the first mine, but the second slammed into the bow, igniting a wave of secondary explosions that vaporized the ship stem to stern. Answers that question, Batra commented, watching the vessel explode. Definitely Vong guards aboard. A flickering sheet of orange filled the control hub as a dozen more mine rockets ignited. The faces of the general's assistants fell, and a bith female asked, Shall I have Sector 223 deactivate, General? Before answering, Batra turned to consult a tactical display hanging on the command deck wall. Wedge's Fleet Group 3 was sweeping down from behind. But even a quick glance at the situation revealed that Garm's force could not hold the Yuzhan Vong in place. While the remnants of Fleet Group 2 had already carved out a sizable hollow at the front of the column, enemy vessels were sweeping past on all sides, chasing the refugee ships toward the mine shell. The orange light in the control hub died away suddenly and was not replaced by the flash of detonating mines. Batra's head snapped back long enough to take in the sight of a dozen refugee vessels streaking through the mine shell unimpeded. The Bothan whirled on the Bith, who had suggested deactivating the sector. I did not authorize that. What little color there was faded from the Bith's face. Neither did I. Batra snatched his comlink from a pocket and stepped to the transparasteel wall that overlooked the control hub's main floor. Activate Sector 223. The Bothan was staring at a lone Mon Calamari seated forty meters away in the heart of the giant floor. She merely folded her hands in her lap and looked out the ceiling. The mine controllers flanking her did likewise. I see. Batra snapped his comlink off and turned to Lando. Are your droids as adept at dealing with traitors as they are infiltrators? Lando glanced at the controllers and swallowed, not certain that he wanted to answer truthfully. Do you know how quickly the enemy will reach us once they have cleared the mine shell? Batra asked. And I should mention that you will not be leaving this station until I have an answer. You designate targets and issue an override command, Lando said. Which is? Lando did not answer, for his thoughts were suddenly full of thrust calculations and pitfalls. Calrissian? General... Do you have any way to keep your minds from targeting your orbital defense platforms? Batra scowled, but looked to an Arcona assistant. We could give them the deactivation codes, the aide suggested. With a tight beam transmission, they could kill the warhead and let the mine bounce off their shields. Good, Lando said. Then I suggest you deactivate all sectors. 
What? Let them through, Lando clarified. The refugees, the Yuzhan Vong, everyone. Batra's eyes narrowed in thought, and Lando could see that the general was already thinking along the same lines. This particular Bothan, at least, deserved his post. After a moment, Batra asked, You know what will happen when those ships hit the planetary shields? Lando shrugged. Your minds might stop the first hundred ships. Not even that many, the Bith said. So you might as well put your assets to their best use. Batra glanced up at the stream of hostage vessels, pouring through the deactivated sector toward the surface of Coruscant. The first transports were already vanishing behind the rim of the observation dome, long needles of ion efflux trailing them as they accelerated into the planetary shield. You know this won't save the hostages? Batra asked. But at least the New Republic won't be the ones killing them, Lando said. And it just might save Coruscant. A bowl of golden light rose from the planet as the first refugee ship disintegrated against the shield. Batra winced, then nodded. Very well, Calrissian. Do it. Lando's jaw fell. Me? Your idea, your assignment, the Bothan said. I'll have someone fetch you some stars, General. You've just been reactivated. By the time Fleet Group 3 connected with Fleet Group 2, local space was too littered with battle debris to enter at anything approaching combat speed. Through the flotsam cloud, Mara could see half a dozen Star Destroyers and perhaps twenty or thirty smaller vessels using their turbolasers to clear an exit path, but even they were barely crawling. At least half were venting bodies and atmosphere, and a dozen were moving only under the power of a nearby vessel's tractor beam. Clearly, Garmbel Iblis and his followers were out of the battle. The Yuzhan Vong rearguard was pouring around the devastation on all sides, trading fusillades with Fleet Group 1 as they streamed past into the deactivated mine shell. Triest Crefe had apparently chosen not to engage until he joined up with Wedge's group. The few thousand vessels remaining to him were all standing off, content to attack from a distance, while the invaders poured into orbit and swarmed Coruscant's defense platforms. Though they were badly outnumbered, Mara found it difficult to believe the Admiral would be so cowardly. Despite his Bothan heritage, he had always struck her as an honorable soldier and loyal citizen. The scene at the edges of Coruscant's atmosphere made Mara's heart race for Ben's safety. A thousand-kilometer circle of shield glowed gold beneath the constant bombardment of hostage ships. Every new impact launched a kilometer's high pillar of fire, and sent shock circles rippling across the surface. Occasionally, a refugee vessel broke away at the last second, as the crew finally overpowered their captors. Every attempt ended badly, with the craft crashing into the shield anyway, or being blasted out of space by a waiting frigate, or disintegrating under the stress of trying to escape. For the most part, the Yuzhan Vong suicide squads were forcing the pilots to hit the same area, and the largest detonations were already causing forks of disruption static to dance across the shield. Danny Kui's voice came over the channel. We've got another Yamask. Mara dropped her gaze to the tactical display, where a targeting box had appeared around a heavy cruiser already deep inside the mine shell. A dozen weary sighs sounded from the comm speaker. This would be Eclipse's fourth Yamask kill. They had taken out the second one with Saba's global tactic, but the third kill had cost so many pilots that Luke had reorganized Eclipse's forces into a single wing of two fifteen-pilot squadrons. When Danny had detected no more gravitic pulses, they had all dared hope that they had killed the last one, but it now seemed apparent the invaders had been holding it in reserve. Luke opened a channel to the Moon Mothma. We'll need that support, Command. During their last rearming break, Wedge had offered the support of both Rogue Squadron and the Wraiths, who were being tapped for combat duty despite their status as an intelligence unit, for the next Yamask attack. This is a tough one. Negative, farm boy, Wedge responded. You are not authorized for attack. Mara felt Luke bristle and knew how tired he was. Luke never 
let himself get so angry she could feel it. This is not time to be looking out for old Buddy's command. You can see how desperate things are. If we don't take out that I said no, Wedge interrupted. I can't order you to hold back, but trust me, there are some things I can't say over a combat channel. Mara felt Luke perform the Jedi equivalent of counting ten. They still had no reason to believe the Yuzhan Vong could eavesdrop on their communications, much less break military codes. But the same could not be said for the refugee ships. If any of those pilots happened to be smugglers in the Han Solo or Talon card mold, they would have the finest com-scanning equipment in the galaxy. Copy, Luke said. Let us know when we have authorization. Count on it. Wedge? Mara was as surprised as anyone to hear herself saying Wedge's name over the comm, and even she wasn't sure why she had done it, until she asked, Can you patch me through to Coruscant Civil Communications? There was a slight pause, then Wedge said, Sure, we can do that. Who do you want to talk to? My brother-in-law, she said. The curiosity she felt from Luke lasted only as long as it took the next refugee ship to strike Coruscant's shields. This time the disruption static shrank back on itself and burned through the shields. Two more vessels crashed beside the hull, enlarging it by a factor of ten. Then a third pilot guided his lumbering starliner through the breach to safety. The comm channels crackled with an odd sort of half-cheer, as Fleet Group 3 gave voice to the jubilation of finally seeing a refugee ship survive. The accolade ceased when a pair of Yuzhan Vong frigates darted through the hole after it. Han Solo's voice came over the comm speaker. Mara, what happened? The channel was full of static. Is Luke... He's fine, Mara interrupted. Listen to me. The shields are going. Can you get Ben off planet? 3PO is already packing, Han said. We'll be in the air as soon as we can reach the Falcon. Thank you. There was an awkward pause during which Mara found herself caught between saying again how sorry she was and apologizing for thinking Anakin's mission had been a good idea. Then she asked, How's Leia? Hanging on? Han answered. Mara flashed on an image of Leia clutching Ben to her breast. Then Han said, We'll see ya. He switched off, leaving Mara and Luke alone with the war. She felt Luke reaching out to her through the Force, trying to fill her with a sense of reassurance she could tell he did not quite feel himself. I'm fine, Luke, she thought. But Mara could feel Luke's irritation mounting as well. Even Master Ernest was growing impatient with this strange game of follow and wait. More than a dozen Yuzhan Vong vessels slipped through the overload breach into Coruscant's atmosphere before planetary shielding finally brought a replacement generator online. Fleet Group 3 was almost at the mine shell when Wedge gave the order to cease pursuit, though there had not been an enemy vessel close enough for X Wings to fire at in twenty minutes. Luke ordered the Sabres and Wild Knights to take up static combat stations two hundred kilometers ahead of the Star Destroyer. Puzzled by Wedge's hesitation, both squadrons settled in to watch the deadly light storm being hurled back and forth by the big capital ships. The puzzle was solved less than a minute later, when the entire mine shell sprouted rocket candles. The capital ships ceased firing. An astonished silence fell over the comm channels, as the mines locked onto enemy vessels and curved after them. The Yuzhan Vong maneuvered wildly, but they were trapped against Coruscant with nowhere to go. No sooner would they escape one mine than they ran afoul of another. Some vessels skimmed the planetary shields and were instantly torn into rubble. A few collided with each other, and still others grew so distracted they fell prey to missiles and turbolaser fire from the orbital defense platforms. Eventually, the Yuzhan Vong realized they were better off to stop and weather the storm, relying on their weapons and shielding singularities to destroy the approaching mines. Many failed and were blasted into rubble. A thousand more suffered hull breaches and began to vent internal systems. Almost all took at least one hit, but an astonishing number showed little sign of damage. They returned to their missions attacking the orbital defense platforms and herding refugee ships to destruction. Then, 
Almost as one, the crippled Yuzhan Vong vessels dropped out of orbit, hurling themselves into the planetary shields. Disruption static shot across the atmosphere. Whole grids shimmered and winked out. Planet-bound generator stations exploded with flashes brilliant enough to be seen from space. Skips began to drop off the surviving Yuzhan Vong vessels and dive toward the surface. On Mara's tactical display, the cruiser carrying the fourth Yamask was blinking slowly to show damage. But it was still intact, drifting toward the sunny side of the planet. Okay, farm boy, Wedge calmed. Now you are authorized to attack. Chapter 49 Even before Jaina peered into the sunken compound, she feared they might be too late. An oily column of pyre smoke was rising out of the pit, gathering beneath in a blackened valve that periodically cracked open to puff the fumes out into the vacuum. The air reeked of charred flesh and scorched bone, but also slower kinds of decomposition that made clear why the place lay so far from anything else. Whatever the Yuzhan Vong did with their dead, it did not involve preserving them. Despite the guidance of her Comlink's signal finder, Jaina did not see Lobaka until a powdery arm rose out of the ash and waved them onto the observation balcony outside the tunnel mouth. She dropped to her belly, and, trying not to think about the fact that she was crawling through the incinerated remains of untold thousands of Yuzhan Vong, advanced to the edge of the pit. What lay below struck her as more of a processing center than a mortuary. About a tenth the size of the spaceport, the five-sided facility lay at the hub of a dozen large travelways, most of them emerging from the world ship's murky interior. Many of the subterranean passages had been permanently sealed with Yorick coral plugs. The rest were choked with Yuzhan Vong mourners, their numbers no doubt swollen by the strike team's efficiency a thought in which Jaina found herself taking some solace. The Yuzhan Vong had finally shattered the emotional armor that had been accumulating around her since Annie Capstan, her first regular rogue squadron wingmate, perished over Ithor. They had made the war hurt again, and now she wanted to hurt them back. As in the spaceport, long colonnades at the bottom of the five outer walls opened into a network of utility warrens whose purpose Jaina could only guess at and cared little about. The five grottos that stood in the facility's five corners were more interesting. The effigy of a major Yuzhan Vong god sat in each recess, gazing out at a deep pit directly in front of his, or her, eyes. Beside each pit stood a priest and several assistants, chanting prayers to the gods and inviting the mourners, one group at a time, to step forward and throw a piece of their loved one into the pit which piece seemed to depend on the particular effigy. Into one pit they lowered the skins. Into another they tossed the major bones of the body. Into Yunyamka's pit, the only god Jaina recognized, they poured the blood. The actual preparation of the corpse was performed at one of any number of stations of varying opulence scattered around the interior of the compound. Selection of a preparer seemed to involve a fair amount of barter, as Jaina could see mourners arguing, sometimes violently, with the aproned body-dressers who performed the work. After the work was done, the first stop was always a blazing pyre in the center of the compound, where the skull and hands were thrown. Jaina grew cold inside. If they did that to Anakin... Lobaka groaned softly and pointed over the rim. Being careful not to push any ash over the edge, Jane eased herself forward and saw, twenty meters below, a handful of Yuzhan Vong warriors, playing some game that involved kicking a snarling spike creature into the opponent's bare chest hard enough to make it stick. Standing off to one side, weaving Anakin's lightsaber through a surprisingly smooth practice routine, was Vergeer. So where's Anakin? Tahiri hissed. Lobaka gestured at the warren beside the warriors, then to a nearby airlock, explaining in a soft rumble that the lock opened into a small docking pit, where Vergeer and her companions had a shuttle waiting. Jaina and the others donned their vac suits, then camouflaged themselves with a coat of ash, and spent the next hour watching the gruesome rites below. 
Had they not seen a pair of Yuzhan Vong emerge from the warren with the husk-encased body of a comrade, and depart in one of the small Yorick coral transports the Yuzhan Vong sometimes used inside the world ship, the wait would have been interminable. As it was, it merely gave Jaina a chance to watch the ghastly spectacle, and hope the warriors who had killed Anakin were among those being offered to their gods. At last, a young Yuzhan Vong subaltern emerged from the warren and summoned two of the crew inside. The others quickly began to dress, pulling thin tunics over their heads and coaxing their living armor open, so they could don it again. Jaina cautiously lifted her power blaster out of the ash, clearing the emitter nozzle and targeting sensors with a quick breath and rub of her tunic. "'Blast them when Anakin's out where we can see him,' Jaina said over the comlink. She missed the intimacy of the battle meld, but it was probably a good thing that Jason was not here to link them all together. As angry as she was feeling, she did not want to open her emotions to the others. We'll jump down and get him. Then commandeer the shuttle, go find Jason, and finish this thing. Check, Zek said, acknowledging the order. By the time the others had checked off as well, the subaltern was walking into view. Behind him came the two crew members, an Anakin-sized husk suspended between. May I have the officer? Alima asked, setting the long blaster's sight on the subaltern. Take him, Jaina said. The others named their targets as well, Tahiri taking the front husk carrier and Zek the back. Lobaka set his sights on the pilot, and Jaina aimed her power blaster at Vergier. I've got Featherbag, she said. Fire it. Four blaster bolts lanced down into the mortuary pit, but Zek's hand crashed down across Jaina's barrel, and her shot went wide, burning into the ground next to Vergier's feet. The creature was already jumping to one side, Anakin's lightsaber coming around smoothly, as though she actually knew how to use it, a notion that was dispelled when she let it slip from her hand and clatter bladeless to the ground. Jaina whirled on Zek. What did you do that for? I had her. And we don't know you should have. Zek retorted almost as hotly. She's done us no harm, and she's had the chance. The company she keeps is harm enough. Jane appeared back into the pit, but her target had already snatched Anakin's lightsaber up and ducked out of sight, as had the spared husk carrier, taking with him her brother's body. Zek, don't do that again. Don't you dare stand in my way. By now an astonished murmur was rolling across the compound as the crowd below began to realize they were under attack. Jaina shouldered her blaster, then snapped her lightsaber off her belt and hurled herself headlong into the pit. Using the force to slow her descent, she performed a twisting flip and landed facing into the warren, midway between Tahiri and Lobaka. Alima was on the other side of Tahiri, her long blaster rising to her shoulder. The warrior whose life Zek had spared was backing under the wall using Anakin's body to shield himself from the Twi'lek's weapon, and drawing his kufi. You two secure the shuttle, Jaina ordered Loi and Tahiri. Alima and I will get Anakin. As they scrambled to obey, the Yuzhan Vong plunged his kufi into the husk and cut it open near the head. You want your Jedi? He thrust the blade through a layer of clear gelatinous slime and placed the tip on Anakin's cheek. Stay back, or I give him to you in pieces. The long blaster roared, missing the Yuzhan Vong, but demolishing the keystone of the arch behind him. He flinched and looked over his shoulder at the tons of rubble crashing down behind him, then turned back toward Jaina and moved his knife toward Anakin's eye. Rage boiling inside her like magma, Jaina reached out with the force and shoved Anakin's body hard. The Yuzhan Vong yelled in surprise and stumbled back into the collapsing arch, his kufi sliding away from the eye. Jaina jerked her brother free of the warrior's grasp and sent him floating in Alima's direction. Take Anakin, she said. As Jaina spoke, she was opening herself to her anger, using the power of its emotion to draw the force into her, as the dark masters Brachus and Tamith Kai had tried to force her to do so long ago, when she and Jason had been imprisoned at the Shadow Academy with Lobaka. The power came surging into her in cold waves, feeding on her hatred of the Yuzhan Vong and pouring it back to her twofold. In a motion so fast, Jaina barely saw it, 
The warrior sat up and flicked his kufi at her throat. She could have dodged or blocked with her lightsaber, but she did not. Instead, with the fierce energy crackling inside her, she used her free hand to bat the weapon aside, then raised her hand toward her attacker and released the dark power inside. A fork of lightning crackled into existence a few centimeters beyond her gloved tips, then blasted a hole through the Yuzhan Vong's chest and hurled him onto the rubble pile, smoking and motionless. Jaina felt someone watching and turned to find Vergeer staring at her from the shelter of a nearby archway, Anakin's lightsaber dangling from one hand, and her narrow eyes angled in what seemed a peculiar expression of dismay. Jaina sneered at the creature then raised her hand and loosed another bolt of force lightning. Anakin's lightsaber snapped to life in Vergeer's hand and rose to intercept the attack. Then, eyes going wide, she turned and fled into the warren, the lit blade wagging behind her like a tail. Alima came to Jaina's side and, somewhat tentatively, took her by the arm. We'd better go. Jaina grew aware of a roar, building on the other side of the vessel and realized that the outraged priests were exhorting their mourners to attack. The shuttle? Secure, Olima reported. Everyone's aboard but us. Good. Jaina took Anakin from the Twi'lek, then entered the airlock. As the outer valve opened, she thumbed the fuse of her last thermal detonator to ten seconds and dropped it on the middle of the lock. The vac breach that leaves ought to burst a few scarhead lungs. Chapter 50 Like some insectoid model of a Coruscant skyline, the hives had over countless years of habitation climbed entirely out of the bug pit, their serpentine spires now scratching at the vaulted ceiling from atop a thirty-meter mound of carapace detritus and discarded chrysalides. Though the colony was as deserted as much of the world ship, the long-neglected glow lichen still shined just brightly enough to reveal the legs of a dead Yuzhan Vong protruding from an acid hole in the base of the innermost tower, jerking and jiggling as the body was devoured by a voxen. The voxen, Jason hoped. With leaden arms and shaking legs, he felt like they had tracked the thing through the entire diameter of the world ship, though it was impossible to know for sure without Alima's sense of subterranean direction. The reading is good, Techley whispered. She used both hands to raise the cell analyzer and show the numbers to Jason. Do we want to test a second sample? I see some droppings up there. Not necessary, Jason replied. They were studying the colony from the mouth of a dark passageway, and it would have been impossible to retrieve the droppings without either leaving their cover or using the force, both of which would have exposed their presence to the Voxen. Tisar has already said the trail is the Queen's. Let's just kill it. Too bad we don't have the Long Blaster, Ganner said softly. I can guess where she is, and we could burn a hole right through that nest. This one thinks it is better for him to sneak around to her blind side. Tisar hissed. If she flees, you will be here to attack and pursue. When Jason nodded, the Barabel leapt onto the wall and climbed silently to the ceiling or he seemed to melt into the shadows. A faint tingle crept down the back of Jason's neck, a tingle that continued to grow as Tisar neared the tunnel mouth. There was something wrong here, something they were not seeing. Tenel Ka touched Jason's arm, and he knew she felt it, too. Tisar, Jason hissed. He did not want to reach out with the Force. They had already learned that doing so would alert the queen to their presence. Wait. Wait? Ganner asked, disbelieving. What for? Be quiet, Techley whispered. Ganner had the danger sense of a Minoc. He had nearly walked into Yuzhan Vong's search parties twice. It feels wrong. When the Barabel did not immediately return, Jason began to have visions of losing Saba's last student. Taking care to remain in the shadows, he slipped along the wall, then nearly cried out when a deep thump shook the passage. Tisar hissed in shock and retracted his claws, almost taking Jason's head off as he dropped along the wall. 
They retreated deeper into the tunnel, their eyes on the dimly shining colony ceiling. Something landing? Ganner asked. Tisar nodded. Something big. Ah. Aha. They were trying to lure us into a trap. Tenelkov bumped her shoulder into Jason's. Perhaps the time has come to withdraw, my friend. Perhaps. Jason did not turn back. There is still something wrong here, something yet to be revealed. But if it's a trap, why give themselves away? Another thump, this one smaller, rumbled down through the Yorick coral. This one could go look, Tisar suggested. Jason passed over the electro-binoculars, and the Barabel bounded up the passage on all fours. This area of the world ship seemed devoted to producing foodstuffs and other necessities, and every kilometer or so there were large airlocks opening onto the surface access routes. Jason had traveled enough of the world ship to know that the surface network would be a more efficient system for moving freight than the sometimes cramped, always meandering passages inside. A minute later, Tisar reported, Frigate analog. Perhaps the one that brought Nomanor. Its shuttle is missing. Despite the extra weaponry and personnel such a vessel carried, Jason was no more worried than before. Frigates of this size were known to carry only three assault companies, and by his count, they had already destroyed one and cut up the other two pretty badly. If Nomanor intended to launch an attack from this ship, it would either be with world ship personnel or the vessel crew, neither of which was likely to be experienced enough to keep them from escaping. Any sign of an assault company? Jason asked. The boarding ramp is down, Tisar replied, but the ones who used it are already gone. Then there couldn't be many. Techley's voice sounded more hopeful than confident. Okay, Tisar, Jason said. Keep an eye on things while we decide what to do here. We could telekinese a thermal detonator at the Voxen and hope for the best, Ganner suggested. Or I could carry it up. And that would work better than the other times. Why? Tenelka asked. We have only two detonators left. We must conserve. Ganner acknowledged her point with a shrug, and the Jedi fell to contemplating the situation in silence. No one felt any compulsion to flee at least not until they knew what was happening. They had been dodging Yuzhan Vong's search party since their escape from the cloning Grashel, and the frigate's arrival was the first hint that the enemy had guessed their location. A few minutes later, Tenel Ka said, Perhaps the Force brought the frigate to us after all. She pointed into the hive colony, where several dozen Yuzhan Vong silhouettes had emerged from hiding places near the Voxen. The unarmored leader appeared from inside a spire and stomped down the detritus mound, circling toward a passage about seventy meters around the pit from that of the Jedi. He was met just inside the colony by an eight-fingered shaper, whose cage of glowbugs revealed the leader's face to be that of Nom Anor. The two immediately began to speak and gesture harshly. A moment later, Vergier came waddling out of the tunnel. Anakin's equipment belt strapped around her body like a bandolier, lightsaber and utility pouches still hanging in place, his comlink set dangling in the empty blaster holster. The sight of his brother's captured equipment filled Jason with sorrow and self-reproach. Jaina's angry accusations had compelled him to rethink nearly everything he had done since his blunder aboard the exquisite death, and he could not help believing that had he been less worried about making amends, and more concerned with tempering his brother's rashness, Anakin might still be alive. Jason was troubled as well by the refuge he had taken in Anakin's calm response to the theft of the Tachyon Flyer. If Jaina, who remained collected under even the most hated attack, could not bear their brother's death, how could he still be worrying about the mission? How come his grief was not driving him mad? Virgir glanced in the direction of the Jedi. Her hand brushed Anakin's comlink, and suddenly two angry Yuzhan Vong voices were coming over the comnet. Jason barely noticed. His gaze remained fixed on Virgir. As much as it hurt to see her wearing Anakin's gear as a war trophy, he felt no urge to attack her, nor even no manor. 
truth be told, though he was determined to destroy the queen, he really did not want to kill her either. None of it was going to bring Anakin back. Tenel Ka squeezed the back of his arm, then quietly reached over and killed his comlink, Mike. I do not know what game she is playing at, but it would be better if they could not hear us as well. Thanks, Jason said. Though he could not understand the conversation coming over his comlink, he did hear two familiar words, Jedi and Anakin. Nomanor gestured angrily toward the Voxen's hiding place. Virgir spread her hands, then pointed up the passage from which she and the Shaper had come. She rattled off something that included the word Jaina, which prompted the eight-fingered Shaper to turn and gesture into the hives, repeating the word Voxen time and again. Num Anor snapped at him. Then he and Virgir began to yell at Num Anor, and soon all three were shouting at once. Looks like Jaina has been busy, Ganner observed. Why am I not surprised? Tenelka asked. But it is going to be difficult to destroy the Queen now. That frigate will complicate matters. Not for long, Jason said. He could feel something in the Jaina place inside him. Something angry and dark coming their way. Not if I know my sister. Relying heavily on both lightsaber technology and several borrowed focusing crystals to help control the enormous power it would need to jam Yamask waves, Silgal's new gravitic amplitude modulator was part gravity generator and part plasteel rectenna. It was also even larger than the one that had been destroyed when the skips from the Yuzhan Vong tracking vessel had attacked her lab. So when she and Kip started across the hangar with the unwieldy apparatus in tow, Booster Tarek did not look happy. He came striding down the Jade Shadow's boarding ramp to meet them, shaking his head and wagging his finger. Your orders are to evacuate, not relocate, he growled. The venture's already packed bilge to bridge with Reesey refugees. We've no room for Jedi sculptures. This is no sculpture, Kip said. This is a G.A.M., and it just might win the war for us. Booster rolled his eyes. And a Gamorrean might be the next chief of state. But it won't happen today. Kip's face reddened with temper. Listen, you old— That's enough, Kip, Silgal said, cutting him off. She passed him the hover sled controls, then turned to Booster and raised her hand toward him. I'm sure that when Captain Terex sees this instrument in action, he will be happy to find a place for it aboard the errant venture. Booster scowled and started to reiterate his denial, then cried out in surprise as his feet rose off the ground and Silgal floated him out of the way. Okay, okay, he growled. If it means that much to you, I'll take a look at this gizmo in action. A wise idea, Silgal said. She disliked using the force on a friend in this manner, but Booster was stubborn and time was short. I am sure that you'll be impressed. So impressed that you'll let us run a power feed off one of your fusion reactors. Booster's scowl returned to its most stubborn. Don't push it, Silgal. We'll talk about that after you show me what this thing can do. As weary as Jason was of watching Vergier and the Shaper argue with Nomanor, he could think of no way to reach the Voxen. With a frigate full of Yuzhan Vong in the area, sneaking up on it was out of the question. So was floating a detonator or incendiary at it. The creature had proved many times that it would flee as soon as it felt them using the Force. That left only waiting, but wait he would, until he was fifty, if that was what it took to destroy the Queen. He had promised Anakin. Virgir and the others were still arguing when a series of frantic clicks came over the comnet. Jason reached out to Tisar and felt the barabelle still waiting at his station on the surface, concerned but not nearly excited enough to be fighting someone. A single click confirmed that Tisar had felt his touch. Then the boom of an exploding missile reverberated through the Yorick coral. Virgir turned and bounded away around the detritus mound. Numanor and the Shaper remained where they were, barking questions at her vanishing back. Jaina? Ganner gasped. Who else? Tenelka replied. 
Jason reached out to his sister through the Force, found only the same cold anger that he had felt since Anakin's death, and tried to break through to some vestige of the Jaina he had known all his life. He touched only swirling darkness, stormy and unreasoning and full of hate. Afraid to use the comm link, he could not be sure what channels Vergeer had open. Jason opened his emotions to the others, drawing them into a battle meld and reaching out to Tisar with the same question on their minds. Was this Jaina's doing? They were answered with a confirming click. An excellent plan, catching the frigate off guard, Tenelka said. It will greatly aid our final escape. Another blast shook the passage. This one closer than the first, then a second eruption even louder. Flakes of glow lichen began to snow from the ceiling. High in the colony interior, the legs of the dead Yuzhan Vong vanished from sight as the startled Voxen dragged him out the back side of the hive and disappeared, never presenting a shot to the Jedi below. A third explosion shocked the dust off the walls, and loose chunks of ceiling began to bombard the insect city. Tisar's desperate voice came over the comlink. Sticks. Not there. Stop. Even as Tisar yelled, a fourth explosion dropped an avalanche of vault ribbing on the colony. An entire burrow of the insect city collapsed into rubble around Nomanor and the Shaper, and then the whole bug pit was filled with an impenetrable cloud of dust. When a sporadic rain of Yorick coral continued to fall from the weakened ceiling, Jason backed deeper into the tunnel and pulled his equipment harness off his back. We'd better get into our vac suits, he whispered. After failing to destroy the frigate on the first two passes, Tisar thought the assault shuttle would turn and flee. That would have been the tactic of a wise hunter striking at such dangerous prey. But Jaina was in a killing frenzy and unable to resist the temptation of a 150-meter Yuzhan Vong frigate, sitting motionless on the surface, its debarking ramp still hanging open like the mouth of a winded dewback. She wheeled around coming in close for a point-blank shot, and loosed a pair of plasma balls that vanished almost instantly into shielding singularities. The assault shuttle flashed over its target and pulled up sharply, preparing to wheel around for yet another attack. The frigate finally answered, launching a flurry of magma missiles and plasma balls from its port-side weapons bank. At such short range, the missiles lacked time to fix on their target and streaked past harmlessly. But two plasma balls exploded into the shuttle's rear quarter, blasting through the firewall and sending it spinning into the sky. Tisar feared for a moment that the shuttle would explode or spin itself into pieces, but then Jaina, at least he assumed she was the pilot, somehow brought it under control and banked away. The craft climbed five hundred meters, then belched flame and began a long, wobbling descent toward the horizon. Tisar snapped his tongue against his faceplate in anger, then thought for a moment and finally decided to risk a message over Jason's personal comm channel. Even if the Yuzhan Vong were eavesdropping, this was not something he wanted to try relaying through clicks and force sensations. No, Jason gasped. He had felt something wrong even before Tisar calmed, but had not known what. Forgetting about Anakin's captured comlink, he opened a general channel and would have started calling for a report had Tenel Ka not ripped the mic off his throat. You will not help anyone by getting us killed, she said. Jaina will bring them down softly. You know that. No, I don't. Not any more. Jason took a deep breath, using a meditative calming technique to bring himself back under control. But. You're right about the rest. Jason reached out to his sister and spent the next minute or so struggling to stay in contact with the dark emotions that now filled her. She did not seem frightened, only angry and focused on the effort at hand. Then, as he sensed her efforts growing even more intense, her anger abruptly deepened to a level that Jason could not bear, and he lost her. She's gone, he gasped. Dead? Gammer asked. I don't know. Jason looked up. I didn't feel that. I just don't feel her at all. Tenel Khan folded him 
in her one arm and pulled him close. Jason, I am so sorry. Out in the bug pit, the dust had settled enough to see the Eugene Vaughn clearing rubble. Although pieces of ceiling continued to fall at increasing frequency, it soon grew apparent that the collapse had so far caused few casualties. Nomanor was already standing at the edge of a fallen hive, glaring down with a sour expression as a pair of assistants pulled the shaper from beneath the debris. Once the shaper regained his feet and a little of his dignity, he brushed himself off and began to speak sharply to Nomanor. Jason thought for a moment they would continue their argument. But after a while, Nomanor only nodded and pointed up the tunnel leading to the surface and their frigate. The shaper nodded back, then took the warriors and started across the colony in pursuit of the Voxen Queen. The executor shook his head wearily and started up the tunnel toward the frigate. He had barely departed before a squeaky voice came over their calm links. It is safe to come out now, young Jedi. You have nothing to fear from me. Jason motioned the others to ready their weapons, then activated his comlink microphone. Who is this? There is no time to explain that now. As she spoke, Vergier came around the colony on the side opposite the one she had departed, then pointed in the direction the Voxen Queen had fled. Your quarry is escaping. Chapter 51 The solo entourage was halfway across the last pedestrian bridge outside the Eastport docking facility, when a deafening crackle roared out of the sky and shook the surrounding skyscrapers. Reflexes conditioned to instant reaction by far too many brushes with death. Han dropped to his haunches and looked for the source of the trouble. He found it in the form of a million orange fireballs reflecting off the transparent steel panes of a million tower viewports silhouetting the dazed figure of his wife with Ben cradled in her arms. Like almost everyone else on the bridge, Leia was still standing upright, craning her neck to see what was making all the noise. Han grasped her elbow and pulled her down beside him. Get down, sweetheart. The smell of ozone and ash wafted down on a hot wind. A corvette-sized fireball roared overhead and impacted half a kilometer up the Durasteel Canyon vaporizing forty floors of a residential tower and blasting the walls out of three adjacent buildings. The shock wave cleared the hover lane of traffic, then hit the bridge and turned the air as hot as a Tatooine drought. Adarak and Miwal dropped the luggage and used their own bodies to cover Han and Leia. C-3PO skidded three steps across the walkway before he and the potted ladalum he was carrying were caught by the YVH war droid Lando had given them and Ben's TDL nanny was swept off the bridge along with a hundred screaming pedestrians. How dreadful! C-3PO peered over the safety rail. She'll be smashed beyond components. And so will we if we don't get off this bridge, Han said, rising. Still holding Leia's arm, he started to push forward through the crowd. With the battle for Coruscant now being fought in an orbit so low the weapon discharges looked like a colossal sky-dazzle show, the planet was being bombarded with a steady rain of flaming spacecraft. The kilometer-long walk from the apartment had been one long smoke stroll, and twice they had been forced to detour around impact craters where the bridge came to an abrupt end a hundred meters above the stump of a truncated building. The closer they came to the docking facility, the slower the crowd seemed to move. Han finally saw why as they drew to within a few meters of the building. A pair of burly Defense Force soldiers in full biosuits and headgear flanked the half-closed access gate, carefully scanning identichips and waving pedestrians through one at a time. It seemed a ludicrous endeavor, given the circumstances. One of the guards turned his dark-visored gaze on Han and held out his scanner. Identichip? You don't know? Han asked, presenting the group's chips. Not being in disguise, he and Leia had been the subject of countless whispers and pointed fingers along the way. At times, only the menacing presence of Lando's YVH war droid had kept frightened citizens from besieging them with questions they could not answer, and bringing their progress to a halt. Where'd they recruit you guys? Pazab? Procedure. The soldier looked at the data reader on the back of his scanner. Solo. 
I read only four chips. There are five of you. Give me a break, Han said. He felt the YVH wardroid easing up behind him and quietly signaled him to stay back. The baby's only four months old. The soldier continued to stare out from behind his visor. It takes six months to get the chip, Han bluffed. If this guy didn't recognize him and Leia, chances were he wouldn't know Coruscant documentation law either. Until then, the kid travels on a parent's chip. Of course. The soldier lowered his scanner, then pointed down an exterior walkway to a large balcony packed with droids. You may enter, but your mechanicals must remain. There is no room to evacuate them. Remain? C-3PO echoed. But my place is with... Han waved the protocol droid silent. They won't be taking a public berth. We have our own vessel. Which you should use to evacuate living beings, the second guard said, stepping over. Not these lifeless. Please remain calm, the YVH war droid said, pushing an arm between Han and Leia. This is a military emergency. Han started to turn. What? A pair of blaster bolts streaked past his face, burning holes through the chests of both soldiers. Leia shrieked and Ben wailed, and an astonished murmur rustled through the crowd. C-3PO, still holding the pot with Leia's blast-stripped ladalum, began to distance himself from the larger droid. Really? 1-507. That was uncalled for. Your primary programming must be garbled. The war droid squealed something in machine language that made C-3PO take a step back, then turned to Han. I apologize for the identification delay. The biosuits were obscuring the criteria. Criteria? Han broke the seal on one of the helmets and found an Uglyph masker already peeling away from the face of its host. And I thought you just didn't want to be left behind. Bureaucrats, business beings, and bankers, the people pouring through Gate 3700 of the Eastport docking facility, were not the ordinary sort of refugee. They swirled into the terminal area, escorted by droids, sentient assistants, and hover sleds loaded with art treasures and portable gem vaults. Most were protected by hastily armed servants, bodyguards of various intimidating species, and even Ulban Arms SEP-1 security droids. But only one family had no gree luggage porters, a protocol droid carrying a heat-blasted ladalum, and a fully operational YVH-1 war droid providing crowd control. As ever, the Solos were the most conspicuous of the conspicuous. Pores still raging against the Uglyph masker she had been wearing since the failed kidnapping at their apartment, Vicky Shesh turned to the child standing with her at the observation deck safety rail. With a mop of unruly brown hair and big blue eyes as round as Old Republic Valor medals, he could have been a twin to the twelve-year-old Anakin Solo portrayed in Newsvid archives. He ought to have been. It had cost Vicky a small fortune in Cosmos Surgeon and back-to-tank fees to make him look that way. You see them, Dab? The ones with the big war droid? How could I miss them? the boy answered. Everybody in the galaxy knows the Solos. You didn't say they were the ones. I didn't say a lot of things, Vicky said. Thanks to a thumb-sized Yuzhan Vong leech creature lodged in her throat, Vicky's once silky voice was now almost reedy and quavery. But if you and your family want passage off Coruscant with me, I won't need to. The boy looked away. I understand. His mother and two sisters were already aboard Vicky's yacht which was berthed under a false name on the other side of the Falcon, just beyond a public star ferry named the Beert. She studied the boy, wondering if she had perhaps misjudged the urchin's character when she spotted him in the underlevels, rifling the pockets of assaulted Arcona. If the child turned out to have a sense of honor, or even the shadow of a conscience, she was as doomed as Coruscant itself. After the holonet had reported her failure at the Solo's apartment, Sabong La's villip had averted just long enough to say as much. I hope you do understand, Dab, Vicky said. I will not suffer failure lightly. I will not suffer it at all.
Leave it to the East Port docking master to squeeze a Ronto into a rabbit hole. By keeping the dome irised open and landing the beard nacelles down inside a Magnalock hull hoist, the remarkable Chev Watson had squeezed a two hundred meter star ferry into a berthing bay designed for yachts and light transports. Leia could have slapped him with a lightsaber. Ten thousand terrified people stood waiting to board a vessel that would hold five thousand at best, most standing in front of Docking Bay 3733, where the Falcon was kept under an assumed name. As much as Leia wanted to board their ship and get off Coruscant with Ben, she knew they would be mobbed by desperate refugees the instant they tried to push through the throng. For now, the best thing to do was wait at the edge until the Beert began to board, then work their way over to their berth as the crowd pressed forward. Leia hoped they would have enough time. Through the narrow crescent of sky visible above the Beert's nose, she could see a steady stream of government yachts rising out of Imperial City, the New Republic's dedicated senators and loyal government officials abandoning their posts. So far, the Yuzhan Vong were still too busy with the New Republic military to harass fleeing civilians, but that would change soon. She had even heard of senators asking admirals from their own sectors to escort them home, and in far too many cases, those requests were being honored. She found it difficult to believe this was the same New Republic she had helped found, and for which Anakin had given his life. General? The voice that asked this was reedy and quavering. General, is that you? Leia turned with Han, the Nogri, and the droids to see a luggage-burdened woman with a large nose and tired eyes pushing through the crowd toward them. Trailing along at her side was a sandy-haired boy of about twelve, also struggling beneath a mound of baggage. General! As the woman said this, she suddenly found her path blocked by Adarak and Miwa. It is you. I haven't been a general for a long time. Han spoke quietly and tried not to be too obvious as he glanced around to see who might be eavesdropping. Do we know each other? You don't remember? The woman used a bag to sweep her son forward, and Leia was struck by just how much he looked like Anakin at that age. It was more than just the upturned nose and the ice-blue eyes. His whole face was shaped the same and he even had the same round little chin. Her heart went out to this boy and his mother. Han studied the woman and her son, then said, No, I don't remember. The woman did not seem offended. Well, of course, I'm sure it was more important to me than to you. After all, you were the general, and Ran was only a flight officer in Rogue Squadron. Ran? Han asked. Ran Keither? Yes, the woman said. I was only his girlfriend then, but I met you twice on Chandrilla. Okay, Han said, warming instantly. He motioned the Nogri aside. I'm sorry I don't remember you. How is Ran? The woman's expression fell. You didn't hear? Han shook his head. I've been, uh, out of touch. He was flying refugee transports for Selkor. We lost him at Kalarba. The woman glanced at Leia for the first time. I understand your daughter was injured there, too. She recovered quickly. Balancing Ben on a hip, Leia reached out to squeeze the woman's hand. It was the first time since Anakin's death that she had felt sorry for someone other than herself, and in a self-centered sort of way, it was almost a relief. I'm so sorry about Ran. There's too much of that these days. Thank you, Princess. Leia, please. Leia touched the shoulder of the boy who looked so much like Anakin. I'm sorry about your father, young man. The boy nodded and looked uncomfortable. Thanks. This is Tark. I'm Wilda. The woman smiled at the child in Leia's arms. The gossip vids haven't said anything about you being pregnant, so I assume this beautiful boy is Ben Skywalker? Actually, we're trying to keep that quiet, Leia said. She cast a meaningful look around the crowd. You understand. I'm sorry. Wilda's tone was abashed, but she did not blush. How foolish of me. A loud clunk sounded from five meters up the beard, and a cloud of vapor shot into the air as the boarding hatch broke its seal and opened. 
Although the boarding ramp had not yet been lowered, the crowd immediately began to compress forward. It looks like they've worked out the artificial gravity alignment problems. Wilda looked at the still-growing crowd, which now had to be closer to twelve thousand than ten. I hope there'll be room for us all. Han looked behind the woman's head and raised his brow at Leia. She nodded. They would be taking as many refugees with them as the Falcon could carry anyway, and she had no intention of leaving this pair behind. Han smiled crookedly and leaned close to Welda's ear. Actually, that won't be a problem. The boarding ramp came down. The crowd started to ascend rapidly, each group being detained at the hatch long enough for an epidermal scan to ensure they were not Yuzhan Vong infiltrators. The Nogri took advantage of the movement to start easing the group toward the Falcon's berth. There were a few angry glares and muttered comments about pushy solos, but the presence of a war droid and the fact that the group was not cutting forward limited the objections to the non-physical kind. Leia was careful to keep Tark and Welda close at hand, and the group reached the entrance to Docking Bay 3733 intact. Now came the tricky part getting inside without being trampled by desperate refugees. Han quietly stationed YVH-1507A in front of the Durasteel door and reached for the security pad. If you're trying to slice the security, save yourself the bother, a gravelly voice said. Leia turned to find a horn-headed Gotal in a gaudy cinta-thread tunic speaking to them from within the crowd. Whoever owns that junk heap couldn't afford the birthing fees. The umbilicals are all disconnected. What? Han cupped his hands to the viewing panel and peered inside. You've got to be kidding. There's containment fluid all over the floor. Even after sitting idle for several days, the Falcon could be cold-started in only a few minutes, but not without a fully charged fusion containment unit. Too devastated to ask the helpful Gotal, what he had been doing, looking at the Falcon. She had no doubt he had considered trying to slice the security panel himself. Leia turned to apologize to Welda. The woman was no longer beside her. Something metallic hit the floor a couple of meters away, and Leia glimpsed Tark pushing through the crowd. She switched Ben to the other hip so her weapon hand would be free, then YVH-1507A clanged past toward the sound, his powerful arms batting people aside as gently as possible. Remain calm and please seek shelter, he intoned. There is an active thermal detonator in the area. Of course, the crowd did anything but stay calm. Determined to board the beard at any cost, someone kicked the detonator and sent it skittering across the floor, and the mob began to push toward the boarding ramp even more urgently. Do not kick the detonator, YVH-1507A ordered. Remain calm and step away. Someone booted it back at the original kicker, and the droid skittered over a family of Aqualish trying to change direction. Incredibly, the crowd continued to shove forward, between the solos and to both sides of them. Determined to avoid becoming separated from Han, Leia snapped her lightsaber from beneath her jacket and turned back toward the berth. She found Welda blocking the way. Raising a small holdout blaster and pointing it at Leia's chest, the weapon remained there for about half a second before Adarak, still holding the luggage he had been carrying, sank his teeth into the woman's arm. There was a sickening crunch, and Welda's hand fell open and let the blaster fall. The Nogri used a bag to knock her feet out from beneath her, and then he was on her, tearing at her head with both hands. Even this did not stop the desperate mob from pressing forward around the fight. Far too accustomed to assassins and kidnappers to waste time wondering who had sent them or why, Leia positioned her body between Ben and Wilda, and started to push her way around the fight. Han was two steps away from her, holding his blaster in one hand, and using the other to punch the admittance code into the security panel. C-3PO, where's Miwall? Leia asked. She went after Tark, mistress. 
still holding her blast-scorched ladlum. The droid was following Leia around the fight. I do hope the boy set a long fuse on that thermal detonator. 1-507 is so terribly clumsy. The soft drone of a vibroblade sounded behind Leia. Surprised that Adarak had not finished the fight already, she turned to find a power shiv rising in Welda's good hand. The Nogri blocked easily, then countered with a slash that caught the woman beside the ear and lifted her entire face off. The woman's scream was nowhere near as ghastly as it should have been. Her face squirmed in Adarak's hand like a thing alive, and neither Leia nor the Nogri understood for an instant what they were looking at. That was all the time Welda needed to drive the power shiv into Adarak's ribs. The Nogri's eyes grew wide with shock, and his mouth fell open. Then Leia felt the life leave his body. All of the disappointment and sadness she had been feeling since Anakin's death turned instantly to anger. She thumbed her lightsaber active and, still holding Ben, stepped forward to attack. Welda hurled Adarak's body into Leia's knees, knocking her legs from beneath her and rolling away. Leia was barely quick enough to catch herself with the force and avoid landing on Ben. A pair of blaster bolts zinged overhead from Han's direction, forcing her attacker back and eliciting an even louder uproar from the panicked crowd. Leia gathered her feet beneath her in a fighting crouch and found the assassin mirroring her position from two meters away, a wide-eyed Hodin family squeezing past behind her. Even with every pore still oozing blood where the Uglith masker had been forcibly ripped away, the slender face across from her was unmistakable. Vicky Shesh, Leia said. Ben finally had enough and began to cry, but Leia was too outraged to pay attention. I would have thought you'd be down in the grotto levels, waiting for your masters with the rest of the granite slugs. Leia, always the proper word for every occasion. Shesh flicked her wrist, hurling the power shiv at Ben. Leia blocked easily with her lightsaber, then cursed inwardly as Han chased the traitor off by zinging another pair of blaster bolts over her head. "'You're a better shot than that, Han,' Leia snarled, although she knew he had only been trying to avoid hitting innocent bystanders. She thrust Ben at C-3PO. "'Put that tree down and hold him. Me?' The droid dropped the pot and cupped his metallic hands under the child. But, Mistress Leia, you had my child care module wiped after that time. Wait on the Falcon, Leia ordered. Of course, Princess, but I must remind you. The droid's objection was lost to the general din as Leia pursued Shash into the crowd. She heard Han call her name, but did not turn back for him either. The traitor would not escape not after betraying the New Republic, selling out Selkor, and, no doubt, arranging the deaths of a great many Jedi. Perhaps she had even had a hand in Anakin's. The whine of a pair of repulsor-enhanced legs echoed through the docking facility girders, and YVH-1507A bounded over the crowd toward Gate 3700. Make a hole! Thermal detonator coming through! The droid crashed down on a hover sled loaded with priceless sculptures and immediately bounded into the air again. Remain calm and... The command ended in a deafening crackle as the detonator ignited, taking with it 500 cubic meters of docking facility, sentient biomass, and durasteel substructure. As the sizzling sphere contracted on itself, a long metallic groan reverberated through the docking facility. Then a large section of floor suddenly began to sink toward the now non-existent Gate 3700. The crowd roared and somehow began to run at the beard, half pushing, half carrying those in front up the boarding ramp. Leia found herself being carried backward by the crowd and had to use the force to stay in place. Her quarry was nowhere to be seen, but she did spy a blood-smeared Rodian rushing in her direction. She pushed through the crowd and planted herself in his path, raising her inactive lightsaber to stop him. He buzzed an objection at her in Hatties. Everyone is trying to board that ship. 
As she spoke, Leia gestured at him with an open palm. And I'm sure you'll make it that much sooner if you just take the time now to tell me where the woman who smeared this on you went. The Rodian repeated her suggestion, then pointed to Docking Bay 3732, the next one after the Falcons. Leia let him go and fought her way fifty meters up the corridor, her fury growing with every step. The damage Vicky Shesh had done to the New Republic was immeasurable. The pain she had caused the Solos unforgivable. Leia owed it to Anakin, and to all of the millions of others who had given their life defending an ideal, to repay her in kind. Leia reached the bay to find it already secured. Not bothering to try the control button, she ignited her lightsaber and jammed the blade into the seam, slicing through the durasteel locking bolt as though it were so much tin. The security alarm that began to blare both inside the berth and outside did little to add to the general commotion in the docking facility. Following close behind to shield herself from attack, she used the force to push the Durasteel door open, and was surprised to find blaster bolts already ricocheting around the launch bay's dreary interior. In the center of the bay sat a sleek KDY star yacht, the pilot peering through the cockpit viewing panel as he powered up the repulsor drives. Vicky Shash was about a third of the way around the circle, holding her mangled arm and dodging for the boarding ramp, while Han fired at her through a hole that someone had recently cut through the Durasteel wall, separating docking Bay 3732 from Bay 3733. He was being fired on in turn by a pair of crew members, trying to cover their employer from the well of the boarding ramp. Leia started across the bay after her quarry, only to hear the ominous whir of the yacht's roof-mounted weapons turret revolving in her direction. She barely had time to hurl herself to the floor before the weapon depressed and fired, burning a fifty-centimeter hole into the durasteel beside her head. Leia rolled and came up with her blade ignited. Leia, are you crazy? Han yelled, forgetting himself and rising up in front of the hole. You're not that good with that thing. The crew members poured a flurry of blaster bolts through the hole, forcing Han to dive for the floor and giving Shesh a clear path to the boarding ramp. The turret laser fired again, but Leia was already dodging across the floor, if a bit awkwardly, at least fast enough to keep from getting hit. She stumbled and nearly fell, then heard a blaster rifle off to one side. She turned toward the sound and found Vicky Shesh rushing under the yacht toward its boarding ramp. Trying to ignore the blaster bolts pinging off the durasteel all around her, Leia locked her lightsaber on and hurled the weapon at the traitor, using the force to keep it spinning toward its target. The turret laser fired again, as did the crew members at the top of the boarding ramp. Leia gave her body over to her instincts, and continued to focus her mind on the attack, trusting to the force to move her arms and legs in the correct manner. Shesh hurled herself down on the boarding ramp. Instead of cutting her in half, the blade slipped along her back, burning away her clothing and a thick layer of skin and bone. She screamed and collapsed, then reached up with her arms and began to pull herself toward the interior of the ship. The ramp rose, and the last thing Leia saw of the traitor was a pair of male hands pulling her aboard. Leia did not even realize she was also being dragged out of harm's way until she heard Miwal say, Lady Vader, you must get down. Leia allowed the Nogri to pull her to the floor, just as another cannon bolt tore through the wall above her. When the yacht's repulsor engines were to life, and a second bolt did not follow, she reluctantly raised her head, her heart already bursting with the news she would have to give Miwa. But instead of the Nogri, she found herself staring at Anakin's twelve-year-old face. "'Do whatever you want to me,' Tark said. He was sitting with his back to the wall and his hands bound by a pair of Miwal's plasteel restraining cuffs. At least my mom and sisters are safe. Safe? Leia could only shake her head. Is that what you think? It's what I know. The boy tipped his head back and looked up at the ceiling, where Shesha's yacht was being forced to wait until the docking master cleared it for departure by opening the dome. They're on the wicked pleasure right now. Leia was already reaching for her comlink when Han came running up. 
Forget it, he said, displaying his own comlink. I tried. Chev's not holding vessels for anyone. Leia nodded. It hardly mattered what Chev said. With its big laser cannon, the yacht could blast out of the bay anyway. Han held out her deactivated lightsaber. Feel any better? Not really, Leia admitted. She stood and took the lightsaber, hanging it inside her jacket again. How about you? Worse, Han said. He pointed at Tark. What are we going to do about him? The last thing Leia wanted to do was take this particular child along on the Falcon. But she was certainly not going to abandon a twelve-year-old boy on Coruscant. She grabbed him by the wrist restraints and pulled him to his feet. Yeah, that's what I thought, Han frowned, then looked expectantly toward the door. What did you do with C-3PO and Ben? They're supposed to be with the Falcon. Han's face fell. Not likely. When you ran off, I secured the door to keep the mob out. A low rumble shook the berth as the dome irised open, and they looked up to see the beard rising on a pillar of ion efflux. The wicked pleasure slipped out of the bay and followed it skyward. Then C-3PO's voice came over the comlink. Master Han? Mistress Leia? Leia and Han activated their comlinks together. Where are you? This isn't my doing, the droid said. The berth was locked, and I was helpless to defend us. C-3PO, Leia said. Are you telling me you're aboard the Beard? I'm afraid so, Mistress Leia, he said. And they're threatening to put a restraining bolt on me. Chapter 52 The skips were stacked like the stones in an ancient Masasi wall, each craft hovering above the gap between the two below every gap covered by interlocking fire from an inner ring of corvettes. Behind the corvettes waited frigates, and somewhere behind the frigates was the cruiser bearing the Yamask. Luke and his shield mates launched another volley of shadow bombs and watched the weapons veer into shielding singularities. The three Jedi continued on vector long enough to taunt the Yuzhan Vong pilots with a fusillade of cannon fire, then broke off amid a storm of hot plasma and angry gretchens. Though all three were careful to present inviting attack angles as they turned, none of the enemy coral skippers abandoned station to pursue. The war master had finally learned how to protect his Yamask, and woe to the warrior who broke formation. Luke opened a channel to Orbital Defense Headquarters, to whom they had been passed off as the battle drifted closer into Coruscant. Zero on the chasers, gambler. That Yamask is in the battle for good. Copy, farm boy. No reason to be disappointed, Lando replied. You forced them to take half a fleet out of the fight. That's something. Luke had no idea how Lando had come to be General Batra's special operations commander. But he was glad to have someone of such composure serving as their battle coordinator. Judging by the static and booming on the channel... The ODH himself was under heavy attack. Let's try a wave attack. Maybe we can just punch through. Negative, Lando said. Stand by for a planet-side compatch. Luke felt Mara grow instantly apprehensive. Han and Leia should have been off Coruscant an hour ago, but it could not be anyone else. Han came on the channel. Can you break free up there? You know we can. Mara answered. You need to catch the Star Fairy Beert. As Han spoke, the tactical display shifted scales. A targeting square appeared a quarter of the way around the planet, on a two hundred meter transport rising into space. C-3PO is aboard with your package. It's my fault. Leia's voice was as brittle as a glitter stim web. Licky Shash ambushed us in the docking bay, and I was so furious. Leia. Don't worry, Mara said. There was only resolve in her voice, no blame or worry. We'll get him back. Okay. Han sounded relieved. We're stuck planetside until we find some containment fluid. The senator did a job on our feed lines and umbilicals. 
Now, Morrow was worried, Luke sensed. Charging an empty containment unit could take hours. Coruscant didn't have hours. Given the number of coral skippers and air skiffs already dropping out of orbit, it might not have one hour. Luke was about to send Saba-17 down in her blast boat when Lando came on the channel. Old buddy, the scarheads will blast this bucket of bolts out from under me any minute. I could drop down in the luck and give you a lift. And leave the bird behind? Never, Han calmed. You guys take care of things up there. Will do, Luke said, and may the Force be with you. Yeah, kid. You too, Han said. Solo out. Luke's thoughts turned to his son. Mara had already potted an atmosphere-skimming vector that would intercept the Beard, and a thousand other vessels streaming up from the East Port Imperial City area. But they would have to hurry. The tactical display showed a Yuzhan Vong frigate group moving to intercept the fleeing starships. Gambler, go, Lando calmed. A couple of Jedi won't make a difference here. Luke peeled off after Mara, who was already diving away. Noticing that Tam was following, he calmed. Quiet, stay with the wing. Hisser, you're in charge. Make it look good until things fall apart, then come it for the rendezvous. You do not want help, Master Farm Boy. I want it. Luke pushed the stick forward and followed Mara under the flaming belly of a kilometer-long KDY New Republic battlecruiser. But every minute you hold that task force here saves ten thousand New Republic lives. Copy, Saba said. Count on us to save a million. The comm speaker gave a sharp crackle. Then Luke came up on the other side of the cruiser to find a rolling fireball where the tactical display showed Mara's X-wing. Jinking around the explosion, he calmed. Mara? No answer. But she reached out through the force, urging him not to worry. Get Ben. R2-D2 tweedled a warning. Luke swung left and narrowly avoided a barrage from the enemy vessel, also a cruiser, that had set the KDY aflame. He designated it a high-priority watch for R2-D2 and automatically fell into a random jink-and-juke evasion pattern. He found Mara silhouetted against the lights of Coruscant's night side her number three engine trailing yellow flame, her astromech droid domeless, her S-foils stuck half-open. No good for firing or speed. Had she been anyone else, or their task any but retrieving Ben, Luke would have ordered her to a safe base. With Mara, that was out of the question until their son was safe. He pulled his X-wing alongside hers and pointed at her shield generator. Mara shook her head. No shields. Finally frightened, Luke reached out with the Force, consciously reinforcing their bond. Mara reached back and slid into place beneath his X-wing, before he could gesture her over. They skimmed through the upper atmosphere, giving wide berth to a small battle raging around a Skyhook residential platform tethered in low orbit, then began to take incidental fire dodging through an airskiff insertion zone. As they drew near the Beert, R2-D2 kept changing the tactical display's scale to show more detail. It soon grew apparent that the Yuzhan Vong frigate group was moving to intercept the same star ferry they were. They left the atmosphere again, and found themselves surrounded by a dozen small battles as Yuzhan Vong assault groups struggled through the interlocking fire zones of Coruscant's orbital defense platforms. The invaders were succeeding, but slowly and only by weight of superior numbers, in view of the naked eye alone, there were a dozen enemy cruisers venting their entrails into space, and hundreds of smaller craft drifting about in aimless, decaying orbits. Luke started to detour around the combat cluster, and drew an admonishing whistle from R2-D2. A pair of time estimates appeared on the main display, showing that the frigate would beat them to the beard as it was. Luke adjusted the threat alarms to their most sensitive and set the X-wing on a straight vector. Something bumped his starfighter's belly. Luke's first thought was of Mara, that maybe she'd been hit again. Then he felt her apprehension and knew she was there. His X-wing jumped again. He looked over and saw her flying down to one side. 
She pulled back on her stick and banged her S-foils into his undercarriage, hard. When she bounced away, they were closed. A new time estimate appeared on Luke's display. They would intercept the Beert within a few seconds of the Yuzhan Vong. R2. Is Mara seeing this? The droid chirped impatiently, then an explanation appeared on the primary display. R2-D2 was using his transceiver to feed data directly onto her vid displays. You could have told me, Luke said. Ask how many shadow bombs she has available. Mara held up three fingers. Luke nodded, then flashed three fingers twice and closed his S-foils. Give us a two-second count. The count appeared, and two seconds later, they were flying through the combat area at two-thirds an X-wing's top speed, the best Mara could manage on three engines without drifting into overload ranges. Luke lost his own shields when an enemy corvette used half a dozen Dovin basils to rip them in swift succession. "'drawing down the grab safety and overloading the generator "'as it tried to bring up new protection too quickly. "'But then they were above the defense platforms "'and out of those battles, streaking after the Beert. "'Luke opened a channel to the liner. "'Starferry Beert, please alter vector toward incoming X-Wings. "'We'll eliminate your pursuit.' "'There was a short pause, then a deep voice came over the channel. "'You gone back, Brain?' There are only two of you. A second New Republic vessel, a sleek KDY star yacht flying with its transponder off, appeared on the tactical display behind the beard. We'll take our chances. No particular reason they'd be after us. There is, Luke said. On the display, the frigate group, a frigate analog and two corvettes, was gaining on the star ferry. This is Luke Skywalker. You have my son aboard. What? captain cried. This is no time for jokes. No joke, Luke said. Alter your vector now. Though he doubted it would carry over calm waves, Luke put the weight of the force behind his words. The Beert's vector started to bend. Mara's relief washed up from below. Luke checked the tactical display and found the KDY star yacht continuing along its original vector, one less factor to worry about. The Beert came into visible range, a finger-length needle of ion efflux illuminating the Yorick coral noses of the three pursuing vessels. Luke touched the symbol of the rearmost corvette. R2, designate that one for Mara, and tell her to be careful. R2-D2 bleeped an acknowledgment. The Jedi split, streaking toward their targets in wild corkscrews. The frigate group dropped skips and began to spray plasma. Lacking shields, Luke and Mara poured on speed and gave their stick hands over to the force. The enemy vessels swelled into stony monoliths, scabrous and black and half-hidden behind whirling curtains of flame. Mara broke toward her corvette, barrel-rolled past half a dozen skips, and launched her shadow bombs. Luke swung after her. The skips took the bait and rushed to intercept him. He broke back toward the frigate and dodged past a magma missile, slashed a gretchen apart on his closed S-foils, and made an oblique run down the vessel's flank. A shielding crew snared his first shadow bomb twenty meters from target. The other two blossomed against the hull. One breached at midships, the other behind the bow. The frigate fell silent and began to vent flotsam. Luke dodged over the top and began a tight turn toward the last corvette. Her first target already reduced to rubble, Mara was also swinging toward the corvette. Luke could feel her resolve as clearly as his own. But with her shadow bombs gone and her s foils stuck closed, that was all she had. R2. Tell her to dock with the beard. The droid whistled negatively. They were too far apart to project data directly onto her screens. Great. Luke finished his turn, found skips swarming over the corvette to cut him off. The Beert's two laser cannons began to spray red bolts at the vessel's nose. The corvette held its fire and extruded capture tentacles. Luke deployed his S-foils and began to trade fire with the skips. With Korn's new targeting system, he quickly destroyed the first pair and forced the rest to spread out. 
A notice alarm beeped on the tactical display. The unidentified star yacht had changed vector, was coming in behind Mara. What now? Luke grumbled. Get this onto Mara's display. R2-D2 whistled doubtfully. Try! Luke juked past a plasma ball and poured cannon bolts into the skip that had launched it. And open a channel to that yacht. A half-dozen skips swung toward Mara. He started after them, then heard her voice in his mind. No. The image of the corvette flashed in Luke's mind, and he knew that Mara wanted him to concentrate on saving Ben. Behind you, Luke returned. He sent a flurry of bolts streaming at the skips, then rolled back toward the corvette. How about that channel, R2? An explanation appeared on the primary display. They won't? The reason for the star yacht's silence grew clear when it fired on Mara from behind. Luke twisted around and saw bolts streaming into her starfighter, then the bright flash of a hit. A piece of wing spun off, flaming. Go, Mara urged. The panic in her thought was for Ben, not herself. A single word more, eject, came to Luke's mind. Mara wheeled toward the planet, using the force to hold her X-wing level, so it would not go into a tumble when she hit the atmosphere. Luke reached out to envelop her with his love, then looked to his tactical display and found her craft already marked for tracking. There was now a transponder identification below the star yacht. The Wicked Pleasure, registered to Senator Vicky Shesh. Luke took a breath and let it out, let his fury go with it. Then he marked the vessel as a target of opportunity. A plasma ball skipped across his nose cone, and the tactical display went dead beneath his fingers. R2-D2 shrieked with static, then fell into an electronic babble as melted comm components and burning sensor packages spilled into space. Luke soared in among the skips, dodging and rolling and pivoting, targeting by the force alone and still scoring hits. He blasted one skip into pebbles and suddenly found a clear hold of the corvette. He closed his S-foils and accelerated. The skips whirled after him, pouring fire from behind. The X-wing bucked. Alarm screeches filled the cockpit. The engines lost power and he decelerated. Luke launched his shadow bombs anyway. The first veered into a skip shielding singularity and detonated barely a hundred meters away. The other two vanished against the corvette's black silhouette. He kept pushing until their proximity fuses detected the pull of a Dovin basil and blasted a pair of deep hollows in the vessel's hull. Close, but no breach. R2-D2 wailed for Luke's attention. He glanced back and found two engines, possibly all four, burning. He slapped the emergency shutdown, wheeled toward Coruscant, and reached out with the force, pulling himself toward Mara and her plummeting X-wing. I couldn't get to him, he told her. I just couldn't make it. Jane awoke to the sound of laughter, with a bright light shining in her eye and a stink in her nose like a Gamorrean refresher station. The laugh was just the sort of mad cackle one would expect in a Kala'un real den, but she knew better than to think her throbbing head and aching shoulder were the byproducts of a spice stream. This nightmare was real. Nomanor's frigate had shot down her stolen shuttle. Jason and the rest were stranded on an enemy world ship. Anakin was dead. The long blaster roared, and another mad cackle sounded somewhere forward of Jaina. Did you see that one? Alima Rar chortled. I cut him in two. Good, Jaina rasped. The effort filled her head with pain, but she welcomed it, drew strength from it. Kill some more. Be quiet, Jaina, Zek said, his voice condemning. The light shifted to her other eye. You don't know what you're talking about. And you do? Jaina slapped the glow stick aside, and the foul-smelling stink salts as well. You don't even have a brother. But I do know the dark side, he said. It isn't the answer. Who said I was turning to the dark side? Jin asked. You used the force to kill. Zek did not say more. 
Jaina looked away from Zek's dark eyes. He had it coming. Her numbness had been replaced with raw fury, and she was glad. You saw what he did to Anakin. Anakin is beyond insults, Zek said evenly. And what about Virgir? You attacked her, too. I was angry. Gritting her teeth against the pain, Jaina sat up and looked around. The inside of the shuttle was a listing mass of clutter, with a long crack running the length of the hull, and a fluid-smeared tangle of cognition hoods and burst villips strewn across the flight deck. Jaina flashed on a garbled memory of struggling with those controls to keep the nose up, of skimming a crater rim, and coming down like the rock the shuttle was, of skipping across the basin floor and rolling sideways and decelerating sharply as the nose caught. Then there was nothing, only a vague feeling of pitching forward and the sound of screaming voices and a sudden darkness. Across from Jaina, Tahiri lay on a litter next to Anakin, one obviously broken arm resting across the husk in which his body was encased. Barely half lucid, she was still talking to him, describing how they had tracked him down in the Yuzhan Vong mortuary. In the back of the vessel, Babaka let out a low groan as he moved something heavy into place. He rumbled softly to himself in the half-slurred voice of a Wookiee with a concussion, then let what sounded like a rock plop into a pool of viscous liquid. A sodden bang followed, and an instant after that, the distant crackle of an erupting plasma ball. A little short, Alima called from the forward door. Raise it one degree and you'll burn them crisp. I take it we're under attack, Jaina said to Zek. Not exactly under attack, but they're coming, Zek confirmed. Nomanor is trying to capture us alive. A sneer came to Jaina's lips. Let him try. She swung her legs off her makeshift litter and reached for her power blaster. I'm going to enjoy this. In all his decades of kicking around the galaxy, Han had never heard anything quite as eerie as the ululation of an anguished Nogri female. It reminded him of the sound of crumpling durasteel, or of the calm shriek a star gives off just before going nova. Even shielded from the noise by the flight deck door and half the length of the falcon, it sent a shiver down his spine and drew tears from his eyes. After eighteen years with the Nogri, he still could not say he understood them, but he knew how much he owed them, and it always hurt when one fell defending his family. Han wiped his eyes, then looked away from the rain of burning ships outside the falcon's cockpit long enough to check the temperature in the fusion power unit. We have about ninety seconds before we become just another fireball crashing down on a tower. Think we still have enough pull to recharge at Imperial City? Or should we try at Caliker Heights? He waited one second. Five. Then ten. Leia? When there was still no answer, he glanced over at her. She was sitting stiffly upright in the oversized co-pilot seat her hands folded in her lap, and her blank gaze fixed on her feet. For the first time, Han noticed that Chewbacca's old seat was so large that it left her toes dangling ten centimeters above the floor. Han shook her arm. Leia, wake up. I need you here. Leia looked up, but stared out the cockpit at the distant smoke plume of a crashing Star Destroyer. Why would you need me, Han? I'll only let you down. Let me down? Han echoed. That's crazy. You've never let me down. Finally, Leia looked at him. Yes, Han, I have. I went after Vicky Shesh. So did I. But you didn't lose Ben and get Adarak killed. Really? Han sneaked a glance at the temperature of the fusion unit, then glanced around the cockpit theatrically. Funny, I don't see them here. Han. Lay aside the word, then looked out over Coruscant's smoking, broken-toothed skyline. You know what I mean. I suppose I do, Han said. I just didn't think you'd go away like I did. 
I thought you were stronger than that. Leia faced him and, for the first time, really seemed to be looking. How can you say that? Though her voice remained even, her very calmness betrayed the depth of her anger. This must hurt you, too. Or do you care only for Wookiees? I care. Han managed to hold his anger in check by reminding himself that her bitterness was a good sign. Any emotional reaction was. And that's why I'm not giving up this time. Not ever again. Anakin and Chewbacca may be gone, and Adarak, and maybe even Ben and Luke and Mara. But we still have each other. That's about all. Leia looked back out the window. And we have hope, Han insisted. As long as we have each other, there's still hope for us. For Jason and Jaina. Wherever they are. Even for the New Republic. The New Republic? Leia's voice rose so sharply it rivaled Miwal's ululation. Are you blind? There is no New Republic. It died before the Yuzhan Vong came. It didn't. Han yelled back, no longer able to contain his anger. Because if it did, then Anakin died for nothing. He glanced down at the temperature of the fusion unit again and saw that they were about thirty seconds from becoming a crater. Han said nothing. If his wife had really given up, he did not care to keep fighting himself. Leia's mouth opened as though she were going to yell back. Then she saw where he was looking and all of the emotion left her face. Han felt her watching him watch the gauge. He said nothing. The gauge ticked up another bar. You're bluffing, Leia said. I'm betting, Han said. Jaina and Jason were still alive, and she would not let her grief make her give up on them. Leia watched the temperature rise another bar, then said, Imperial City. Han let out his breath. Calicur's closer. Han! Han swung the falcon around and began a silent countdown. Go to the Chief of State's landing pad, Leia said. We need to see Borsk. You think Borsk is still on Coruscant? Han gasped. Where else? He certainly won't be going to Bathawi. Leia pulled a data pad out of the stowage slot on her seat and, with the ease of a practiced state person, began to make speech notes. There's something I need to do for him. Chapter 53 With the orbital defense headquarters burning like a second sun as it plummeted across Coruscant's opalescent sky, the tapered spires and delicate towers of the Imperial Palace were bathed in scintillating orange light. As they descended toward the Chief of State's private landing pad, Leia felt like they were dropping into a forest ablaze. Han brought them down less than a meter behind the tail fins of Felia's garish Cothless Systems Luxiflyer, and shut down the fusion unit even before the Falcon settled onto its struts. Leaving Anakin's look-alike, his true name was Dab Hantak, aboard under Miwal's care, they lowered the boarding ramp and found themselves looking down the barrel of a tripod-mounted G-40 portable cannon. Something wrong with the Falcon's transponder, Garve? Leia asked, not all that surprised by the cautious reception. We tried to come, but couldn't get through. Just being careful, Princess. A thin man in the uniform of a New Republic general stepped into view. Sorry about the calm problem. The Yuzhan Vong are starting to take out the satellite web, so Chief of State Failure has ordered a blackout on all non-military communications. That's sure to help the evacuation, Han said. Garve, General Thomas, to everyone except his superiors and former superiors, responded with an enigmatic half-nod. Leia had personally named Garve the commander of palace security, and in all the time she had known him, that was as close to a comment on a superior as she had ever seen from him. Garve, we ran into a little sabotage problem with Vicky Shesh, Leia explained. 
Would it be too much to have someone recharge our containment fluid? And I'd like to speak with Chief of State Failure. We can arrange both. Gar sent a furry-cheeked boffin aide off to fetch the maintenance crew, then turned back to Leia, looking uncharacteristically doubtful. Forgive me if I'm intruding, but I've heard rumors about Anakin. I can't tell you how sorry I am. Thank you, Leia said. Knowing she would need to accustom herself to people offering condolences, she laid a hand on Garve's arm. That means a great deal to us. Han nodded. We're going to miss him. As will the New Republic, Garve said. And speaking of the New Republic, Leia said, glad for an excuse to change the subject. I noticed the data towers are still intact. Shouldn't someone be destroying those records? Someone should be, Garve said. But failure refuses to give the order. He thinks he can hold the planet? Han asked, disbelieving. The idiot. If the Scarheads capture those survey abstracts, there won't be a safe place in the galaxy to put a base. Garve's expression turned sour. I have mentioned as much. I'm sure the Chief of State will give the order when the time comes, Leia said. With shafts of turbolaser fire starting to strike at hostile vessels from rooftops all across Coruscant, she felt certain the time had come already. But Garv Thomas was too good an officer to exceed his authority even under these circumstances. Still, it wouldn't be improper to arm the charges now, would it, General? Garv smiled. Not improper at all. He keyed the order into a data pad and dispatched an officer to see it carried through, then led the way through the hangar to the Chief of State's Tower Top office suite. After a brief dispute with an agenda droid, which Garve won by virtue of a security override command, the General admitted them to the restricted chambers and withdrew to continue his duties. They found failure bereft of his usual gaggle of advisers and sycophants. Standing alone in the heart of his opulent office, studying a holographic display of Coruscant's crumbling defenses. The situation was hopeless. What remained of the New Republic fleets were surrounded or cut off from the planet, sometimes both. Half of the defense platforms were falling out of orbit, the rest blinking with critical damage indicators. The atmospheric security force was fighting fiercely in their V wings and howl runners but the superiority of their air-dedicated craft could not overcome the enemy's sheer numbers. Yuzhan Vong dropships were already forming up to make their runs, and Leia knew this battle would soon be moving to the rooftops. It took failure a minute to notice he had guests. Come to gloat, princess. Leia forced a warm tone. Not at all, chief hoping Han's face would not betray the opinion of failure he had expressed earlier, she extended her hands and crossed to the Bothan. I came to apologize. Failure's ears flattened. Apologize? For not helping with the military, she explained. I'm afraid I was too consumed with grief. Failure's attitude changed instantly, and he took her hands between his paws. Not at all. I am the one who should apologize, to call upon you at such a time. It must have been important, or you wouldn't have intruded. Confident that failure was already considering how he might use her to bolster his evaporated support, Leia shifted her gaze to the display and let the comment hang. Our position certainly looks tenuous. Can we hold? We must, failure answered. If Coruscant falls... So does my government. Yeah, wouldn't that be a shame, Han said. Resisting the urge to stomp on his foot, Leia smiled and pretended not to notice the sarcasm. What my husband means to say, Chief Failure, is that you have our support. She pulled Han to her side. Isn't that right, dear? Of course, dear. Han sounded sincere, or close enough to draw an accepting nod from Failure. Chief Failure can count on us. Leia put on an earnest look. If you thought a few words from me would do any good. 
Thalia's smile looked more relieved than appreciative. What could it hurt? If the military knows you're with me, they'll stand firm behind my government. That's been the problem, you see. All these senators running for home and grabbing a piece of any fleet they can. I know, Leia said. I've seen the news vids. Is the comm center still over by the window? That was such an easy place for Baldavian lip-readers to watch. Thalia took her arm and guided her toward what had been, when she occupied the office, a coat closet. One body of open water on the whole planet, and you drop our X-wings in it? Mara said, wrapping an air splint around her broken ankle. The only one? What were you thinking, Skywalker? Mara, I really didn't have a choice, Luke said. The heat of his engine fires had fused the fibers on the back of his flight suit, and he would need a close cut before his singed hair looked human again. It was put them here or crash them into a tower. Mara and Luke were staring across the firelit waters of the Western Sea. A vast artificial lake and multi-species recreation area spread across thousands, maybe tens of thousands, of rooftops. A dozen whirlpools marked where crashes less controlled than their own had punctured the durasteel bed and freed the contents to rain down on Coruscant's underlevels. All in all, it had not been a bad place to push the X-Wings after they ejected, but the bottom was so strewn with discarded droids and junked airspeeders that locating their cherished R2 unit was proving difficult even for Luke. She pulled the air splint's inflation tab and did not allow herself to wince as it compressed her broken bones, then took an injector out of the ejection med pack and gave herself a shot of bactinum. Mara would normally have avoided any kind of painkiller, but they would be moving fast over the next few hours, and she did not want her injury slowing her down. The Yuzhan Vong were starting to bring their big vessels down to suppress the rooftop turbolasers, and she could sense that the Beert had not escaped into hyperspace with Ben. They had to find a way back into orbit, and fast. Luke finally stretched a hand over the water. A distant speck broke the surface and swelled into the shape of a scorched X-wing. A pair of Yuzhan Vong air skiffs promptly dropped out of the sun to attack, in turn drawing fire from a nearby turbolaser battery. For a few short seconds, the sky above the lake erupted into a gridwork of streaking plasma balls and flashing energy bolts. Then one skiff burst into rubble, and the other pulled up, vanishing into the sun with a stream of laser shafts, chasing its tail. Mara waved their thanks up to the battery crew, which was so well camouflaged on a nearby rooftop that she had difficulty finding it until she used the force. Luke brought the X-Wing to shore and lifted a wildly chirping R2-D2 from the astromech socket. Other than heat scarring, the droid looked sound, and the fuss he was making confirmed that his hermetic seals remained intact after both fire and submersion. Something big exploded high above, momentarily outshining the sun and spraying long tongues of white flame across the sky. Mara and Luke watched until the brilliance dimmed enough to reveal individual pieces of debris fluttering planetward. But there was no way to know whether the vessel had been New Republic or Yuzhan Vong. Suddenly overcome by the desperation of their situation, she looped her arm through Luke's elbow and allowed him to take the weight off her broken ankle. Luke, how are we going to do this? They had seen from the air that the hover lanes were either jammed with traffic or blocked by debris, and they both knew that even if they did reach a spaceport, any spacecraft worthy of the name would be long gone. We'll be lucky to get ourselves off planet, much less rescue Ben. Luke took her in his arm. Trust in the Force, Mara. Is that the best you can do? Mara asked bitterly. Did trusting the Force save Anakin? Perhaps Anakin was meant to save us, Luke said gently. He knelt in front of R2-D2 and used his sleeve cuff to dry the droid's auditory sensors. We're not in this alone, Mara. 
If I too can get through on a military channel, maybe someone else can help. Maybe. Mara looked away and tried to keep the dark emotions from rising inside her. She did not want to blame Han and Leia for their son's peril, but it had been help that had endangered Ben in the first place. Will you hurry, Skywalker? Got it, Luke said. I too. The droid whistled in excitement. You're sure? Luke began to dry R2-D2's speaker grill. You found Leia? This is not the end, Leia said. Two years ago, the Yuzhan Vong entered our galaxy. They came not as friends and equals, though we would gladly have welcomed them as such, but as thieves and conquerors. They saw a galaxy at peace and mistook the strength of our convictions for frailty of arms, the wisdom of compromise for the timidity of cowards. They attacked without provocation or mercy, slaying billions of our citizens, enslaving entire worlds and sacrificing millions of beings to appease the bloodlust of their imaginary gods. They believed we would be easily defeated, because they believed we would yield without a fight. They were wrong. We have fought at Dubrillion, Ithor, the Black Bantha, Borleas, and Corellia. We have fought them every leg of the way from the outer rim into the core. We have lost untold numbers of loved ones, my own son Anakin and my husband's dear friend Chewbacca among them, and now we are battling in the skies over Coruscant itself. We are still fighting. Soon the enemy will be on our rooftops, in our homes, roaming the dark underlayers of our city. To those able to evacuate and... To those trapped behind, I say the same thing I would tell my twins. Were I able to reach them behind enemy lines, keep fighting. This is not the end. Twice already Jedi-led forces have decimated Yuzhan Vong fleets, and we enter each battle with new weapons and better tactics. We have prevailed against ruthless enemies before, against Palpatine, against Thrawn, against the Cyruk. This is a war we know how to win. Keep fighting until you can fight no longer. Then exhaust the enemy chasing you and turn and fight some more. Keep fighting. I promise you, we will prevail. The Lady Lux flight deck fell as silent as a Nogri with a Vibra blade. Lando pretended to adjust the shield power until he knew his eyes would remain dry, then heard an odd half-growl from the co-pilot's seat. He looked over to find General Batra drying his cheek fur. That woman could talk a hut onto a diet. The Bothan spent the next few seconds looking out the forward viewport, where the Beert's finger-sized profile was rapidly swelling to arm-sized. A smaller lozenge, black and scabrous, was tentacled to its belly, and Vicky Shesh's sleek KDY star yacht hovered nearby. Finally, Batra grunted. General Calrissian, none of those vessels looks like the errant venture. They're not, Lando said, offering no other explanation. As far as he was concerned, his reactivation had ended with the fall of the orbital defense headquarters. Now Batra and his soldiers were just evacuees hitching a ride. He opened a ship-to-ship -ship channel to his wife. Has, where are you? Tendra demanded. I've been worried sick. Everything's fine. I was, uh, delayed at the ODH. As Lando spoke, he was sending her coordinates on a separate data band. When Booster arrives, ask him to swing by this location. I'm doing a favor for some mutual friends and it would be good to have a Star Destroyer standing by. What kind of favor? It's important. Though the channel was encrypted, Lando hesitated to say more for fear of Peace Brigade slicers. Just tell Booster. I'll see you soon. You'd better bet on it. Not wishing to alarm Tendra, Lando signed off without telling her he loved her. Batra studied him out of the corner of his eye. Didn't figure you for a hero, Calrissian. Me? Not at all. 
Lando flashed his salesman's smile. But I couldn't pass on a chance to demonstrate my droids to a captive audience. Batra snorted, then half smiled and glanced at the primary display. Even this high in orbit, space was crowded with vehicles. For the most part, the Yuzhan Vong were too busy with Coruscant's still formidable defenses to molest civilian ships, but a dozen skips patrolled the area around the Beert, chasing off any vessel that came near. Batra tapped a claw on the display. Wouldn't hurt to bring some escort. We could call the Jedi Wing off that Yamask. And draw attention to ourselves. Lando cocked his brow mischievously, then activated the Lux intercom. Tighten your crash webbing back there. 1-1-A. Is your company ready to go? Affirmative, General. I'm not a general. The reactivation was temporary. A general is always a general. General. Lando rolled his eyes and opened a panel on the arm of his pilot's seat. He pressed a safety-locked button, and a valve in the starboard engine pod began spraying non-sealed Tybana gas into the ion drives. The Lux sprouted a kilometer-long tail of what looked like white flame, but was actually a harmless, fulgurous discharge caused by the ionization of Tybana gas. Lando put the yacht into a corkscrew spin and set an oblique course for the Beert, maintaining enough angle to clear the Star Ferry by a safe margin. The skips scattered, but held their fire. A hit might change the damaged yacht's course and send it careening into the vessels they were guarding. Compliments, General. Batra squeezed his eyes shut against the nauseating star spin outside. Haven't seen a Bothan runaway gambit this tight in years. Lando continued on a vector that would miss by half a kilometer. The skips wheeled around behind him, but stayed well back from the Tybana tail. The beard swelled to the size of a building, and Lando nosed down toward it and decelerated hard. And then there was nothing but Durasteel hull in the forward viewport, and the two ships kissed particle shields hard enough to push the star ferry into the Yuzhan Vong tether ship. Lando swung his stern around and tractored the luck alongside the beard. The first two coral skippers arrived, belching plasma balls into the Lux energy shields. Lando shut down the sublight fuel feed and closed the efflux nacelles. Tybana gas billowed out through the cooling vents, becoming trapped under the shields and engulfing the luck in fused photon flames. The next two skips pulled up without firing, and Lando lowered the shields on the Beert's side of the yacht. One one a, go. When General Calrissian's attack authorization came, YVH one one a was already magna clamped to the beard, affixing a bead of elastic detonite to the hull. Still troubled by his failure at the Coruscant proving trial, he had dedicated a processing band to weapon circuitry tests. All systems checked full power and ammunition, but so they had on Coruscant. YVH-11A's self-preservation routines kept accessing the memory of his blaster bolts dancing off the armored Yuzhan Vong, kept reporting an undetected flaw in his power selection module. His logic center knew the assertion to be groundless. But if it was only a ghost loop, why did it persist even after he degaussed his circuits? In 1.2 seconds after General Calrissian issued the go order, two subordinate units secured the Lady Lux cofferdam around him. YVH-11A withdrew to the airlock and activated the detonite. A door-sized section of hull popped free and clanged off 11A's chest armor as the pressures equalized. Scanning ahead with both optical and acoustic sensors, 11A rushed through the breach into a small power relay control station. Three crew members lay on the floor, holding their ears, groaning from the pressure shift. YVH-11A ignored them and crossed the cabin, then stopped when his see-through sensors detected a squad of Yuzhan Vong in the main corridor outside. Ambush? 124A asked. Affirmative. YVH-11A projected red dots onto the wall to show the location of each individual. He was about to outline an attack strategy when 124A clunked through the hatch and started firing. The results left no doubt 
that his weapon systems were functional. Corridor secure, 124A reported. Maximum efficiency, 11A complimented. Circuits chilling at his own hesitation, 11A assigned firing teams to sever the enemy tether, to secure the Beert's drive units, and to begin a Yuzhan Vong search-and-destroy sweep. The most important task he reserved for himself, leaving two squads to secure the breach until General Calrissian arrived with the biotics. 11A set his auditory sensors to their most sensitive and stepped through the hatch. Though only 4.5 seconds had passed, the corridor walls were pocked with spent thud bugs, the floor strewn with Yuzhan Vong bodies. Droid squads were advancing in both directions, their blaster arms filling the passage with flashes of color. As his processing unit began to interpret auditory data, 11A realized he had underestimated the difficulty of his own mission. Within current sensor range alone, he detected fifty-two vocalizing infants, loudly vocalizing infants. Starting with the nearest, 11A stepped over a still-smoking Yuzhan Vong corpse and followed the wailing through a short maze of corridors to the first-class berthings. An enemy search party was pulling refugees out of their sleeping cabins, shoving them to the floor. The leader was dangling a crying infant by one leg, shaking it at a sobbing human female, and demanding, Tell me, is this the Jedi baby? YVH-11A raised his blaster arm, and the whir of his servo motors caused the Yuzhan Vong to whirl around. Some pushed their captives back into the cabins. Others dragged them out to use his shields. YVH-11A sprang forward, firing. There was no question of faulty selection modules or dampened power outputs. He dropped five foes in five shots. When the leader attempted to dash the baby against the wall, he even felt confident enough to shoot the warrior's hand off at the wrist. The astonished mother caught the child in her arms, then turned to 11A, babbling incomprehensible words of gratitude. Remain calm, 11A replied. Seek shelter immediately. Vicky Shesh looked like something resurrected by a craft death witch. Her cheeks were hollow, her pupils dilated, her skin as gray as a nogris, and her gait suggested the influence of some powerful painkiller. But she held her head high and seemed most determined to impress the Yuzhan Vong following her down the corridor. Fearful that the glow of his photoreceptors would betray his presence, C-3PO stepped to one side of the evacuation bay hatch and continued to peer through the viewport at an oblique angle. And then the nasty Senator Shesh came looking for Ben Skywalker, he said quietly. In a futile attempt to calm the distressed infant, he was using his agile Tran Lang III vocabulator to replicate Mara's breathy voice. The imitation was flawless, but there was nothing he could do about the coldness of his metallic flesh, or about what the child sensed through the Force. So brave Ben grew very quiet. Ben whimpered loudly. Out in the corridor, Vicky Shash cocked her head to one side. I told Mistress Leia I was the wrong droid for this, C-3PO whined in Mara's voice. He opened the emergency med pack he had taken from the escape pod and removed the safe trank. Please be quiet, Master Ben. I am quite certain your mother wouldn't want me administering sedatives. Vicky Shesh spoke to her escorts, and they began to open hatches and search escape bays. C-3PO had primed their own pod for launch, but he was not eager to take another escape pod ride. Besides, they would only find themselves back on Coruscant. The searchers were three hatches away when a hulking YVH war droid appeared behind them. Thank the Maker, C-3PO said. He thought it was a 1-1 series, but that hardly mattered. The whole YVH line was top quality, and the mere fact that there was one aboard was a positive sign. C-3PO sent a burst transmission identifying himself and his charge and requesting aid. He received a terse reply informing him that rescuing him and Ben was the mission. Then the droid loosed a flurry of mini-cannon fire, taking out four of Shesh's escorts in half as many seconds. Ben erupted into a fit of wailing. 
Given the roar in the corridor, C-3PO thought that three centimeters of durasteel wall might prevent the baby from being heard. He was disabused of that notion when he peered through the viewport and found Vicky Shesh crouching behind a bulkhead opposite him, staring through the viewport directly at him. Ben, now look what you've done. It was just the sort of tactical problem suited to a deceptive boffin mind. One narrow doorway defended by a dozen well-armed foes in possession of an undetermined number of hostages. Batra would normally have sent a team through an air duct, or tried to lure the enemy out by feigning withdrawal. This time, he turned to a YVH war droid and pointed at the door. 132, secure the bridge. Yes, General. YVH-132A waded forward into a bug swarm so thick Batra lost sight of him. The droid countered with a lightning storm of blaster fire. Three seconds later, he stood in the doorway, both blaster arms smoking, laminanium armor pitted to the circuit casing. Bridge secure, General. Well done. Batra raised his comlink and spoke to a subordinate waiting in Lando's yacht. You may send the Lady Luck on her way, Captain and give it some speed. I'm sure General Calrissian would appreciate the vessel still being intact when he activates his recall unit. The general clicked off without awaiting an acknowledgment, then followed a dozen soldiers onto the bridge, though there were no signs that the Beert's crew had put up a fight. Two had been tortured to death, the rest bloodied to various degrees. Batra looked around until he found a Rodian with a captain's epaulet, hanging off one shoulder. This ship is being commandeered. Batra handed him a piece of flimsy plast with a set of coordinates. Take us here. You're not commandeering us, General. You're rescuing us. The Rodian studied the flimsy plast, then looked out the viewport as the uncrewed Lady Luck streaked past with an entire squadron of coral skippers in pursuit. The funnels atop his head twisted outward in confusion. Then he said, but I don't understand. This is barely beyond the battle. We won't be safe there. Batra smiled. We will when the venture arrives. Lando was halfway down the service ladder when a shock wave slammed the Beert so hard there was no need to finish the descent. He lost his grip and simply found himself squatting on the Star Ferry's lowest deck, listening to the roar of a pitched battle around the corner. Thermal detonator ignition, General, 11A reported, already standing on the deck. Tether ship destroyed. Thanks for the warning. Lando stood, then heard a familiar drone and dropped back to his haunches as a stray razor bug streaked around the corner. The thing dived at his throat, but 11A zinged a low-power bolt past his ear and zapped it out of the air. Lando managed a weak smile, trying not to show his fright but knowing the war droid had already detected his increased heart rate and the slight rise in skin temperature. He drew his blaster and peered around the corner. Vicky Shesh and two dozen Yuzhan Vong were withdrawing into Escape Bay 14, leaving the floor behind them strewn with tiny black seed pods. Though Lando had never seen this particular weapon, he felt sure the husks contained some unpleasant surprise. Analysis? he asked. Unknown Caltrip device, 11A replied. High potential for biotoxin attack. Thanks for nothing. The Beert lurched slightly as the sublight drives kicked in, and Lando knew they were on their way to the venture. He removed his breath mask from his combat belt. You're sure it's the right baby this time? Lando asked. We're not going after some squib trapped in a locker? The sound signature was identical, 11A said defensively, and the confidence level here is high. YVH-125 received a burst transmission from a 3PO protocol droid claiming to have the correct child. That's them. Lando covered his face with the breath mask. Send in a droid, 11A. Lando had barely finished before 125A rushed forward, deftly dancing through husks. He made it two steps, then the pods began to roll toward him. Another two steps, and his foot came down on one. Nothing happened. 
Then he moved his foot, and a heart-shaped kernel shot into the air behind him. The droid went motionless, then drained into the nugget. Singularity mines. Lando pulled his breath mask down. Nasty. Analysis predicts obstacle impassable, 11A reported. All techniques for bypassing or clearing minefields will fail. Lando shook his head in disappointment. Remind me to speak with the brain department about your ingenuity routines. He took out his comlink and opened a channel to the bridge. Calrissian here. Request two-second suspension of artificial gravity and inertial compensation. Copy. Lando grabbed a bulkhead and had the droids magno-clamp themselves to the floor. A moment later, his stomach fluttered, and the singularity mines floated into the air. They drifted toward the stern and filled the corridor with eerie grating sounds as they brushed the walls and ripped two-meter holes in the durasteel. When gravity was restored, the remaining husks dropped to the floor and destroyed a five-meter section of service corridor. Lando released the bulkhead and sprinted toward Escape Bay 14. He had intended to lead the charge himself, but the droids were already there, pouring blaster fire through the hatchway. Careful, Lando ordered. Watch the baby. And 3PO. He peered around the corner. The last Yuzhan Vong were squeezing into the crowded escape pod, flinging thud bugs at the bay hatch. Vicky Shesh was nowhere to be seen, and the muffled wailing of a terrified infant could just be heard from inside the pod. Go, Lando screamed. Don't let it launch. YVH-11A was already charging. The bug swarm trailed off, then C-3PO's golden form tumbled out. Don't shoot! C-3PO screamed. He picked himself up and raised his hands. I'm one of you! The war droids continued to pour fire past C-3PO as they rushed across the launch bay. The pod hatch started to close. YVH-11A sprang forward, reached for the gap, arrived a millisecond too late to prevent it from sealing. C-3PO palmed the automatic launch button. C-3PO! Lando rushed for the control panel and hit the cancel pad. There was a soft clunk. Then the rockets pounded the blast shielding with efflux. What a relief! C-3PO started across the bay. I thought they would take me along. Lando followed close behind. C-3PO, who was that crying in the escape pod? Oh, that was me, General Calrissian. C-3PO answered in an infant's voice. He stopped next to an emergency breath mask locker and withdrew a med pack pouch containing a soundly sleeping infant. Ben won't be crying for several more hours. I am quite certain. Chapter 54 With both valves of the distant airlock drawn open, a bright crescent of blue sun could be seen blazing out from behind Mirker's rising disk, illuminating the million pillars of the Serpent Hall in gloomy streaks of sapphire. The Shaper and his escorts were little more than stick silhouettes, filing toward the exit in a single line. The Voxen Queen was not visible at all, though Jason knew she was there, in the gap two figures from the front. This is not right. Tisar rasped quietly. That airlock can't be open. It is better to seek an explanation than to deny what we all see clearly, Tenelkar replied. There is an atmosphere outside that lock. Yes, but what else? Virgir asked. That is the question, is it not? How about you answer it for us, Ganna replied. When Virgir spread her arms and gave a feathery shrug, Jason looked back to the line of Yuzhan Vong. He filled his mind with thoughts of fear and suspicion, and reached out to the Queen for the eighth time since leaving the Hive Colony. The Voxen reacted even more quickly than she had the last time, whirling on the warriors behind her. She must already have struck the first Yuzhan Vong with her poison tail barb, for she ignored him and belched acid at the second in line, then leapt past both to slash at the next one. All three warriors went down and she was attacking a fourth before the Shaper and two of his remaining assistants got hold of their leashes and restrained her. Jason withdrew his presence. 
The queen slowly calmed to the point where the shaper felt confident in approaching her, stroking her muzzle and no doubt speaking to her in soothing tones. It would not be long before that act of bravery turned into a deadly mistake, but Jason did not want the beast to kill the handler yet. As wary as the warriors were already, the death of the shaper would cause them to send for reinforcements. The shaper finally backed away and signaled his assistants to release the tethers. They had learned the hard way that the queen would not move with someone holding the other end of a leash, the result of another uneasy feeling planted by Jason. When the Voxen showed its willingness to resume travel by not killing anyone, the Yuzhan Vong turned and, leaving their dead and wounded where they lay, vanished through the open airlock. Only four left, Rajir said, rising from the group's hiding place. Well done, Jason Solo. Jason did not thank the strange little creature. He disliked killing, and he disliked even more tricking an animal into doing it for him. But he had his promise to Anakin to keep, and his sister to track down. He still could not feel Jaina through the Force, and encouraging the Voxen to follow its nature was his only hope of doing either. He nodded to Tisar, who rose and set off. The Barabel kept them concealed in a fungus-lined rift for the area was strewn with Yuzhan Vong workers, scavenging the exhausted serpent yards for a usable amphistaff, or Tsaisi baton. As they traveled, Gana remained a step behind Vergier, his repeating blaster pointed at her feathery back. Though she had been of considerable use in tracking the Yuzhan Vong, the Jedi still did not trust her. Not only had she declined to identify her species, claiming they would not recognize it anyway, she had also refused to explain her presence during Elan's attempt on the Jedi, or her reason for providing the tears that had saved Mara's life. While unsure that she was an enemy, Jason hardly considered her a friend either. Needless to say, he now had Anakin's lightsaber clipped to a spare hook on his equipment harness, and Ganner had pointedly confirmed that he would blast her into a feather cloud at the first sign of treachery. Virgir had indulged them with a shudder, undoubtedly insincere. The fissure and fungus both dwindled away as the group neared the airlock. To avoid drawing attention, the Jedi activated their hollow shrouds and, keeping Virgir screened from view, marched through the airlock disguised as Yuzhan Vong. They found themselves standing on the inside rim of what looked like an enormous impact crater save that the slope was surprisingly featureless and the crest unnaturally even. There was no covering overhead, but the atmosphere was as thick and warm as inside the world ship. In the bottom of the basin lay what resembled a giant honeycomb, save that each cell was a meter across and held a single Dovin basil. Jason could not sense the emotions of the Dovin basils. Creatures with no connection to the Force remained as unreadable to him as the Yuzhan Vong themselves. But he could see by their labored, pulsing, and flaking hides that the things were in distress. There were even large tracts where the cells contained nothing but shriveled husks. Whether this stemmed from old age, exhaustion, or disease, he did not know. But it did suggest another reason the Yuzhan Vong were deserting the dilapidated world ship. The Shaper and his escorts were already on the floor of the basin, moving along the edge of the basal comb toward Nomanor's frigate, which lay about a fifth of the way around the circle. The executor himself and perhaps fifty Yuzhan Vong were half a kilometer out on the structure itself, crawling along the narrow walls between the cells and being careful to avoid the Dovin basils themselves. From the group's different dress, many of them wore armor only over their torsos, it was apparent the executor had stripped the ship's crew to supplement his company. Nomanor and his followers were making their way toward the center of the basal comb, where a huge sweep of cells contained either shriveled husks or nothing at all. In the heart of this dead area rested Jaina's stolen shuttle, cracked and overturned, but still in one piece. The sporadic stream of blaster bolts and magma missiles arcing out of the wreckage suggested that at least a few Jedi had survived the crash. Virgir hunched beside Jason her gaze running from the queen over to Nomanor's frigate, where four warriors stood watch at the base of the boarding ramp. Interesting. Will you destroy the Vox in Jason Solo? 
or save your sister? Jason ignored the question and continued to study the situation. The long blaster roared and split open a warrior in front of Nomanor. The executor shuddered, but lowered his head and continued forward. I don't understand, Tekli said. The shuttle is helpless. The frigate should be attacking. Yes, Tunnelkar agreed. Why crawl so far under fire? Why, indeed, Virgir said. Perhaps there is something aboard they want alive. Jaina, Jason said. Virgir spread her hands. And you? Savongla promised you Nyamka a pair of Jedi twins for the fall of Coruscant. Matters will go badly for Nomanor, if she is already dead. She stopped there and studied Jason a moment, then said, But you could save him the trouble of looking, could you not? I understand that Jedi twins have a special sense of each other. Jason studied her from the corner of his eye. I wouldn't place too much trust in cantina tales were I you. No. Regeer smirked. Are you just cautious, I wonder, or do you have a suspicious nature? Both are the same around you, this one thinks, Tisar said. He checked the power level of his mini-cannon, then braced it on the crest of the slope and trained it on the Voxen. Jason, this one has two shots, maybe three. We must destroy the queen. Jason nodded. And save... He almost said Jaina, then caught himself. Our friends on the shuttle. You cannot do both, Regier warned. The Yuzhan Vong have a saying. The fleet that fights two battles loses twice. Do we look like Yuzhan Vong? Ganner demanded, pointing at his eyes. We're Jedi. So you are, Regier said mildly. But the Yuzhan Vong have their strengths as well. Do not dismiss those strengths because the Force is blind to them. I don't, Jason said. But we are going to win two battles. And here's how. He explained his plan to the others, then watched as a plasma ball arced over Nomanor and crashed twenty paces away. The strike vaporized a ten-meter circle of basal comb. But as the superheated gas spread over the adjacent cells, it condensed into nothingness and vanished in a sheet of flashing color. What about her? Ganner motioned at Virgir with his blaster. Once you're on the frigate, she's free to stay or leave with us as she likes. Jason said. Until then, if she makes one false move, blast her. Virgir finished. She gave a flip of her four-fingered hands, then turned to Tisar. On the bridge of the Kastar, you will find a pilot, a co-pilot, and a communications subaltern. The Master Keeper will also be aboard somewhere. They are not permitted to leave while the vessel is in action. This one shall keep the information in mind, Tisar said, and also where it came from. Tisar passed his mini-cannon to Ganner, then removed his jumpsuit and slipped over the rim of the basin on all fours. His rough scales camouflaged him against the Yorick Coral's dark background, and he moved with such slow reptilian grace that it immediately grew difficult to pick him out. Jason filled his mind with an image of his cramped cell in the Shadow Academy, and allowed himself to feel again the terror of the kidnapping his fear and confusion when he realized he no longer controlled his own destiny. Never far from the surface, even this many years after the event, and perhaps made more accessible by his anguish over Anakin's loss, the emotions returned easily. When a cold sweat began to beat on his forehead, he reached out to the Voxen, infusing her with his own feelings, urging her to flee. The Voxen screeched, and sent two escorts reeling despite the protective membranes in their ears, then turned to run and found a third warrior blocking her way. She snatched him up and bit him cleanly in two. The Shaper raced after her, calling out commands, trying to calm her. Jason urged the beast not to trust her tormentor. She whirled and spat acid, but the Shaper was quick enough to dodge and let one of his escorts be hit instead. Jason unclipped his lightsaber. I'll need to concentrate on the Voxen, so we have to do this without the battle meld. 
May the Force be with you, my friends. Taking her own lightsaber in hand, Tenelka stepped over to kiss him, and was cut off by Vergeer. And with you, Jason Solo. The little creature shooed him down the slope. Now go, before your quarry escapes. Jason looked over her to Tenel Ka and rolled his eyes, then flashed the Dathomiri a lopsided grin and pushed up his breath mask. Using the force to descend the basin's inner rim in two bounds, he landed undetected behind the last stunned escort. Thinking he could knock the lurching warrior unconscious rather than kill him, he reached out to pull off the Yuzhan Vong's helmet and saw his mistake when the fellow spun on him. Jason thumbed his activation switch. The weapon sprang to life in front of the approaching arm and severed it at the elbow. But losing a limb would never stop a Yuzhan Vong. Jason turned his weapon ninety degrees and drew the blade across his foe's neck. The warrior collapsed in a heap. Jason? The voice on the comm link belonged not to Jaina, but to Zek. That you? Who else? Jason continued forward, tried not to be disappointed that he wasn't talking to Jaina. What's your condition? A few injuries, but everybody's stable, Zek reported. We have Lobaka. And Anakin's body. And Jaina? Jason asked, concerned by what Zek left unsaid. Zek paused. No doubt surprised Jason would need to ask. She's here, Jason. Something in Zek's tone hinted at the cold darkness Jason found whenever he reached out to his sister, but he was happy enough for now to hear she was still alive. Good. Wait there. Somebody's coming for you. Jason risked a glance at the frigate. Whether or not the ramp guards realized who he was, the sudden appearance of a single Jedi had proved too much of a temptation. Leaving one warrior on station, the other three were racing after him, amphistaffs in hand. Behind them, Tisar Sebatine's dark figure was creeping into the shadows beneath the frigate's nose, gathering himself to pounce on the last sentry. Jason raced after the Shaper and fleeing Voxen. The mini-cannon roared once, then twice— and two of his pursuers fell. The third dropped under a torrent of T-21 bolts. Jason did not even look back. By now Tisar would be boarding the frigate, the others rushing to join him. The Voxen pulled away fast, the Shaper less so. Jason reached out with the Force, this time to soothe the Voxen. Not a chance. With plasma balls bursting and lasers flashing just a few hundred meters away. The queen continued to run. He tried to call her hunting instincts into play. No good either. Where her clones were trained to stalk Jedi, she was trained only to preserve her own life. Jason pulled one of two thermal detonators from his belt, thumbed the fuse to the first click, and used the force to hurl it into her path. The queen whirled away from the silver ball, found her handler in the way, and slapped him aside. Jason saw an arm fly in one direction and the rest of the Shaper tumble in another. Then the Voxen was racing toward him, head rising to belch acid. He activated his lightsaber and charged to meet her. She disgorged her acid at three paces. Jason launched into an airborne roundoff, and the brown spray shot past below. Then the detonator crackled behind him, and he found himself swinging at empty air. He landed lightly and sprang into a half-twist that brought him around facing the same direction as before, and his heart rose into his throat. No Voxen, only the brilliant flash of the detonator shrinking in on itself. Blinded, Jason brought his lightsaber around in a block and slash and reached out to locate his quarry. She was off to the side, moving away slowly. He blinked the dazzle from his eyes and found her crawling out onto the basil comb angling away from the battle, angling away from Jason, her body so broad she had to straddle the wall between the cells. He left his T-21 slung on his shoulder and started after her. He had only a handful of shots remaining, and the bolts would not penetrate her thick scales anyway. Tenel Ka's voice crackled over the comm link. Frigate secured. We have a way home, but also a complication. Lobaka rumbled a question. How does not matter, Tenelka replied. 
When we found the communications officer, he was in contact with the spaceport. Jason groaned inwardly, then asked, Vergeer? She said she had no wish to be atomized, then departed, Kennelkaw said. She seems to be following you. Check. You hurry. Jason reached the basal comb and had to slow. The walls between cells were a half meter wide, but so steeply crowned that running over them was like running on a board's edge. Shuttle first. Us? Zek complained. You do know the Yuzhan Vong are chasing you. Jason had no time to look. He was gaining on the queen. Shuttle first, he repeated. I have to finish here. The Voxen stopped at the next cell convergence, where the walls met to form a sort of island, then whirled. Jason leapt across the Dovin Basil and landed at her rear flank, tottering and activating his lightsaber. The Voxen screeched, but could not bring her head around far enough to assault Jason. He danced forward and brought his blade down behind her forward leg. Internal organs began to slip from the gap, leaking blood into the air and filling it with toxic fumes. Jason slashed sideways, taking the second leg off at the joint, then thrust deep and brought the blade up. The Voxen pulled away, retreating onto the adjacent wall so she could turn on him. He leapt across to stay behind her, then heard a razor bug droning in his direction. Jason dropped into a squat and brought his weapon up to block, and the bug crackled out of existence. The Voxen continued to retreat until she could face him again. Jason launched himself into a backflip and came down on the cramped convergence behind him, dared to glance away from the Queen. The stolen frigate was already sweeping across the basin toward the crashed shuttle, the forward ramp hanging open for quick boarding. Nomanor and his warriors were within a hundred meters now, some staring up at the stolen frigate with gaping jaws, others still crawling toward Jason, but all too distant to have thrown the razor bug. A shiver of danger sense drew Jason's attention in the opposite direction. He turned and saw a large Yuzhan Vong flying at him across the cell. No, Jedi! The figure extended a single arm. Jason swept his lightsaber up and cut the fellow through at the waist, and did not even recognize him as the shaper until an eight-fingered hand caught hold of his breath mask and nearly jerked him over. He lowered his head, and the breath mask came off. The Yuzhan Vong's torso tumbled into the cell beside him, angry eyes glaring up and barely touched the Dovin basil before the creature reacted with its only defense. A tiny gravitic singularity sprang into existence. Then the shaper's corpse collapsed in on itself and disappeared in a flash of dancing color. The acrid smell of toxic blood reminded Jason of the peril he faced without a breath mask. He looked up to find the queen staring at him from two meters away, eyes expressionless and black, the force heavy with her grim resolve. The creature knew why he was here. She was not angry, not hateful, only determined to save herself. Jason did not want to kill her. He had never wanted to kill any animal. Perhaps she sensed that in him. Jason's head started to spin. He had to finish this. Flicking his lightsaber to hold the creature's attention, he dropped his free hand toward his last thermal detonator. The queen came bounding. He pulled the detonator off his harness. She stretched forward to snap at his head, then surprised him with a claw to the shoulder. The talons bit deep, launched him off his perch. The detonator flew, inactivated, from his hand, and the Dovin basil appeared beneath him, rising fast. He whipped his legs over his head, flinging himself to the opposite side of the cell. Landing dizzy and off-balance, Jason continued in the same direction, this time flipping higher to buy more time. He came down on his heels, vision closing, nostrils burning. He fell backward onto a convergence. His shoulder was throbbing already but at least it still supported the weight of an arm. A trio of coral skippers streaked past overhead, their noses pouring plasma balls toward the center of the basin. Coughing, fighting to stay conscious, Jason sat up and saw the stolen frigate lumbering skyward beneath the bombardment. It launched a magma missile, which vanished into a shielding singularity the instant it neared a skip. With a large enough crew, the frigate would overwhelm the smaller craft easily. 
with a handful of Jedi, it would be torn apart piecemeal. Jason activated his comm link, but was interrupted by a familiar burping sound. He rolled over his good shoulder and came unsteadily to his feet. A fan of brown mucus landed where he had been lying. Then the voxen began to advance. The acrid stench of her blood staggered him, made his lungs burn and his head spin, and nearly sent him tumbling down onto a dovin basil. The queen reached the convergence and stopped. They were separated now by a sizzling pool of her acid. Jason brought his lightsaber to middle guard, tip angled forward, his wounded arm hanging limp. Behind the voxen, the hundred-meter bulk of a York Coral Corvette swept in and cut him off from the rest of the strike team. They were battling now, his friends and a whole flotilla of arriving Yuzhan Vong. A wave of nausea dropped Jason to a knee. Eager to press the advantage, the voxen gathered herself to spring. A thermal detonator splashed into the pool of acid. The fuse had not been activated, but that was all Jason saw before the silver casing sank into the sludge. Could that be important? Bergier called. She was coming toward him, thin arms extended for balance. I saw you drop it. Jason's jaw fell. How did you? No time. Bergier pointed. The Voxen was scrambling along the edge of the convergence, fleeing the silver sphere. The detonator could never ignite without a properly set fuse, but what did the Queen know about detonators? All spheres of tiny silver were spheres to be feared. Jason sprang feet first, caught the Queen dead center, heels driving high into her ribs, forcing her over the edge. She dug her claws deep into the Yorick coral and saved herself. Jason landed beside her hard, and the breath left his burning lungs. The darkness began to rise inside him. No tried to rise. He stabbed his lightsaber into the Yorick coral and began to cut it from beneath the queen's claws. Still intent on escaping the detonator, she released her front leg and reached for the adjacent wall. Then her support began to crumble, and her front quarters slipped into the cell. She brought her tail around, the poisonous barb driving for Jason's neck. He ducked behind his wounded shoulder, took the tip in an open gash, felt venom pulsing into his torn flesh. Hot. Stinging. Too weak to kick, Jason pushed with the force. Another leg came free. The queen, also weakened by injury, slipped deeper. A foot grazed the Dovin basil. Then she was plummeting over the edge, collapsing in on herself, shrinking out of sight. Jason did not see the final flash of color. The barb tore free of his shoulder, and he was overwhelmed by dizziness, collapsing backward onto the convergence. Something began to sizzle, and his hand began to burn. Then someone lifted his arm and propped him up. There came a terrible thunder overhead, a firestorm so bright it lit the darkness behind Jason's closed eyes. He heard a voice calling, a voice he had known all his life, yet one that now seemed as alien as that of any Yuzhan Vong. Jason. A pause, cold and demanding. Jason, answer me. A delicate hand brushed back Jason's hair, took the comm link from his head. You can do nothing for Jason now, a second voice said, also familiar. Save yourselves. Virgir? The first voice demanded. Is that you? I want to talk to my brother. The demand was clicked silent. Jason opened his eyes and saw a delicate four-fingered hand flinging his headset into the air. In the sky far above raged a battle, a Yuzhan Vong frigate trying to blast through a screen of Yuzhan Vong corvettes. Jason was confused, but only for a moment. The frigate was no Manor's, stolen by his friends, now trying to reach him. He struggled upright and saw a one-eyed Yuzhan Vong leading several dozen warriors through a rain of plasma balls and magma missiles. Toward him. He tried to roll found himself restrained by a four-fingered hand. No. Despite the apparent frailty of the hand, its strength was irresistible, at least in Jason's condition. It took his lightsaber from his grasp, then unclipped Anakin's from his equipment harness and took that one as well. You have won your battles. Now you pay. Jason recalled the tortures he and the others had endured aboard the exquisite death. His stomach grew queasy. 
His hands trembled. He opened himself to the Force and smiled at his body's fear. The Jedi were safe. Compared to that, his pain meant nothing. It will, Jason, Regier said, surprising him. He did not recall speaking his thoughts aloud. That I promise you. It will. A warm drop struck his face, then another, and another. Jason craned his neck and found Regier wiping tears from her cheeks. Her face was turned so no Manor and the others could not see. Regier, were you? Yes, Jason. She pressed a finger to his lips. I was crying for you. Chapter 55 The drop fleets hit like a Niclonian meteor storm, slanting across the sky in fiery armadas a hundred kilometers across, crackling and hissing like S-thread static, and trailing anvil-shaped towers of night-black smoke. Standing in the open cannon turret atop Thalia's office, Leia allowed herself two seconds to be awed by the spectacle of it all, and let the thunder reverberate through her body. There was something primal and beautiful in the power of the drop, something that stirred in her a passion of purpose that, until Anakin's death, she had thought lost with her youth. Han came to her side and handed her a calmlinked artillery helmet. The end of the world, he said. Who'd have thought we'd live to see it? There'll be other worlds, Han. She put the helmet on and buckled the chin strap. There was, after all, Duran. The smile Han gave her was as crooked as usual, but now more wistful than cocky. Then let's hope this one lasts until they finish charging our containment fluid. Shafts of color rose from distant rooftops to stab at the descending drop fleets and vessels almost invisible to the naked eye showed damage in the form of white starbursts and flickering disks of orange. The turbolaser fire was answered by a torrent of plasma balls. Towers melted into liquid pillars of durasteel slag. In some cases, building shields endured the first strike, only to fall to the second or third. Dark swarms of coral skippers and air skiffs boiled down ahead of the drop fleets, taking advantage of the steady barrage to locate and attack the turbolasers. These attack craft were met by a far smaller number of New Republic atmospheric fighters, and a steady drizzle of smaller craft began to rain down on Coruscant. General Raikin's voice came over the helmet comlink. Light artillery, take your stations. Hold fire. Han slipped into the gunner's seat on one side of the laser cannon, and Leia took the spotter's station on the other. She would actually have the more difficult of the two jobs, finding and prioritizing threats on the weapon's display. All Han would have to do was shoot them down. Leia activated the sensor feed and began to plot trajectories, assigning precedence based on which drop ships would be approaching nearest to their position. Over the next ten seconds, the number of turbolasers firing decreased steadily, but they punched so many holes in the drop fleets that Leia had to update her targeting priorities twice. By the time the ships themselves began swelling from fingertip-sized circles of friction flame into glossy, black wedge wings, the turbolasers had opened holes the size of lakes in the great armadas. Open fire, Raikin commanded. Han squeezed the trigger and the air filled with the deafening screech of discharging actuators. Their attack took the first dropship by surprise, burning away a wing and sending the wedge-shaped vessel tumbling in two different directions. Subsequent targets proved more difficult. Han had to pulse the trigger and stitch bolts across the hull to defeat the shielding crews. But it was easier to fire from a stationary turret than to defend aboard a wildly gyrating craft, and he and Leia sent two more drop ships crashing into the towers. They paid no attention to the skips and air skiffs, diving on their position from all sides. Those were the responsibility of even lighter blaster cannons firing from adjacent towers, and their expert crews never let an attacker get close. Finally, Leia could find no more targets on the tack screen. She looked up into a dark miasma of smoke, fed by flaming ruins and fuming wrecks all across Coruscant. For a moment all was quiet, then Raikin's voice came over the comlink again. Look sharp there. They're sending in the hunter-killers. 
Leia studied the tactical display, and saw a line of blast boat analogs. She and Han called them blast boulders, streaking toward their position. Large enough to take a hit or two from a light blaster cannon, yet nimble enough to dodge the slower laser cannons, these craft posed a more serious threat than anything that had come before. Leia began to designate priorities and feed Han targets. Borsk Felia chose that moment to appear on the access lift, flanked by a pair of tall, orbital defense soldiers with sandy hair and square chins. Their other features were also so similar they had to be brothers. In Leia's time, relatives would never have been permitted to serve in the same unit, but those rules had changed under Felia. Bothans had a different view of family. Leia, you have a comm message in my office, Felia said. His brisk tone suggested he had lifted himself out of the torpor into which he had sunk when her speech failed to bring the deserting senators and their pilfered flotillas back to Coruscant. You can take it at my desk. We're kind of busy right now, Han growled, pouring fire into the first blast boulder. You might have noticed. It's Luke Skywalker, Felia said. He seems to be trapped. Han stopped firing. On the planet? Over at the Western Sea. If I heard him correctly, Felia said. The channel was scratchy. Han looked over the cannon at Leia, and she knew he was thinking the same thing. If Luke was on Coruscant, there was no telling where Ben was. These guards will take your station, Felia said, motioning to the brothers. Leia slipped out of her seat and moved toward the lift. Instead of stepping out of her way, as most soldiers would for a former chief of state, this pair stared down at her blank-faced. She knew instantly something was wrong, and confirmed it when she reached out with the Force and felt nothing from them. Forgive me, soldier. Turning to hide her lightsaber from view, Leia stepped aside to let the infiltrator by, then caught her husband's eye as he did the same thing. Han furrowed his brow. She glanced pointedly at his blaster and snapped the lightsaber off her belt. An alarmed light came to his eye, and he reached for his blaster pistol. His Yuzhan Vong spun on him, knocking him into the back wall. Han slumped to the floor and, never taking his weapon from its swing-free holster, blasted the infiltrator. Leia was already pressing her lightsaber against her foe's ribs. Siren! He whirled, elbow driving at her head. She ducked, thumbed the activation switch, then stepped away as the imposter collapsed at her feet. Thalia stared at the corpses, jaw snapping as the Uglith maskers peeled away from their faces. In my own office. Perhaps the time has come to destroy the data towers, chief, Leia suggested mildly. Thalia's eyes flashed, but any reply was cut off by a blaring attack alarm. One glance at the display told Leia the infiltrators had succeeded, at least in part. With three blast boulders lining up for approach, they had no chance of saving their weapon. Go! She pushed Han and Felia onto the service lift, then followed. They conned a report to General Thomas's aide, then emerged ten meters below in the Chief of State's office. An instant later, a series of explosions shook the blast-hardened ceiling, and the cannon turret was gone. Leia saw Garve Thomas coming through the far door, but she removed her artillery helmet and went straight to Felia's comm center. Luke. Luke, this is your sister. Luke? There might have been an answer. It was difficult to tell over the battle roar in the background. She stretched out and sensed her brother's presence somewhere beyond the horizon. Though she was not sensitive enough to guess his condition or situation, Leia could feel that he was alive. Luke, if you hear me, we'll be there as soon as the Falcon's containment fluid is recharged. Actually, it's recharged now. Leia glanced over her shoulder to find Garve Thomas glowering at Felia. I asked Chief Felia to relay that news some time ago. Felia shrugged. They were needed in the cannon turret. Check that, Luke. Leia was not even angry. Being upset at the Boffin's selfishness would have been like being angry at a Wookiee's shedding. And they had been needed in the turret. The Falcon is ready now. We'll be coming soon, Luke. Again, there was no answer. Only a small surge in her sense of her brother. Though Leia hoped it meant Luke had heard her, there was no way to be sure. It could have meant he was trying to find her, thinking about her. 
going to miss her. Anything. Leia stood and turned to find Han, already describing the infiltrators to Garve. The general was shaking his head angrily. The door guards have epidermal scanners and orders to use them. But disordered troops are pouring in by the tens of thousands, and no one wants to turn away a fellow soldier. Garve ran his fingers through his hair. For all I know, they're all infiltrators. It was bound to happen, Garve. Leia turned to failure. The time has come to destroy the Data Tower's chief. To delay longer is to give the enemy his most precious advantage. Philia's eyes flashed angrily, almost madly, and Leia thought he would refuse. He spun away and went to stare at the carnage outside. You're deserting me, aren't you? he asked. Just like the senators. Han rolled his eyes, then hefted his blaster like a club, and cocked his brow at the others. Leia pushed his hand down, then went to stand behind Felia. Not like the senators. It's time. Felia stared over the smoking city for another moment and finally let his chin sink. I suppose it is. He took a moment to gather his strength, then turned to Garf. General Thomas, give the order to destroy the data towers, if you haven't already. Very good, Chief Felia. The fact that Garve did not reach for his comlink suggested the order had indeed been issued. I'll have First Citizen prepared for departure. Felia nodded wearily. Evacuate as many as you can, and be sure you are aboard. That's an order, General. Yes, sir. As long as my duties here are completed, they are, Felia said. Don't make me dismiss you. Garve reluctantly inclined his head. Very well, then. Good. Felia turned back to the transparent deal. And tell Captain Durham not to wait. I won't be joining you. What? Han asked. If you think you can make some kind of deal, Han, that's not what the chief is thinking. Leia held a finger to her lips and said, Chief Failure, you can't accomplish anything here. And what could I accomplish anywhere else? Who would follow me after this? He waved a hand outside. History will blame me for what happened today. Don't try to tell me otherwise. Leia did not. Even if she had wanted to lie, Failure was too smart. There are other ways of serving. Felia snorted. Perhaps for you, princess. He turned his back and walked to his desk. But not for me. Not for Borsk Felia. Snap to, people. The captain had to yell to make himself heard inside the turbo laser's cavernous turret. The battery intercom had gone with the rest of the communications. Here comes the second wave. Luke hardly needed the officer's warning. He had only to crane his neck to look through a ten-meter hole in the ceiling and see a sheet of orange friction flames crackling down from above. If anything, this assault looked larger and faster than the first, and the first had reduced Coruscant's turbolaser capacity by two-thirds. They're coming through this time, Mara said, not quite reading Luke's thoughts. She was sitting on a bench in the observation bay, her back to casted ankle, Popped on a spare blast helmet. That first wave was just to soften us up. Luke took her hand. Han and Leia will get here, he said. I told Borsk where we were. But did he tell them? Luke knew better than to offer hollow reassurance. The fear they had been sensing in Ben all morning had become a strange disconnectedness, and Mara, always more of a realist than an optimist, Assumed the worst. Never one who liked counting on others, she blamed herself for leaving the baby with Han and Leia after Anakin's death, which only made her all the more determined not to count on anyone else for his rescue. Luke chose to place his trust in the Force, though he knew that an unhappy outcome would certainly lead to a profound crisis of belief. The twin turbo lasers began to hurl blue streaks skyward each discharge shaking the huge turret so hard that Luke's knees felt like they would buckle. This time, far fewer starbursts and orange flares appeared in the heart of the drop fleet. 
A steady stream of white pinpoints swelled into crackling orbs of white plasma and burst against the battery's hastily repaired shields. Each time, the internal lighting dimmed a little more, and a few more pieces of equipment sparked out. In the middle of it all, R2-D2 started to tweet and whistle so fiercely that he was audible even two bays away. Luke looked toward the number two targeting bay, where the little droid was filling in for a damaged R-7 unit, and saw a scowling fire control officer waving him over. "'I'll be right back,' Luke said to Mara. A plasma ball finally crashed through the shield and burned a second hole through the armored ceiling. In the next instant, two more fiery balls roared into the turret itself and erupted against the back wall, filling the chamber with smoke and screams. One of the big turbolasers fell silent, and the evacuation alarms blared. "'Hold on, Skywalker,' Mara stood and limped after him. "'You're not going anywhere without me.' Computer operators began to pour out of both targeting bays, but the officer who had waved at Luke stayed long enough to shake a finger at a vid display. "'Your droid frizzed out and said you had to see this.' He turned to depart with the others, calling over his shoulder. He picked it out of a teletargeter data stream. It was in one of the old flash codes. The display showed a string of times and orbital coordinates, then a four-word message. Beert, bet, covered. Calrissian. Lando, Mara exclaimed. I could kiss him. Luke tapped the console keys, ordering a flimsoplast printout. And I could let you. Instead of continuing down into the teeth of Coruscant's still plentiful light artillery, the second wave of drop fleets pulled up at two thousand meters and began to disgorge spiraling lines of dark flecks. As they came closer, the flecks resolved into V-shaped wings over tiny dark rectangles, then into Yuzhan Vong warriors suspended in the grasp of huge, Minoc-like creatures. Watching from the privacy of his office balcony, Borsk found himself admiring the way Sawang La built one attack off another, lulling the enemy into believing he was trying one thing while actually doing something else. It was classic cutthroat Dejeric strategy, and the War Master was executing it like one of the old Bothan masters. Borsk hated him for it. The Yuzhan Vong were robbing him of all he had spent a lifetime seeking, and they were ensuring that he would be forever remembered as the Bothan who lost Coruscant. For that, Borsk would have liked to teach the Kintan Strider death gambit to Savang La. Such a coup would certainly have changed how New Republic historians remembered Chief of State failure. When the descending warriors began to fling fire jellies down on the palace, Borsk took a last gulp from the snifter of Andorian port in his hand, then stood and went to his desk. Not allowing himself to hesitate or tremble, he reached down to his bottom drawer and keyed a code he had never expected to use. He removed a small medkit scanner transmitter, then depressed the activation switch and held the device next to his heart. When the function light began to beep in time with his pulse, he placed it in the center of the desk and reached down again, this time arming a fuse attached to the proton bomb that filled most of the drawer. The bomb was not huge, but it was large enough to destroy this wing of the palace, and all the secrets within it. By the time he finished, the enemy drop troopers were circling the palace's burning data towers and fighting their way onto its bitterly defended balconies. Finding no guards outside the chief of state's office, a squad dropped onto the balcony where he had been sitting. Borsk waited behind his desk and watched as the warriors kicked in a door they could have opened with the touch of a button. The first two raced to his side and thrust amphistaffs toward his throat but stopped short of killing him when they saw his furred paws resting in plain sight. Several more rushed through the room to secure the doors and equipment. Then a heavily tattooed officer came to his desk. Before the Yuzhan Vong could ask, Borsk said, I am Borsk Felia, Chief of State of the New Republic. Harm me at your own peril. This drew a derisive snort. It does not look like I have much to fear from you or your new republic, Borsk Felia. Then from your own war master, Borsk said evenly. Salong La will certainly wish to speak with me. You may tell him I will receive him here. You will see the war master when and where it pleases him. 
The officer glanced at the heart rate scanner on Borsk's desk. What is this abomination? A communications device, Borsk lied. I can use it to communicate with all New Republic troops on Coruscant. Quicker to see the obvious than the Chief of State had dared hope, the officer thrust it at Borsk's face. Tell your troops to lay down their arms and they will be spared. After. I have worked out terms with Savong La. The officer slapped his amphistaff across Borsk's hand. Something sharp penetrated his furry flesh. Then the Bothan felt a fiery tide of venom rolling up his veins and noticed the frantic blinking of his heart rate scanner. Quickly regaining his composure, he reached over with his free hand and pinched the pressure point inside his armpit, then looked up at the officer and shrugged. Pump me full of all the poison you wish. It makes no difference to me if you offer your gods a spoiled sacrifice. You assume much in thinking yourself worthy, Failure. Despite his words, the officer turned and spoke into the air. One of the villips on his shoulder said something in reply. He nodded curtly and, saying nothing else to his prisoner, stationed his squad at various points around the tower's suite. Borsk wished he had thought to bring in the port from the balcony. He felt sure he would die the instant he released the pressure point. But the pain was not bad enough to prevent him from holding the snifter in the poisoned hand. And, judging by his success so far, he could probably have bluffed the officer into letting him finish it. Outside, Yuzhan Vong drop troopers continued to swirl around Coruscant's Ares, trading fire with light artillery emplacements and slowly claiming control of the tower-top strongholds. As the cannon fire dwindled, the blast boulders started to venture down again, melting stubborn pockets of resistance into naked skeletons of durasteel. Finally, the drop ships descended, landing whole brigades of reptoid slave soldiers on captured rooftops. The Yuzhan Vong might claim to be great warriors, but Borsk knew who would be doing the hard fighting down in the underlevels. Despite the pains shooting up his arm, Borsk called upon his long experience as a diplomat to keep an impassive face. At last, a large blast boulder stopped outside his balcony and disembarked a company of much tattooed warriors. An earless individual, wearing a cape of colorful scales over armor, entered the office and came to Borsk's side. He had fringed lips and a face so mutilated it was difficult to tell the tattoos from the scars, but Borsk knew this was not Savong La. Like nearly everyone else in the New Republic, the chief had watched the War Master's broadcast after the fall of Duro, when he had demanded the surrender of the Jedi, and even this grisly face could not compare to Savong La's. You may stand, the newcomer said, when I see Savong La. The Yuzhan Vong held his hand out and received an amphistaff from one of his subordinates. He brought the butt of the weapon down on Borsk's poisoned hand. The Bothan bit his tongue to keep from screaming and grew immediately dizzy. Tell the War Master to hurry, Borsk said, fighting to stay upright. I will be dying soon. I am Ram Zakar, commander of the drop. The Yuzhan Vong said. You must surrender to me. Borsk shook his head. Then there will be no surrender. Instead of striking again, Zakar pressed the amphistaff's fanged head to the hand holding the pressure point. Why must you speak with the War Master personally? Honor. Borsk had been expecting this question, and had long ago thought of a suitable answer. If I am to surrender... I must do it to someone of equal station. Zakar surprised him by speaking into the air in Yuzhan Vong. There were a few minutes of silence. Borsk continued to grow dizzy, and the light on his heart rate scanner began to blink more slowly. Finally, one of the commander's shoulder villips answered. Zakar nodded and uttered a single Yuzhan Vong word, then ordered the others to evacuate the office. When his subordinates filed onto the waiting blast boulder, Zakar said, You are not Savong La's equal, but he sends his compliments. He flicked the amphistaff, and the head sank its poisoned fangs deep into the hand holding the pressure point. He believes the Kintan Strider death gambit to be the only worthy move in your infidel to Jarek game.
The detonation flash would have been visible from orbit even without the magnification of Kotok's great eye. But through the lens, Savong La saw the white sphere of Borsk Felia's death bomb flash into existence across a full kilometer. It hung there for many seconds, its heat melting the faces of the surrounding towers and shattering every Yorick coral vessel within two hundred meters. In addition to Zakar's departing command vessel, the blast destroyed two drop ships and at least twenty air skiffs, and the warriors inside a good portion of the Imperial Palace as well. In all, perhaps twenty-five thousand, Yuzhan Vong. I should have had Zakar let him bleed to death, Savang La said. Our losses today are already too heavy. I am glad you are not among them, War Master. Seif was standing next to him at the edge of the Great Eye, staring down on the world they were conquering. In her hands she held the villop of the priest Harar, whom the War Master had dispatched to Mirker to consecrate the capture and return of the Solo twins. Eminence Harar was wise to advise you not to go. Savang La considered this, then addressed the villop. Seif praises your wisdom, my friend. She does not think me ready to stand before Yun Yamka either. It is not a matter of your readiness, War Master, Harar's Villip said. It is a matter of what the gods desire. If it was not their wish to take you when the Sunalak was destroyed, it would have been a blasphemy to let the infidel leader slay you. The War Master looked back to the Imperial Palace, and watched the fiery sphere contract into its own vacuum, drawing clouds of smoke and rubble and tumbling bodies after it. The blast had annihilated most of what Vicky Shesh's diagrams identified as the executive and administrative wings of the Imperial Palace. Only the Grand Convocation Chamber and Senatorial Offices remained more or less intact, and there was no reason to believe they would contain many of the vital records the readers had hoped to capture. I am not so certain the gods will be all that pleased with my survival, Eminence Harar. Savong La glanced down at the scales and spines protruding from the still rotting flesh at his shoulder, and said, It is better to die in the service of a victorious end than suffer the disgrace of a shamed one. Then the corruption is advancing again? Harar asked. It has not abated, Savong La corrected. The gods have given me Coruscant. Now I must give them their Jedi twins. You will, mighty one. It was a mark of their friendship that Harar addressed him so, for priests rarely afforded warriors such respect. Regier's ruse was successful. She reports that Jason Solo is her prisoner even now. And Jaina Solo? When last we spoke, Nomanor assured me she was within his reach. Seif exhaled in relief. But the War Master's stomach grew queasy. The Alfoth had already contacted him to complain about the destruction of the cloning Grashel and the loss of the Vox in primary, so he knew just how short Nomanor's reach truly was. He folded his hand and raw dank claw together before his chest and bowed to Harar's villip. Glory to the gods, Eminence. All Coruscant awaits your return. They brought the Kastar around again. The targeting mask on Jaina's face showed three York Coral Corvettes coming straight at them. Behind the trio, the world ship was silhouetted against Mirker, a huge gray disk overlapping an even larger green disk. The basin where she had last seen Jason was smaller than the last time they had come around, about the size of a Fefz's compound eye. Zek! She yelled into the targeting mask. We're farther away. Because they keep getting closer, Zek growled back. We won't save him by getting blasted ourselves. Clear me a lane. Done. Cursing Zek for a Sith-spawned coward, Jaina raised her left thumb. The control glove on her hand activated the mask's targeting reticle, basically a set of increasingly blurry rings. She fixed her gaze on the rightmost blur and— Working through trial and error, with no idea what the strange flashes in the viewfinder might mean, ran a right hand through an awkward finger dance that brought each concentric ring into focus. When the center disc showed a clear image of her target, she made a fist with her left hand. From the other side of the blast jewel came the loud plop of a plasma gun's automatic loader, 
then the deafening bang of the actuator charge ionizing the medium. Jaina's mask went dark, and the blazing sphere streaked away. The viewfinder cleared two seconds later. Her plasma ball was arcing toward her target, and a long line of enemy rounds was streaking back toward her. Incoming, she yelled. Zek put the frigate into a tight rising turn, and they swung away from the world ship. Zek! Labaka cut her off with an urgent bellow. A fleet? Jaina cried. She craned her neck around, and a dozen oblong flecks appeared in her targeting mask, streaking in from the edge of the system. Her heart fell. It wasn't a fleet, not exactly, but if they tried to return to the world ship, they would be trapped. A flurry of plasma balls blazed past under the Kastar's belly. Then one slipped past Tisar at the stern shielding station and impacted the hull. The frigate shuddered. Zek's voice came through the mask. Jaina, what do you want to do? Jaina could not answer. There was only one thing to do. But how could she abandon Jason? After rebuking him for leaving Anakin, how? The Kastar shuddered again. A wet pop sounded somewhere aft, a door valve sealing against a vacuum breach. Jaina, Zek yelled. I... The words caught in her throat, like she was choking. She closed her fist and sent a plasma ball streaking into space. Better for Jason if we flee, Kennel Ka said. With only one twin, perhaps they will delay the sacrifice until we can organize a rescue. What rescue, Jaina thought. They had lost so many Jedi already. Even Luke would risk no more to rescue Jason, but he would not stop Jaina. Nobody would. That's what we do, Ganner said. Best thing for Jason. Jaina? Zek asked. Your brother. Just do it, Jaina thought. Don't make me say it. All right. Zek turned the ship away. I think I understand. This one thinks you do, Tisar said. We all do. Not possible. Mask filling with tears, Jaina craned her neck around, and the world ship came into view, no larger than a fist. She closed her eyes, concentrated on that place in her chest that had always belonged to Jason. She felt him there, just a flicker for just an instant. And then she lost him. Then she could feel nothing except her own anger and hatred and despair. We'll be back, Jason, she said finding the strength to speak. You hold on. We'll come for you. Generally speaking, it was not good to skim a planetary surface with a ship's artificial gravity fully activated. The conflicting perceptions of up and down played havoc with most species' sense of balance, and Leia could feel the effects in her own queasy stomach and spinning head. She could also hear over the intercom and smell in the circulation system the effect it was having on the passengers. There was nothing to be done about it. With the holds packed full of unrestrained passengers, and the Falcon dodging and swinging through Coruscant's hover lanes and a skip squadron nosing their tail, they needed some way to hold everyone on the floor. If that meant Leia had to sanesteem the entire ship later, she would consider it a privilege to be alive to do it. Han rolled the Falcon upside down and bobbed over a bridge, then found two skips coming head-on and had to dive for the dark underlevels. Both laser turrets chuffed as Miwal and a gunner from the palace poured fire over the stern. One of them hit, and a deafening rumble shook the towers. Their success had no effect on the number of magma balls streaking down all around. Leia pulled herself back to the center of the oversized co-pilot's chair, checked the map on her vid display, and cursed. Missed our turn. I knew that. Of course, dear. Han leveled the Falcon out and headed back. The upper quad cannons chuffed constantly as Miwal ripped into the bellies of half a dozen surprised skips. Then Han stood the Falcon on its side and banked into the narrow side lane, and Leia had to grab the arm of her chair to hold herself up, where she could see the map display. Left in three, two, got it. 
Han flipped the falcon over on its other side. Then they were shooting through the dank catacombs beneath the great western sea. Miwal and the palace gunner took out another pair of skips. Han splashed the falcon through a swirling waterfall, made three quick turns, and the skips were gone. Not bad for an old man. Leia centered herself in her chair. Maybe Corin can teach you to fly an X-wing when we get out of this. If Eclipse has any left, Han said. They picked their way through the dark maze of mildewed buildings and mossy pillars that supported the lake bed, then poked the falcon's nose out from under the Ferrocrete beach and hovered on their repulsor engines. Directly ahead lay the smoking ruins of a planetary turbolaser battery. The weapons themselves were melted to slag. The massive support structure looked more like a meteor crater than a building. This the one? Han's voice was full of disbelief. Leia checked the display. This is it. Han cursed. Leia could tell what he was thinking, that he was afraid they were too late. But knowing she had other resources, he waited and said nothing. He was the same Han, certainly, but somehow attuned to her in a way the old Han could never have been. She was beginning to like this. Really like it. Leia closed her eyes and reached for her brother, trying to let her sense of his presence lead her to him, as it had that time on Bespin when Darth Vader took his hand. After a moment, she raised her arm and, without looking, pointed in the direction she felt him. There, she said. You mean right over there? Han asked. Where that dropship is coming down? Leia opened her eyes and saw the small mountain of a Yuzhan Vong dropship descending toward the tower top she was pointing at. Yes, she said. That would be about right. Pirouetting on her good foot, Mara raised her back to cast, and Hook kicked a Yuzhan Vong in the temple. He dropped, and she continued her spin and slashed her lightsaber across the one behind him, then ducked an amphistaff striking from the right, and saw Luke leave himself open to run her attacker through. She brought her blaster under her arm and fired twice, once to either side of Luke's head, and burned holes between the eyes of two Yuzhan Vong rushing to attack him. Luke smiled and swept the feet from beneath a fresh warrior as he skipped in to attack. For each warrior they killed, a dozen more rushed forward to die. They launched themselves into side-by-side -side backflips, and came down in the middle of the turbolaser crew's firing line, and began to bat swarm and lay bolt. The Yuzhan Vong charge faltered, then dribbled to an end as the crew members opened up with their blaster rifles. A junior officer, one of two remaining to the battery, stepped to their side. We're out of here. Going under. No, Mara told him. The Falcon can't find us inside a building. Won't much matter. The officer pointed into the sky, where a thousand-meter dropship was moving into position over the building. Like the lady said, fight until you can fight no longer. Your friends aren't coming. We'll do more damage below. The dropship started to rain fire jellies, melting hand-sized holes into the durasteel roof. One landed too close and drew an alarmed whistle from R2-D2, and Mara and Luke began to use the force to redirect those coming in their direction. What do you think? Mara asked Luke. She knew he still felt Leia searching for them. Maybe we're just drawing them into a world of hurt. The dropship's belly hatches opened and began to dangle lines, reptoid slave soldiers already sliding down. A dozen ropes landed on their building alone. Luke raised his blaster and opened fire. We have to stay. Han and Leia won't leave until they know one way or another. Mara nodded. Fine. Ben is safe. I'll trust the Force for the rest. Hey, where's everybody going? Han demanded of nobody in particular, least of all Leia. Wouldn't you think they could stay in one place for five minutes? The tower was one of those mere steel jobs with a stepped roof, and of course the lightsabers and blaster flashes had been on the wrong side when Leia finally spotted Luke and Mara and the battery crew. 
It had taken five minutes of wild flying to circle the area and approach from Luke's side of the roof, and now the New Republic crew members were running for the stairwell. Tighten your crash webbing, Han said, and arm the concussion missiles. The concussion missiles? Leia gasped. Han. Han took his eye off the rooftops and glanced over. Yeah? Leia swallowed, then reached for the arming switches. How many? Han smiled crookedly. How many do you think? All of them. Leia started flipping toggles. Han brought them in fast and low, streaking under the dropship barely three meters above roof level. Too slow to react, the big vessel released a volley of fire jellies that did more harm to the reptoids on its drop lines than to the well-shielded falcon. Han slammed the decelerators and, hoping he wouldn't ion-scorch Luke or Mara, brought the ship up on its tail. Launch! Leia hit the launcher. The first pair of missiles flashed away and slammed into the dropship's belly before the shielding crews could react. The shockwave banged the Falcon down on its tail, and she launched the second and third volleys. By the time she hit the fourth wave, the massive vessel was belching fire from its drop hatches and raining shards of Yorick coral from its hull. The New Republic troops reversed course, racing for the Falcon. Han could not see Luke and Mara, but felt sure they were already running up behind. Get the boarding ramp. Han set the Falcon down on its struts, and make it. Leia was already rushing down the outrigger access tunnel. Miwal and the palace gunner opened up on the reptoids with the quad cannons. Han lowered the retractable repeating blaster for good measure. He kept expecting the dropship to lay down a suppression barrage, but soon realized that the real danger was being crushed beneath the flaming boulders that kept crashing down around the Falcon. Maybe there was such a thing as overkill. Han withdrew the retractable blaster. As soon as the status light indicated the ramp was rising, he lifted off and streaked out from under the drop ship, diving into the hover lanes and shooting under the Great Western Sea, navigating more by sensor and display map than by what he could see. They were about halfway across when Luke entered the cockpit with Mara, Leia, and R2-D2. Thanks for the lift, Luke clasped Han's shoulder, and slipped into the co-pilot seat. We were beginning to think you wouldn't make it. The hover lanes were murder. Han glanced at the map on Leia's display and started to ask Luke to find a good place to break for orbit, then thought better of it and hitched his thumb toward the back of the cockpit. Sorry, kid, that seat belongs to Leia. Luke's face fell. I'm sorry. He stood and fished a piece of flimsyplast from his pocket. I just needed to give this to you. An uneasy silence fell over the cockpit. Luke started to hand the flimsyplast to Han, then caught himself and turned to Leia instead. Han rolled his eyes. Look, I didn't mean anything. I just need my co-pilot in her own seat and you on the belly gun, that's all. The relief in the cockpit was thick enough to taste, and Han was content to leave it that way. The last thing he wanted was someone apologizing for Anakin's death. That would have cheapened it, implied that Anakin had died for nothing. Will you guys get to it? Han demanded. Mara, maybe you can see about reloading the missile launchers. We've got a lot of people on this tub who'd like to get out of here. Sure. Mara and Luke stepped aside so Leia could slip into her chair. Then Luke handed her the flimsy plast and explained where it had come from. By the time he finished, the falcon was streaking out from beneath the far side of the western sea. Han took it down deep in the hover lanes and began to bob and weave through broken-down bridges, leaving R2-D2 to plug into the droid socket. Luke and Mara retreated to their combat posts. Leia looked over. My seat, huh? You've been doing all right? Han eyed the huge co-pilot's chair, Chewbacca's old chair, then added, If we get out of here alive, we'll make it official, and you get a seat that fits. Leia raised her brow. Now that would be something. She studied the flimsy plast, checked the chronometer, then punched in a set of coordinates. Take us up, flyboy. Han laid on the power and pulled the yoke.
and the falcon streaked out of the tar canyons into the opalescent sky. They were past the dropships and assault ships before the Eugene Vaughn had time to react, but as they left the upper atmosphere, a cruiser analog tagged as the Crotok dropped skips and moved to cut them off. Luke and Miwal sounded off with the quad cannons. R2-D2 chirped and whistled, searching the comm channels for a friendly voice. Han activated the intercom. Mara, how are those three loaded? That'll do. Han tried to sound confident. Stand. R2-D2 trilled wildly. Then Danny Kui's familiar voice broke in. Falcon, break to ten degrees. Continue with all due speed, and don't fire those concussion missiles. Han obeyed instinctively, then looked at his tactical display. Nothing but skips ahead. Uh, ten degrees doesn't look good. It will. This from Lando. Mara was instantly on the channel. Calrissian, what are you doing? I don't want— Your package is safe with Tendra, Lando replied. Aboard the venture. Han looked over. Leia could only shrug and wave the flimsiplast Luke had given her. Trust me, Danny said. R2-D2 tweedled. Then the Jedi wing appeared on the tactical display, streaking in the ship's flank. Copy. Han continued toward the converging coral skippers. What have we got to lose? The enemy closed another few seconds and began to fire. Luke and Miwal answered, and the Krotok rushed to join the battle. The first plasma balls blossomed against the forward shields. Then the Jedi wing reached range and opened fire, and half the skips vanished. The cruiser suddenly had other concerns and veered away from the battle, and the skips fell into chaos. Four wheeled around to meet this new challenge, all moving in different directions with no hope of concentrating their fire. Another pair collided. The six skips in the lead continued forward, oblivious to the danger behind. The Jedi wing loosed another volley. Then nothing lay between the Falcon and freedom. Think you can put the bird through there, you old pirate? Lando calmed. Even you ought to be able to handle that. Han was speechless. A disciplined skip squadron did not dissolve into a mess that would have embarrassed a swoop gang, yet that was what he had seen. He piloted the Falcon past the few remaining skips. The Venture appeared on the tactical display, and he veered toward it. Finally he asked, Did that really happen back there? I think so, Luke said over the intercom. A Yamask has just been jammed. He switched to the general comm channel, then added, Danny? Silgal? Congratulations. Your success came too late for Coruscant, but it gives me hope for the future. It gives us all hope, Leia said. Thank you. The rest of Eclipse's forces added their congratulations. Then Luke came on the channel again. Let's form up on the venture and proceed to the rendezvous, he said. And be careful. With Coruscant captured... The responsibility for keeping the New Republic alive will fall to the Jedi. Han swung the Falcon into line with the rest of the convoy, then started to calculate whether they should make even the short jump to the rendezvous site with so many passengers aboard. Leia, how many troopers did we pick up on the roof? When there was no answer, Han looked over to find Leia lost in meditation, her face weary and full of sorrow. His heart rose into his throat for it was a look he had seen on her face only once before. He reached over and shook her arm. What? he asked. Not the twins? Leia's face remained weary and sad, but also grew fearfully calm. They're alive, but in trouble. Terrible trouble. I, too. Give me a line to the venture, Han ordered. We'll dump this bunch and go after them, Leia. Just you and me. Leia placed her hand on his and shook her head. No, Han. Even if I knew where to look and could reach there alive, it doesn't feel like that kind of trouble. They must rescue themselves. Han scowled. It sounded like Jedi trouble, and that was the worst kind. And if they don't? They will. 
Leia closed her eyes and held his hand. They will. 